This is part one of what if Naruto lost his sight. If you fund the what if to your taste then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Posts once to three times a week. Start chapter. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 1. Trouble 1. D-I-S-C-L-A-M-E-R, I do not own Naruto. I was never able to get enough ramen for the trap to work. Tilda 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 tilda. Are you alright, scaredy cat, I taunted. My eyes felt sharper as I held back an extremely large snake from eating Sasuke. Something inside me loved the way things stood, I was the one protecting my team while Sasuke was scared stiff. Oh how the tides had changed over the last few months. There's no way anyone could call me the dead last now that I just saved the pretty boy's ass. Unfortunately, the second I thought this I forgot all about the gift-wrapped freak on its head. She, or he grabbed me with his, daughter, its tongue before I could react. As I was being pulled away, towards the snake-obsessed weirdo, I was stuck between being startled at my current predicament, mad at letting myself be put in this current predicament. Engrossed out that the cause of my current predicament was holding me with its tongue. Let me go you unisexed pedophile. The person in question looked at me questioningly, as if to ask, what the hell is that about? But then it just shook its head and spoke. The nine-tailed brat is still alive, I see. With quite the tongue on him as well. Bet you like that. Again I was ignored, though I did get the pleasure of seeing an angry tick appear on the its head. Oddly enough, you and your biju are coexisting quite well. I'm going to have to change that. The it raised a hand, each finger glowing with a different kanji. Five-pronged seal. It shouted as the glowing fingers were forced into my seal. An intense pain coursed throughout my body, making me unaware of anything other than it. I could have sworn that I heard someone shout at Sasuke while the other one screamed. When I thought back on it, I was probably the one screaming but why anyone was calling out for Sasuke when it was M.E. that was getting hurt I would never know. Everything became fuzzy after that, like I was losing consciousness. I was vaguely aware of being thrown into a tree then dangling there from my jacket. I felt that if I did let myself get knocked out, something bad would happen. So I struggled to claw my way back to the real world, using nothing but my strong force of will to do so. Luckily I have a lot of that. Once I was back, I opened my eyes to find myself dangling on a tree, nothing holding me there except a kunai through my coat. I could hear fighting nearby, probably that it person and one of my teammates. On second thought, probably not. Well, whoever the it was fighting, I figured I could get down without them noticing, but only if I was quick about it. Though I was still in pain, I reached up and pulled out the kunai. After I began to fall, I focused chakra into my feet so that I would stick to the tree but something wasn't right. My chakra didn't work like it should, this was made apparent by my feet slide down the bark like I wasn't even doing anything. Lucky for me there was a branch just a few feet down that I could land on. Once I did, my legs wobbled, forcing me to grab the tree in order to keep from falling again. After I was able to stand on my own, I looked up to see how the fight was progressing. To my surprise, I saw Sasuke was the its opponent and though I could tell that the bow-wearing non-gender was holding back, Sasuke was still doing pretty well against it. He was able to surprise the it with a couple kunais, a shudokan, and some ninja wire. Something I knew I'd have never thought of. Then the Tem set the string on fire, burning its face off. No really, its face was peeling off like an orange peel, or a sticker off a wet billboard. It then said something about wanting Sasuke, and my two teammates froze. Again. They didn't even move as it stretched its neck out, its snake-like fangs gunning towards Sasuke's neck. Without thinking, I threw myself up as far as I could, grabbing its now extremely long neck and pulling it off course. When it sunk its teeth into bark instead of my duck-butted teammate, it wasn't very happy. I quickly found myself yanked back towards the snake person again, and grabbed by my jacket collar before I could let go. How are you still conscious? It looked at me like one studies a science experiment. I tightened your seal so you can't access the fox's power, so how are you able to keep fighting? 
I don't need that stupid furball's power to fight you, ya creepy pedophile. I yelled back. I tried to hit him or kick it in some way, but it kept me too far away for that. And why do you keep calling me a pedophile? Because you look at Sasuke like hungry kids look at an ice cream cone, you clearly said you want him, and you just tried to give him a hickey. So that makes you some creepy old pedophile, or Eno in disguise. Somewhere in the forest, another blonde sneezed, scaring away their dinner. How troublesome, her teammate said before falling back asleep. I'm not a creepy old pedophile, nor a fangirl, it said crossly. Um, if you're not a guy or a girl, does that mean you don't have a gender? If you must know, I'm male, but not a pedophile. You look like a chick, I said while reaching for a kunai. But before my fingers could even brush the pouch, the girly man slammed me into the branch of the tree we were standing on. Cleaver boy, trying to distract your opponent while planning a counter-strike, he said, sounding amused. I must say, you are quite intriguing yourself, but you keep getting in the way. It would be easier just to kill you so I'd know for sure you wouldn't ruin my plans, but then I wouldn't get a chance to study you more. Personally I didn't like either of the choices. The man was starting to give off the creepy doctor vibe, and I didn't like doctors. I went to voice my opinion but was slammed into the tree again, causing my vision to swim. But I have plenty of time to come up with a solution, I heard the snake man say, his voice sounding as if it was underwater. I was starting to lose consciousness again, but this time there was no fighting it. The last thing I saw was the madman's neck extended again and the sound of Sasuke screaming in pain before all went black. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Few hours later. After giving Sasuke his present, and that so-called fight with Anko, Orochimaru was in a pretty good mood. He was still floating around the forest of death, more for the fun of it than anything else. Though he was enjoying his leisurely walk, he did have something he had to do. Soon after fighting his precious student, he had come up with a way to solve his problem with the blonde brat. It was an ingenious idea, yet so painfully simple he should have thought of it beforehand. But he had it now, which attributed it to his good mood. It was nearly dark when he ran into the person he was looking for. He dropped down in front of the group, startling only the two teammates. Orochimaru-sama, did everything go well? The unsurprised one asked respectfully. Yes, though I did run into a bit of a problem. A problem I was hoping you could rectify, Kabuto. Whatever it is, Orochimaru-sama, I'm sure I can handle it. The silver-haired man grinned as he pushed his glasses up, making them flash. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Few days later. We were on the fourth day in the forest and were running low on time. Somewhere along the way we had picked up the weird guy with the ninfo cards. He had said something about losing his teammates in the forest and wanting to stick with us until he found them. Truthfully, I wasn't listening very much, I was still trying to figure out when Sakura found time to get a haircut in the middle of the forest. It was cute, but I kinda liked the long hair better. Not to mention after that whole snake man ordeal I was kinda rethinking my whole crush on her. She didn't try to do anything other than scream our names. Well, scream Sasuke's name. Apparently I'm chopped liver, not chopped ramen, or chopped fish cakes, or even chopped veggies. Anyways, while we were traveling with the silver-haired spectacles man, we had ran into a random team and were able to snitch the scroll we needed when they weren't looking. Actually after they were knocked out but same thing. We were on our way to the tower in the center when we noticed that it was starting to get dark. Considering we had the whole day tomorrow to get there, we decided that it would be best to set up camp so when we arrived there tomorrow, so we'd be well rested. Spectacles offered to take first watch. Though my teammates were a bit apprehensive, they decided that it was probably best. After all, he had more experience in the field than all three of us put together. Not to mention, first was most likely going to be the longest and we were still feeling the effects of the attack a few days ago so we all grudgingly went to sleep. Well, 
I went to sleep almost immediately, not nearly as distrustful as I should have been. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Few more hours later. Naruto, wake up, it's your watch, I heard Sakura say as she nudged me with her foot. I simply rolled over. Five more minutes. Get up, she hissed, kicking me off my bed roll. Wah. My eyes shot open to try and figure out what was happening but the forest was so dark that I couldn't see anything. It's your watch. I could hear her footsteps move away as she made her way back to her bed roll. I'm going to sleep so you better stay awake or you'll regret it. All right, I'm up, I said, finally sitting up close to my bed roll. I figured, since it was so dark it would probably be safer to stay where I was. I didn't want to trip over anyone and wake them up. That would be bad, especially if it's Sakura, she'd beat the crap out of me. So I sat there waiting for the sun to rise. It felt like several hours went by without the sun even starting to peek over the horizon, I was sure the sky should have gotten lighter by now but it wasn't. It was, apparently, going to be one of those days when time just drags on almost as if it stopped. It was a while later, that I heard someone's bed roll rustle. Thinking they were just going to turn over and go back to sleep, I was surprised to hear Sasuke, him, in disbelief. Dobi, you were supposed to wake us up at sunrise, he said, his voice sounding a tad annoyed. The sun's taking its own sweet time rising. It's already up. Impossible. It's already ten o'clock, I glanced around, starting to get worried about not seeing anything. Sakura, we have to go. The Dobi decided to ignore the sun. What, Baka, are you blind or something? I heard them packing and yelling at me some more but I wasn't listening very well. The whole blind comment kept repeating itself in my mind. I bolted to my feet, desperately looking around, searching for anything to prove myself wrong. I stumbled away, tripping over my sleeping bag, ignoring my teammates as they called my name, confused. There had to be something, even if it was just a small smidge of sunlight. But before I even found it, I ran into something hard head first, knocking myself out cold. The last thought that crossed my mind was I really couldn't see. End chapter 1. Start of chapter 2. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 2. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. A few hours later. After several hours of hiking through the forest while taking turns carrying their unconscious teammate, they finally reached the tower. Kabuto found his team and took off with them while they lugged Naruto through the door. Once inside they dropped him to the ground, simultaneously waking him up in the process. Get up Dobi, we're here, I heard as my head popped up from the floor. For a moment, I thought my visual situation was just a dream, but as soon as I opened my eyes I knew that wasn't the case. Now that I thought about it, I could feel the heat from the light but everything still looked black. Once this is over, you have a lot of explaining to do, Sakura stated angrily from my right. I don't know why you freaked out this morning, and frankly I don't care. But after carrying you for several hours we deserve at least a bit of an explanation. You got that baka. I snapped my head to the right, pretending to look at her and nodded. For some reason, I just didn't want them to know yet. Everyone already thought of me as the dead last. I was afraid of what they would think if they knew I couldn't see. I'd want to hear it now but we have to figure out what the plaque means. I nodded again, deciding it was wise not to get up. Considering I didn't know my surroundings, it was probably better to just sit there and pretend I knew what was going on. Get up, I heard the Tem say, his voice off to my right as well. I'm fine where I am, thank you very much. I answered as I straightened myself up so I could sit there cross-legged. Naruto, Sakura yelled, hitting me over the head. Stop messing around and get up. No, I crossed my arms stubbornly. Naruto, she hissed. No, I'm sitting right here till I darn well have to move and there's nothing you can do about it. Why, Sasuke asked, as monotone as ever. I froze, not planning this far ahead. 
I never thought they would want to know why I was being so stubborn about this. I had to think fast and give a plausible answer before they jumped to the wrong conclusions, or the right one. Um, I stalled as I aimed my eyes at the floor. At least this way I wouldn't need to try and look at anything as I thought. But I was never the sharpest canai in the pouch so I just couldn't think of anything, no matter how hard I thought on it. Just because. Naruto, Sakura threatened again, making the voice I used to think sounded so pretty, compared to nails on a chalkboard. Answer him. Why should I? Because he's Sasuke. Don't care. He's your teammate, you have to answer. I don't care if he's the Hokage, I don't need to tell him nothing. I declared loudly before they all went silent. After a few seconds, I heard footsteps come from the right, I tensed myself, wondering what the Tem was going to do when I was suddenly yanked up by the front of my jacket. Unfortunately, my feet couldn't get under me in time so I ended up dangling there, completely confused and surprised by the turn of events. Why? Sasuke's voice was a lot closer than before. In fact I doubted he could be any closer if he tried, at least without reliving the last day of the academy and I really didn't want to do that. Because I don't like you. He meant why won't you get up, you baka. Sakura shouted before I got hit again. I think it was Sakura, but they sounded so close that I wasn't sure. Answer or Sakura will hit you again. I heard her crack her knuckles in anticipation, making me gulp. I never realized what a force the two of them could make against their only other teammate. But it was about now that I figured out how to solve my problems. Dizzy, I mumbled to them, hoping not to get hit. What was that? I'm dizzy, alright, I didn't want to stand up and fall right over again. Dizzy, Tem asked, most likely finding it a bit hard to believe. Yeah, Dizzy, I was hit really hard. You mean you hit the tree hard? I had to practically bite my tongue off to keep from asking if it really was a tree. Somehow I didn't think that would have gone over too well. Instead, I decided it was best to move on to a different subject. Yeah whatever, I thought we were going to save the 20 questions till after the plaque thingy. This was different, Sasuke said as he dropped me onto the floor for the second time in the past few minutes. Hey. What was that for you duck bud M? Ow. Sakura, stop hitting me. Stop insulting Sasuke and I will. It's not an insult if it's true. The plaque, Sasuke broke and his Sakura's fist passed to the right of my head. How the hell she had missed when I didn't even know to dodge, I don't know. I could hear Sakura's feet tap on the floor as she hopped up to focus on whatever plaque was in the room. Luckily for me, they read it out loud even luckier that they didn't even expect me to know what it meant. Somehow, the two of them had come to the conclusion that they were supposed to open the scrolls. I heard the seals break as the scrolls unraveled faster than my teammates could do so. There was some fizzing as Sasuke yelled to drop them. They clattered to the ground just before there was a quiet-ish pop, and then silence. Yo, the unmistakable voice of Kakashi said happily. Kaka-sensei. What are you doing here? I asked curiously. Well, Baruka was supposed to be the one to explain it all but he was unavoidably detained. Three of his students were caught trying to prank all the clan compounds during school hours. Really? Cool. It was Konohamaru's group wasn't it? Yes, the infamous Goggle Brigade strikes again. How far did they get? Let's see. They had set alarms clocks in the Nara compound that are going off every five minutes and were caught trying to sneak flash bombs into the Hyuga compound. They were also in possession of several suspicious items including bug spray, dog whistles, the makings for rope foot traps, and several bags of chips that were thought to be used as the bait. And on a completely unrelated topic, Sasuke I think you're going to have to hire a decorator. Someone snuck into your building while you've been gone and painted your apartment search pink. Why would someone do that? Sakura demanded loudly in order to be heard over my laughter. Who knows, Kakashi announced happily. He waited patiently until I sat up again and stopped laughing before he continued onto the topic at hand. Anyways, I'm here in his place to explain the meaning of the plaque. I tuned out as he spoke, explaining something that I wouldn't understand anyways. 
Instead I opted to think on what I was supposed to do about my new bind status. I thought about telling someone, like Sensei or Hokage Gigi, but as I thought about it, they probably would want me to quit being a ninja. After all, I've never heard of a blind ninja. I wanted to be a ninja, had to be in order to become Hokage. Plus if I wasn't a ninja anymore then the villagers would start up their crap again. I pushed the thought away, deciding that I was going to keep the whole thing a secret. It was the only way to achieve my goals after all. Didn't quite know how yet but I'd figure it out. Naruto, are you even listening? I was snapped out of my thoughts by Sakura's banshee-like voice right in my ear, making me wince. What the hell Sakura, are you trying to make me deaf? I couldn't help but be angry at her, I mean I was pretty much relying on my hearing to know what was going on around me. With that being said, I guess it was starting to get progressively sharper the more I focused on it. So that loud, high-pitched voice in my ear was starting to get painful. You're not even listening, why do you care? She shot back, I was about to respond when Sensei spoke up. Now now you two, stop fighting. He sounded amused, and maybe a bit suspicious. Naruto, why weren't you listening to the explanation? Um, because it's kinda confusing. All right then, I'll explain it in simpler terms for you. As a chunin, you must work on what you are weak in. For instance, if you are strong in tijutsu and ninjutsu, and weak in strategy, then you must work on your thought process to fix it. And vice versa, do you understand now? Yeah, thanks Kaka-sensei. I gave him one of my goofy grins from the floor. Unfortunately, I didn't see how he reacted but, he was probably eye smiling back. Now, would anyone care to explain why Naruto's sitting on the floor? I tensed slightly at this, unsure of what to say. Luckily the more talkative of my teammates was there to unwittingly cover for me. The Baka here lost it this morning and ran into a tree. We had to carry him back here after he knocked himself unconscious and now that he's awake, he's dizzy. Is that so? Yeah, I'm an idiot, I agreed, attempting to look at my sensei. But I think it might have been a genjutsu some other team put on me. And why is that? Well, I was the only one on watch, so it kinda makes sense that they wanted our scroll. So I guess they decided that they should steal it while you were sleeping and I was distracted. Then why didn't they? Sakura asked, suspiciously. How am I supposed to know? I'm not them. I was feeling quite proud of myself for coming up with such a good story in such a short amount of time. I guess it makes sense, after all whoever was still out there would be pretty desperate to get a scroll. Maybe they only saw the one scroll they already had so they left, thinking it was the only one we had. Sounds plausible, Sasuke said. All right, you three have an hour before you must meet in the testing room. Kakashi's tone was quite chipper. I suggest you pick up some food from the cafeteria. Food, real food. I throw my arms into the air with such force that I knocked myself over. Kaka-sensei, where is the cafeteria? Sakura sounded almost as excited as me. Does it have ramen? Right through the door over there. Kakashi must have been pointing towards the door. And yes, it has ramen. Yes, I exclaimed happily. It was only a moment after that that I realized I had no idea where the door was. Thanks, sensei, Sakura said sounding a lot cheerier than I was feeling right now. I heard two sets of footsteps walking away from me somewhere off to my right. I blinked as an idea struck me. They knew where the door was. They were heading towards it right now. I could hear which way they were going. Therefore, I knew which way the door was. Oh and if I waited long enough I could probably figure out how far away it was too. I sat there, feeling proud of myself for a moment before I realized the only reason I came up with that was because there was ramen on the line. Of course I had no real problem with this so I didn't lose my happy attitude. Hey Sasuke-kun, so you want to? No. But I didn't even. No. You're not even listen. No. But Sasuke-kun. No. I listened to my teammates' voices fade as they moved away towards my goal. Sakura was just starting to say something else when the creaking of the door told me it was somewhere to my right and only about 20 paces. 
With this in mind, I went to get up after the door clicked shut. Naruto. I jumped at my name being called, almost forgetting Kakashi was even there. What? I was starting to get irritated with the man. There was ramen on the other side of that door and he was keeping me from it. I'm pretty sure I had every right to be snippy with him. Mind if I ask you something? You just did, but sure. Are you blind? End of chapter 2. Start of chapter 3. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 3. Tilda 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 tilda. Huh, I asked, completely stunned at his question. I thought I was doing pretty good keeping it a secret but somehow he knew. Let me rephrase that, at what point, in between now and when I last saw you five days ago, did you lose your sight? Uh, sensei, are you feeling well? I'm not blind, my vision is 20-20, like always. Your eyes haven't been tracking correctly and whenever a conversation starts you look at the floor. So, maybe the floor looks better. Naruto, Kakashi said, his tone scolding. I'm not blind, Kaka-sensei. Come on. Would a blind person know where the door is? It's right over there, by the way. I pointed towards where I knew the door to be, hoping that would be enough to convince him. Ma ma, I guess you're right. How silly of me, Kakashi said. I was mentally patting myself on the back when he spoke again. But I'm still a bit worried about you. So, how about this, if you answer my last question correctly, I'll let the whole thing drop, okay? Yeah, sure. How many fingers am I holding up? I froze at the question. Come on, if you can see as well as you say, this should be easy for you. Uh, two. Are you sure? Of course I am. Too bad, it was four. No it wasn't. Yes it was, see. One, two, three, four. He matched each number with a tap on my nose using the different fingers. Um, you must have switched them. If I did, wouldn't you have seen it? His voice was closer now, like he was kneeling in front of me. I sighed, knowing I was beaten in the battle of wits. Now, care to answer my questions truthfully? Yeah, I guess, but a couple things first. He made a sound that I interpreted as continue. How did you know? Other than your eyes not tracking, I nodded. I said there was ramen and you didn't even move to get up. Instead you waited for your teammates to move first so the sound would tell you where it was. Pretty smart move, by the way. Of course it was, ramen was on the line. I smiled happily. Speaking of which, let's eat. You're supposed to be telling me what happened. I can do that as I eat, can't I? I trying to use my puppy eyes on him, but was unsure how well I was doing. Well, I guess. Before he could finish I was on my feet into the door, trying to find the doorknob. When I finally found it, I yanked the door open, only to practically faint at all the noise that assaulted my ears. It was like at the academy only ten times worse. Everyone must have been in there because my two teammates couldn't be make this much noise by themselves. I didn't even notice that my legs gave out or that I was now lying in the doorway with my hands over my ears. I did, however, notice that the volume dropped a bit, but not enough to make it any better. Sensei, is he alright? Sakura asked over the noise. Yeah, he's fine, Kakashi voice came from somewhere behind me. He's still a bit unstable from that genjutsu I'd imagine. Plus, he just caught his first whiff of ramen in five days. I heard several, oh's, and a few chuckles before they continued their conversations, though a bit quieter to my relief. Volume a bit much for you, I heard my sensei whisper right next to me. He was most likely kneeling next to me in order to keep quiet. It surprised me. I'd imagine so. Anyways this place is packed so I'm just going to carry you to a secluded little table so we can chat. I tried to protest but before I could, I was already on his back being carted off to who knows where. Don't worry, they won't think anything of it after the explanation I gave. Your explanation sucked. But it was believable, he said with an audible smirk. Quote dot dot, I hate you. Well, that's nice. It was about now that he stopped presumably at a table, then slowly set me down until I was sitting on a hard wooden chair. 
Then after a second I heard a chair scratch the floor in front of me before he continued. If that's the way you feel, I might not want to go get you any ramen. I didn't mean it, it was a total lie. You're my favorite sensei ever. Am I now? Yeah, definitely, I said desperately. Sue, do I get my ramen now? I suppose, he said with a chuckle. I'm only grabbing two though. But, if I get any more you won't have time to tell me everything. His chair scrapped the floor again before I heard his footsteps walk past me. Be right back. I lost track of him soon after that due to the chatter in the cafeteria. I was starting to get used to all the noise surrounding me, unfortunately now I couldn't figure out what was happening around me. I wasn't able to separate the important stuff from the background noise. So it wasn't too much of a surprise when my sensei was able to startle me. Here you go, he loudly placed something in front of me, making me jump. After the initial surprise wore off, I realized he was talking about the ramen and sat up straighter. Chopsticks are right in front of you. Thanks Kaka Sensei. I quickly found the chopsticks before breaking them open and started digging into the first bowl. It wasn't very hard to do, even though I couldn't see the bowl, I've eaten ramen so often I really didn't need to. Now Naruto, when did this happen? Don't know, I answered, my mouth half full. I swallowed before continuing. When I went to sleep last night, my sight perfect. I woke up and it was gone. I didn't know until Sasuke and Sakura yelled at me for not waking them up that something was wrong. So then I freaked and knocked myself out with a tree. Apparently my teammates carried me over here. Was there anything strange that happened yesterday, like a cloud of smoke that only hit you or something like that? No, all we did was knock out that other team while they were eating and stole their scroll. Then we traveled for a bit, made camp and ate some gross fish the Tem caught before falling asleep. Any suspicious people that you guys came across? Nope, we did let this guy, Kabuto I think, travel with us while he looked for his team but he's pretty harmless, for a ninja. Kakashi didn't respond so I continued eating my food, figuring he was lost in thought. I had finished off the first and was halfway through the second before a thought struck me. Um, sensei, I asked quietly. He made a noise to tell me he's listening. Do. Do you think that this is permanent? There was silence for a while before he said anything. I don't know. It's possible but you'd have to be examined. No. There was quite for a moment before he answered. Why not? If I'm examined then they'd tell the Hokage and he'd have to take away my ninja status. Naruto, in this condition it's too dangerous for you to be a ninja. It'd be even worse if I wasn't, I said before I realized I had done so. I could almost feel the curious look Kakashi had aimed at me. What do you mean? He asked. I looked down out of habit. I didn't say anything, knowing that I had said too much already. Naruto, answer me please. You know the civilian laws about ninjas, right? I asked with a sigh. That if you assault a shinobi of the leaf or one from an allied village without provocation, you will be charged with treason, which is punishable by death. Yes, I know of it. Well, that's the only thing keeping me safe right now. If I was a citizen again, there would nothing stopping them. Less consequences I guess. But why would that worry you? They see me as the demon. Do you think, for one second, that if they had a chance to kill me, without being executed themselves, they wouldn't? Not all of them. Don't need all of them, just a couple strong ones, a few bottles of sake, and maybe some blunt weapons. After all, it wouldn't be too hard to catch a blind kid. I stayed quiet in order not to be overheard. And don't try to tell me they wouldn't because before I was in the academy they'd do so. The only reason they stopped was because you're not considered a citizen when you're training. I see, he said after a bit. You won't tell, will you? I raised my head to look towards him. I don't believe it's necessary to put you at risk like that. You mean, I perked up at this, hoping he was saying what I thought he was. Yes. I'll keep your secret. It was all I could do to keep myself from shouting in excitement. But, only if you listen to my direct orders. For instance, if I say something is too dangerous for you, 
you won't go charging in otherwise. Is that understood? Hi. That and I want you to let a medical nin examine you after we're done here. But. She's a friend of mine that lives outside the village so she doesn't report back to the Hokage. But what if she does anyways? Don't worry, she's trustworthy. I've known her for longer than you've been alive. If I ask her to keep it a secret, she will. Well, if you can trust her, I guess I can too. Good, now finish up your ramen and we'll get going. We're supposed to be there in 20 minutes after all. Yes sir, I said with a mock salute as Kakashi chuckled at me. But only if you get me more ramen. If I get you any more ramen, we could be late for the meeting. And you care? Not really, be right back. End of chapter 3. End of part 1. This is the end of part 1 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. If you all enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Peace out people. This is part 2 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. If you all enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Start chapter. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 4. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. You, re late. Sakura yelled from behind me somewhere as Kakashi and I shunshined into the meeting place. I stiffened a wince as I tried to figure out why she was shouting so much, it was only ten minutes. Well, you see, there was this blind man that got lost so me and Kaka-sensei had to make sure he got to where he was going safely. We're in the middle of the forest, Shikamaru pointed out, sounding bored. Um, he was very lost. How troublesome, he stated, barely heard underneath Sakura's, liar. If she only knew how close to the truth it was. Kakashi, I'd prefer if you saved the corrupting of your student until after the exams. The Hokage sounded almost exasperated as he spoke. At least then he'd have a fair chance of showing up on time. I'll try, Hokage-sama, but it's hard to convince a student to not mimic their role model, Kakashi said sagely. I heard the other man sigh. I mean, look at Guy and Lee. The mentioned duo started shouting each other's names as they prepared their sunset genjutsu of death, I mean youth. At the sound of the traumatized, disgusted populace, I was suddenly a bit glad I couldn't see it. Moving on, Naruto, if you could join the others I'll get started. I panicked for a moment, trying to come up with a good excuse. I'd rather not. And why is that? Well, they're kinda mad at me so if I go over there, they could hurt me. There was silence after that, probably from confusion. So Kakashi decided to explain. They had to carry him back because he knocked himself out with a tree. A tree, Ino exclaimed, how the hell do you knock yourself out with a tree? It's a talent, I pretended to flip my imaginary long hair over my shoulder. And I'm not sharing. Why would anyone want to, Ino was about to continue when the Hokage cut her off. Okay, that's enough. If you feel more comfortable where you are then you may stay. It doesn't matter much anyways. Thanks Gigi, I heard a few people make disapproving sounds at that, but I didn't really care. Now, before we get started, let me just say that from here on out, you will not be working in teams. So when I say you have the option to drop out, your personal choice will not affect your teammates. But before we get to that, I must announce that due to the number of you that passed the second test, we are going to have to run a preliminary test as soon as I'm done. So if any of you feel as if you are not up to a one-on-one -on -one fight then please withdraw from the exam. Kakashi nudged me as two of the other contestants dropped out. The first guy kinda sounded like the spectacles man we ran into. The second was announced to be some kid from Taki, who apparently got his leg broken out in the forest. The whole time, that poor kid's teammates were shouting at him to come back and face it like a man, or at least the feminine-sounding one was. She probably wasn't that stable of an individual, especially if she thinks her teammate can fight on a pair of crutches. You should drop too, Kakashi whispered, snapping me back to the present. You're not ready for this yet. I can do it. Naruto. I can do it, Sensei. There was a disapproving silence before I spoke up again. 
At least let me see who my opponent is. He thought it through for a few seconds. All right, but if I say it's too difficult then you forfeit. Okay. I guess, but that's not going to be a problem. I can handle anyone they throw at me, Dadboyo. I could hear him chuckle as a set of double doors closed with a thud. Is there anyone else that wishes to leave? The Hokage asked. When no one spoke up, he continued, going into this long spiel about war, or war substitute or something like that. Again, I wasn't really listening, opting to try and figure out how to keep my eyes a secret. After all, Kakashi said earlier, that only a blind man, or another blind man, would be unable to see that my eyes weren't tracking. I mean, I can't keep my eyes shut forever, it would eventually get me into trouble, especially considering I doubt my opponent would like it. As I thought this, I was vaguely aware of the Hokage's speech being interrupted by Guy shouting something about saving some poor kids, flames of youth, before his, eternal rival, could do any more damage. It wasn't until a hand landed on my shoulder that I was shocked out of my thoughts. No need to worry, I shall make sure your flames of youth stay bright. And if I fail, all. Did you say something? I asked, unknowingly parroting my sensei's line. No, it's too late. His cool, hip attitude has already spread. Kakashi snickered as the Hokage then decided that this would be a good time to gain back search control. Quote dot dot, and now, on with the preliminaries, he announced, getting everyone's attention again. Each match will be chosen randomly by our randomizing computer. As long as it doesn't glitch again. He ended up whispering the last part to himself, making me wonder what he meant by that, and why Kakashi was chuckling. After it was announced that Sasuke and this other dude I didn't know were up first, Kakashi shunshing the pair of us somewhere else. We're on the balcony above the arena. I heard everyone else climbing up the stairs that we essentially skipped. Okay, hey, why does that computer thingy glitch? If it's such a great piece of technology, they shouldn't have a problem with it, right? He started chuckling again, making me even more curious. And why do you find it so funny? Well, you see, it was created about 15, 16 years ago by the fourth. The fourth Hokage. No, the fourth ramen stand owner. The sarcasm was practically dripping off his words. Yes, the fourth Hokage, back before he was Hokage. He was a great seal master and that thing runs entirely on seals. So? Well there were only three seal users in the village, one being the fourth, another was his sensei, while the last was a close friend of his. Now, what you have to understand about this friend is that she was one hell of a prankster, as in you would be amateur in her eyes. A good amateur, but one nonetheless. Really, why haven't I heard of her? Where is she now? Unfortunately she died the same night as the fourth. I looked towards the ground. I knew that was just a nice way of saying that it was in the Kyubi attacked. But not without leaving a few things to be remembered by. Like what? I glanced back up towards him, curious once again. Well, for one, that computer. I gave him an odd look and he continued. When the fourth was making it, this friend decided to help him. So one night he was out on a mission she snuck into his house and made a few adjustments. Now whenever it's used a few, unexpected pairing pop up. They never know when but every time it does, everyone that knows about her prank has to chuckle. So not everyone knows who did it. Very few do. Then how do you know? The fourth was my sensei. I had to listen to him complain about it for months afterwards. Why are you gawking at me like that? The fourth was your sensei. Didn't I say so before? No. Ma ma, anyways I had to listen to him complain for a long time after that, especially considering neither he nor his sensei, Jiraiya, could fix it. Why not? She was from a very elite clan that specialized in sealing, he told me. I wanted to know more, all of this sounded so interesting. I was about to ask another question when I was interrupted. Here. We'll talk more on this later. Right now we should be supporting your teammate while he's fighting. He's fighting. For the past two minutes. Oh well, it's not like I can watch, I said quietly. Hey, won't people know if I'm not watching the fight? Hmm, 
Good question. He sat there quietly for a moment before he spoke up again. Ah, here, I heard him rustling through a pack before he pulled something out. Catch. I held my hand out just in time to catch whatever he threw. After further examination I figured out it was a book. If you pretend to read it, people will think you're distracted. It's not that pervy book, is it? If I gave you one of those, we'd both get killed, whether you could read it or not, he said, sounding suspiciously seriously. So, what is it? It's from the same author as my Ika Ika books. It's his only non-perverted book entitled, Tale of the Gutsy Ninja. I'm sure you would have read it as well eventually, if this hadn't happened. Okay, as long as it's not going to get me hit. The book itself won't, but your inattention might. Before I could reply, there was a crash followed by a loud cheer from most of the female onlookers. Let me guess, Sasuke won, I deadpanned right before they announced that I was right. Good guess, I opened the book up to the first page, feeling so bored I wished I really could read it. Now stay right there until I get back. I have to take care of something for Sasuke. And if you're called up before I get back, be smart. If it sounds like a challenge, then back out. I can take anyone. Maybe you could before. Promise me that if you come up against a strong opponent, back out. All right, I promise. Now, no breaking your promise. After all, if you do that, you'd be breaking your Nindo as well. I won't break my Nindo. Dad boyo. Just making sure. I stuck my tongue out at him before focusing back on the book. I could hear him chuckle again before he poofed away. After a moment, his voice could be heard speaking on the ground level. After I heard the two of them were taken off the floor, they announced that Katsu, some guy from Taki, was versing Shino. Well, after they convinced Guy that the Flames of Youth was not a legitimate competitor so it would not be competing against the lesser-known fire extinguisher of Search Fate. I laughed, knowing Kakashi was right about this. Whoever was the mastermind behind this was a pranking genius. If I was still pranking I would definitely take this as a challenge. A trick this epic would be a great thing to aim for. But I had promised Gigi that I'd stop once I was a ninja, and I had. For the most part. But just for fun, I started thinking of stuff I could have done, during Shino's match. Unfortunately, it was over so quickly that I had only come up with a couple. Apparently he won by sucking the chakra out of the guy until he passed out. Across the room, I heard some chick laughing hysterically. She yelled something about wondering why his name didn't assure his victory like he said it would. It took me a bit to figure out what she meant until I remembered that the boy was named Katsu, which meant, victory. The matches went relatively quickly after that. Konkuro beat the human rubber band, Sakura and Ino decided to just knock each other out instead of actually doing anything. I breathed a sigh of relief at this because the pair of them kept screeching during every match. At least now my ears could get a bit of a rest for a few matches. And if you're wondering how I knew all of this, for some reason everyone felt like commenting on the fights as they were happening. Not that I was complaining, I just thought it was weird. Unfortunately, the silence didn't last too long due to the fact that they woke up right after Tenten's humiliating defeat by Tamari. It was equally unfortunate when Sakura came over to Screech, Sorry, I meant speak to me. Naruto, why are you reading? You're supposed to be watching the matches. I winced at the shrillness of it once again. It was then that I felt a sudden urge to duck. No sooner did I do so, I feel a whoosh go over my head. Hey, you're not supposed to duck. I wouldn't need to if you didn't try to hit me. I had to fight the urge to look up at her. Instead I continued to stare at the book, trying to look preoccupied with whatever story was in it. Where did you get the book anyways? Kakashi. This time there was no warning before I got whacked upside the head for no reason. Naruto, how dare you read that smut? It's not smut, I said as I rubbed my sore head. Read the title. I flashed the cover at her before making like I was reading it again, and then turned the page for good measure. Oh, and why are you reading a book when you never willingly touched one in your life? Um, Kakashi said to. Something about freaking guy out. 
I wasn't sure what I'd do if she asked anything else. Just as she started to ask another question, I heard someone clear their throat. Yo, Sakura, I heard you had your match already. How was it? Sensei asked, effectively shutting her up. Well, it wasn't that bad. Her versus Eno, both of them made this huge deal out of it only for it to end in a double knockout, I said simply getting a growl from her in the process. She should be proud of herself. After all, it was a tie. More like a double loss. To Eno. So probably not. Naruto. She was about to berate me about that when Shika was announced as the winner. About time. Thought it would take forever. Well, he's a Nara. They use their mind instead of their fists so it tends to run a little on the long side, Kakashi answered. If you insist, I said with a shrug. All right, who's next? Well... It's not Clucky versus the log. What? Both of us asked. If the two of you stop fighting and focus on the task at hand, you would have noticed the quite humorous glitch on the randomizing computer screen. It clearly states that the next opponents are Clucky versus the log. Sakura was silent as I almost busted a gut from laughing so hard. I struggled to get out the single questioning word. Why? Apparently she and one of the Uchihas had an argument as academy students about which was stronger, a chicken or our ever-present, substitution log. It eventually evolved into what everyone liked to call, Clucky versus the log. Which side did she take? Clucky, of course. Do you think any Uchiha would know about this argument? Probably not, he wouldn't want it to be common knowledge among his clan. Would Sasuke know about it? Maybe. After all it was his father that started it. I could feel the fox-like grin spreading across my face as I put my book down for a moment. Clucky will win. Naruto, Sasuke is unconscious in a hospital room at the moment. This means he couldn't possibly hear you. Damn, and I wanted to start that up again. I brought my book up to look at it. Is Gigi done with his hissy fit yet? I wanna know who's next. Naruto. The Hokage doesn't have hissy fits, Yubaka. If someone's cursing something out it's usually called a hissy fit, right? I didn't think it changed if it was the Hokage doing the swearing. Hokage-sama would do no such thing. I can hear him swearing from here. He does look pretty upset, Kakashi backed me up. I heard Sakura take in a breath, getting ready to yell or something, when the Hokage cleared his throat. Next match please. He sounded a bit self-conscious about his outburst. I listened to the computer click as it no doubt thought through the possible selections. The clicking eventually slowed to a stop and the competitors were announced. Uzumaki Naruto vs. Inazuka Kiba. Yes, I accidentally throwing my book into the air due to my excitement. I'm pretty sure Kakashi caught it because I never heard it hit the floor. About damn time. I went to jump over the rail in front of me when a hand dropped onto my shoulder, stopping me. Naruto, I don't think you're ready for this. Oh, come on sensei. He's too strong for you. Like hell he is. He is right now. You need to forfeit. No. Naruto. No, I'm fighting Kiba and there's nothing you can do to stop me. There was a pause in the conversation before he continued. We'll see about that. End chapter 4. Start Chapter 5. Blindsided by Twice the Trouble. Chapter 5. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. P.S. If you do not like the outcome of this fight, please remember that this is a fairly humorous story that can be quite ridiculous at times. Also, I thought it was probable at the time I wrote it. Tilda 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 tilda. Kakashi looked at the boy, seeing the stubborn look in his eyes making it undoubtedly clear that there was no talking him out of it. Instead he decided to bring his student to the Hokage, knowing that if he convinced him that Naruto isn't well enough to fight, then he could pull the boy out himself. So he grabbed Naruto's arm and Shunshin down to the platform below. Hokage-sama, Naruto's not fit to fight Kiba. He is still feeling the effects of the last test. He kept a strong grip on the boy's arm as he struggled. Are you sure? What specifically are these ill effects? I believe he's still suffering from a slight concussion from running into the tree. He's still very dizzy to the point he was having trouble standing over. 
only half an hour ago. Hmm, you don't say. But don't you think it's a bit late to be bringing this up? The Cyclops became confused, shooting a questioning look at the still writhing boy before turning back to the Hokage. After all, he's already on the floor. The man's lone eye got wide as he looked back at the floor to see a grinning Naruto. Then he looked at the boy he had, who had just stopped fighting long enough to acquire that same grin before poofing out of existence. Begin, the proctor shouted as his student's smile widened. Kakashi looked at his student, unsure if the boy was up to this. As the two competitors taunted each other he just hoped Naruto knew what he was doing. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Few minutes earlier. I waited for Kakashi to poof away before coming out of my hiding spot behind Choji, who was conveniently walking by at the time. Thanks man. No problem, he said, munching on his ever-present bag of chips. I reached out to where I knew the railing was, finding it first try, then hopped over it. Unfortunately I had no idea how far down the floor was so when my feet hit it sooner than I thought, I ended up doing a face plant into the tile floor. Don't tell me he knocked himself out again, I heard Kiba say as I lay on the ground for a moment, still stunned. Does that mean I win? I'm good, I called, climbing back to my feet. Damn. I kept Kiba's location in mind as I hurried towards the sound of our proctor coughing. Are you afraid to face me, Kiba? I asked once I turned to face him. I heard him start to say something but I interrupted him. Who am I kidding, of course you are. Hey Proctor, can we get this started? Eager to get you butt whooped. Yeah, right, I could defeat you blindfold. Dad boy -o. Begin, the Proctor shouted over our banter. Time to put your money where your mouth is, Kiba said as I heard his feet shift on the floor, probably into a Tijitsu stance. So I did the same, not wanting to be taken by surprise. Don't know why I'd do that, I'd rather eat ramen. It was about then that I heard the sound of something that could only be him jumping, probably at me. My theory was confirmed when a fist connected with my face. Note to self, when his feet leave the ground, move, I thought as I got to my feet again. Is that all you got, dog breath? I grinned like a madman just to throw him off. Konohamaru hits harder than you. Ya yeah, know, I was going to be fair and let you think you had a fighting chance. But now I think I'm just going to finish you off right now. Good, I don't want your charity anyways. Ninja art. Beast mimicry. Kiba shouted as his hands thudded to the ground, making me wonder what he was up to. Here I come, Kiba said, his voice sounding on the verge of a growl. I'm guessing it was some sort of transformation because I could hear the slightly shocked crowd commenting on how bad I was going to lose. I was just about to yell at them when I heard his feet, dot in his hands, leave the ground. I was trying to decide whether to dodge or to see what he got when he rammed what had to be his shoulder into my gut, making my mind up for me. I was then sent flying across the room before my reunion with the stone floor. As I struggled to get my bearing I could hear Kiba trying to talk the proctor into ending the match saying that I wasn't getting up anytime soon. What really ticked me off though was that that dumb proctor was actually considering it. So I climbed to my feet, ignoring Kiba's conversation, only listening enough to get a fix on his location. Then, before he could even turn his attention back on me, I tackled him, wanting to share the ground's hospitality with my opponent. I used the momentum of the tackle to roll past him and onto my feet. I stayed crouched close to the ground, no doubt facing away from him, but it's not like it mattered. Don't underestimate me, asshole. I must have took him by surprise, if his silence had anything to say about it. Come on, are you really that weak or are you just going easy on me? He growled at me, most likely trying to glare as well. You want no mercy? I'll give ya no mercy. Akamaru, to me. I heard small, padded feet rushing to its master side. I stood up and turned to face him. Seriously, you're really bringing your puppy into this? I gave him a disbelieving look to tick him off even more. This puppy is that's going to be your downfall. His voice clearly telling me that I was succeeding. Let's get him Akamaru. I heard them charge at me, 
their feet leaving the ground for a moment before they started running. Something hit the ground in front of me, before making a poof sound. Then the air began to smell strongly of smoke which kind of confused me. Well, until I figured out that it had to have been a smoke pellet in an attempt to obscure my vision. I almost laughed at the thought. It was soon after this that something told me to duck, so just like earlier with Sakura, I listened to this gut feeling just in time to feel his swing pass right overhead. Not a second after I was told to move again, this time to the side. I did so right before a pair of teeth clamped together right where my arm used to be. After dodging like this a couple times I figured out what was keeping me safe. It wasn't some sixth sense or anything, it was actually my other four senses that I normally never paid attention to in a fight. I was able to avoid his attacks so easily because, even though I couldn't see his throws coming, there were other indicators. A whisper of fabric as Kiba moved, the taste of smoke thickening or thinning as the air was disturbed, even, oddly enough, the smell of dog as Akamaru neared. It all told me exactly where the duo was, and exactly how to avoid them. Soon after this revelation they stopped attacking, opting, instead, to stand in front of me panting. I couldn't hold back a laugh this time as the smoke soon faded from my senses. How? Kiba asked over my laughter. How what? How did you? Avoid us? I'm a ninja, I answered condescendingly, even though I had no clue where this was going. So? Ninjas fight ninjas, I said my mind trying desperately to come up with something fast enough to say it. Ninjas are supposed to be invisible. So fighting with only your eyes is stupid. Don't you agree? When he didn't answer I did so for him. You should, after all you're always using your nose. How? How do I know? I smiled at his confusion. A ninja's intuition. You guessed, didn't you? Uh, enough about that now, I believe it's my turn. I smirked evilly before crossing my index fingers. Shadow clone jutsu. I could tell there was something ruining what little chakra control I had, because I could feel the drain in chakra even after the ten clones I made. Whatever that long-haired freak did to me the other day, it wasn't good and I should probably get that looked at as well. But now wasn't the time for this, I had to focus on the fight. My clones grinned before charging as one towards the enemy. Of course, None of them could see either but it was strange, every time Kiba and Akamaru made one poof away, it made it easier to find the pair. I thought on it for a moment before deciding to use it now and figuring out later. So I made more clones, spamming the field despite the extra chakra strain. I was going to win this fight if it was the last thing in do. I need to prove it to Sensei, and myself, that this handicap wouldn't hold me back. I lashed out where I knew they were and came into contact with something fluffy. Unsure whether it was Akamaru or just Kiba's jacket I grabbed it. The dog yelped, causing me to smirk. I didn't particularly like hurting Kiba's ninkin but if it helped me win the match then there was really no other choice. Surrender, Kiba, I yelled, holding the dog up by its paws. I thought they were his front paws but there was no real way of knowing. Or what, you'll hurt my dog. Maybe. Akamaru can take care of himself. His bag rustled like he was searching for something in it. Akamaru, catch. Something flew through the air, until the dog I was holding caught it in his jaws. The canine started growling, his fur becoming spikier in my grasp. I lost my grip on him, dropping him to the floor. He darted to his master's side, right before I heard a poof of a transformation being performed. Man Beast Clone. From the gasp in the audience, something happened visually that shocked the peanut gallery. I pretended to be shocked like everyone else, even though I had no idea what was so surprising. So just to be prepared, I created a bunch of clones just as a set of feet left the ground. I had them surround me like a shield as the pair of them ran my way. Something was off about their footsteps, but I couldn't place what it was. It wasn't until my clones started disappearing and I started getting vague impressions of being punched by Kiba several times that I realized what was wrong. There were no paw steps. It was two sets of Kiba-sized footsteps. I was surprised at this for a moment, 
which was just enough time for them to take out the rest of my clones and throw me into a wall. Through my shock, I could hear the cracking of cement behind me as my back exploded in pain. I had no idea how but he was now five times stronger than he was before. See, this match will be over before you can even say, I give. The dog boy sounded so confident in his own words that even I was on the threshold of believing him. But just to make sure you aren't going to pop back up again. The boy went quiet, his feet shifting on the ground as I sat there, trying to get my body to start moving. Fang over fang, he shouted and I pretty much knew I was in trouble. Even if I didn't know what that meant, I knew that if he had that much confidence in this technique, then it must be pretty powerful. It was only a couple seconds after this that I got nailed in the chest, causing several of my ribs to snap into pieces. My breath was knocked out of me, and even as I fought to get it back, I found it oddly difficult to do so. My head was spinning and all sounds were dulled. I could barely hear Kiba talking to the proctor again. But I wasn't giving up now, not after all that happened. I'd been through more today than I have in my whole life just to fight for my spot as Chunin. There was no way that I was going to let some mutt take it. So before the proctor could call the match, I struggled to my feet even though I could barely breathe. Hey, what are you doing? Just give it a rest will ya? You've already been beaten and you know it. I winced as my hearing snapped back into focus just in time for his yell. Not yet, I struggled to say. Just those two words making me cough which, in turn, caused my chest to feel like I was being stabbed. You can barely breathe, just stop before you get seriously hurt. No, I wanted so bad to give him a long rant about how I never give up, but I just couldn't. Naruto, you're being stupid. Just give up before you die. Sakura screeched from the stands. No, not done. I started coughing again, the taste of blood flooded my mouth this time. I knew I had to end this quick before I passed out and this was all for nothing. I put my hands in my favorite hand sign. Fine, I don't care if you give in. But there's no way I'm going to let you attack again. Fang over fang. I heard the two of them fly through the air towards me as I thought quickly. Oh how lucky I was that they didn't find my hedged clone on the other side of the arena. So, I quickly performed a substitution with him. Though it disoriented me, it was worth it to hear them give a surprised gasp as my clone poofed out of existence soon after their attack. Lucky for me my disorientation didn't last long after he destroyed it. I soon got a faint feeling of being hit with that just to again as well as knowledge concerning where I was compared to him. Shadow Clone Jutsu. I let a smirk spread across my face as their feet shuffled on the floor quickly. I made as many clones as I could, which, if I had to guess was somewhere between 50 and 100. Not many comparatively but not bad for someone as injured as I was. I could almost feel the duo's shock as he was surrounded by so many of me, especially since I was quite sure they had the same smirk I had. Sikkim, I told them quietly, but they all got the message as hundreds of feet charged at one place. At first I mostly heard poofs, but the more that were taken out, the easier it was for the rest of my clones to pinpoint his exact location and start winning. It didn't take long for the poofing of disappearing clones to be replaced with that of Kiba and Akamaru being hit. And it wasn't too long after that that they were knocked out of the ring and didn't get up. Time out, the proctor called. I could hear footsteps walking over to where Kiba had fallen. He was probably checking the other boy's vitals to make sure I didn't go overboard. Kiba is unconscious and therefore cannot continue the match. The winner is Uzumaki Naruto. I smiled as a cheer went up around the room. It was mostly my clones celebrating our accomplishment but I was able to pick out a few voices cheering that I knew weren't mine. I recognized Choji, Uruka sensei Shikamaru to some extent, and I might have heard Hanada but there's no way to be sure. Then for some reason I could hear the tacky girl louder than everyone shouting something like, now that was a fight. It was then that my clones decided that it was time to go and poofed away, leaving me with an overwhelming exhaustion. It was also about now that my body remembered the fact that it was having difficulty breathing and decided it didn't want to stand up anymore. My knees buckled and I fell forward. 
I readied myself to hit the ground when I was suddenly grabbed around my torso. I yelped as pain stabbed my chest again. But before I could flinch away from the arm, it moved to my shoulders, in order to sit me gently on the floor. Nice job, Naruto, Kakashi said, obviously being the person that helped me. He sounded sort of proud. You did very well considering. Thanks. I tried to say more but ended up starting to cough once again. Let's get you to a medic so you can be fixed up. Sounds good. I rasped once I got my breath back, or at least as much of it as I could right now. His arm disappeared, but before I could fall one way or the other, I was picked up in what seemed to be the bridal style. Though his one arm was more on my shoulders to keep the pressure off my ribs. Wheel, take him from here, a voice said off to my left. I felt someone try to take me, I wouldn't have really cared much if they hadn't tried to do so by touching my already hurt ribcage. I yelped again just as Kakashi took a step back and away from the other arm. That's alright, I got him. Just show me where to go. Follow the stretcher. That was all I heard before my mind decided that it was also too tired for any of this and I started to doze. I was barely aware of the fact that we had started moving or that we stopped soon after for Kakashi to speak with a few people. I'm pretty sure I completely fell asleep right then because the next thing I knew I was lying on a fluffy board or a very uncomfortable hospital bed. For a moment, I thought I was alone, until a pair of hands, radiating some sort of heat, touched my ribs through my mesh shirt. Not knowing who this person was I immediately panicked and tried to get away from them. It's alright Naruto, it's just a medic. They're not going to hurt you, even if they wanted to. Kakashi's voice seemed relatively close by. I nodded in response but I guess I still looked tense. Medic San, can you give us a couple minutes? I'll call you in when he's less nervous. If you insist, the hands disappeared and then there were footsteps leading away from me until a door clicked shut. I relaxed knowing the man left the room. Naruto, you know they're trying to help you. They surprised me, I didn't think anyone was there. I found it a bit easier to speak, so I guess the medic already helped a bit. I figured that much. How long was I out? Only a couple minutes. Oh, okay. I was quiet for a bit, before I thought of something. What did the medic do? He only had time to keep your ribs from piercing your lungs. He didn't get near my eyes. Not in the slightest. Good, I let out the breath that I didn't know I was holding. They're going to find out aren't they? No, they're worried about your ribs, not your eyes. I heard a faint rustle of fabric but didn't think much of it. But as for the rest of the world... I believe I've come up with an appropriate solution. Really, what, I was starting to feel tired again, and I sounded like it, even to my own ears. Heck, it barely sounded like I was asking a question at all. This, was the only answer I got before he was slipped something over my head so whatever it was, rested over my eyes. My hand went up to touch it, feeling around the edges of the object. Goggles. Yep. I could practically hear him smiling. But not just any goggles. They belong to a very close friend of mine, my old teammate actually. He was the one that said that those who don't protect their friends are worse than trash. That's nice. I have my own you know. Yes, but I thought you'd like these ones, he told me, happily. That and I think he'd like the fact that they're being used again. Especially when it's by someone with such a similar nindo to his own. But, they're orange. Really? Yep, the lenses are orange so if you get your sight back you'll be seeing everything though in orange hue. Awesome, I tried to sound excited couldn't. Go to sleep, Naruto. You need your rest. But, you're safe here. No one will find out about your eyes while you sleep. Okay, the next thing in new, I was out. End chapter. This is the end of part 2. Hope you all enjoyed and if you did then like comment, and subscribe for more content. This is part 3 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. Hope you all enjoyed this what if and if you do then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Start chapter. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 6. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1.
tilde 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 exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark one day later my eyes snapped open and having forgotten my predicament i was startled not seeing anything it wasn't till i shot up looking around for something other than black did i remember what happened as if to remind me that things were less than good a small ache started right behind my eyes i shook off my thoughts before they could turn negative instead opting to figure out how my body was feeling. My ribs were a lot better than the last time I checked. Just to make sure, I pressed a hand against them and though there was still a bit of pain it wasn't nearly as bad as it used to be. I could tell that my chakra was still messed up but there was nothing I could really do about that. I was still exhausted, which either could be because of my screwy chakra, or adding to it. Either way it wasn't much to be worried about either. So I laid back down on, whatever I was laying on before. It was about then that I realized that I had no idea where I was. And since I couldn't exactly look, I had to guess. Well, my clothes were different, a long top made of some scratchy fabric. I don't think there were any pants with the ensemble but that was kind of hard to tell because there was a sheet over me. By this alone, I could pretty much guess where I was, especially considering there was only one place I knew that smelled so strongly of antiseptic. Realizing I was taking up residence in the local hospital I tensed. I didn't like the hospital and they didn't really like me either. They never tried to help me unless ordered to buy the Hokage. Usually they would either ignore me or try to stunt my healing process. Lucky for me the same reason they hated me was the reason I didn't need to come here as often. Kayubi has taken care of a lot of the injuries that should have ensured a trip to the hospital, though I still ended up here a fair amount due to lack of consciousness. Unfortunately this seemed to be one of those times. I sat up, tossing the sheets off me before trying to get out of bed. I had just jumped down when my right arm was yanked back towards the bed by my elbow. As I stood unsteadily on my feet, I used my other hand to feel what was attached to my arm. It took me a couple seconds to figure out that it was actually an IV. I was just reaching to pull it out when a hand stopped me. Startled, I jumped back onto the bed, scrambling across till my head came in contact with the wall. Naruto, it's me. I relaxed at the sound of Kakashi's voice. You really have to stop being so startled when people sneak up on you. I'm not. I got poked in my head, right where I had hit it making me yelp a bit. You sure, because you look pretty nervous to me. Don't like hospitals, I mumbled, rubbing my sore head. Smells funny. Can't argue with that, he sounded like he agreed but I'm pretty sure he wasn't completely convinced. I heard a squeak off to my right and I could only assume that it was from a chair. Anyways, let's talk about your test. But I want it, what more is there to talk about? You weren't listening to the explanation before the matches were you. Uh, in my defense I had a lot on my mind at the time. I'm sure you did. Anyways, those were the prelims. You now have a month to train for finals. What? Why didn't he tell us before? He did, you weren't listen. Oh yeah, I heard him sigh, probably shaking his head like he usually does when I do something like that. So sensei what awesome jutsus are you going to teach me? I'm not, I blinked trying to figure out if he was joking with me. I have to train Sasuke for his match against one of the Suna Shinobi. What, why, and how does he know his opponent? Oh yeah, you were unconscious for that. I gave him the no duh look and he continued. They pulled numbers out of a hat and put it into some elaborate graph thing. He has to go against Gara, the red head with the gourd. What's so dangerous about him? His last opponent, Rock Lee, is in intensive care right now being treated. There, unsure if he can continue being a ninja. Oh, I looked away, feeling bad for the spandex-wearing ninja. After all he was the dead last of his year like me. He would have killed him if Guy hadn't stepped in. So I'm going to have to train myself, aren't I? Not necessarily, I was able to call in a few favors and got you a teacher for the month. How's that supposed to help? I didn't even bother with pretending to look at him. 
They'll probably try to teach me by showing me stuff and we both know that won't work unless I miraculously get my sight back. Ah yes, we haven't figured out if your situation is permanent yet, have we? He didn't even phrase it as a question. Well, it seems pretty permanent to me, I said sourly but was obviously ignored as I heard the chair get pushed back and a pair of feet padding across the ground. I'm going to see if you can get signed out of this place. His footsteps began to lead away from me. If so, we're going to go visit my friend. The medical nin that lives outside the village. Yep, if there's anything that can be done for you then she'll at least know about it. Be back soon. The door clicked shut, leaving me alone in the hospital room for who knows how long. With Kakashi's tardy habits I wouldn't be surprised if, soon, meant five hours from now after he's flirted with every nurse in the building then blame it on a cat again. I debated about just ditching him and leaving through the window but considering I didn't even know if this room had a window, I decided that probably wouldn't be the best decision right now. Instead, I figured it would be better to at least find my clothes and get dressed because there was no way I was meeting someone new in a hospital gown. First checking if my new goggles were in place, and finding that they actually were, I inched to the side of the bed in search for the nightstand I knew would be there. After finding it, I used my hands to check for my clothes. Throughout the two minutes it took to search the small table, I spilt a cup of water, jammed my fingers against the wall, and almost knocked my forehead protector to the floor. But didn't find my clothes. It took me a minute to tie it in place and make sure it was right side up before resuming my search for my clothes. So I began crawling to the end of the bed, thinking it might be there somewhere. But before I got there my hand met empty air as my legs slipped off the edge of the bed, making me tumble to the floor. I laid there for a bit, my head spinning and my arm aching from my IV being yanked out in the fall. Itai, I murmured before writing myself so I was sitting on the floor. I heard several pairs of feet hurry down the hallway giving me a bad feeling as my door shot open with a bang, those feet skidding to a halt at the same time. Uh, hi. I tried to sound cheerful even though I had no clue who was there. Though I was pretty sure it was a flock of nurses that heard the thump and came running before they realized whose room it was. Nice weather we're having huh? Uzumaki, one of them shouted, making my smile fade. Just from her voice I knew which nurse was at the in front of them all. She was the witchy wiest nurse in the whole hospital, at least to me. To the other patients she was this sweet old lady that does everything she can for them. To me she was one of the main reasons I hate hospitals. She always gave me as many shots as she could get away with in the largest needles she could get her hands on. She was also the one that always stopped me when I tried to escape this horrid place. Whenever she caught me, she'd slap me hard enough to leave a bruise and was always able to pass it off as an injury I caused myself from a fall or something. I would try to tell Gigi, but all the nurses would back her up even though they knew the truth. You are trying to escape again aren't you? I tried to shrink into the floor, suddenly wishing I knew that headhunter jutsu that Kaka Sensei used on the 10 months back. When I didn't answer, she continued shouting, making my head hurt more from her sheer volume. Well, are you? Answer me brat. I I'm not, really. I insisted as I heard most of the feet start leaving the room leaving me alone with the loud woman. I just fell out of bed. Bull, her voice flat as her volume was lowered slightly. Not enough to make a difference but it was a bit better. Your headband is already on and your IV is mysteriously missing from your arm. You honestly think that I believe that you aren't trying to escape. The IV ripped out when I, I tried to explain, but she wasn't listening to me. She never did. I don't think so. That's not going to work this time brat. Her volume started raising again, making the pain in my head grow even worse. You're always trying to escape before you're even recovered. Well, maybe if you weren't such a bitch I wouldn't have to. I had wanted to say that for a while, but the tense silence that came after told me that I really shouldn't have. How dare you, ya little. I flinched away, knowing what was coming but when the sound of skin hitting skin reached my ears, I became extremely confused at the lack of pain in my cheek. 
That's my student you're trying to hit. Kakashi's voice sounding colder than a steel katana left outside in a blizzard. Not to mention, he is a registered ninja which means the laws concerning assaulting shinobi still applies to him. I'd think twice before even getting near him again. Is that clear? I heard her, hum, as a pair of heels trot away through the door before slamming it angrily. Are you alright? He was sounding normal. Yeah, it was silent for a bit before I spoke up again. I hate her. I can see why. An arm reached under mine and helped me to my feet. I was a bit wobbly but I was able to stand on my own so he released me. Is it safe to say that she is another reason you hate the hospital? I nodded lightly in response, not wanting to irritate my headache. It still wasn't going away, in fact it was growing more severe now that she was gone. Kakashi was saying something else, but I didn't hear what it was as the pain just kept increasing. I eventually I sat down and removed my goggles, then pushed my hands against my eyes, trying to relieve it even just a bit. Naruto, Kakashi's voice asked, sounding worried he placed a hand on my shoulder. Are you alright? My head hurts, I murmured to him. Right behind my eyes. How bad? Bad. A pile of folded cloth was placed on my lap that felt like a very familiar fabric. Get dressed, we're going to Rin's as soon as you're done. Rin. My medic nin friend, I'm going to talk to the Hokage in the meantime and see about replacing a certain nurse we both now know and hate. There was a bit of a swoosh that could only be from a shunshin. I smirked at that, hoping he was more successful than me. I sat there for a couple moments before convincing myself to let go of my eyes and figure out which piece of clothing was which. End chapter 6. Start chapter 7. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 7. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. When Kakashi came back, five minutes later, Naruto still wasn't finished getting dressed. He had his pants on right but his t-shirt was backwards with one arm through his collar along with his head. He had apparently stopped halfway through the process and was now laying on the bed with some of the sheet bunched up in his hands, pressing them against his eyes again. It's gotten worse, hasn't it? He knelt down beside the bed, studying his student worriedly. The boy nodded into the blanket, not even speaking. Alright, then let's get this shirt fixed and we'll leave. Ren will know what to do, promise. Kakashi became worried when Naruto sat up, his fingers reluctantly releasing the sheet, but didn't give any other response than that. Kakashi swiftly fixed the shirt and helped him into his jacket before picking the boy up on his back and shooting out the window faster than a flying kunai. He ran across the rooftops, reaching the edge of the village in record time. Seeing the gate, he dropped to the ground in front of the pair everyone called the Eternal Chunin. They jumped in surprise, but before they could start asking questions, Kakashi started answering them. Naruto and I are off to see a friend of mine, we'll be back tomorrow. Yes, the Hokage already knows of the trip and approved it. And no, Naruto's not feeling all that well but he'll be fine when we come back. Yane. Before either of them had opened their mouths to say anything, the two were out of sight. He needed to get there as soon as possible. He didn't like seeing Naruto in such pain, he was supposed to be a happy, energetic person but right now he was so lifeless it was like carrying a doll on his back. The only thing that assured him that Naruto was still there was the boy's hands gripping his sensei's shirt sleeves and his face buried in his flask jacket. It was only a couple minutes later that the pair landed in front of a wooden shack big enough for a couple people to live comfortably. They dropped to the ground, the older walking swiftly through the front door. Ren Chan, you here? Kakashi called, hoping she wasn't out collecting herbs or something. In the kitchen, Kakashi Kun, a voice called back from down the hall. The silver haired man hid a sigh of relief before walking through the living room towards her. He stepped through the doorway into a simple kitchen to see the brunette grinding herbs. Her relatively short hair was being held back in a small ponytail to keep it out of the way. She was dressed in a light green short sleeve shirt and a pair of black baggy pants with an apron to keep the herbs from making a mess of her clothes. I haven't seen you in a while. 
I thought you had that new Genin team to take care of. She smiled, looking up from her work but in no way stopping. Anyways, what brings you here today? Him, he said, nodding his head towards the student on his back. Her eyes went wide when she caught sight of the small blonde as her hands finally ceased. Is that... Naruto, yes, he has a bit of a problem that I'd like to get your opinion about. What's wrong? She slipped her apron off and set it on the countertop before moving to the boy's side. It's kind of complicated. Well, let's go to the guest room and you can tell me what happened. She ushered him out of the room and down the hall to another. He went in and tried to put Naruto on the bed but the boy was so wrapped up in the pain that Kakashi couldn't get his hands unclenched from his sleeves. The silver-haired man thought of trying to coax his student into releasing him but he doubted that Naruto could make out words right now. Ren, do you mind? He gave her a pleading look. She nodded, flashing through some hand signs before placing a hand on the blonde's head, knocking the poor boy out. She helped Kakashi set him on the bed, freezing once she caught sight of the goggles. Those are Obito kuns. Yeah, long story but he earned them. Kakashi took the goggles off his head and placing them on the nightstand. But what you need to look at is under them. When Naruto came back from the second test I noticed his eyes weren't tracking right. Somehow he lost his sight the night before and we can't figure out what caused it. That and as of a couple minutes ago, he gained an intense pain behind his eyes, which was putting him in the state you saw a moment ago. Then why did you come here? The Konoha hospital is a lot more prepared for this type of thing, Rin pointed out as she began treating him anyways. I hardly have the technology for any of this. He wants to keep it a secret so he doesn't lose his ninja rank. That and I doubt they'd treat him very well. He doesn't like them and I saw firsthand that they don't like him either. She nodded, her hands glowing green as she held them over the boy's eyes. She closed her own so she could focus on what she couldn't see. As she did so, Kakashi stayed quiet to keep from disturbing her concentration. Several minutes passed by before the green glow faded and she looked up at him, her gaze telling the silver-haired man that the news she had for him was grim. What is it? I'd rather wait to say once he's woken up. That way I don't have to say it more than once. That bad? Yeah, she answered simply but I was able to ease the pain so when he regains consciousness, it won't be so debilitating. Just tell me one thing, will he be able to see again? She was quiet for a moment, biting her lip as she decided whether or not to tell him. I, I don't know. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. One hour later. My hand shot up to my eyes as soon as I woke up, surprised by the lack of both the pain and my new goggles. Where are my goggles? I asked out loud, sure that either Kakashi or his friend, Rin, was in the room. Something scraped against wood to my left, making my head turn towards the sound. Here you go, a sweet voice said as something was placed in my lap. I picked it up, recognizing the increasingly familiar feel of my goggles. Thanks, I grinned as I sat up and slid them back on my head, finding it easier than tying my headband. You're Kaka-sensei's friend, right? Yes I am. Her voice didn't hold the resentment that most adults do, which was a bit refreshing. My name is Rin. Nice to meet you, Rin-san. I'm Naruto. I held my hand out to shake, remembering the bit of manners that Gigi tried to teach me years ago. It's not that I didn't learn it, I just didn't put it into practice because none of the adults I was introduced to deserved it. With a bit of a chuckle she took my hand and shook it. Well, it's nice to meet you too. Is Kaka-sensei in here? I asked after a moment. I don't think so but I've been wrong twice before. He can be really quiet sometimes. No, he's in the kitchen cooking some dinner. He can cook. He's lived by himself for a long time, it was either learn or eat out a lot. What about instant ramen? You can't eat that all the time. I do. It's not very good for you. What are you saying? It's great food. I was just about to give her a long lecture on the wonders of ramen when I heard footsteps coming down the hallway followed by a delicious smell that made me halt. Unfortunately it wasn't ramen but whatever it was it was certainly edible at the very least. 
Kaka sensei, what's that? A door squeaked open intensifying the smell slightly. Grilled cheese, he answered, sounding amused. I figured you needed something relatively healthy. Plus you have to really try to make a mess if you're eating a sandwich. Why would you care if I made a mess? I followed his footsteps as he walked across the floor before he placed a plate on my lap. Because I'd be the one cleaning it up. It smells good. The food wasn't hot so I figured it was one of the first out of the pan for my convenience. But that didn't matter to me, food was food and I felt like I haven't eaten in days. Which got me thinking as I ate, has it really been that long since I had eaten the ramen after the first test? At this point I didn't even know how long it has been since then. So instead of torturing myself with unanswered questions, I asked Kakashi. Uh, sensei. The air tensed as the pair stopped chewing their food. This brought up a whole other batch of questions that I decided to ignore for the time being. If being blind had any advantages it was that you could pretend not to notice the mood in the room and no one would know the difference. How long has it been since the prelims? Finally decided that you wanted to know how long you were out huh? Kakashi asked with a chuckle that sounded kind of relieved. I nodded. One day. A day. Yep. It could have been worse. If it weren't for Fluffy, you'd still be out. But I'm so far behind. Everyone else has already started training and I don't even know who my sensei is yet. Relax, everyone else are still recovering from their wounds as well. I doubt anyone has started training yet. Oh yeah, we settled into a tense silence as we ate. Eventually I couldn't take it anymore and spoke up. Alright, what's going on here? I demanded after I finished my sandwich. What do you mean? Rin was clearly pretending not to know what I was talking about. You two have been walking on eggshells since I woke up. There was a surprised silence between the two that got on my nerves. Just because I'm blind doesn't mean I don't notice these things. Might as well spill. Kakashi's chair creaking like he was reclining. I don't quite remember him sitting down in one but that was probably because of the food. Can't put it off forever. I know. Rin sounded sad as she spoke. I examined your eyes while you were out. Is that why my goggles were off? Yes. She took a nervous breath before continuing. Anyways, the eyes themselves are undamaged. Everything worked like it was supposed to until I got to the optic nerve. The nerve was, for the most part, severed a few centimeters behind the eyes. It's not completely detached just enough so you can't see through them. Did you understand that Naruto? Kakashi asked after a silent moment. I think so. The connection between my eyes and my brain was cut, right? Yeah, but my question is how? There was a bit of medical chakra still remaining on the nerves so I'm pretty sure we can safely assume it was done with a medical jutsu of some type. So it was done purposefully. Though Rin said nothing, I had the feeling that she nodded. Is it reversible? Not as far as I know. The nerve could probably be reconnected if it wasn't separated by chakra. If it was from regular wound we could try to patch them or, if we had to, grow them back. The person that did this, did it in such a way that it practically ensures that they can't be fixed by someone like me. Someone like Tsunade might be able to but, even then I doubt it would be much of a chance. The pair of them continued talking. I think they were trying to figure out who had the skill and opportunity to do this to me. But wasn't listening, I let their voices fade from my hearing, not wanting to hear any more. Even though I didn't show it, I was secretly hoping that she would be able to do something, that this was reversible. Now that I knew it wasn't, that bit of hope fled, taking my resolve with me. Without my sight I knew, despite my nature, that it would be practically impossible to achieve my goal of Hokage. I'd end up risking my life every time I went on a mission, even if it was just simple D-ranks. I would be useless to the village, there was practically no point to staying a ninja anymore, I might as well let the civilians kill me. Naruto, my name coupled with a gentle hand on my shoulder got me out of my thoughts. Are you alright? Yeah, I flashed a smile at her even though I didn't feel like grinning. I'm fine. There was silence before she spoke up again. I'm sorry, her voice sounding close to tears. 
I wish I could fix this but I just don't have the skills to do something so complicated. I'm so sorry. I closed my eyes for a moment to collect my thoughts. I didn't have time to be upset about this. I only had a month before the finals, if I became upset about this now all it would do is make me lose valuable time. I had to stay focused. It's not your fault, I said after I opened my eyes to the blank world around me. Speaking of fault, Kakashi said, interrupting whatever I was going to say next. I might know whose it is. Naruto, you said earlier that you ran into Kabuto the day before right? Yeah, what of it? Before you woke up I caught him in Sasuke's hospital room prepared to kill him. I stopped him but he killed all the guards stationed there with some high quality medical ninjutsu. Kabuto, but he's a Konoha ninja. Why would he try to kill Sasuke? I don't think you understand what I'm getting at, Naruto. Kakashi sighed before continuing. Kabuto was the only one in the whole exams that has shown himself to be well versed in medical jutsu. He's also the only one with the opportunity to use said jutsus against you. I'm saying he's probably the one responsible for blinding you. But, he was practically harmless, for a ninja. A ninja's greatest weapon is deception, Kakashi said gently. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't think it could have been him either. It doesn't, I muttered. I heard him take a breath to say more when I interrupted him. Can we change the subject please? If you want. Why did it hurt this morning but not when it happened? He fused chakra into the nerve when he cut it. Right now, the Kyubi's chakra is acting like antibodies and attacking it. Apparently your Baiju doesn't like foreign chakra too much. That's where the pain was coming from, the two types of chakra fighting each other. It didn't hurt before because the chakra had yet to recognize the intruder and after it did, it took time for it to get there. It had to struggle past the seal and through your chakra pathways, all which took until you started feeling the pain. So the Kyubi chakra was trying to get rid of the other stuff. Yes. If it did get rid of it, would I be able to get my sight back? There was silence for a moment as she thought. Probably not. Any Baiju chakra is highly poisonous, especially the Kyubis. Even if it is able to get rid of the other chakra, the damage it would have done to the nerve would be too great to fix. Optic nerves are not meant to contain such potent chakra, they're just too delicate. Why doesn't it hurt now? Because I used my medical chakra to make it seem that the foreign chakra is actually yours. As long as it feels like yours, the Baiju chakra won't attack it. But it won't last forever, you'll have to come back here in about two months for me to repeat the procedure. You should have just let the Kyubi get rid of it, I whispered after a moment. But there could be something that can be done that I don't know about. Letting the Kyubi destroy your optic nerve would ruin any chance you might have had with it like this. But who knows where I'll be in two months. I was getting more nervous as I spoke. I know you said you're not sure if something can be done, but wouldn't it be easier to keep me knocked out as the Kyubi did its thing? There are better medical ninjas than me, Naruto. They might know about something I don't and I wouldn't want to inconvenience them if they do. But I'm not going to tell anyone else about this. You don't know that. I do, I'm not going to lose my ninja status for a maybe. I turned away from the pair of them stubbornly. There's something else isn't there. Kakashi asked after a moment. I pretended not to hear him. Naruto, are you scared of something? No, I'm not. My head snapped back towards him. I'm not scared of anything. Ghosts. The word itself made me shudder, which pretty much proved me wrong. Now, what's worrying you? It hurt, I said quietly, not even sure if he heard me. It really hurt, I don't want to feel that ever again. You won't have to. A hand was placed gently on my shoulder. I guessed it was Rin because Kakashi's hand was bigger than that. Just stop by once every two months and you won't have to worry. But I don't want to do that all my life. No offense but I just can't. Then just do so for six months. If you don't find someone that can help in six months then I'll do as you said and keep you unconscious until the foreign chakra is gone. I could almost hear the smile in her voice. Does that sound better? Yeah, I guess. Well, this is as good of a time to change the subject as any. 
Kakashi sounded oddly chipper. We need to chat about that fight of yours coming up. You haven't even told me who I'm going to fight. I glared in his direction, gaining a chuckle for my trouble. That's not what I want to talk about. He started to talk in a scolding tone which worried me. You told me you wouldn't disobey my orders, right? Yeah. Didn't I also say that you were not ready to fight Kiba? But I won. Yes, you did, and that's the only reason I haven't pulled you from the competition just yet. But I will, if my conditions aren't met. What conditions? I want you to come up with a substitute for your sight. What? You barely won against Kiba. Everyone that's in the next stage is a lot better than him. You're going to need to be able to see or come up with some way to make it like you're seeing so you have a chance of winning. But how am I supposed to do that? I don't know, that's what you're going to have to figure out over the next month. He paused before speaking again. Unfortunately, I'm going to be unavoidably preoccupied so I won't be able to help you. But don't think I won't be able know if you succeeded. I'll be waiting for you inside, ready to ask the question. What question? The question, he emphasized the, the, with a finger tapping my nose. You mean that question? But of course, he spoke as if he was smiling. How else will I know? You'll have had a month to get used to it so anything else wouldn't work. So you're serious about all this, huh? Damn straight, with your opponent, you're going to need all the help you can get. Wait. You know who I'm fighting. Didn't I tell you, he sounded way too innocent to be believed. No, you didn't, I don't even know who made it through to the next round. Well, as you know Sasuke and Gara made it through, as well as Shino, Konkuro, Tamari, Shikamaru, and, of course you. He spoke kind of slowly, like he was purposely avoiding what I wanted to hear. The ones you missed were Neji, Duzo, and Fu. Who were they against? Neji versed his cousin Hinata, Duzo went against Choji, and Fu was against Zaku. How did Neji win? Hinata has that cool eye jutsu that can pretty much see everything. So does Neji, and he's older and more trained in its use. That and he apparently holds a lot of resentment towards her. He almost killed her in that match. My mouth dropped open, stunned. It took a couple seconds to process this, one Konoha nin trying to kill another out of hate. The thought of it was horrifying. But it was even worse than that, and I told Kakashi as much. Who in their right mind would try to kill their family? I asked quietly, my voice rising in anger. That insane, a family is a gift and all he's doing is treating them like dirt. Trust me, I know. I know about as well as you do. I gave him a funny look, before shaking my head and continued my thoughts. Someone should teach him that. Glad you think so because you'll have the chance to do just that. I looked at him, about to ask why when he answered it for me. Your first opponent is none other than Neji. I was silent for a bit, my mind processing what he was saying before I burst out laughing. What's so funny? Rin asked as I struggled to breathe. Neji's going to be a hard person to beat. Not only is he a genius in his clan's tijutsu but he has his Byakugan down to almost an art. Exactly. I said between bouts of laughter. Neji seeing everything, he's fighting me. The one that sees all vs the one that can't see at all. Hehe, <laughs> this is going to be fun. End chapter 7. This is the end of part 3. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Peace out people. This is part 4 of what if Naruto lost his sight. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Also it'll be starting shoutouts next video. Start chapter. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 8. Hope you enjoy. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next day. Kotetsu and Azumo were sitting at the table. Azumo trying to get his friend to play a card game to relieve his boredom when Kakashi appeared with Naruto on his back just like the day before. Except this time the boy was completely awake. Hi Azumo, hi Katetsu, Naruto waved at them happily. Morning Naruto, 
Kakashi, Azumo said, trying to hide his confusion. Everything was taken care of, Kakashi informed them. I'm going to drop him back at his apartment then I'll be right over to the Hokage like I'm supposed to be. You wouldn't mind letting him know, would you? You were supposed to be there an hour ago. We got lost in the forest where we ran into a hermit who took us captive. It was all we could to sneak out of there this morning. Surprisingly, this excuse came from Naruto. Good one, his sensei praised. Thanks, came up with it on the way here. I figured we'd need one. The whole, black cat, routine is getting kinda old. Watch it, that's my best excuse. But it's boring, there's no creativity in it. Well, then how about you come up with my excuses from now on? You know what, I think I just might. Uh, excuse me, Azumo said, succeeding in getting the pair's attention. The Hokage's expecting you Kakashi. My apologies, do tell him I'll be there soon. And when he arrives three hours from now, his excuse I'll be that he discovered Tora in an alleyway and was engaged in a game of cat and mouse, where he was unfortunately the mouse. Thanks Naruto, he tipped an imaginary hat towards the guards in a sort of thanks. Yeah nay. There was a slight poof as the two left via Shunshin. The guards looked at each other for several seconds. So, who's going to explain all this to the third? They were silent for another moment before competing in a swift round of Jenkin Pan, to which Azuma lost. Damn, he whispered, as Kotetsu shunshined away as well. I really wanted to get away from this desk. Dash. Well, here you are. Kakashi put me down so I was standing on the ground. I knew I was in my apartment just by the familiar smell, which was something along the lines of old wooden ramen. Sure you'll be alright alone here. It's my house, if I can't figure out how to get around here then I might as well just hand over my forehead protector. Naruto. But seriously sensei, I'll be fine. I waved a hand dismissively as I headed in the direction of my kitchen. I'm going to make some ramen. Don't use the stove, I stopped and spun around to face him. Why not? It would be best for everyone that you don't try to burn the apartment complex down. And why do you think I'd do that? Simple, because you think you're heading to the kitchen when in fact you're three inches away from walking into your front door. I glared at him, raising a hand, determined to prove him wrong right up until I banged my knuckles into the door. Of course, my sensei just ignored me and continued to talk as if I didn't just injure myself. So with that being said, no stove for you. But, my ramen. You have hot water, right? I nodded, though it wasn't always as hot as I would like, it's not worth complaining. Use that. But sensei, I began to complain before hearing a small poof. Sensei, sensei. I didn't get an answer so I could probably assume he left. Bastard, I murmured as I turned the other way and headed back to the kitchen. On the way there, I ended up bumping into the table, tripping over a chair and hitting my hip on the countertop. Damn. This is going to be harder than I thought. It took me five minutes just to find the stuff I needed. Luckily I live off plastic wares so anything that fell didn't shatter on contact. After that, I waited for the food to be ready but when, after ten minutes, it was still crunchy gave up. I was starving, and didn't want to wait any longer to eat, so I tossed the ramen towards the sink, celebrated briefly when I heard it actually go in. Then pulled out my book and headed towards Ichiraku's. Apparently, I knew my way to the ramen shop better than around my own house, because I had absolutely no trouble finding my way there. Though, I myself can't take much credit for that, after all I was following the scent of ramen the whole time. I did have some trouble dodging people but other than that I got there without much difficulty. Unfortunately my impeccable luck didn't last that long. I had put my book on the table and just as I went to sit down, someone yanked me away by the collar. What are you doing out of bed Uzumaki? A man demanded. It took me a couple of seconds to recognize the voice as Ebisu. Kakashi said you wouldn't be able to start training until tomorrow because you were recuperating. This doesn't look like resting to me. I got hungry. My answer sounded more like a question, which didn't convince him any, I'm sure. Wait. You're training me. Yes. 
I heard some sort of clink coming from where his face would be. The only guess I had to that was either he was straightening his glasses or he was suddenly wearing a bunch of earrings. But since this is Ebisu we're talking about, I figured it was the first. What? That jerk. I'm not any happier about this than you are. I would much rather be home reading my books. You mean your porn? My answer was accompanied by a choking sound from where he was. I ate his end not pp porn. Fine, smut, exotic literature. Whatever you pervs are calling the Ika Ika books now. You know what brat, seeing as how you seem well enough to insult your new teacher, you're definitely well rested enough to begin training. I could almost hear his evil grin. Alright, sounds fine to me. Right now. Dash. Hey, let go. Aim heard Naruto shout from her spot behind the table. I can't leave yet, I have ramen to eat. No oh, hey Aim. Can you keep an eye on my book? I'll be back for it. Thanks. No. I demand ramen. The short, blonde boy continued shouting until they were well out of sight and earshot. Was that Naruto? Her father asked from the stove. Yep. She picked up the book and put it behind the counter for him to get later. He was dragged away again, wasn't he? She hummed an affirmative, not bothering to truly answer. How dare they do that? Without Naruto eating here we'll go broke. She nodded in agreement as she waited for their best customer to come back, because he always did. Dash. Jerk. I murmured as I sat on the ground, pouting angrily. I was sitting on a patch of grass surrounded by the smell of minerals, the sound of moving water and giggling. If I put all this together I was pretty much sure I was in, or near, a bathhouse. I should have known the perv would bring me here. What are we doing here, Ebisu Arrow? We're here for training of course. Are you sure it's not for peeking on girls? Of course not, I'd never do such a thing. His exclamation was louder than it needed to be probably for the sake of the girls that were doing the giggling. Well, most of it anyways. Whatever, what's this training I'm supposed to be doing? You're going to walk across that pond over there. I could tell he was pointing right at the damn thing, so I had to come up with a quick excuse. Nope, it's against my religion. I winced at the absurdity that my mind came up with as a thump was heard that probably indicated some sort of face fall. This was going to be hard to explain but it was a little late to change now. I had no other choice but to go with it. What? Ebisu exclaimed. It's against my religion that a lowly human should be able to do what only the Kamis can. Naruto, Konoha don't have a religion. Uh, what do you call the will of fire then? He was quiet for a moment before speaking again. Alright, that's a religion. But we don't have anything else. What about the flames of youth? Youth, a voice interrupted me from far away. Or the fire extinguisher of fate. There was silence for a moment, but Ebisu and I waiting to hear a shout that never came. The fire extinguisher of fate is not a religion, Ebisu said finally. I was sure someone would have started worshipping it by now, I answered simply before coming up with another one. Oh, what about the log? The log is not a religion either. Tell that to the clans. They worship the thing like it created ninjutsu right alongside the Sage of Six Paths. I wouldn't be surprised if that's why Clucky versus the Log was such a controversy. But how is water walking against any of those? I froze, trying to convince my mind to come up with something quickly. Well, it's not. My religion is completely different. And secret, very secret, so secret, in fact, that if I tell you any more about it I'd be thrown out of the order. What? They take their religion very seriously. If you're not allowed to walk on water then why can you defy gravity and walk up a wall? He asked, stopping my far-fetched excuse in its tracks. Uh, I tried to stall, my idiot brain not coming up with anything to counter it. Thought so, now walk. He grabbed my coat and pulled me to my feet. But you haven't even told me how. It's just like tree climbing but you have to keep changing the level of chakra because the water's moving. His explanation was rushed, as if he were hoping I have missed most of it. He pushed me forward making me stumble, my left foot shoe splashing into the water a bit, which is what I was waiting for. Now I knew where the water I was supposed to be walking across was. Fine, 
but if I get kicked out of the order for this, I'm blaming you. I began focusing my chakra into my feet as I spoke, more to keep appearances than anything. Heck, I might even take pranking back up to get revenge for it. You, re not in an order. I ignored him and continued trying to focus. It was difficult, probably more than it should have been since my chakra was still feeling funny. It wasn't moving like it should be, which made my already shoddy chakra control even worse. So I wasn't very surprised when I stepped out towards the water and ended up sinking straight through the surface. What did surprise me was the fact that the pond was hotter than boiling water. Luckily I had taken a deep enough breathe to make sure I would float to the surface despite my heavy clothing, and didn't really have to worry about drowning. Instead I was kicking myself in the butt about not bringing a package of ramen with me. It would have cooked up so nicely in this pond. Like I was being right now. As soon as my head broke the surface, I leapt backwards, towards where the land should be, screaming about it being hot. Stop being a wimp, it's not that bad, he said soon after I landed on the grass again. Not that bad, I could cook ramen with this water in about a minute. And it takes three. I guess you'll have to learn quickly then. There was an audible smirk that I've been hearing a lot lately. It was really starting to annoy me. You're lucky I don't throw you in the bush over there with the other pervert. What? I heard two voices say in unison, one of which sounded similar to the giggling I heard earlier. Apparently my guessing is getting better. It was about then that I felt a swishing around my eyes which could only mean that these old goggles weren't waterproof. So with a sigh I took them off to clean them. What were you doing in the bush? Ebisu asked the man as the rustle of leaves could be heard. Shush, you're going to scare them away. He hissed back. Scare what away? There was a moment of silence, a silence full of female giggling, before he answered his own question. How dare you peep on the WOM? Unfortunately before he could finish his accusation, there was a thump and a quickly fading scream. Damn man should just admit he's a pervert instead of trying to get the rest of us in trouble, the remaining man muttered, obviously something happened to Ebisu that made him suddenly disappear. Did you just punt my sensei? I kept my head down as I tried to dry my goggles. Didn't you see the fantastic throw? There's hot water on my eyes, I muttered quickly. There was silence so I explained. Apparently my goggles leak. Goggles? What goggles? I held them up before slipping them over my eyes. Are those? Kakashi Sensei's teammates? Yep, my Sensei gave it to me after the preliminaries. Don't know why, it's not like I don't have a pair of my own. I straightened my goggles until they felt right. So you're Naruto, he stated, not a question in his voice. I looked up towards him questioningly. How do you know my name? I trained your sensei's sensei. But his sensei was the fourth. Wait, you trained the fourth? Yep, I bet you know who I am now. Not a clue. What, I'm Jiraiya the Toad Sage. You're still just an old pervert to me. I am not an old pervert. I'm a super pervert, my face connected with the floor from the sheer stupidity of the statement. Whatever, I climbed to my feet and dusted off my pants. I gotta get back to training. I paused for a moment before remembering that my sensei was gone. Great, how am I supposed to train if I don't have a sensei? I stood there for a moment, before I heard that old pervert try to sneak away which gave me an idea. Hey, you can train me. No. Well, you're the reason I don't have a sensei so you should replace him. What, I don't think so. You wanna bet? I'm not Tsunade, kid. I stood there for a moment trying to figure out who this Tsunade was. I remembered a Sani medic mentioned in my history class by that name but I wasn't sure, so I asked. Isn't she one of the Sani? Come on, you recognize her name but not mine. What is this world coming to? Well, she's a Sani. So am I, he shouted in my face. I didn't respond as I thought back to academy class, trying to remember his name being mentioned. It took me a moment to remember a Jiraiya being mentioned shortly after the other two. Oh yeah, now I remember, I said, placing a fist in my palm. You're the one with the hair jutsus. That's all you remember about me. No wonder you're the dead last, 
he muttered to himself. I guess I'll have to introduce myself properly then. He cleared his throat. I heard him quickly go through several hand signs before hitting the ground as he shouted something about a summoning jutsu. After a large poof and the smell of strange smoke wafted away, he continued his introduction from several feet in the air. I am the writer of the best-selling novels in the world, the Toad Sage, Master of Seals, Keeper of the Konoha Information Ring, and the man that makes every woman swoon. Jiraiya. Why are you on a frog? I was guessing again. After all he did say it was a toad sage so he could probably summon them. It's a toad, he shouted before another poof was heard, followed by the sound of someone crashing into the road. Whatever, I shook my head at his antics. Wait, did you say master of seals? Yes I did, he climbed to his feet. An idea popped into my head regarding my messed up chakra that made me almost grin. How good. I am called a master. On a scale of academy student to the fourth. Little bit below my student, if I'm to be honest. Why, I started to believe that this might actually work. My seal got messed up in the second test, do you think you could fix it? What seal kid, he asked after a slight hesitation. That pause told me he knew exactly what I meant. I've been lied to enough throughout my life to be able to tell as much. You know what seal, the one on my stomach that nobody's allowed to talk about. You gonna fix it or what? How about the, or what? Guess I'll have to find someone else. You'd cause quite the stir if you did that. Jiraiya's playful tone replaced with a more serious one. I pretended to stare at him stubbornly as he was, no doubt, staring back. It was quite hard to keep from laughing when I realized he was trying to have a staring contest with a blind kid. Fine but not here. I jumped in victory. There's too many people around for something like this. End chapter 8. Start chapter 9. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 9. Wow. Almost forgot it's Monday. A bit busy today. Chaos I tell you. Thanks for the reviews. The chapter's a bit short and not much happens but here it is. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Fine, but not here. I jumped in victory. There's too many people around for something like this. His footsteps started moving away relatively quickly, leaving me to catch up with him on my own. It was difficult, after all I was using only my hearing to figure out where he was headed. I stumbled quite a few times on sticks but other than that I did pretty good. We were only walking for about 10 minutes when he announced we were here right before I could walk into him. This should do. Wherever we were, it still smelled like minerals but not as strong as before, that in the water sounded like it larger than the other. Off with the jacket. Excuse me. The seal's on your stomach, right? I nodded. I can't very well see through clothes now can I? You'd enjoy that too much, I stated as I removed my jacket as well as my shirt. There, happy. I'd be happier if you were a chick but then I would be a blubbering idiot so it's probably for the best, he murmured, more to himself than me. All right, focus your chakra into your stomach. Why? Stop asking so many questions brat. Then start explaining stuff better. Fine, the chakra reveals your seal. Now focus your chakra so I can see what's wrong with it. All right then. I started forming a seal and doing as he said. Damn Geki, he hummed in thought. Well, that's probably the problem right there. Someone put a secondary seal over the one you already had. It wouldn't be a five-pronged seal, would it? I asked, remembering what the snake Tem had called it in the forest. Actually it is, I guess you know who did it then. It was that weird, snake-loving girly man that gave Sasuke Tem the hickey. Damn. I should have guessed he was behind it, he said to himself before talking back to me. But there's no need to worry, it's an easy fix. How? Like this, was the only warning I got before he said, five prong seal, release. And slammed his palm in my stomach. I stumbled back in pain, though it wasn't as bad as when the seal was put on but it still hurt. There, now try your water walking. Fine but if it didn't work you're next on my reinstated pranking list. 
I walked towards the sound of the water as he mumbled something about being a carbon copy of some Kashina person. I ignored him as my toes touched the water so I could start channeling my chakra into my feet. I could already feel a difference as it rushed to my feet in a controlled burst, unlike before. Feeling better about this, I stepped confidently towards the water. And it worked. I could feel my feet sink slightly into the water but stop before I even half my foot was wet, and long before I touched the sandy ground. It works, I yelled happily. I looked down at my feet for show then ran out a little farther before turning around and heading back the way I came. Guess I won't have to put you on my list. Oh thank Kami. So what do I do now? Keep practicing. Why, I have it down just fine. The more you practice, the better your chakra search control gets and trust me kid, you need it. I thought on this for a moment before nodding in agreement. So get started Gaki. Alright, but you're buying my ramen. Ebisu Arrow took me away from my lunch. But I'm training you, you should be buying me ramen in thanks. But a sensei should treat their student to food after a grueling day's work. He made an unbelieving huff before I continued, bringing up my best argument. After all, ramen is the best way of keeping me quiet. And why would I need to keep you quiet? Well, I'm pretty sure that the girls in the bathhouse would love to hear who was peeping on them a half hour ago. You wouldn't, I could almost feel the glare that was surely aimed at me. Try me, I matched his glare, starting another useless staring contest between us. I must have looked pretty convincing, because he gave up quite soon. Only this once, and you have to work hard or the deal's off. Hi, I focused my chakra and ran towards the water, only to fall right through the surface. This might be funnier than I thought. I heard him call once I broke the surface again. I glared at him before climbing out and trying it again. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Five hours later. I'm done, Jiraiya heard his new student say. He looked up from his writing to see the boy purposefully fall backwards into the sand. It was about four in the afternoon so by his calculations, Naruto had been working for almost five hours now. Jiraiya thought it an impressive feat for a boy straight out of the hospital, especially since he wasn't looking too good when he was checked out. Yes, he was well aware of most of what happened. At least that he was hospitalized, thought to have tried to escape, then escorted by Kakashi to his teammate's hut with something akin to a headache. It seemed whatever young Rin did, it must have worked, after all Naruto has been working hard for most of the day without end. Of course, he wasn't going to tell Naruto any of this, it would probably just inflate his ego and that didn't need to be any bigger. Seriously, is that all you got? He taunted. The sun's still up. And I just got out of the hospital. The boy shouted his breathing still labored from his training. So, that's no excuse. I'm tired. Fine, I guess considering everything you earned your dinner. Naruto threw his fist in the air in victory only to let it drop back to the ground with a quiet thump. Well, get up and we'll leave. Can't. Can't. Naruto nodded without lifting his head. Why can't you? Too tired. Then how do you expect to get there? Me carrying you into town. Jiraiya asked sarcastically. Yes. Seriously, the boy nodded again. What makes you think I'd even consider doing that? Women's bathhouse. You can't blackmail me twice with one thing. Says who? He was silent as he tried to come up with something legitimate the boy would believe. Damn brat, he murmured, coming up empty-handed as he picked the blonde up and put him, unceremoniously, onto his back. I don't want to hear a single complaint. Got it. Hi, Naruto murmured, sounding as if he were about to fall asleep. Sid wasn't a surprise when after a minute or two he heard a light snoring coming from his back. Jiraiya shook his head at the boy's easy ability to trust almost anyone. It was kind of nice to see a ninja still so naive about the world, even though he knew that he'd have to teach him otherwise eventually. Jiraiya paused for a moment trying to figure out exactly when he decided to continue training him. Maybe it was when he showed his determination to get stronger, or when he actually noticed his chakra was out of whack by himself. No, it was when he saw him. He looked too much like his old student, 
like his father, to be ignored. He didn't consciously think about the fact that Naruto's father would never be able to teach his son his best ninjutsu, the Rasengan, the Flying Thunder God technique, or even sealing in general. He just knew that he needed to teach him in his student's place. Guess I'm stuck with you for a bit, he mumbled to himself as the ramen stand came into view. Hey Gaki, we're here. Jiraiya spoke up, but didn't get a response from the boy. Hey did you hear me back there? We're at the ramen stand. He mumbled something into his sensei's back but did nothing else, not even wake up. He must have been more tired than he let on, the adult said to himself. Guess I'll just take him home then. He was about to turn around when he remembered why he was taking the kid out for ramen to begin with. So with a sigh he went up to the stand and ordered two containers of beef ramen to go. After all, he couldn't have him going around telling everyone he's been spying on bathhouses. Although most people already knew this, sometimes letting someone think they have the upper hand opens up a whole different world of opportunities. After all, how could he train the boy if he didn't let him think it was his idea in the first place? Is it for Naruto? The pretty waitress asked after delivering the order to her father. How'd you guess? He teased. Call it a hunch, she said with a smile, glancing at unconscious blonde on his back. Oh, I almost forgot. Can you give him this when he wakes up? He forgot it when his other teacher dragged him away this morning. She had reached under the counter, placing a familiar book on the tabletop. He stared at it for a bit before picking up the book and putting it in his pocket. Don't worry, I will, he said with a smile. By now the ramen was already done and placed in travel containers. He quickly paid for the meal before grabbing his bag and heading towards Naruto's apartment. End chapter 9. Start chapter 10. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 10. So, as always, hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. My eyes shot open as I heard my front door slammed shut. Thinking someone had broken in at some point, I grabbed a kanai from my pouch. As quietly as possible, I snuck towards the kitchen, only to trip on something and make a bunch of noise in the process. Naruto, whatever you're doing in there, you should probably clean up the floor first, I heard a voice call from the kitchen. Kakashi, I asked, climbing to my feet, I headed towards the main room. What are you doing in my kitchen? Again. Dropping off food, that's not ramen. Not ramen, what's wrong with ramen? I demanded as I ran my hand along the hallway wall until I got into the main room. It's not very healthy, he answered from someplace near where the table should be. Your sensei wants you to start eating better so you won't be so exhausted like you were today. That was because of the fight and you know it, I said, pointing an accusing finger at him. A bit more to the left, I adjusted my finger accordingly. There you go. But I want my ramen. I pouted. There's no need for water works, your new sensei left two bowls on the table for you, he said, I heard a paper bag rustle and the smell of Ichiraku's ramen filled the room. Yes, the black mail still works. You blackmailed Asanin? He asked, sounding mystified. I ignored him as I rushed over to the table not caring that I bumped into it in my search for food. How am I not surprised? It didn't take me long to find the food or to start devouring it. In fact I was halfway through the first bowl before one realized what Kakashi had said. Wait, you met my new sensei? I asked after swallowing a mouthful of ramen. Yep, he was dropping you off as I was bringing in the food. How you were able to talk him into training you all never know. Blackmail. Again. It works, doesn't it? You really shouldn't be blackmailing people, Naruto. It doesn't really mesh too well with your nindo. I don't do it all the time, I stated simply, continuing to eat as I spoke. It's really more of a last resort, well, more of a second to last resort. Before that's prank listing them and after that it's sexy jutsu. And how does that work for you? Surprisingly well actually. You'd be amazed how many perverts there are in Konoha. Instead of being called village hidden in the leaves, it should have been called village hiding all the perverts. Seriously, 
He had an unbelieving tone to his voice as he stopped putting away the food. Seriously, I'm actually surprised there hasn't been restraining orders from the other villages because of this. That's because they never let it affect their work, he answered. I paused in my eating to give him an unbelieving look before continuing on to the next bowl. Sure, whatever you say sensei. Well, I'm starting to train Sasuke tomorrow so I won't be able to check up on you for a while, probably not, till the exam, Kaka-sensei warned, continuing to put away different cans and boxes. That's alright, I think I'm getting the hang of everything. Oh, and Jiraiya-san said for you to be at the lake by 8am tomorrow, and if you're not, he'll come here and drag you there. His words exactly. Hmm, I guess it would be better if he came and got me, wouldn't it? Why, before I could answer he tried to answer for me. It's because you're having trouble figuring out the time, isn't it? Huh, I stopped eating my ramen in my confusion. I guess you haven't discovered that yet, he muttered to himself, making me think. I mean, of course I'd know what time it is. It's not like I don't know how to read a clock and if that fails I always can tell by where the sun is in the sky. My eyes went wide as I realized what he was talking about. Sensei. Yes. I can't tell time anymore. Glad to see you caught up. How can I be on time if I don't know the time? Just blame it on me. Everyone would believe you're picking up my tardy habit. But that's only if I'm late, I could be really early or come on the wrong day entirely. I threw my hands in the air in emphasis, sending one of my chopsticks into the wall behind me. This is a real crisis, Sensei. Ma Ma. Calm down. It's not much of a crisis yet. You'll be busy with Jiraiya all month who will probably pick you up every day, especially if you're late, he stated simply, still placing cans on the shelf. Anyways, I'll think of something so don't worry. Alright, I answered before turning back to my ramen only to remember I didn't have my chopsticks. I thought for a moment only to shrug and picked up the bowl to slurp what was left. As I finished, Kakashi crumbled up what had to be a paper bag or two and tossed it into something, probably the trash. Well, there you go, he said once the noise had stopped. What did ya get me? Bunch of canned food and some random snacks. Sweet, I exclaimed, Arigato Kaka Sensei. You're welcome, we were quiet for a moment which let my mind wander. A uh, Sensei, he hummed, letting me know he was listening. I was just wondering about something. Ever since the exam my other senses have been getting sharper. You don't happen to know why, do you? Quote. They're compensating for your lack of sight. But are they supposed to be doing that now? Shouldn't it be a bit slower? He was silent for a moment before speaking again. How sharp are your senses already? Well, I could follow the scent of ramen all the way to Ichiraku's, starting from only a block from my house. Were you able to smell that before? I don't think so. Have any of your other senses become as sharp? Well, in the fight, I could hear Kiba moving. You mean his footsteps? No, his clothes moving. And Sakura's been extremely loud lately, I could barely stand to be next to her in the prelims. Is that normal? Your senses should take longer to enhance than that, he said slowly. I asked Rin about it before we left. I'm not sure why they're already so acute only after a couple days. Unless. Unless what? Never mind, it's an absurd theory. Didn't make sense in the slightest. But. Why look at the time? It's getting late, no need to get up I'll let myself out. Ya yeah, nay, there was a poof indicating his departure. Asshole, I murmured as I continued to just sit at the table. After a couple seconds of breathing in the lingering ramen fumes I began lamenting my lack of ramen in the house. Then I realized that if the need for ramen becomes too much, I could always make my new sensei buy it for me. With a yawn, I wondered what time it was. I probably should have asked Kakashi while he was here. Right now I didn't even know if the sun was still up or not. I shrugged, deciding not to bother with it. If I was tired... I was going to go to bed, time be damned. So, with a smirk I headed back to my room to sleep. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next day.
I woke up that morning to find the arrow Sanin, which is what I decided to call him, dragging me out of bed as he complained about my lack of an alarm clock. Who needs an alarm clock? I mumbled tiredly. Obviously you, he shouted, making me win slightly. It's 8.45 in the morning, you were supposed to be at the beach at 8. But seriously, I don't need an alarm clock with you around. And how do you think that? You're loud, annoying, and tell me the time. All right, smartass, who woke you up for the academy? I highly doubt Aruka would stop his whole class just to drag you out of bed. My alarm clock. Where is it? He demanded again. How am I supposed to know? It was here when I left, I answered with a shrug. It was obviously frustrating him but he deserved it if he was yelling at me before breakfast. Someone must have snatched it. And you didn't lock your door because... Oh yes, because locking the front door is ever so helpful in a village full of ninja, I stated sarcastically. All the thieves would come up to the door with all their tools, find the door locked and yell, damn, it's locked. Too bad I don't have a lock picking jutsu. Or lock picks, or a hairpin, then turn around and leave. Okay, but why an alarm clock? Look around and tell me if you see anything else of any value in here because if you do, I'll surely return it to the thief that dropped it. Alright, I get it, the Sanin relented. Get dressed so we can leave. I am dressed. Those are the same clothes you wore yesterday. And how can you tell that? I asked Riley, since all my clothes were either those jumpsuits or PJS. They still smell of salt water. I sniffed my shirt curiously only to wince away at the strange smell of salt and sweat. So get changed into something clean. This is the cleanest one I have. There was a stunned silence for several seconds before I spoke again. I didn't have time to do laundry before I left so everything that was a little dirty at the start of the exam is now really dirty. You have to be kidding me. Nope. Fine. Then the first order of business is for you to collect all those jumpsuits of yours while I try to figure out how to make doing laundry a training exercise, he half ordered me. As his footsteps began to recede from the room and towards the kitchen. Can you make some breakfast while you're in there? I called, climbing up off the floor. Why should I? Because I work a lot better on a full stomach. I heard him muttering as he started going through my cupboards. While he was preoccupied in the other room, I found my basket and began searching for the four other jumpsuits I knew to be scattered across the floor. I had to sweep my hands across the ground, picking up whatever fabric I touched. I kept count of the different pieces I picked up, hoping I could find them all before he came back. When I was relatively positive I had everything, I picked up the basket and carried it down the hall, careful to drag the corner of my box across the wall so I knew where it was. Are you done yet? The Sanin shouted down the hall, which turned out to be right in front of me. I don't know, am I? I said sarcastically. Shut it Gaki, he said. Before I could say anything in response I was hit in the head by something. The object dropped into my basket as I stood there stunned. What was that for? That's your breakfast, be happy, he grumbled before a hand was placed on my shoulder. We're running late so I'm just going to Shinshunas there. Okay. There was a swoosh and my feet found themselves buried in the sand. I put down my clothes as he began explaining my laundry-based chakra exercise. Apparently I was to stand on the water while I scrubbed my clothes against a rock, if I understood him correctly. Wouldn't it be easier to put it into the washer? I asked after I finished whatever it was that I ate. Couldn't you have done that last week? I was busy, I complained but he didn't say anything back. I figured he was ignoring me so no matter what I said, it wouldn't change his mind. So with a sigh, I got to work. It was pretty difficult having to stay balanced on the water while being distracted with figuring out how to clean my clothes. It took me until a little afternoon before all my clothes were drying on the rocks, including most what I was wearing. When we sat down for lunch, I was wearing my boxers and pants, which were both soaked from falling in the water so often. That took longer than expected, Jiraiya said. It wouldn't have if you put them in the washer, I shot back, flopping into the sand near where he's been sitting the whole time. I was pretty sure he was facing towards me, 
but just to cover my tracks I laid down pretending to stare at the sky. Oh well, it's time for lunch anyways, he said over the rustle of plastic. Sandwich. Yes, I'm starving. All right, hold your horses, he stated as he started making the sandwiches. There was silence for a bit before shouting, catch. Knowing I couldn't catch it, I didn't even bother to try. Instead I waited for it to thunk into the sand on my right before picking it up. Why didn't you catch it? Didn't feel like it, I said as I took a bite. It tasted alright, as long as I ignored the gritty sand flavor that was clinging to it. So you'd rather eat a sand-covered sandwich than be bothered to catch it? I guess so. You've been hanging around the Nara lately, haven't you? We traveled with him a bit in the forest of death. Why? Thought as much, he stated not answering my own question. The plastic rustled again as I can only imagine he was making his own sandwich. Eat up, the real work starts as soon as we're done here. Hi, Erosenin, I said, eagerly taking another bite of my lunch. We were quiet for a while we ate, giving me plenty of time to think on what Kakashi had said about coming up with a sight substitute. I had no idea how I could do this, I didn't even know if there was a substitute for sight. I was about halfway through my lunch when an idea hit me. I had a sensei here for a reason, he had to know something that I could use or he shouldn't be a sensei. Feeling clever, I turned towards where I knew he was and asked. Hey sensei, he grunted in response. Do you think there could ever be a blind ninja? What, where did that come from? He asked, still somehow sounding surprised when speaking around his food. Well, when I was in the forest for the exam, I thought I couldn't see and freaked out. Kakashi said that it was a genjutsu from a jealous team so I'm alright now, but it made me curious, I said, rushing through the cover story from earlier to get to the good stuff. I mean, what if it hadn't been a genjutsu? What if I had really went blind? Would I have still been able to be a ninja? I don't know, he finally answered, after thinking on it for a few seconds. He swallowed his mouthful and continued talking. I haven't heard of one before but, then again, I don't know everything. It's possible that a ninja existed that was blind. They would have to have their other senses be really strong or somehow come up with a way to compensate. Though, the second would be more likely unless they were blind from birth. But how would he do that? I don't know, he said around another bite of food. Echo location maybe. Echo what? Echo location, it's something bats use to see in the dark. They make sounds and it bounces off their surroundings back to them so they know what it looks like. Cool, I exclaimed happily, do you think I could do the same thing with Chakra? Probably, but why would you want to? He stated suspiciously, but before I could come up with an answer he did so for me. Wait, you're going against Neji in the finals. He has the Byakugan, which, if I know the Hyugas, he's going to rely on pretty heavily. You're wondering if you can create something similar to level the playing field, aren't you? Huh, oh, yeah, you caught me, I said after a moment, his reason sounding a lot better than anything I would have come up with. I thought it would really freak him out. It will be the best prank ever. Do you think it will work? It's possible, I'd imagine you'd have to really crack down on your chakra control but I think it's doable. Sweet, I exclaimed happily, shooting to my feet. I'm going to start right now. I ran off towards the sound of water before realizing something important and having to run back. Realized you don't know how, huh, he said clearly amused. I nodded sheepishly, you want it separate from your eye, correct? Yeah. Okay then, this is what we'll do then, Jiraiya said after a moment of thought. You're going to need a focal point. A focal point. A place on your body where you'll emit the chakra waves. It should probably be close to your eyes so your vantage point will be similar. He scratched his chin as he explained. It should probably be located on your forehead or between your eyes. But it can't be hidden by anything because it might mess with your readings. But why does that matter now? We're just working on chakra control. Yes, but while we're doing that we should get your body used to emitting chakra from that spot so it will be easier later on. I nodded in understanding. 
Are you going to be wearing those goggles from now on? Yes, I like them. Okay then, the focus point should probably be right there. He poked my forehead right in the half an inch between my goggles and my hit I ate. Unless you'll be moving the forehead protector somewhere else. Nope that will work, I answered cheerfully. How do I do this? With this, there was a bit of a rustle as he obviously held up something that I couldn't see. You have to focus your chakra and to make this leaf stick to your forehead. What, that's it? Yes that's it, he said, obviously mocking me. Simple but effective. Baruka tried to get a bunch of us to do that when we were in the academy, I said, thinking back a bit. I thought he was crazy. Nope, he was actually giving you a good chakra control exercise. Probably shouldn't have ditched the detention then, huh? Just get to work. End chapter 10. Hope you all enjoyed this what if and if you did then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. See you all in the next video. This is part 5 of what if Naruto lost his sight. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. I'm happy people seem to be enjoying this what if. Start chapter 12. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 11. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Three hours later. This isn't working, I exclaimed angrily as I felt the leaf slip off my forehead for, what seemed to be, the millionth time that day. You obviously aren't trying hard enough, my sensei said, being no help whatsoever. I am, it's just keeps falling off. I glared at where I felt the leaf land on my leg, hoping my gaze would set the damn thing on fire. It shouldn't be, this exercise is easier than tree climbing and water walking, you shouldn't be having any trouble with this. Yeah, well I am. I could hear my sensei humming in thought as he processed this. Naruto, I have a theory but I'm going to need to test it out. Why do I have a bad feeling about this? Drama queen, it's not like it's going to hurt, he huffed indignantly before continuing. I just need you to try the water walking exercise again. Why, I asked slowly, I already did that. Do you want to find out what's wrong or not? Fine, whatever. I got to my feet and followed the sound of moving water towards the source. Once my toes touched the chilled liquid, I focused chakra into my feet and stepped out towards the lake. Only to fall straight through the surface. I came to the surface spitting the mineral water I didn't expect to be breathing today. Let me try that again. I climbed out of the water and readied myself once again, but when I tried to walk on the water, I fell through the surface yet again. I tried this repeatedly, each time falling into the lake as if I wasn't using chakra at all. What the hell is this? I demanded, once again soaked. Just as I thought, something to do with your chakra search control got messed up between now and lunchtime. And how the hell can that happen in three hours? Good question, I'm not sure, but whatever it is can probably be solved through meditation. I gave him a blank look, causing the man to sigh. You do know what meditation is, right? It's something to do with monks. Why didn't I expect this? Anyways, chakra is a mix of your physical and spiritual energies, right? I nodded. Then it should be easy to understand that if there is a miscommunication between the two they would not work correctly. Meditation will help you find these flaws, which allows you to fix them. Do you understand now? I guess. He sighed again sounding as if he was about to try and dumb it down even more. But before he could do so I interrupted him. Just tell me how to meditate already, will ya? I don't have forever you know. And the world doesn't revolve around you, if you haven't noticed already, Jiraiya said. It should, my hair's twice as bright as that self-important sun. Do you want to know how to meditate or not? If it will help, I shrugged as he grumbled about ungrateful brats. The trick to meditation is to be absolutely still while thinking of nothing. How the hell do you expect me to do that? Oh yeah, you have attention problems don't you? If I read your file correctly it has something to do with excess chakra. Am I right? I don't know, I never paid attention to those boring doctors. 
That's a yes then. There was an uncomfortable silence as I fidgeted in place. I guess he was thinking but not hearing anything coming from his direction made me nervous. After about 30 seconds of this, I'd finally had enough. So, how does this meditation thingy work if I can't even focus for ramen? Try to work through it. You might not be able to keep your attention normally, but you're also the most stubborn kid I've seen so far. For a moment, I tried to figure out if this was a compliment or an insult but decided that it didn't really matter. Since as of right now, your chakra search control problems are more important than your attention issues, I'm sure you can overcome it. I thought you said not to focus on anything. Relatively, you either focus on one thing or nothing. I guess I can try. I scratched my head in thought. Then let's get started then, he said, almost excited. Sit cross-legged, close our eyes, and focus on chakra search control. Is that all? To start with, yes. By doing so you should be able to tune out the real world until you're not even aware of it anymore. At this point, you'll enter what's called your mindscape, if you do it right, that is. From there you will have to look around and find what's wrong. And how will I know what's wrong? I asked, my mind still trying to catch up with him. You just will, was the only answer I got. As long as you don't fall asleep. I won't, Dadboyo. I settled into the cross-legged position, closed my eyes, and tried to focus. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Two hours later. I now had three sore lumps on my head from where Jiraiya hit me for falling asleep. I've no idea how he could tell the difference, though it might have something to do with waking up with my face in the sand. Regardless, I was having trouble doing what Aero Sanin had suggested. I just couldn't keep my thoughts focused on what I needed to. I sighed and tried to focus again, despite how troublesome it was, it needed to be done. I sat there for a couple minutes, trying and failing quite miserably. I was just wondering if I'd be able to con Jiraiya into more ramen when I felt my body pitch forward. My eyes snapped open on reflex as I tumbled towards the ground. There was a flash of color before my face made contact with water. It wasn't the mineral water that I had tasted most of the day yesterday, it was foul and felt almost slimy to the touch. I shot to my feet, sputtering as I attempted to get the taste out of my mouth. I was trying to physically wipe it away when I noticed something. I could see. It was a dark sewer-like place, but I could see it. I could see the murky waters whose taste I was trying to scrape off my tongue. I could see the brick walls surrounding me. I could see. A large cage at the end of the corridor that probably shouldn't be there. Once I got over my excitement, my curiosity then took over, I waded through the ankle-deep water towards the cage. When I was closer, I saw a pair of glowing red eyes glaring at me. I stopped short, trying to figure out what it could be. Hurry up, I don't have all day, a deep, rumbling voice grumbled from behind the bars. Startled, I stepped back. Wrong way. Why should I get any closer? What am I going to do, eat you? Sorry but you humans taste disgusting. Too many cosmetics. This didn't make me want to get any closer. I mean, yeah he said we taste nasty but that means he still ate one. Oh stop being a coward already. We have things to discuss. I don't even know who you are. I knew you were an idiot but I didn't think you were this bad, his voice grumbled, extremely annoyed. Seriously, how many voices do you have in your head? I didn't think I had any. Did you really think I wouldn't show up in your mindscape? No wonder this place is a dump. Wait, this is my mindscape? Yes, it is. So I did that meditation thing correctly. Nope, I got tired of waiting and brought you here. I moped a while, not liking that I failed at something. Are you done yet? Why do you care? I thought I finally did it only to find out you did it for me. I looked at him curiously, just realizing something. Who are you again? Oh, come on, I'm the damn Kyubi you disrespectful little human. The Kyubi, I stepped back again in surprise. Yes, I'm the nine-tailed fox. So stop moving away, unless you don't trust the fort's handiwork. I trust it. Then what are you scared of? 
it's not like I'm going anywhere. I guess, I said, taking slow steps closer to the cage. Once I was about two yards away from the door, I stopped and studied the being behind the gate. He was obviously a fox, except I don't think I ever saw a fox three stories tall. His nine tails flicked behind him as he glared back at me. He was also completely covered in dark red fur. He laid on the ground, not even bothered by the water. Are we going to talk or are you going to stare at me all day? The fox asked flatly. I'm not the one that wanted to talk. You wanted to see if there's a glitch holding back your chakra search control, right? I nodded wearily. Same thing really. How could chakra search control and you be the same thing? Think about it. I gave him a confused look that earned a tired sigh from him. Hint, from here, I can mess with a lot of different stuff. Wait, I said slowly. My mind thought rapidly, ignoring the Kyubi saying something about smelling bacon. Did you mess with my chakra control? Took less time than I thought it would, he muttered to himself. But yes, I did. Why the hell did you do that? We need to talk and the best way to do that would be to get you to meditate. But you brought me here. Which I wouldn't have been able to do if you weren't at least trying. Really? Well, I guess I could call you over when you were sleeping but you'd think it was just a dream. Probably. I looked around the sewer-like setting, just happy I could see it. So, what are we talking about now? I have a proposition for you. I turned back towards the Kyubi studying him suspiciously. If you're trying to convince me to let you out. No, I'm well aware that won't happen, he said with an annoyed sigh. Instead I want to see outside. Quote dot dot, how? Through your senses. You want to tap into my senses to see outside? That's what I said, wasn't it? I'm blind. I know that, you idiot kit, he said with a huff. I want to know what's happening outside through your remaining senses. Why, I asked slowly, not trusting the fox as far as I could throw him. And since I can't throw a 30 feet tall animal, well you get the idea. Look around Kit, this isn't the most interesting place to be stuck for a lifetime. At least being allowed to experience what you're experiencing won't be as boring. Can't I just change the mindscape? Nope, this place personifies your experiences in life. You, yourself have no search control over it. What happens if I do let you? The seal will be a tad weaker but with me trapped into your mind, your senses will be sharper. They are already pretty sharp for some reason. That's the result of my chakra leaking into your system. If I'm in your mind, I can influence them directly and make it so you can hear a pin drop from half a mile away, feel ink words on a page. Even smell your beloved ramen shop from the gates of the village. It will be confusing for a while but you'll get used to it. What about Sakura's shouting? It already hurts my ears. Oh you're up a creek on that one. I'd just avoid her completely. Why would you do this? Increase my senses just for a glimpse of the world outside. I told you, I'm bored. That in the way you're going now, you'll die on your next mission. I don't feel like dying anytime soon and in order to avoid that, my vessel needs to be strong. So, you're doing this for yourself, I answered flatly. Of course, you humans aren't worth my time. I wouldn't be helping you if it didn't benefit me somehow. But, let me phrase it this way. You're already an idiot so if you remain weak from this, even if we don't end up dying, I'll be the laughing stock of the Baijus. I am the most powerful of them all, having a weak vessel would be an insult. You really are self-centered, aren't you? I'm a demon. What did you expect? He gave me this exasperated look before continuing. So, are you going to let me in or not? You could escape, couldn't you? Not really but I'll promise not to try if it makes you feel any better. I should believe you because. You oblivious, insolent kid. I'm a baiju, even if I wanted to lie I couldn't. Why not? The Rakuto Senen knew our chakra would make us thirst for power. If left alone we would take over you mortals through trickery. So, to allow you furless monkeys to retain your freedom, he made it so we could not lie. What does that have to do with not lying? Seneve, do you really think any leader does not have an ulterior motive? 
You can't rule a country on truth alone. Also, it made it so we could not trick you as easily. But you can still trick people. Right, twisting a few words here and there, making it seem like something other than what I'm really saying. How do I know you're not fooling me now? Because if I was I'd make it seem like I could give you your sight back. But I can't do that. Oh, I thought for a moment, debating on whether I wanted to act on the idea coming to mind. How good are you at twisting the truth? I've had hundreds of years of practice kit, I'm the best. If I do this for you, I want you to teach me how to do that. The damn fox scoffed at the idea. Do you really expect me to go along with this? Yes, unless you don't want to know what happens outside till I die of old age. I earned a glare as he thought through it seriously this time. Why do you want to learn this, and from me no less? Because I'm a horrible liar. I can be seen through like a window. That's for sure. So, if I can't lie, maybe I can do what you do. If not, they're going to find me out fairly quickly. You're already doing it, not to my level but you have the basics. Distraction, engaging emotions, even acting like an idiot is all fairly good tactics, for you at least. He sat there in silence for a moment, trying to decide. Well, I suppose I could teach you. I didn't think the small senses boost would convince you anyways. Seriously, Arigato. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Just put some chakra through the seal in front of you and it will lessen itself. I nodded and stepped forward and placed my hand on the seal with a small amount of chakra in it. Good, that's enough. Any more and the warden will show up. Warden. You'll meet him eventually, I assume. Well, thanks, I suppose. You can leave now. Wait, I can't meditate. How can you teach me if I can't meditate? A creepy grin spread across his face making me almost sorry I asked. You'll see, now get out. A wind blew through the passage, throwing me through a pair of double doors that appeared. End chapter 11. Start chapter 12. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 12. Anyways, hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. I opened my eyes, my mood crushed as the black void stared me down once again. It was about then that the world around me became amplified. I could smell the grass in the field as if I was laying in it, I could hear birds in the forest. I almost literally felt every piece of sand digging into my back. The fox wasn't kidding when they said my senses were a lot stronger. Especially considering there wasn't a hint of a forest or meadow when I passed out. Naruto, are you alright? Hands grabbed onto my shoulders, shaking me to get my attention. He sounded extremely loud, and somewhat worried, which probably had something to do with the fact that I was now on the ground. Shush, I whispered despite my ears claiming otherwise. According to them I was almost shouting. Don't you shush me, Gaki. And why are you whispering? Because you're too damn loud. I was talking normally. And it's too loud. Fine, how's this? His voice dropped to an acceptable level, about the same as mine. I nodded and sat up so I was sitting cross-legged. Now tell me what happened. Well, the Kyubi was blocking my chakra search control, which is what you suspected, right? There was a small swoosh of hair that I would have never heard before my new hearing. I assumed that he was nodding so I continued. Well, he did it to get my attention. Apparently he wanted to gain access to my senses. Why would he want that? My sensei sounded worried but was trying not to let me know. For this reason, I was starting to like these new senses. Why does anyone do anything? He was bored. Naruto, people don't do stuff because they're bored. Really? Yes, there are reasons other than boredom. But if the world was never bored, they wouldn't think of other things to do. Heck war probably wouldn't even exist because no one would be bored enough to start anything. So, your plan for world peace is to keep everyone entertained. Yep. I don't want to know how you came up with that, he muttered to himself. Anyways, back to what happened. Okay, well he was bored so he wanted to see, and hear, what was happening so it wasn't so boring. In return he gave me my search control back as well as heightened senses. 
So that's why we're whispering. Yay, I decided to purposely leave the secondary deal out of my explanation. It would be best if he didn't know I was being taught by him. That's all. Heightened senses and chakra search control for a view of the outside world. Seems a little unequal. He's right, you know. I shrieked as I looked around for the owner of the voice before remembering I couldn't see anything to begin with. Totally unfair on my part. Though your reaction might have just leveled the scales for me. What the hell, I exclaimed, finding myself on my feet. I tried to ignore my own volume, intent on figuring out what the heck just happened. Quiet down, not only is it a literal pain, but you're making a spectacle of yourself. You didn't tell me about this. You didn't ask. You should have told me. And miss out seeing this. I think not. Naruto, are you alright over there? Jiraiya must have thought I was losing my mind at this point. Yes, I'm fine, or as fine as I can be now that the Kyubi can talk in my mind. He's speaking in your mind, Jiraiya said slowly. Yes, and he's annoying. Oh, and you're not. I'm not talking to you. There was a strained silence outside my head as that damn fox laughed on the inside. How much did you loosen that thing? Not enough to call the warden, I spoke meekly. What the hell does that mean? Oh, never mind, just show me the seal. I nodded and channeled Chakra into the seal. He thought for a while before he spoke again. Well, you didn't break it, that's good. There's no extra Baiju Chakra in your system either. The only thing you changed was opening a passage to your mind so he can access it. Best advice I have for you is to ignore him and not let him convince you of anything. Damn, there goes my plan to have you to take over Konoha for a bowl of ramen. I'd probably work better than a Klondike bar. What, I wouldn't do that, even if there is ramen. How about for two bowls of ramen? No. Three. I thought you said you couldn't lie. Your point. I wasn't lying, I thought about it for about 30 seconds until I figured your damn conscience would get in the way. Or I couldn't get enough ramen to bribe you. Both. You know, you can talk to me without physically speaking, right? I gawked as Jiraiya tried to get my attention but was failing. Why didn't you tell me this before? Because watching you make a fool of yourself is the highlight of my day. If I ever meet the fourth I'm going to slug him for making me put up with you, I thought not thinking he could hear me. I was wrong. I am defiantly bringing popcorn for that. I was about to say something in response when I was shook out of my thought. Naruto, Jiraiya shouted, giving me a shake as if to wake me up. I was starting to get used to the volume but I still stumbled back and covered my ears. Itai, damn it sensei, don't be so loud. I winced at the volume of my own voice. Damn it, I don't need to be so loud either. What the hell was that? His volume was lower but I could still hear the concern in his voice. Kayubi being an ass. Are you sure you're alright with this? Oh yeah, I'm fine. Though I might go crazy before I get to fight Neji. If you do, my job will be complete. I paused debating on whether to confront him now but deciding against it. That wasn't the time for such things. But don't worry, I'm going to ignore him. A lot. You can try. Are we done for today? I asked Jiraiya, trying to get off the topic. We still have several hours left of daylight and you want to stop now. Yep, my senses are going crazy. I don't think I'd be able to focus even if I wanted to. I suppose giving you the rest of the day to get used to them will be alright. Be ready by 8 tomorrow morning. Sounds good. I turned to leave only to trip over something, sending me sprawled face first into the sand. I tried to scramble to my feet but ended up catching my foot again before I was even up. I sat up slowly, spitting sand out of my mouth. I was sure that Aerosanin figured out my secret by that stunt alone. There was no other way for him to interpret it. Jishgaki, if your senses are that warped, you could have just said so. I blinked. Huh. So distracted you forgot your clothes and can't even walk straight. I heard his feet walk away through the sand, pick something up, and walk back. Before I could figure out what he picked up, I got hit with a pile of fabric. Get your shirt on and I'll take you home. Seriously, 
I felt more surprised that he didn't figure it out than the fact he was solving my problem for me. What? You think I'm just going to leave you there? I'm not that cruel. He huffed in annoyance as he headed away again. I stayed still for a moment listening to what he was doing, which sounded like he was putting something away. This meant he wasn't watching me so, if I was quick, I could put the rest of my, still damp, clothes on before he could see my process. I quickly felt through the clothes and found one of my t-shirt. I then figured out which way it went and put it on. Once my arms were in the right spots, I felt a bit excited for my success even if the shirt felt a bit strange. It's strange because it's on backwards. Damn, I whispered before slipping my arms out and turned the shirt around so it was correct. Okay, let's go, Jiraiya said from in front of me. I sat there confused for a moment as I tried to figure out what was going on. Are you coming or would you rather walk back yourself? Wait, you're going to carry me. It's better than you getting distracted and walking into a tree. Again. Again. Oh, never mind. I don't want to know. Just get up already. I nodded, getting to my feet and climbed onto his back. Thanks Aero Sanin. Yeah, don't get used to it, he muttered to me. I'm not going to do this again. If you say so, I smirked as he started walking, already planning ways to get him to do this again. I would need several of them if I was to have a way home every day. Just work yourself to exhaustion every day, you're good at that. Good idea, I thought back, earning an exaggerated sigh from Kayubi. I was mocking you, Baka. I know, but it's still a good idea. I could heard him grumbling to himself in my mind. I grinned happily at the thought that I annoyed him for a change. Exclamation mark. Twenty minutes later. Here ya go Gaki. Jiraiya placed me on the ground and handed me my laundry basket. I'm sure you can get up the stairs yourself. Yeah, I'll be fine from here. Arigato Aero Sanin. See you tomorrow, I'm off to do some research. The way he said, research, made it sound like something perverted. Is that what you were doing yesterday? Um, I'm going to leave now. There was a, poof, indicating his departure, making me sigh. Why does everyone shun away when I'm talking? They can't get away from you fast enough on foot. I felt a tick mark appear as I started chanting something about ignoring him. I calmed down a bit and started moving forward towards where I thought was the stairs. I was just wondering how I was going to find them then my foot banged into something, almost sending me and my clothes to the ground. Found them, I muttered. I glared as I tried to ignore the laughter echoing through my head. Shut up. I struggled up the stairs, trying to remember how many steps there were but despite having climbed as thousands of times, I couldn't remember. I ran my hand up the railing, starting to count the steps for future reference. Unfortunately it didn't do any good because I lost count halfway through due to the fox shouting random numbers close to the one I was at. Damn it, I exclaimed as I tripped on the missing step. Apparently the staircase ended sooner than I thought. Now I have to count again. Sucks to be you. What's your problem? I demanded as I dragged my basket against the wall again. Problem, I didn't know I was the one with the problem. You're the one talking to yourself after all. I glared as I walked towards my apartment. It was the third door so I didn't need to count much. What would your neighbors think? Well, if I had neighbors they'd probably think I was crazy but thanks to you no one wants to live near a demon. Kid, you're no demon. You couldn't be even if you tried. Too soft-hearted. Thank Cammy for that, I muttered. Finding my door, I opened it and somehow tripped over the threshold sending my clothes flying as I landing on wooden floor. I didn't bother to move as I continued questioning the fox. But seriously, why are you tormenting me so badly? Do you really hate me that much? My freedom was taken from me under false pretenses, what do you think? But the fourth did that not me. Yes, but a prisoner hates the bars that hold him as much as the man that put there. I guess that makes sense, I said after a moment. But still, there are a million different ways you could show it. Out of all of them, why did you choose pranking, it's kinda immature. You're one to talk. I'm twelve, pranking is in my job description. 
You're hundreds of years old, what's your excuse? There's a reason why all your human folklore contain trickster fox demons. It's what we do, and I haven't pranked anyone in about a hundred years. Needless to say, I've missed it. Let me get this straight, you're pranking me because you can't prank anyone else. That's about it. And there's nothing I can do about it. Not a thing. I was quiet for a moment as I thought. What if I start pranking again? Idiot, how's that supposed to work? You can experience what I am doing right. So wouldn't that mean if I'm pranking someone then, for the most part, you would be too? There was silence on the other end of the line, making me think that I was wrong when. Son of a bitch, he cursed loudly. Why didn't I think of this? Because I'm awesome. You're lucky, that's all, he murmured angrily. So, I get my prank fix, you get to do the pranking, and the not-so-innocent third party you will most likely target will get what they deserve. I guess that's what you call a triple win scenario. So it will work. Only if the pranks are high quality, not paint buckets over the door or itching powder down someone's shirt. Those are all academy student tricks that don't even deserve to be called a prank. I will only accept fantastically orchestrated works of art. At least once a week. That's a lot. I suppose I could assist you as needed. Just watching isn't much fun anyways. Sounds good I guess, but I'm allowed that consecutive license thing, right? Creative license, and yes, as long as you earn it. They don't just give those things away you know. I guess there's only one question left. Who's first? Both of us were silent as we tried to figure out who deserved our first, come back, prank. There were many different choices, but none of them seemed worthy of this first one. Well, until there came a knock on the door. Uzumaki Naruto, I know you're in there. The voice called between bangs on the door. Still avoiding training I see. How are you supposed to learn anything if you avoid your sensei? Ebisu, I asked silently, earning a throaty chuckle from my tenant. A sly smile spread across my face. He will do. Exclamation mark. Ten minutes later. Sensei, Sarutobi looked up from his paperwork to see his student sitting in the open window. Jiraiya, will you stop using my window as a door? There is a difference, he chastised as he turned back to the papers in front of him. Difference, I don't see one. The only difference I see is that the window is always open. He grinned as he jumped down from the ledge. But I'm here for more serious matters. What's that? He asked condescendingly. And if it's about that proposition to make all bathhouses co-ed then I'm going to ask if we do this another time. I'm actually quite busy. No, it's about Naruto. This got his attention, making him look up from his desk and even set down his pen. You know I'm training him. Right. I'm aware. Well, his chakra system got messed up today for no reason, so I had him do some meditation, thinking the Kyubi was behind it. Was it? Yes, now Naruto has made a deal with the fox to get it back along with enhanced senses. And what possessed him to think this is a good idea? I have no idea. Then we should keep a really good eye on him in case the seal weakens. I will, but I wasn't finished yet. Sarutobi raised an eyebrow. This deal made it so the Kyubi can now converse with him mentally. There was silence in the room as he thought this through. Are you joking? No, the Baiju isn't manipulating him directly, just tormenting him and seems to enjoy it, if Naruto's reactions say anything. Well, I suppose it could be worse, the Hokage said as he sat back in his chair and thought. If he's actually conversing with him, even in a tormenting manner, then he's not as out of search control as he was 12 years ago. This could be a good thing. I don't see how sensei. With Naruto's habit of turning enemies into friends, he might just befriend the Kyubi. That would make things a lot easier. Yes, but wouldn't it make Naruto more inclined to listening to it as well? The Baiju could make him do something horrible by convincing him it was a good thing. I doubt Naruto is that susceptible. Just as he finished saying that they heard a tortured scream from the village. They spun around to stare out the window, appalled at what they saw. Down in the streets Ebisu was running through the village with a copy of what looked like Ika Ika Paradise stuck to his hands. 
He was so obsessed with trying to remove the book that he didn't seem to notice the paper saying, I'm a pervert, that was attached to his back, or the, kick me, sign right under it. Neither of the two men had to wonder why he was running as they saw the group of irate women chasing after him with a variety of different makeshift weapons. In the front of this mob was an orange-clad, pigtailed blonde with familiar whisker marks that was leading the charge while standing in a cart that was being pulled by Konohamaru and his two friends. You were saying, Jiraiya asked as the impromptu parade made its way through the village, picking up more participants as it went. That you should keep a really good eye on him just in case, he thought for a moment as Ebisu tripped over a sign in the road and ended up getting caught by the group. And don't give him a reason to do that to you. Will do. End chapter 12. This is the end of part 5 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Peace out. This is part 6 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Blindsided by Twice the Trouble. Chapter 13. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next day. Get up. I heard Jiraiya state as the covers disappeared from by bed. You're late again. Five more minutes, I murmured back, rolling over to face the wall. No, you're getting up now. Before I knew it, I was pulled off my bed by my shirt. The short tumble to the ground woke me up quick. What the hell, I demanded, sitting up. You're late and you sleep like a rock, he stated as footsteps began to lead out of the room. Seriously, you wear those goggles to bed? Forgot about them, I said, scratching the back of my head as my drowsiness started kicking back in. Get dressed, we're leaving in five. And don't say you're already dressed, I don't care what you wear to bed but you're wearing clean clothes to training, is that clear? Yeah. And you better be ready to train today because you're not getting out early this time. I was just trying to figure out where my clothes were when his footsteps stopped. Why are your clothes in the living room? I dropped them, I said, walking towards the door only to catch my shoulder on door frame. Are you somehow incapable of walking straight in the mornings? You can't be that tired. What did you expect? I muttered, making my way towards where he was. Maybe that my student would be a little more bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, he answered as I got to the living room. Train a squirrel. Huh. I didn't say anything else as I found my clothes and dragged the basket back down the hallway towards my room. I could hear him muttering something about disrespectful brats as he rummaged through my kitchen. Once I was back I searched through the clothes to find a shirt, pants, and a jacket. When I finally found one of each I thought briefly about taking a shower but decided to save that inevitable torture for later today. At least then there wouldn't be anyone here to witness me fumbling with the knobs. So I got dressed, happy for once that the jumpsuits were all the same so I didn't have to explain why nothing matched. It was still hard to figure out what was what but at least it was getting easier. I figured out that if I can just find the tags on the fabric I can ensure that I'm at least putting everything on straight and right side out. After zipping up my coat I started shuffling back towards the kitchen. I pretended to be slightly more tired than I was to keep the clumsy excuse as long as I could. Here, Jiraiya said grumpily. I heard something go flying before a rectangle object connected with my face and dropped to the ground at my feet. He sighed, eat it and we'll leave. If your crippling exhaustion isn't cured by that then I'm going to have to shove coffee down your throat. You don't want to do that, I told him as I grabbed my granola bar and sat at the kitchen table. It makes me hyper. Never mind then, he said after a moment of thought. Oh and this was on your doorstep, I think it says it's from Kakashi. Something plastic was placed on the table before being slid across the surface towards me. I held my hand out to where I thought it was coming only to have to hide my excitement when it actually connected. I held it up in front of my eyes, pretending to examine it as I ran my fingers around the box. It was a plastic square about three inches with a thick piece of paper tied to it. 
I ran my thumb over the paper, figuring that there was something written on it that I couldn't see. I was just debating whether to be mad with him when I felt letters indented into said paper. I wasn't sure what it said but I really couldn't decipher it now with Jiraiya here. Setting the box aside, I picked my breakfast back up and began eating it. Aren't you going to open it? Later, I answered around a bite of granola bar. It's not inappropriate is it? He asked, his tone suddenly serious. I swallowed my food as I thought of what to say. Like what? I tried to look confused, like I felt, but with the Kayubi laughing in the background it was kinda hard to do so. Never mind, I don't think I want to know. Here. I slid the box back across the table, glad to hear it tap into his hand a few seconds later. You open it. I will then. His fingers made a slight sound as he picked up the box. I could hear him fiddling with the paper for a moment before he spoke. The note says that, I heard about your training. This should help keep you on time. Huh, whatever it is, he probably re-gifted it. There was a sound of plastic sliding against plastic before one piece clanked onto the table. It's a watch, Jiraiya said after a moment of silence. A watch? Yeah a watch, a plain old watch, another, heavier piece of plastic tapped onto the table before a rustle of paper was heard. It was quiet again as he no doubt read whatever was on it then whistling in an impressed tone. You know how I said it was plain. Yeah. Forget I said that, this thing is not plain. It's basically a mobile alarm clock. He paused like he was reading a little further. It has a settable alarm of course, a stopwatch, it even vibrates once every hour instead of beeping. Why would it do that? I asked in fake curiosity. You're a ninja, idiot. If you're hiding you don't want your watch to give you away with a beep. It even has raised numbers so you can check the time without looking at it. You know, in case it's dark where you're hiding. How do you know that's what it's used for? Says so in the instructions. Anyways, that sensei of yours spoils you, kid. Nah, he's probably trying to make up for the fact he couldn't train me this month. Couldn't he have just treated you to ramen? You haven't seen how much of that stuff I can eat have you? I took the late bite out of my breakfast and crumbled up the wrapper. I'd bet the watch was cheaper. That can't be possible. You wanna test it? I asked eagerly, forgetting to act tired at the possibility of ramen. He must have seen my sly grin and reconsidered. No thanks. Damn, so close. Alright, you seem to be awake enough now, Jiraiya said, his chair creaking as he got to his feet. Let's go so we can get started. What are we doing today? If I told you you'd run. I suddenly had an uneasy feeling as he shunshined us away to the training grounds. Somehow I knew this was going to turn out to be something closer to a torture session than a day of training. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. A few days later. Why? I demanded as I laid on the ground, too exhausted to move. Why do you torture me? Because I can, Jiraiya said with an audible smirk. Because it's fun, the Kayubi piped up happily. You didn't even do anything. I haven't, well I guess I'm going to have to change that. I groaned as I heard him start to plot things that he could do to join in on the torture. But seriously, Jiraiya stated. This will really help you. How is trying to keep five leaves stuck to my forehead supposed to fix a jutsu that doesn't work? There's nothing wrong with the mechanics of the jutsu. It should work, so the problem must be with you. And, since your chakra search control is still garbage, I figured that was the missing link. Did it have to be done sitting on the lake? Yes, again you need to work on your search control. And the weights around my ankles. What were they for, other than trying to drown me that is? It would be too easy without them. Whatever, I'm hungry. You're always hungry, he grumbled. I'm a growing boy, aren't I supposed to be? Fine, take this, with a sigh, I heard him fumble with his pocket for a moment before something went flying towards me. Deciding to experiment a bit, I reached my arm into the air where I thought it would be. This time when the rectangle-shaped parcel hit my hand I couldn't resist the cheer came out. Why are you cheering? Jiraiya asked, making me freeze. I had no idea what I was going to tell him, 
my mind was completely blank of excuses. It shouldn't be, I've been coming up with excuses all along, but now there was absolutely nothing. What other reason could I have for cheering other than the real one? Isn't this why you wanted my help? The Kayubi asked slyly. Oh yeah, what do I do? Call me the great Kayubi-sama and I might help you. This isn't time to joke around. Who said I'm joking? There was a mental silence between them as I tried to figure out what he was playing at. You can't be serious. I'm not doing that. Looks like your sensei is starting to get suspicious. I think you've been quiet too long, Kit. At this rate he might figure it out for himself. Fine. Great Kayubi-sama. What the hell do I do? Not bad, but we'll have to work on the amount of sarcasm for next time. I'm glad you're pleased. Now help. Tell him you had your eyes closed and were experimenting with your new senses. That's all. Lesson 1. Keep it simple and as close to the truth as possible. Naruto. Jiraiya's voice sounded closer than before. Are you even there? Uh, yeah, I answered. Thinking back on what the Kayubi had just said, I figured out what to say next. The Kayubi was being a jerk again. He wanted me to call him the great Kayubi-sama. I shook my head in a disapproving manner. Did you ask me something Aero Senen? I'm offended, and slightly impressed. I hid a grin as Jiraiya asked his question again. I was wondering why you were cheering. I don't like being left out of the loop, especially if it's about something good. I caught the food, I answered, placing said object on my chest for safekeeping. Still not seeing the point. I didn't open my eyes. I wanted to see how good my hearing was, and judging by the fact I was able to catch it, it's pretty damn good. You picked up the sound of it going through the air right? Yeah, it's a faint sound, but it's there. Everything makes a sound if you listen hard enough. Impressive. I nodded a bit as I opened the granola bar and took a bite. Thanks, I said with my mouth full. Jiraiya hummed in acknowledgement as I continued eating. I was just finishing and was starting to doze off when my watch vibrated once to indicate the time. Well, I believe that was your watch saying it's 5 o'clock, Jiraiya said, sand crunching as he climbed to his feet. That means we're done for today. See you here at 8 o'clock sharp. Got that. I nodded tiredly, listening to the faint whoosh of him shunshuning away. It wasn't until a leaf from the technique landed on my nose that a thought hit me. I shot up straight, suddenly awake as I listened hard, hoping he was still in the area because I had no idea where I was. But that wasn't what worried me. What worried me was that I had no idea how to get home. Kuso, I swore, flopping back into the sand angrily when I didn't hear anything. What am I supposed to do now? I'm stuck at this beach, with no way home. I laid there silently, listening to the calm noises that surrounded me, Noises that I never would have heard before. Well, I guess it's not that bad. The sand's soft and warm, and I can always continue my training if I'm bored. Suddenly the calming sounds I was hearing were interrupted by my stomach growling loudly despite the granola bar. This led me to another realization that ruined everything. Damn it, I don't have any food. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next morning. Jiraiya made his way to the beach, hoping that the Gaki would be on time for once. He didn't have much faith though. After all, in the week he's been training him, the boy always had to be picked up in order to get him there. He had the feeling that the pint-sized ninja was doing this on purpose for whatever reason. He didn't want to even pretend he knew why, trying to understand that boy was like trying to understand why the sky was blue. He was sure someone could but he himself didn't have the patience to figure it out. Much to his surprise Naruto was there when he arrived five minutes before eight. He was lying in the sand in almost the exact position he left him in last night, except he was completely asleep. Jiraiya was just trying to figure out why the boy was here so early when he noticed that his clothes were damp. Not like he had jumped in the lake fully clothed but more like he had been laying there so long that the dew settled on him. Which would mean that the blonde never went home. Hey Gaki, Jiraiya said, trying to wake him up with an accompanying nudge of his foot. When he didn't respond, 
he lightly jabbed his toes between the boy's ribs, making him shoot upright. I don't want a search pink jumpsuit, he exclaimed, still half asleep. Gaki, what are you doing here? Naruto turned towards his sensei, staring at him blankly for a while before the question seemed to register. Huh, Jiraiya shook his head, assuming he was wrong about the registering part. Why are you sleeping on the beach? I was tired, he muttered in response. How long were you sleeping here? Don't know, how long were you gone? You spent the night here. It's morning already, Naruto mused as he stared up at the sky. He acquired a surprised look for a moment before continuing, sounding a little more awake. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I did. Why? Why what? Why did you sleep here? I was tired. Stop messing around, Jiraiya demanded, knocking the brat over the head. You're avoiding the question. Fine, Naruto grumbled as rubbed his head grumpily. I couldn't find my way home. Did your apartment move since you were last there? No, but I've never had to walk home after training so I don't know how to get there from here. His watch chose that moment to vibrate, demanding the blonde's attention. He glanced down at the face, rubbing a thumb over Tit almost adoringly as he began talking again. I've been stuck here for 15 hours with only that granola bar for food. It was horrible, I almost ate my jacket but it tasted horrible so I stopped. You're kidding. I don't joke around about food. The boy answered as he flopped back into the sand. Though, on the plus side I was able to train a bit more. I can now sit on the lake for about 20 minutes with six leaves on my forehead. Nice, huh, still can't get that jutsu to work though. Jiraiya didn't answer as he stared at the boy. How could he forget Naruto never walked home on his own? For a week now he carried him back to his small apartment, grumbling the whole way. With a sigh, he rooted through his pocket and found a few granola bars. Here kid, eat this, he said as he dropped them on the boy. He barely twitched, only glancing at them before flopping back into the sand. Seriously, I've been starving all night and this is all I get, the boy said, making Jiraiya wince a bit. Eat this now, and I'll buy you ramen after. Fine, he muttered, finally sitting up and grabbing one of the bars. But I better get at least 10 bowls out of this. Get you jutsu working and I'll pay for 15. Hi arrow senen. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Several hours later. Oh glorious ramen, how I've missed you. I exclaimed as I latched on to the counter dramatically. You were right, it did work. Of course it worked, the Kayubi said. I told you before. Invoking an emotional response makes them easier to manipulate. Guilt is one of the best to use in something like this. I'll keep that in mind. Just don't let them know you're guilt tripping them or it will backfire. Though I will admit, the jacket statement was a nice touch, it's not something I'd use but still. Thanks, I exclaimed happily. My smile widened as I let go of the countertop and sat down correctly. As if sensing my happiness at being praised, Kayubi spoke again. That doesn't mean you can slack off, you need a lot of work kit before you have even a fraction of the skill I have. Yeah, I know. Good to see you again Naruto, Aim said happily. What will you have today? Three miso ramens to start please. Will do, and I'll have my father put three more on when he's done with those like usual. Thanks Aim, I smirked to myself silently gloating at my ramen-flavored victory. Hey Naruto, did you ever get that book back? Aim asked after delivering the order to her father. Book. Yeah, that adventure novel. Tale of the gutsy whatever it was. With a start I remembered the book that was supposed to be acting as my attention decoy. The one I left here a week ago and was never able to come back for. But, before I could panic Jiraiya interrupted. Oh, oops completely slipped my mind, he said before hearing him root around in one of his pouches. Here you go Gaki. The hollow sound of a paperback book being dropped onto the counter could be heard. I quickly picked it up and examined it. Why did you have it? I'm sorry, I asked him to drop it off to you when he was here last week, Aim explained. I didn't think it would take as long as it did. That's alright, I said, 
sending her a reassuring smile in the process. Thanks for watching it for me. Shouldn't you thank your sensei? He watched it longer than I did. Yeah, she's right, you haven't been thanking me nearly enough lately, Jiraiya said. I thumbed through the pages, pretending not to hear them. Naruto, aim voice warned, her spatula thumping softly against the palm of her hand. I guess, I muttered, sticking my nose into a random page. Well, thanks Aero Senen, I said. I chuckled as I heard an annoyed sigh from my sensei. You're not going to let that go, are you? Nope. End of chapter 13. Start chapter 14. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 14. Anyways, hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. So, Jiraiya started as they waited for their meals. You're reading tales of the gutsy ninja, huh? The blonde looked up at him for a moment before turning back to the book. Yep. Liking it so far. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Lots of action. Jiraiya's ego inflated a bit, happy someone's enjoying it. What about the main character? I like him, he didn't even bother to look up this time. Very realistic. Good, good, anything. Familiar about him? No, why, his sensei stared at him with a look of true surprise. How could the boy not recognize his own name? He stared at Naruto for a while before noticing something, one thing that he should have noticed as soon as he opened the cover. The book was upside down. No, not reading, his head never moved not even a centimeter he turned the page, yes, but he never looked at both pages. He was pretending to read the book to cover something up. He could see now that Naruto was tense when, reading, like he was stressed. Oh. Nothing, Jiraiya watched the tension in his muscles disappear, confirming that the questions were to blame. By this time, Jiraiya had figured out what was wrong with the boy, but he had to make sure. So after making sure no one was looking, he waved a hand in front of his book. Naruto's head popped up for a moment, making Jiraiya think that maybe he was wrong. Kinda windy, Naruto said, turning back to the book. Jiraiya sighed getting up from his seat. Where are you going? Naruto looked up at him, confused. I have something I forgot to do earlier, he lied as he pulled some money out of his wallet. The girl came back balancing the three bowls. Jiraiya waited until she set the bowls down before handing her the bills. Here's the money for his food, just make sure to cut him off after ten. Oh come on, I worked hard enough for fifteen, didn't I? Naruto asked. Did your jutsu start working in the 20 minutes it took to get here? Quote dot dot, no. Then you get only 10. Okay, she gave him a kind smile before turning to Naruto. Here you go, Naruto. Yay, ramen, he shouted before putting his book down and digging into the ramen. Arigato sensei. You're welcome, see you tomorrow, the boy waved before turning back to his food. As soon as he was out of sight, even though he knew it wasn't really an issue at this point, he quickly shunshined away in search of someone. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. 30 minutes later. A half hour later, after searching three different training grounds, asking five different people of his whereabouts, and finally grilling his old sensei. He ended up in a desert-like training ground outside the village. From where he stood he could see Kakashi lounging against a rock as his minion ran laps consecutively. It wasn't long before Kakashi looked up from his Ika Ika book and waved lazily at the Sanin. Jiraiya waved back as he moved towards his student's student. Kakashi, it's been a while, he stated once he was close enough. Yes, it has, the two men shook hands. So how's the council's favorite student doing? Not bad, I suppose. Kakashi said, glancing towards the running team. I've had him running all week. Probably won't be able to get away with it much longer but I'm enjoying it for now. You'd make a good Nara. If I had more brain power, maybe. So what brings you here? Whatever do you mean? Jiraiya asked in fake naivety. You only go searching for people if you have urgent business with them, because if you didn't, you'd just wait for them to come home. You caught me, I wanted to talk to you about your student's eyes. 
Kakashi glanced at Sasuke in an almost silent question. Jiraiya answered in a whisper. Your other student. They stared at each other for almost a minute before Kakashi nodded then turned to talk to his student. Sasuke, I have to talk with this man for a moment. You're to continue your training till I get back. The boy gave him a look that said he was tired of this training. And if I find you had stopped, I'll have Anko join us again tomorrow. As soon as Anko's name was stated, the boy started running again, faster than before. You got Anko involved. She was bored and he didn't want to do my training, the man shrugged with a sly eye smile. Turns out she's a great motivator. So, you figured out about Naruto's sight deficiency? Kakashi asked, once they were out of sight and hearing range of the other student. Yep, he was reading my book and couldn't recognize his own name. Bit of a tip off if you ask me. Probably should have told him the basics when I gave him the book. So you're helping him hide it. Guilty as charged. Why did he decide to keep it secret? He doesn't want to lose his ninja certification. Jiraiya was silent for a moment to decide if it was a good enough excuse. Finding it acceptable he continued on with his questions. How many people know? As of right now, three. Jiraiya's jaw dropped. Not including Naruto. Are you counting me? Yes. I assume the Hokage is the other. Nope, Rin, Kakashi answered, making Jiraiya gawked at him for a bit. What? The Hokage doesn't know. No. Jiraiya ran a hand through his hair in thought before speaking again. And how long have you been keeping this a secret from your Hokage? A week and a half. Wait, how long has he been blind? A week and a half. There was silence as he tried to do the math. You mean to tell me that he was only blind for three or four days before duping me for a week straight? Kakashi nodded. I'm getting rusty. Or he's just really good at fooling people. There was an awkward silence. I'm really getting rusty. Actually, from what I've, he's actually improving in that area, Kakashi answered with a chuckle. Fairly quickly, I might add. Wonder who's training him because it sure ain't me, Jiraiya grumbled. Maybe he's figuring it out on his own, he has a pretty good reason to need to. A natural huh, Jiraiya said with an amused huff. I guess I made a good choice when I took him on as a student. I thought you weren't going to take on another apprentice after Minato-sensei. He's not my apprentice, but after what I just heard, I'm starting to seriously consider making him one. He'd be a great successor to keep my spy network running. With a bit of training, I have no doubt he would. If we can get him to overcome his blindness. Which is the main problem here? Jiraiya sat down on a rock with a sigh. How am I supposed to teach a boy who can't see? Same way you teach anyone else, he answered. Especially considering that he doesn't know you know. Just explain everything more thoroughly. Don't show him as much, but show some things so he doesn't think you know. Also give him a few hints towards a way he could make up for his eyes. And how do you know all this? I've been reading, he held up the Ika Ika book. I didn't think my books had that type of content in them. But it's good at hiding books that do. Kakashi peeled the book cover back, showing a book about the disabled. Found it in the library. Strange, never saw someone hide a different book in an Ika Ika cover. My books are usually the ones hiding. But wait, wouldn't the librarian be suspicious? Nope, I take out weird books all the time, she doesn't even look at the covers anymore. She's too busy flirting back at you to look at the books anyways. Am I right? What can I say, librarians are hot, he said with a shrug. And nurses, and shopkeepers, and waitresses, and... I get it, you flirt with anything female in a five-mile radius. You wanna read it? Sure, Jiraiya said with a shrug himself. If it can help, thanks. Just as Kakashi was about to respond, they heard a shout from town. Was that? Naruto, yep, where'd you leave him? The ramen shop, I brought him ten bowls of ramen, he couldn't have gone through them all already, could he? Easily. Damn, I'll go find him. Good luck with that. Jiraiya just glared at him before he shunshined away. Kakashi went back to where his other student was still running, 
pulling the real Ika Ika from his pouch and opening it. You can stop running now, minion. It's time for push-ups. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Five minutes earlier. I was walking home, or at least trying to. In truth, I was lost. I had no idea where I was. I couldn't smell the ramen stand anymore, which is a good indication I wasn't close to home. I could hear someone selling fish across the street. I don't even know where fish is sold around town. It turns out that I was way too focused on where I was, instead of where I was going. I was just about to try my jutsu again to see if it would work when I ran into someone. They must have been running because I ended up on ground with said person on top me. Idiot, look where you're going, will ya? A feminine voice shouted at me. Before I could place the voice, she continued talking. Wait, you're that kid that fought the dog boy. Um, fish cakes. Naruto, I corrected a bit startled. Same thing, anyways, that was a good fight, I guess I can forgive you. Thanks, can you get off me now? Nope. Why not? You're comfy. I felt her arms cross across my chest and her head rest on them. Plus you smell good, like foxes. I froze at this statement. I already knew I smelled like a fox, but not enough for a normal nose to pick up. Thinking this, I suddenly felt the need to figure out who this girl was. So, using my new senses and took in the smells around me. Oddly enough, she didn't smell bad herself, like grass, fresh water, and beetles. Strange, but she did sound familiar, like that mint-haired girl from Taki. Yeah, that's her, Fu. After figuring out who it was, I was unable to do a mental victory dance. Instead I was spoken to by a voice I've been hearing from a lot more lately. But he sounded different than I ever heard him, for the first time the Kyubi actually sounded scared. Shit, you have to get out of their kit. Why? Because I'm not ready to die. And I doubt you are either. And that has to do with her because... She's the host of the Nanabi and if she figures out that you're my host, we're screwed. One way or another. Again, why? Me and her have, history. So if you stay they're going to beat us senseless. Seriously. Do you want to test it? No. What do I do? I asked, the Kyubi's fear starting to make me nervous. I already told you, run. Wouldn't that make her suspicious? Good point, he said after a moment. How about you just make a slow, quiet escape before she figures out I'm here? Sounds like a plan, I answered, his own fear making me more agreeable. This chat only took a couple seconds, all the while Fu was silent, no doubt thinking about something. You know, those whisker marks make you look kind of foxy as well. As she spoke, the Kyubi started chanting curse words. You don't say. You don't happen to know the nine-tailed fox do you? She asked, suddenly making said fox shriek. She knows, run, before I could even think, I was up and darting in a random direction, letting out a frightened yell during the process. Faster. Have you forgotten I can't see? Oh, hold on, after a moment he was back to talking. There, try your jutsu now. I immediately sent a small bit of chakra out towards the real world. I almost tripped over my own feet when it came back, portraying my bleary, undefined surroundings for me. Right after I realized I was seeing stuff, I realized there was a pole a foot away from my head. Dodging it, I continued running. I kept running, dodging whatever my jutsu was able to pick up. How did you fix it? Less talking more running, I nodded, running even faster from the girl behind me. I was doing well too, until I glanced back and ran into something in front of me. Are you alright Naruto? The thing asked in the voice of my sensei. Figuring that it must be him, I jumped to my feet and darted behind him. Save me, I told him desperately before he could even ask why, she was already there. Oh come on Foxy, I'm not going to bite. Much, I peeked out from behind Jiraiya, to see her matching my movements. I shrieked again, diving back behind him, only to have to climb up his back when she tried to reach for me. I ended up perched on his shoulders as she jumped to reach me. Come back down, I'm not that scary, am I? 
You're scaring the fox, I hissed back quietly. What do you think? Before she could answer, I was yanked off my perch by my collar at the same time she was picked up off the ground by her bag. What the hell is going on here? The Sanin demanded. Seven, I said panicking, pointing at her. Nine, she said happily, pointing back at me. I see, he said after a moment of thought. We're going to see the Hokage now. End of chapter 14. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Peace out people. This is part 7 of what if Naruto lost his sight. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Start chapter. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 15. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. What the hell is going on here? The Sanin demanded. 7. I said panicking, pointing at her. 9. She said happily, pointing back at me. I see, he said after a moment of thought. We're going to see the Hokage now. I opened my mouth to object when there was a pop and we disappeared from the marketplace. We shinsun straight into the Hokage's office, making my jutsu fail for a moment before starting back up again. Jiraiya, you do realize I have a door, right? The Hokage said with a sigh. Yes sensei, I gawked at him in surprise. You were taught by the third, I heard a sigh but was otherwise ignored. You do know that door is there to be knocked on, he asked him again. My hands are a bit full. I can see that, care to explain why. I found Naruto here, running for his life from this girl. And who is she? Fu, she piped up. I'm from Taki. You're here for the exams, right? Yep, made it to the third exam. Congratulations, would you care to explain why you were chasing Naruto? It's my job, she said simply. She then continued before they could become worried about it. He's host of the Nine Tails, and I host the Seven Tails. I have to chase him. Well, that makes more sense. The Hokage continued smoking his pipe, acting like me getting chased by a foreign ninja across town was normal. I said as much. Makes sense, she's chasing me for no reason and the freaking Kayubi is scared shitless. How does it make sense? He doesn't know about the legend, does he? Fu asked the Hokage, ignoring me. It's not common knowledge nowadays. What legend? I asked, confirming her assessment. It's an old story that struck fear in the villages in search control of both the Seven Tails and Nine Tails. Jiraiya finally placed a pair of us on the ground as the third spoke. Though he made sure that he didn't let go in case either I started running or she started chasing. It was a simple tale, long before the villages were created, the third continued. Back then, the Baijus ran free, unaffected by the humans in the world. In this time, the Kayubi and the Nanabi were relatively close. According to the story, the Kayubi would purposely torment the Nanabi until she would finally have enough and chase after him. The pair of them would run across the elemental nations for days, even weeks, until the Nine Tails finally decided to risk letting himself get caught. Why, wouldn't he have been beat up? Only half the time, Fu piped up. The other half, they'd get busy. Busy doing what? You know, they were, getting it on. Huh. They were screwing, Jiraiya finally stated. What, they were building something? Sensei, has Naruto been giving the talk yet? I'm guessing not, he answered. I'd have to ask Kakashi. Well, he should probably be here anyways so you might as well summon him. Might as well. He made some sort of gesture followed by the almost silent swish of fabric as an Anbu left to find him. While we wait for him, we should talk about your trying to catch Naruto. First of all, let me say I was chasing him more to freak out Kayubi-kun than anything, Fu said. I felt the tailed beast in question's fur prick angrily. He doesn't like being called that, I stated. He should get used to it because it's either that or Ku-chan. That's just demeaning, I said for the Kayubi. Guess I know what I'll call you from now on, Ku-chan. Stop it. Never. You're always so childish. Because you're always a self-righteous prick. 
I opened my mouth to say something else the Kayubi wanted to be known when I thought better of it. This isn't going to work, I said instead. I thought for a moment before coming up with an idea. Not bad, considering. Now you'd have to convince the Hokage to let you do it. Hey Gigi, if I make a clone with the Kayubi's chakra to let him talk, would I get in trouble? What? The Hokage blinked. Well, he wants to bicker with Nanabi and I don't like saying stuff I don't understand. So if I make a clone with his chakra, it would be more his clone than mine. And why would you think this is a good idea? Well, I'd have search control of the clone and could poof him as soon as he does something funny. But he could still contribute to the conversation. One question, whose idea was this? Jiraiya asked nervously. Mine. Not the Kyubi's right. Yeah, why? All right, I'll allow you to do this, but only after I seal off the room, Sarutobi said. Won't Kaka-sensei be locked out? Only people inside the seal would be locked in. Anyone can come in if needed. Okay, I smirked, crossing my fingers in my favorite seal. The Kyubi weaved enough of his chakra with mine to give him mental search control of the clone. There was a poof and when the smoke cleared I saw a form not similar to my own in the slightest. Dash 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 dash. The Hokage almost lost his pipe as he took in what appeared in front of him. The village leader had expected a copy of Naruto, not the man standing next to the boy. He had long, red hair tied back with a back ribbon as well as a pair of fox ears sticking out of his head. The man's eyes were slitted and of the same color adding to the feral look the exaggerated whisker marks already created. He was dressed in a black silk top that resembled a decorative kimono, along with a pair of red baggy pants almost hiding his bare feet. That's better, he said as he began to stretch. He yawned slightly, his animalistic canines flashing as a bright orange tail flicking out from behind him. Feels good to have a real body again, even if it's a puny human form. Why don't you look like Naruto? The Hokage asked still startled. Hedge, there was no way I was wearing that. He motioned towards his host in disgust. I might be a demon but I still have standards. You have a tail, Naruto said. I'm a fox, foxes have tails. Didn't you pay attention in school? Well, sorry if I didn't expect a human clone have a tail. My turn, Fu announced, before they could stop her. She began weaving water out of her bag to create a water clone in the same way. The person that appeared was again older than its source. The woman, because she was obviously female, had long, light blue hair, hanging loose around her hips. She was wearing a bright green halter top dress, with a flowing skirt ending about her knees. There was also a pair of large, detached sleeves going all the way down her arms. Unlike the other baiju, she had on a simple pair of sandals on her feet. Hello, sweetie. She fluttered her insect-like wings momentarily, sending the other proud baiju cowering behind his host. Keep away from me, River Song Incarnate. He shouted over the startled boy's head. You really think I'm like her? I'm flattered. No, you're worse. You're going to regret that, she said through an evil smile. She lunged at the fox only for him to dive behind the Hokage's desk. They continued to race around said desk, taunting each other throughout. At least it's not me. The stunned man heard Naruto say as everyone watched the two run. Who said that? Fu taunted, making the young boy freeze. B but, they're over T there. So, I wasn't chasing you just because the Nanabi wanted to. You're a cute boy my age, if you weren't, I wouldn't listen to her. I'm not that easily manipulated. Naruto paused trying to understand what she meant. That would mean. He started to speak, only to stop when the girl grinned. You should start running, Foxy. She made the boy to dart behind the Sanin only to have her follow. When Kakashi made it into the room five minutes later, the Hokage had finally had it. Enough, he shouted, causing both running pairs to freeze in place. I don't care if two of you are the most powerful demons in the world. This is my office and you will restrain yourself. Is that clear? Yes sir, all four said fearfully, scrambling to get into line in front of the desk. Glad you were able to make it Kakashi. 
you were summoned a half hour ago. Well, Kakashi began to explain only for Naruto to interrupt. He was looking for someone to keep an eye on the Tem when he ran into Anko and knocked her dangos onto the floor. He ended up having to run for his life, till he offered her the chance to torment the Tem, and she took off, almost skipping, to his training ground. He's actually right, Kakashi said after a moment. Seriously? Yeah. But I was joking. I know. The boy gave him an unbelieving look. I have the dango sticks in my ass to prove it. He turned to show Anko's name written in dango sticks. This caused the two youngest in the room to double over laughing. I like her, the Nanabi said before joining in with the laughter. The Kayubi just shook his head at their antics. Uh, mind filling me in on who the people I don't know are. Kayubi and Nanabi, the Hokage said, indicating the two ancient beings standing in his office. The man's eye widened in surprise. And those pieces of papers across the room are active barrier seals, not letting anyone leave. Are you sure this is a wise idea, even with the seal? Probably not, but it's a little late now. Kakashi nodded before starting to remove the large splinters from his buttocks. Are you three done? Sarutobi asked with an intimidating flare. They nodded, still chuckling. Good, so am I right to assume that the legend is correct? Why do you think neither of us have had a male Jinchuriki before now? The Kayubi said simply. They were terrified a situation like this would happen and they'd end up with a whole bunch of demon children to deal with. I've heard of that. The one-eyed man looked up from the growing pile of sticks to contribute to the conversation. That was the main reason the council was so against Naruto to begin with. They wanted him dead, didn't they? Everyone stared at the fox in shock. What? You think I didn't notice that half the mobs were actually groups of missing nin with money signs flashing in their eyes? Or all those times he, accidentally, ingested some sort of poison that I had to deal with? Oh and that wave mission he was on seemed way too suspicious to be looked over like it was. I'm willing to bet it was purposely ignored to try and take the boy out, at least the supposed, demon brothers, part. How do you know all that? Naruto looked confused as he asked. You've only been able to see the outside for a week. I looked through your memories soon after you had them. There's more than one way to skin a cat, you know. Don't let the Nibi hear you say that, the Nanabi pipped up. Kayubi just gave her an unamused look before returning to the subject at hand. Anyways, aren't we supposed to solve our predicament? What exactly am I solving here? The old man asked. I don't want to be caught, Naruto and the Kayubi said in unison. We want to catch, the other two said excitedly. Okay then, he lit his pipe to give him a moment to think. Well, since Naruto is only 12 I don't think it would be healthy for him to be caught. Ah, come on, I wanted to chase Ku-chan, Nanabi complained. You can chase him all you like, just don't catch him. He earned terrified looks from the other pair. When are we allowed to actually catch them? Fu asked. When he turned 16. But that's like four years away. Closer to three, the Hokage explained calmly. He'll be 13 in a couple months. But. No buts, he's my ninja so my word's law. Understood. Yes sir, Fu said, as the Nanabi thought for a moment. So, let me get this straight. I'm allowed to chase them, but not catch him. Not in your traditional sense, no. Then why would he run? Give him a new reason to do so, he advised. If you can't catch him, do something else. Mess up his hair, steal his weapons, force him to buy you dinner. Something that won't result in the traumatization of one of my ninja. I like it, Fu said with a plodding smirk. I don't, Naruto moped. Kid, you're lucky you got it as easy as this. Kayubi sounded almost mournful at this point. Enjoy it while it lasts. And on a related note, the Hokage started getting everyone's attention before continuing. Kakashi, has Naruto had the talk yet? Well, considering I haven't talked to him about it and I highly doubt Aruka has, I'd have to say no. Have no fear sensei, Jiraiya exclaimed loudly. I will explain everything to the boy. Jiraiya, I don't think that's a good... 
Kakashi was cut off by a poof, indicating a shinshun. But when the smoke and leaves cleared, the two were still standing there awkwardly. The seal, the Kayubi waved a hand towards the paper in a bored fashion. Oh yeah, do you mind sensei? The old man sighed as he put his hand over a seal on his desk and flashed his chakra enough to let the pair out. As soon as they disappeared, Kakashi sighed. Hokage-sama, do you really think that was a good idea? He asked, his face looking as if he thought otherwise. Yes, the boy needed to know and who would be better to tell him. Almost anyone, sir. He gave your sensei the same talk. That's why I'm concerned. The man with the hat gave him a strange look. Do you remember what his wife would do when she got mad at him? She'd chase him around town with a spatula. And if she was still mad the next morning, she'd decide to have bagels and bananas for breakfast and he'd be traumatized for the rest of the day. Is this going somewhere? Almost there, and why was he traumatized by bananas and bagels? Because when Jiraiya gave him the talk he used, props. Oh. Congrats you just traumatized the boy you were trying to prevent from being traumatized. That poor child. Uh, sir, the Hokage turned towards Fu, indicating for her to continue. Can I leave now? I have training to do. Oh, yes you may. Just make sure the Nanabi's back in your seal. She nodded, dispelling the hedged clone just as said Baiju was about to complain. I'd best be going too, the Kayubi said, eyeing the mint-haired girl wearily. The farther from her I can get, the better. That and my host being traumatized is bound to be hilarious. You sound way too happy about this. The Hokage eyed the fox with suspicion. How else am I supposed to be entertained? He shrugged before turning towards Kakashi. And Cyclops, don't worry so much, he's going to drive that Huga prick insane next month. Bye he said before poofing away himself. The two adults remaining sighed in relief. Remind me never have two baijus in my office again. I will try, Hokage-sama. Now Fu, before you go, I'm sure I don't have to tell you not to let the Nanabi out like that without my permission. Am I right? Don't worry, I'm not that stupid. Good, and the arrangement between you and Naruto is to be kept a secret. I won't tell anyone. The Taki Council would have my head if they knew what I was planning. I don't doubt that. You may go now. Thanks. She skipped through the door as Kakashi made a peace sign and disappeared out the window. I'm getting too old for this, he said with a sigh as Naruto's shout was heard across town for the second time that day. Far too old. End Chapter 15. Start Chapter 16. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 16. Anyways. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next day. Naruto, unlock the door. I heard Jiraiya shout as he banged on said door unmercifully. He'd been out there for probably five minutes now trying to get in. I just sat on my bed, the thought of moving not even crossing my mind. He can bang on the door till the Chunin exams were done and over with, I still wasn't letting him in. Go away, I shouted back, you're an asshole. Are you still mad about yesterday? I didn't say anything, which was apparently all the answer he really needed. That was something you needed to know. No it wasn't, go away, I heard him sigh on the other side, pausing in his abuse of my already weak door. Oh come on, it wasn't that bad. In answer to that I got up and picked up the bunch of bananas that I threw away yesterday, and proceeded to chuck them out the window towards my perverted teacher. Judging by the faint splat I heard a few seconds later, they missed their mark and hit the ground. Just like Minato, I heard him mutter under his breath before raising his voice. You know, I can break this door if I wanted. Do it. I will. Enjoy the waterproof paint and the itching powder. The sand installed for a moment. You rigged the door didn't you, Jiraiya said, not bothering to phrase it as a question. I don't know, why don't you break the door down and find out? Jiraiya huffed in agitation. You know what, fine, I'll leave you alone, he said, a few footsteps echoing on the walkway outside before the paused. But I'll be back. Don't bother, I shouted back, 
hearing him sigh again before his footsteps resumed, taking him down the stars. Wow, if I knew the talk was going to make you this upset, I would have told you myself years ago, the Kyubi mocked in amusement. Shut up, I said as I flopped back onto my bed. I don't need to deal with you right now. No can do kit. Why not, I asked with a groan. Guess what day it is. Tuesday. And last Tuesday you did what? That. Prank on Ebisu. And why did you prank him? The. Deal I made with you. Correct, for once. So today is also the day that I start to mentally torment you until you prank someone. I groaned even louder. It wasn't even 9 o'clock in the morning and I already couldn't see how this day could possibly get any worse. I should have let him break the door, I muttered to myself. Unless that door was a lot more impressive than you led him to believe then it wouldn't have stopped me. I hate you, I said, earning a chuckle from him. Ah, I hate you too, he answered, in a tone way too enthusiastic for his own good. I hate you, I hate Jiraiya, I hate pretty much everything right now. You're learning quick, I sighed angrily, which only made him more amused. Fine, I'll bite, why do you hate everyone? Because you're all disgusting, I said, glaring at nothing. I mean that's what everyone's obsessed with. I thought it was just naked girls, which was kinda weird but still, at least it wasn't something so, so disgusting. You said, disgusting, twice. Anyways, it's a fact of life, Kit. You can't really condemn us for it. Yes I can, it's gross. You're just too young to appreciate such things. No matter how old I get, it will still be gross. You keep believing that, he said. This probably not the best time to say that the Nanabi is technically my sister. My jaw dropped in surprise and disgust. Are you kidding me? Nope. That's even worse. For humans maybe, but we view things a little differently, he began to explain. There's only nine biju, so if we want to have some fun we either do so with each other or find a human lover, which none of us would be caught dead with. Or you could, I don't know, not do it. The QB only laughed. So naive, it's actually kinda adorable. I'm not being adorable. So you think, he said, continuing to chuckle to himself. Anyways, I suggest getting some sort of prank ready because I'm just going to continue till something hilarious happens. Oh, and what are you gonna do, sing something really annoying? I asked sarcastically. I could, but I was thinking something a little different, he answered smugly. You see, the Nanabi and I spent thousands of years, having fun. And I wouldn't mind sharing some of these, experiences. Please don't, I whispered desperately. So, there was this one time, about 2000 years ago where. I'm going, I'm going. I yelled as I leapt off the bed and straight into the far wall. Turn on your eyes, stupid. Shut up, I muttered. I focused for a moment, activating my jutsu for the first time today. A blurry version of my room came into view. I rubbed my face where I hit the wall, watching my sight wavier as my hand went past the focus point. It was still a bit hard to get used to. It was nothing like seeing used to be. There was no color and not much texture, everything was blank, undefined objects that I had to guess what they were. Half the time I ended up having to use those extra strong senses to figure it out, but it did help me avoid things so it wasn't completely useless. Well, once my vision stabilized, I climbed to my feet and headed into the main room. I went over to board under which I kept my more secret pranking equipment. I pried up the board, and began taking inventory. So, what are you going to do? He asked curiously. Just gonna tweak the door a little more, I answered, pulling out a bag of confetti and a can of either spray paint or silly string. He's no doubt going to go through it when he comes back, whether I have it locked or not. So I'm going to give him a little something to remind him why he shouldn't do so in the future. Sounds fun, he said, no doubt grinning like a madman. Or... Well, a mad fox I guess. Go right ahead, just make it as outrageous as possible. I pulled out the rest of the gear I wanted before getting to work. The silence that followed was heavenly. 
Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. 20 minutes later. Jiraiya walked back up the apartment stairs, a plastic, grocery bag firmly in his grasp. He was still annoyed at his students' antics. After all, he didn't think using props was that bad an idea for talks like that. He thought back to the rest of the students he had explained the finer facts of life to, all of which ended up acting the same as Naruto. Yahiko, Conan, and Nagato had collaborated to lock him out of the house for a week after such things. Minato, on the other hand, had a habit of throwing away any banana or bagel he came in contact with, even if they belonged to someone else. There were several times he caught the boy nudging someone's breakfast into the trash can while they weren't looking. Okay, maybe it was time for him to admit that he might not be the best one to teach kids about such things. He shrugged, deciding that it was too late now, and if they needed to know, they needed to know. He stopped in front of Naruto's door, debating if an apology was in order. Figuring it wouldn't hurt, he knocked on the door. Naruto, open up, he called through the door. I don't answer people that knock, Naruto called back. What? There's a doorbell for a reason, Aero Sanin. Doorbell, what doorbell? Jiraiya shouted. And don't call me that. It's next to the door. I only answer when someone rings the doorbell. Jiraiya glanced next to the door, positive he wouldn't find a doorbell. He's ended up here every day for the past week and there was no way he'd miss something like that. Jiraiya stared at the weathered doorbell in surprise. He could have sworn there it wasn't there this morning. But, then again, it looked like it belonged. All the rest of them had doorbells so it shouldn't be that strange. You didn't say it all during the last week. That's because you always let yourself in, Naruto pointed out. So either ring the doorbell or I'm not answering. Fine, Jiraiya said with a huff. He poked the bell angrily only for a loud blow horn to go off and confetti to explode up into his face. Spitting out the bits of colored paper, he finally snapped. That's it, Gaki. Jiraiya grabbed the doorknob and tried to force the door open. He threw himself at the door, only to find that it was already open. Losing his balance, he stumbled forward, straight into a pile of shaving cream. He slipped, falling to the ground, his face connecting with a plate full of peanut butter. Jiraiya laid there for a moment, stunned by the turn of events. When he finally got his head off the plate, it got knocked back into it by a bunch of bananas. Huh, Kayubi was right, you are taller than I thought, he heard Naruto say from in front of him. The Sanin sat up and wiped the peanut butter off his eyes before he opened then to look at the orange-clad troublemaker. Naruto was sitting at the table eating a bowl of cereal. The boy barely gave him any notice as he continued to eat his breakfast, the most attention the older man got was him picking up a can and spraying silly string at his face. Naruto finally looked towards his victim, seeing his handiwork. And that's when the boy's poker face shattered. He started laughing like a maniac, his head dropping to the table as he lost control of his body in his amusement. What? Dot was that? Jiraiya asked angrily as Naruto's laughter began to wane. A prank, duh, Naruto said through his chuckles. I know that, he shouted, struggling to get to his feet without falling back to the ground. I thought you said there was only itching powder and waterproof paint. That's for people that break down the door. You didn't. Jiraiya thought for a moment before nodding in agreement. Guess that's fair, he answered as he started cleaning off the rest of the peanut butter and silly string off his face. Does that mean we're even? That depends, are you going to give another, talk? Not for a while yet. Then, Naruto paused dramatically. He made Jiraiya wait almost half a minute before he pulled a cord hanging here him which instantaneously dumped a bucket of bright orange paint on his sensei's head. Yep, we're good. Then let's go kid, Jiraiya said with a sigh. You've got some training to do. Okay, Naruto took the last few bites of his cereal before leaping out of his chair. What are we doing today? First, I'm going to wash up. After I throw these away, of course. Jiraiya held up the now paint-covered, plastic bag for his student. Naruto stared at him curiously, obviously having trouble figuring out what it was. 
Jiraiya watched as he tried to stealthily use his other senses to help. After a few seconds, he finally decided to take a deep breath which almost caused his eyebrows to jump off his face. I is that. Dot was that. Ichiraku Ramen, yes, I was going to give them to you as a sort of apology but since you took matters into your own hands, I guess these aren't needed anymore. Not to mention they're full of paint. Jiraiya dropped the bag into the trash as he kept an eye on his student. For the first time since Jiraiya met him, the boy was speechless, well for a few seconds at least. I could have had ramen for breakfast, Naruto said quietly. Yep, but you ruined it for your own, petty revenge, Jiraiya said sagely. Now I hope you learn something from all this. It's all my fault. Yes it was, but did you learn anything? It was so young. Wait what? My poor ramen. Naruto, are you? I'm so sorry, Naruto yelled, falling to the floor in despair. Oh for Kami's sake, Jiraiya rolled his eyes. He grabbed the boy's arm and pulled him to his feet. Come on, you can mourn your meal later. We have training to do. End of chapter 16. Start chapter 17. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 17. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Next week. I already told you no, I told the fox firmly as I walked down the street. I was exhausted after the training and I still had grocery shopping I had to do. The food Kakashi Sensei dropped off did last a while, but apparently two weeks was the limit. I don't think you realize how this works, he exclaimed angrily. You see, you're supposed to prank people so I don't mess with you. Therefore, if you don't prank someone, you won't be able to think straight for a week. And last time you had me prank someone three bowls of ramen were destroyed. I'm not willing to risk such a loss again. And it was hilarious. No it wasn't, it was tragic. To you. So I'm not pranking this week. You have to. No I don't, I shouted back causing the street to go silent. I glanced around to see everyone practically frozen in the streets, their bodies angled towards me. I scratched the back of my head, an embarrassed smile spreading across my face. Uh, I don't have my keys. After a moment, everyone started moving again as they whispered back and forth to each other, every word of it about me. I started walking again as well, not realizing I'd stopped. I kept my head low as I ran my hands through my hair tensely. They think I'm crazy now, I said silently to him. It's all your fault. Of course it is, and you want to know why that is. Because didn't prank someone. Well, you didn't explain why my weird echo jutsu is working now either. What does that have to do with anything we're talking about? Um, it kind of fit. No, no, it didn't. I really want to know all right and you haven't told me. Fine, I'll tell you after you prank. But, the ramen. Just don't prank someone that has ramen. It's not that hard of a fix, he said back, I could almost feel his tails twitching in annoyance. Hell, prank that minty girl that keeps stealing your clothes. She's kinda scary. She's not that bad. Every time we run into her you scream like a girl. I uh, I shut up, that just means she deserves it. Hi, a female voice said in my ear, dragging the one word out longer than necessary. Speak of the devil. I let out a high-pitched yelp as I leapt away, trying to get as far away from her as I could. I only got a few feet before I was tackled to the ground with my face in the dirt and Fu sitting cross-legged on my back. Got you, she said proudly. Good for you, now let me go, I murmured, lifting my head off the ground. What do you say? Please, I said. Wrong, she answered, no doubt smiling sinisterly. I was looking for the answer of, please my almighty Fusama, but nice try. Before I could change my answer, I felt my goggles start to move. I tried to reach up and stop them but couldn't get my arms free before fresh air blew across my eyes for the first time in weeks. Yoink, she said as she completely removed my goggles, causing me to panic. I'll be borrowing these for a bit. Fear coursed through me as I felt her get off my back. I climbed to my feet quickly, 
trying to figure out which person-shaped blob was her as quick as possible. These are pretty sweet, I heard her say. I was immediately able to pinpoint her. She was walking away from me, holding what I assumed were my goggles up towards the sky. I'm not exactly sure why, maybe to get a better look at them. Who knows, anyways, she wasn't more than five yards away. Give them back, I demanded, careful to keep my eyes focused on the ground. I watched as she stopped and turned back towards me, lowering the goggles again. What? What? The QB echoed. Give me back my goggles, I said again, trying to ignore the panicking Biju in my gut. Don't call her back you moron, he demanded as Fu sighed. That's not how this game is played, fishcakes, she said, resting a hand on her hip. I catch you, I take something. Then I give it back when I feel like it. If you're lucky they'll be in your apartment when you get home. I don't care about your stupid game. Just give me back my goggles. Why did you have to choose today to rebel? The QB demanded. You can't ignore rules you moron. Shut up, I'm not talking to you. I shouted at the fox, getting an angry grunt in response before I turned back to Fu. And you, those goggles are important to me. I seriously couldn't care less what you take off me, but those are off limits. How can they be off limits if I already have them? Just give them back. How about, no, she answered, spinning back around to leave. At this point I thought all was lost. I had a feeling she wouldn't give them up easily if only because I told her to return them. And if I didn't have those goggles, it would only be a matter of time before someone noticed my eyes and then the whole thing would be done with, including my ninja status. It would all be over. There would be no way for me to run from it. My mind suddenly got stuck on the word, run. I was always running from Fu, making her chase me. And she really liked the chasing, to the point that I think she's slightly upset when she finally catches me. But, how can someone chase you, if you don't run? If you don't, I swear I won't let you chase me for the rest of the day. I shouted quickly, before I could lose my train of thought. She had only gotten a few feet away when she stopped. What the hell does that mean? She spun back around angrily. I can chase you any time I damn well want. No, you can't. I could almost feel her glare trying to burn holes in me. We'll see, she answered, turning on her heels before darting off. Are you insane? The QB shouted in my mind. I grimaced a bit. Maybe, I answered silently. But if it works then she won't take them ever again. As long as the psycho bitches don't kill us first. Come on, how bad could it be? Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Two hours later. Just one stop left. Just one stop left. I chanted as I made my way down the street. I had finally gotten all my groceries for the last few weeks and was on my way to my last place on the list. I would skip it, if I could stand the increasingly bad smells coming from the abandoned apartment buildings on my floor. Normally it wouldn't bother me. After all it was only really noticeable on a hot day, but that all changed when I began relying on my nose more. I kept my face hidden behind my book while I carried my scroll full of food in my other hand. Pretending to read helped me ignore the figures surrounding me that couldn't keep their eyes to themselves. Finally, I muttered in front of the Yamanaka flower shop. I hurried through the door to escape the stairs only to almost drop my book at the assault my nose was experiencing. It smelled like there was a hundred different flowers being shoved up my nose. Hello, welcome to the holly crap, I heard Eno exclaim. What the hell are you wearing? I glanced down at my person for effect as I ran inventory. Um, my boxers, a watch, and one sandal, I answered, turning back to my book. What are you doing here? My parents own the shop, she said offhand. Where are your clothes? Stolen. Who the hell would want to steal your ugly jumpsuit? A thief. Well you can't be in here like that. I peeked my jutsu point over top the book to see her standing with her arms crossed. I'm not naked. You're in your underwear. I had pants till about a block ago, I told her crossly. I stayed where I was by the door, hoping she'd let me in. 
Why don't you go home and come back with some actual clothes, she suggested with a sigh. I would, but by the time I got back here she'd have stolen them again. I watched as Eno perked up at this, making me immediately regret having said it. She, you have a girl stealing your clothes. It's not what it sounds like, I said with a wince. Then what is it? I bit my lip in order to stay silent, making her chuckle. Fine, I'll help you with whatever you're looking for here as long as you tell me what's going on with this mystery girl. Deal. All right, I guess. Good, Eno exclaimed, a hand motioning for me to come in. How can I help you? I'm looking for a flower, I answered, taking a few steps into the place. The smell was still way too intense for my nose's liking but I was doing a pretty good job ignoring it. Well, duh, that's why you're here. Wait, is it for the girl? No, she already has my clothes, she's not getting flowers too. Then, what's the flower for? My apartment, I need something to make it smell a little better. You could clean it. I did, I said. All right, whatever. Eno walked back from behind the counter and toward some flowers on the right. Cut or uncut? Uncut. I am guess it will be inside so a potted plant. She continued past a bunch more before stopping. It has to smell nice and the flowers themselves should probably last pretty long. Do you have any experience gardening? A little, I have three leafy plants at home. Okay, then my suggestion would be an orchid of some type. Probably the Phalaenopsis bellina. The what? She didn't answer as she glanced through the flowers in front of her before pulling out one of them and holding it out to me. Smell it, she ordered. I followed her command only to get a strong, floral scent flooding my already abused nose. I began coughing as she pulled the flower back. Don't like it. Too strong, I coughed out. It's not that bad. It's just too strong for me. Fine, she put the pot back with a thud. She sounded disappointed, until she got an idea. She struck her palm with her other fist in excitement. I got it, I think. You like the scent, right? Yeah, for the most part, I answered, my coughing subsiding. All right then, stay here. I think I have something for you in the back. Okay, I answered, but she had already disappeared into the back room. I waited for a few minutes, the whole time listening to her shuffle around in the back, occasionally letting out muffled curse words when she didn't find what she was looking for. After a while, she let out an excited shout and hurried back to the front. Here, this is an orchid hybrid I experimented with a while ago. I'll admit, it didn't work out very well, but it has a more subtle smell than the bellina, she explained, holding the pot out to me. I took a tentative sniff, not wanting it to assault my nose again. But it was just like she said, the smell was almost identical to the bellina, yet not as strong. It's not particularly pretty so I've been trying to get rid of it for a while now. If you want it, you can have it. I don't care how it looks. Is that why you've had your nose stuck in that book this whole time? Yeah, I answered, that, and training. Something about listening to my other senses. I shook my head. Anyways, how much for the flower? Just take it, it was never put on sale so consider it free. Seriously, I asked in astonishment. Yeah, as long as you buy the supplies for it here, Eno said slyly. Oh, and you still have to tell me about that girl. There's always a catch. Yep, now do you want it or what? I sighed in defeat as I placed the scroll under my arm and took the plant from her. What do I need? Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Twenty minutes later. My nerves were shot, after I had told Eno only as much as I could get away with. I had to leave the safety of the shop once again. In the process of getting home, my other sandal was stolen, leaving me in only my boxers. Of course I was surrounded by people staring at me, but I didn't back down. The only thing that would have made me run was if Ichirakus was giving away free ramen. And maybe an invasion. I dragged myself up the stairs, having abandoned my book shield about five minutes back. Instead I kept my eyes down and focused on the steps. I stopped halfway up, getting a whiff of someone smelling like water and beetles over that of my orchid. 
My fist clenched as I used all the willpower I had to force myself to continue climbing the stairs again. When I got to the top there was no one there. In fact, the only thing strange was an object sitting in front of my door. When I got closer, I noticed it definitely smelled of her. I bent down cautiously to pick it up, finding it to be a very familiar shape. My fingers ran along the curved edges of the goggles almost lovingly before I put it back where it belonged. You are one lucky little bastard, you know that, the QB pointed out. This was the first time he'd spoken since I challenged the tacky girl. He wouldn't admit it, but it was scaring the fur right off him. If anyone else had tried that same gamble, they would have lost. Epically. Even you, I asked as I opened my front door. Are you kidding? My luck isn't that good. Nanabi got most of it. Whatever, I said, placing my flower on the kitchen table. Just so you know, I'm exhausted so I'm going to put my groceries, get dinner, and going to bed. Sounds like a plan, he muttered, sounding just as tired as I was. What about the pranking I'm supposed to do? I opened my scroll, releasing the objects inside. After today, I think we've had enough crazy ideas for one week. So you're letting me off the hook. It's more like I'm considering that stunt you pulled to be close enough to a prank to satisfy the weekly quota. Yippee, I said unenthusiastically. I think I'd prefer the pranks. End of chapter 17. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. This is part 8 of what if Naruto lost his sight. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Thanks you all for the support as well. It means a lot to me and gives me more motivation. Start chapter. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 18. So, hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next morning. I let out a yawn as I sat, cross-legged in the sand. I really should have used to these morning training sessions but I had a hard time shaking my drowsiness when my sensei barely gave me time to get ready this morning. Okay, Naruto, Jiraiya seemed more enthusiastic than usual. Today, I'm going to teach you how to summon toads. Why would I want to summon a frog? Toad. Whatever, I yawned. Can't we focus on something else? Why would we do that? Toads are the best. What am I going to do with a toad against Neji? I asked. He placed his hands on his hips in disapproval. And what do you think would be useful, hmm? I thought for a moment, knowing there was something that needed to be addressed but not remembering what. How about doing something to make it harder for that stalker of yours to sneak up on you? The QB suggested in a bored tone of voice. Like what? Oh, I don't know, maybe what Jiraiya thought you were creating your jutsu for two weeks ago. Just a thought. I didn't say anything, he sighed. The fake Byakugan you moron. Finishing my jutsu would help. I gestured impatiently, hoping he didn't think much on my hesitation. There was silence from the other man as he just stood there. I wanted it to copy the Byakugan so I can level the playing field a bit. Don't you remember? Huh, oh yeah, that's right. He scratched the back of his head for a moment before his hand dropped tentatively to his side. I gave him a suspicious look as he continued. I suppose we can do that, but I really think you should learn the summoning as well. Why? You can't fight with shadow clones alone. I watched him silently, knowing he was right. After a few seconds he must have realized I had nothing to say and continued. So, here's how we'll do this. I'll teach you the summons in the morning, then after lunch we'll work on the new versions of, uh, what's it called again? What, I asked, giving him a confused look. I forgot what you named it, he admitted. I stared back at him blankly. You did name your jutsu, right? What, yeah, of course I did, I exclaimed. It's, uh, I call it the, I forgot. Oh yes, the famous I forgot jutsu. How could I have not remembered its name? Jiraiya said, the sarcasm heavy in his voice. It's always followed closely by the what's it called jutsu and the it had a cool name, I swear jutsu. No, 
I forgot to name it. Jiraiya sighed in response. Of course you did, Jiraiya sighed. I guess we'll be figuring that out in the afternoon as well. Does that sound good? Yeah, I guess, I answered, climbing to my feet. What do I have to do for this training? More stuff with leaves, almost drowning in the lake again. Both. We shall see, Jiraiya chucked lightly. Before I could ask what that meant, he bit his thumb and ran his hands through a number of signs faster than my jutsu was able to catch. Summoning jutsu. He shouted as he slammed his palm onto the ground. There was a loud poof sound before my sensei disappeared behind what I assumed had to be a cloud of smoke. Only when it finally cleared, did I see that he was now twice as tall due to the fact he was standing on a large, toad-shaped figure. Show off, I muttered, earning a huff of dismay from Jiraiya. I'll have you know that was completely necessary to get the contract here. Jiraiya jumped off the toad taking a scroll the size of his arm out of its mouth. Contract, I asked tentatively. Yes, Naruto, a contract. He walked towards me a few steps then rolled it open in front of me. When one wants to summon an animal like this they have to sign a contract. I'm not going to end up signing my soul away or something, am I? I asked, only half joking. The paper was making me really nervous. After all, I might be able to do a lot of things with the unnamed jutsu, but reading wasn't one of them. No, nothing like that, he said with a chuckle. It's more for their own protection than anything else. Most of them ensure that you do not mean to do them harm or won't set them up for something malicious. Of course, there are others that add things to it. For instance, the snake summons demand a sacrifice every time you summon one of the largest ones. But, don't worry. The toads have nothing of that sorts in their contract. That's good. I didn't look up as I continued to stare at what easily could have been a blank piece of paper in front of me. Damn straight it is. Jiraiya kneeled on the other side of the scroll, looking down at it as well. First, pick the hand you want to summon with, preferably your dominant one. Then you bite your thumb and sign your name in blood. I nodded in response, but didn't move to follow any of it. He didn't seem to notice because he just kept explaining. Unfortunately the last person to sigh this wasn't exactly neat so you should probably sigh it about here. Jiraiya pointed at the part of the scroll directly in front of me. I nodded again, hiding a nervous gulp as I slowly bit my right thumb. I took my time as I tried to convince myself that this was going to be easy. All I was doing was writing my name straight down. There was nothing difficult to it. I put my left hand down close to where Jiraiya was pointing, hoping he'd think it was to keep the paper steady. He stopped pointing, leaving my hand as the only thing that told me where I was supposed to sign. I hesitated again before putting my thumb to the paper and writing my name the best I could. When I was done, I gave a small sigh of relief and watched Jiraiya examine my signature. Always messy, always. I swear I've never seen a 12-year-old signature that was neat he said, shaking his head. Anyways, just get a bit of blood on each of your fingertips and press them down right here. He pointed at the bottom of the paper. Okay, I nodded, pressing each of my fingers against my thumb before placing them all down where he had pointed. Is that all? For the contract, yes. Jiraiya rolled the scroll back up again with a small kick and picking it up. Now, it's time to summon. Um, and how do I do that? Oh yeah, didn't teach you that yet, did I? He asked, scratching his head in an embarrassed manner. Preform the signs, boar, dog, bird, monkey, and ram, then slam your right hand onto the pavement like I did. If you have the right balance of chakra, then you can easily summon a toad as large as this guy. Jiraiya patted the toad on the head as he passed at the scroll. Of course it also takes quite a bit of chakra, but I'm sure you won't have a problem with that, Jiraiya said with a chuckle. Well, go ahead, try it out. Here goes nothing, I muttered. I positioned myself so I was kneeling on the ground then focused on my hands as I carefully went through each of the five symbols need. Only when they were complete did I start putting chakra into it, molding it like it felt it should be. I smirked as I brought my hands apart, 
finding the jutsu a lot easier than signing the stupid contract. Summoning jutsu, I shouted, slamming my hand onto the ground. There was a large poof of smoke that forced me back onto my butt. I coughed and waved the smoke away the best I could. Once it had dispersed, I saw that I had, indeed, summoned a toad. If you could consider an inch-long tadpole with two stubby rear legs a toad. Jiraiya, his toad, and I stared at it for a while, none of us saying much. The only sound I heard was the QB laughing quite loudly while we sat there. Is that it? I asked. What did you expect, to summon Gambuda on your first attempt? This kind of stuff takes lots of practice, and time. I was hoping to be done in an hour, or at least by lunch today. No dice kid, there is no way you can completely learn such an awesome jutsu in just a few hours, Jiraiya explained. He motioned towards his toad that it could leave, causing another poof of smoke to appear in its wake. The small tadpole followed suit soon after. You better get started. I sighed as I got back to work. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Four hours later. Jiraiya watched as the smoke cleared from around his student revealing the newest of the uncountable number of toads he summoned today. This particular one was about two inches long with four legs and a tail. Soon after, Naruto flopped onto the sand and let out a frustrated groan. Why can't the tail just go away? He exclaimed, as the young toad returned home with a poof. I told you, it takes work, Jiraiya said with a sigh. He was lounging on a picnic blanket, spending his spare time writing in a notebook. Or he would be, if he had anything to write. Even after four hours of work, the only thing on the page was a few shapeless doodles. I've spent all morning on this and all that's happened is that they now have four legs. At least you're improving, he said. But it's so slow. Stop complaining and start working. I'm going to bleed to death before I summon a real toad. Jiraiya heard him mutter. No you won't, Jiraiya said. He watched as the boy bit his thumb for probably the millionth time that day. For some reason the wound kept healing up almost as soon as the jutsu was finished. Why not, Naruto said as he ran through the hand signs almost with ease. Because I'm pretty sure the Kyuubi's pride would be hurt if he let you die in a stupid way. And, trust me, Bleeding to death from spamming half-formed toads would no doubt fall under that category. Jiraiya received an annoyed look from his pupil as Naruto finishing the jutsu with an enthusiastic statement of its name. Jiraiya waited for the smoke to get out of the way again only to see another four-legged tadpole. The tail's a bit shorter, he said, looking at it briefly before turning back to his notebook. Though, he did make sure to keep his eyes on his student. The small toad stayed for a moment before disappearing yet again. Naruto only stood there for a little bit, looking more frustrated now than he did when he thought Jiraiya was watching him. Naruto seemed to be trying to convince himself to start again when Jiraiya heard his watch vibrate, stopping the boy in his tracks. Naruto held his arm up and ran his thumb over the watch, checking the time as his sensei pretended not to notice. Time for lunch. The boy said as he walked over to the picnic blanket and sat down. What you got? Jiraiya put aside his notebook, pulled out storage seal, and released a pile of sandwiches. Sandwiches again, Naruto asked, staring at the food. Well maybe if you used your manners once in a while I would have brought something different, he retorted, trying to give Naruto a pointed look. He was thoroughly ignored. It took him a moment to remember that Naruto probably couldn't see said look. His jutsu worked only so well, and, from what Jiraiya has seen, facial features weren't part of what it could pick up. Naruto grumbled as he grabbed a sandwich and started eating it in a somewhat grumpy manner. And if what Jiraiya heard about yesterday was true for his student, he had every right to be. If Jiraiya had been in the same situation, well he probably would have enjoyed the fact that a woman was stealing all his clothes, but then again, he wasn't a 12-year-old kid anymore. Jiraiya sighed, grabbing one of the sandwiches just as Naruto was going for seconds. The boy was doing surprisingly well for someone who hasn't been blind for more than a few weeks. It was pretty impressive, watching him train as if it wasn't even a problem. 
Despite everything Jiraiya had thrown at him, the only thing that has tripped him up so far was the contract. Um, Sensei, Naruto asked, snapping Jiraiya out of his thoughts. He looked over at the boy to see him staring at the half-eaten sandwich he was holding in his lap. What, you going to complain about the bread being stale or something? Naruto's head lowered a few inches more, like a guilty flinch. No, um, I'm sorry, Naruto muttered, Jiraiya barely catching the words. What was that, I don't think I heard you, Jiraiya teased, getting Naruto to lift his head to glare at him. I said I'm sorry, I shouldn't have complained so much about you teaching me a new jutsu, Naruto explained, looking tentative once again. It's a really cool jutsu and I was being grumpy for no reason. First I'll say, your apology is accepted. Second, who put you up to this? Naruto gave him a startled look that he quickly tried to cover up. What, I don't know what you're talking about. You're a strong-willed boy who doesn't like to admit when he's wrong. So, who made you admit it now, to me? Naruto stayed silent. It was the QB wasn't it? He said if I didn't stop winning like a baby, he was going to treat me like one, Naruto said with a glare. He then talked to me only in baby talk for the next five minutes. Well, you know you're definitely wrong when you get lectured by a demon. Yeah, tell me about it. Naruto huffed in annoyance. And thanks for teaching me to summon toads. I know you didn't need to or anything, so thanks. I've always liked toads. You're welcome, Jiraiya responded, a smile spreading across his face. Do you feel like stopping at Ichiraku's after training? Naruto's attention perked considerably. Seriously. Only if you don't complain anymore, because I will take back my offer if I hear any more of that today. Is that clear? Hi Sensei. Now finish eating so we can get back to work, Jiraiya said unnecessarily as he saw Naruto start to scarf down the rest of his sandwich. End Chapter 18 Start Chapter 19 Blindsided by twice the trouble Chapter 19 Trouble 1 Tilda 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 Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Five hours later. Wavy chakra jutsu, I suggested. We were done for the day and finally on our way to the ramen stand. I didn't complain at all, no matter what ridiculous training he put me through, which just happened to be me sitting there trying to keep a crown of coins sticking around my head. He didn't even bother to tell me why, but I kept quiet. Ramen was on the line. Too strange, Jiraiya shot down. Radar jutsu. Too boring, I answered. Bat sight jutsu. Doesn't make sense, Jiraiya shook his head. The third eye just do. That's not too bad, I said in thought. I was interrupted by the QB's chuckling. Yeah, that will do nicely, if you change your name to Tien. But it amuses the QB too much so we have to find something else, I said with a sigh while said fox muttered about ruining his fun. There's got to be a really good name for that just do. Having just reached the ramen stand, I sat down at one of the stools as my sensei followed suit. Yeah, it's out there somewhere. We just have to find it, he answered, sounding as frustrated as I was. Find what? Aim asked as she came over to take our orders. Naruto, did you leave your book somewhere again? No, it's in my pouch. I flashed her the book before putting it back where I had it. We're trying to find a name for the new jutsu he created, Jiraiya explained. And we haven't had any luck so far. Naruto created a jutsu, Aim grinned excitedly. Well, I helped. Good job Naruto, I'm proud of you, she said, making me sit a little taller out of pride. To celebrate, your first round of ramen's on us. Really, I asked as excited as she was. Of course, what type? Beef, I exclaimed, Arigato aim. You're welcome, she said before turning to Jiraiya. And you? I'll have a miso, Jiraiya answered. All right, I'll return with your order as soon as they're done. She smiled white again before going to her father and giving him the order. Jiraiya and I sat there silently, the only sound between us being the scratch of his pen on paper and the tap of my leg twitching impatiently. After a few minutes I'd had enough of it. Arosenin, I called, getting his attention. 
His pen froze before he slowly turned to look at me. I continued before he could complain. You didn't tell me why I had to keep those coins stuck to my head. No, I didn't. He let out an annoyed sigh and continued writing, not bothering to continue. Why? Why is an onion? He didn't even look up from his paper as I stared at him in confusion. What? Why? Is an onion? He repeated. I didn't say anything as he sighed. The more you ask, why, the more layers there are. Like an onion. I don't get it. Of course you don't. Jiraiya shook his head. Anyways, the coin crown was a training exercise. I know that, I told him, glad to get back to a subject that didn't involve strange vegetables. But why did you have me do it? What purpose does it do other than make me look ridiculous? It was to help your chakra get used to focusing in several places at once for the new version of your, uh, chakra location, jutsu. Nope, sounds like it finds chakra, I responded before going back to the question at hand. But why does my chakra need to do that? Think about it kid, if you want to see all over using that jutsu, what would you do? He waited for me to answer but nothing was coming to mind. Alright, your jutsu acts like an eyeball, right? It can only see pick up what is in front of it. Yeah. So, if you wanted to be able to see behind you without a dojutsu, what would you do? Well, I'd probably just create a shadow clone and have him stand back to back with me so he could tell me what was going on. It would give me another set of eyes on the target, I answered. Jiraiya gestured for me to continue. I gave him another confused look. And how would you do that with your jutsu? Do you mean more focus points? Bingo, he said with a smirk. You will need four of them for what you want to do, one on each side of your head. That makes sense, but why the coins? Why couldn't you just use leaves like before? The coins are harder to keep on your head and you needed more of a challenge. Jiraiya closed his notebook and placed his pen on top it. Plus, I believe you've gotten used to the leaves. I was just about to continue when I saw AIM coming towards us out of the corner of my vision. She was carrying what had to be bowls of ramen that were to be delivered. I turned towards her, an excited smile spreading across my face. Here you go, she said cheerfully as she placed the four bowls their appropriate owners. I hope you enjoy. Arigato, I exclaimed as I lunged for the chopsticks, knocking the cup over in the process. Sorry. That's alright, Aim said already picking up the chopsticks. I tried to help her but couldn't see the pieces of wood well enough to do so. She ended up cleaning up most of them while I guiltily went back to my ramen. So, what's this new jutsu of yours? Well, it doesn't have a name yet, I replied around my ramen. Don't talk with your mouth full. Jiraiya didn't even look at me as he reprimanded me. It's rude. I glared at him, but still swallowed what I had in my mouth before continuing. Anyways, I don't know what to call it but it kinda acts like a radar. I send out waves of chakra that return when they hit something and let me know what's around me. I took a bite of ramen then continued. I'm working on a more advanced version that sends the waves out in all directions. That's pretty cool, she said, her voice smiling. So it's kinda like echolocation, but with chakra echoes. Right, I froze at her words, my chopsticks almost falling out of my hand. There was a clatter of wood against ceramic that told me that Jiraiya's chopsticks actually did fall. Neither of us spoke as we turned to stare at each other in awe. Chakra echoes, Jiraiya questioned. Chakra echoes, I answered, excitement making its way into my voice. What? Aim looked between the two of us, her voice confused. Did I say something wrong? No, Aim, you're a genius. I threw my arms in the air, almost knocking myself off the stool in the process. It's the perfect name, Chakra Echo Jutsu. Well, I'm glad I could help. She placed the cup of chopsticks back onto the table and went about her business. That is a very good name, Jiraiya replied his chopsticks full of noodles waiting in front of his mouth. She has a knack for this type of stuff. I hummed in acknowledgement as I ate to keep from talking with my mouth full again. So, what do you think the new one should be called? I paused in my eating, wide-eyed. 
Damn it. End chapter 19. Start chapter 20. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 20. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Five days later. I wiped sweat off my forehead as examined the new toad I just summoned. I focused really hard on it, trying to figure out if it was a full toad or just another tadpole with legs. Over the past couple days it had been getting progressively harder and harder to tell. There had been a few yesterday that were actual toads, but just barely, and I couldn't summon them consistently. Which is why, at 7.30 in the morning, I was practicing before Jiraiya came to pick me up for the day. I knelt down to get a better look at him. From what I could see, he didn't have a tail, but even with all the practicing I had doing with my chakra echoes I still was missing details. I had a feeling that it would never pick up everything like I had hoped it would. This was exactly why I didn't fully trust it when trying to find tails on toads. While the toad had his back to me, I poked his butt. He spun around with a loud croak of complaint, but he didn't have a tail. Yes, no tail, I shouted, throwing my hands in the air. The toad let out an angry ribbit before hitting me right in my focus point. Everything went black for a moment as I was knocked back on my own butt. When my vision returned I saw the toad stare at me before disappearing into a poof of smoke. Well you didn't have to be so rude about it, I glared at the spot he used to be for a moment before sitting cross-legged on the ground. Okay. So that's seven in a row now. I think I've actually got this down. whoop de doo they QB said an enthusiastic ally. Oh shut it, this is important. Oh yes, because your life will definitely hinge on your ability to make a toad the size of your palm appear out of thin air. It's important to me, I muttered. I climbed back to my feet before beginning the search for clean clothes. You should be working on your fake Byakugan in your free time. I have been, and you know it. I knelt down and searched through the clothes pile. I was able to pick out some clean pants, shirt, and underwear but there was no clean jacket. In fact out of the seven wind suits I owned, there were only three jackets left that the other Jinchuriki hadn't stolen yet. After the goggles incident last week she's decided to keep my jacket every time she steals it. Luckily I've only ran into her four times in the last week. Two simultaneous points isn't good enough. I know, back off already, I'm doing the best I can, I exclaimed, gathering my clothes and heading to the bathroom for a really quick shower. You should be glad I can see behind me. It's saved me twice this week after all. And, if you could see on your right and left too then you'd still have three out of those four jackets she took. If you hadn't been so distracting yesterday, she wouldn't have the last one either. I set my clean clothes on top the toilet and ran my fingers across the wall to make sure the towel was on its hook. The thing was so thin that sometimes I couldn't even pick it up. I stripped out of my clothes and began fiddling with the knobs, hoping I actually had some hot water today. Oh, so you're allowed to be loud all the time, yet I do it and I'm, distracting, and it, costs you a coat. I see how it is. You were demanding that I steal Sasuke's remote so I can mess with his TV on my way home every night. I rolled my eyes as I entered the shower. That is not a good Xu cold. Sometimes the best pranks are the simplest, the QB said with a chuckle. For instance, your landlord turning off your water at random points in the week could easily be considered a good prank. If he wasn't actually trying to be an asshole. Looks like you have a cold shower ahead of you. Shut up. I muttered, already starting to rush through my routine. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Twenty minutes later. I was just finishing my cereal when Jiraiya let himself in. I heard his footsteps stop suddenly in my foyer, not moving for a moment. In the silence, I took a bite of my breakfast, my spoon shaking. Naruto, why are you wearing three jackets? Jiraiya asked. No hot water. I murmured around chattering teeth. But three jackets, sounds like a little much. Jiraiya's footsteps started up again, making their way towards the table. It's almost summer, after all. That water was really cold, 
I answered as he finally came into sight. I watched him sit at the other end of the table, facing me. I wouldn't be surprised if my water's coming straight out of a freezer instead of a water heater. From what you've told me, I wouldn't be either. He shook his head slowly, before turning his attention back towards me. Ready to go. What are we doing today? I asked, focusing my sight on my bowl. If I looked really close I could just find the outlines to the stray pieces of cereal floating around. That meant my chakra echoes were becoming more refined, since it was only a few days ago that I had trouble with chopsticks. Oh, just a little training experiment. That's all, Jiraiya answered as I pretended not to notice the slight hesitation in the statement. It's something I thought would help you with summoning toads, since you're having trouble and all. I summoned seven full toads this morning. Does that get me out of the experiment? What size were they? As big as my fist, I said proudly. I saw his head turn to look at one of my hands for a moment. Your hands are small, he stated flatly. They are not, I exclaimed. Plus, those are the biggest toads of summon so far. And consistently. I get it, you're proud of yourself, Jiraiya said with a sigh. And if you weren't on such a time crunch I'd think this was great progress. But you have maybe a week left before the final phase and the skill isn't even usable. Therefore, you need a bit of help. I frowned, eagerly searching for some way he could be wrong. He wasn't. Fine, I admitted as I stripped off the spare coats. What is this experiment of yours? Oh you know, nothing much, he said. I raised an eyebrow at his failing nonchalant tone. Is it dangerous? There was a pause. Time to go. Huh. I watched as he reached across the table and grabbed my arm right before he shunshined us both away. With a poof I was sitting on the ground, my vision wavering in transfer. When it finally stabilized, I noticed we were somewhere I've never seen before. This place seemed similar to the training grounds, yet wasn't. What I meant was that it smelled like where we go every day, but instead of a hot spring and sand, there were trees and bushes. In fact, the foliage was so dense that I couldn't see very far in any direction. Uh, sensei, this doesn't look like our normal training grounds, I said wearily. That's good, because it's not, he stated. I got up off the ground, dusted myself off, and dropped my spoon in the process. You could have at least let me put my dishes away, I told him as I picked up the spoon and waved it at him. Now I'm going to lose one of my two spoons and my apartment's going to smell like old milk. Back to complaining again. No, I'm just telling you. I don't want to lose my silverware and I don't like my apartment smelling like old milk. Sounds like complaining to me. I sighed in exasperation, not wanting to continue this conversation. Where are we sensei, and why are we here? It's for your new training. Which is? Something I hope will work he said, artfully avoiding the question. Sensei, how am I supposed to do this training if you don't tell me what it is? Like this. I was just about to give him a confused look when he raised a finger and poked my forehead. The tap surprisingly sent stumbling backwards a few feet in my vision swimming again. I took a few more steps backwards to try to keep him from doing so again, only to find nothing under one of my feet. Before I knew what had happened, I started falling backwards. I panicked, trying to get the chakra echoes started again, but to no avail. I was moving so quickly that by the time the echoes were on their way back I was long gone. So, now I was not only falling, but I had no idea what I was falling into. I yelled, the unknown making me fearful. I had no way of knowing how long I was going to fall or even what was down there that would, eventually, stop it. For all I know, this chasm could go on forever, never ending, which, I suppose, is better than it ending. I was just running through what I could possibly do to stop this when I heard a deep, laughter echoing through my head. What the hell are you laughing at? I shouted at him, causing the QB only to laugh harder. I am falling to my death at this very moment and all you can do is laugh. Help me damn it. Don't think so, he said around his laughter. Why not, I could die. Yes, you could, his laughter devolving to chuckles. Then why aren't you helping me? 
I thought you didn't want me to die. I never said that. What about that whole stupid death thing? Never said that either, your sensei did. That's it, I'm coming in there, I yelled. You don't know how, Kit. I'm desperate, I'll figure something out. I closed my eyes, ignoring everything, from the whispered, obviously, that came from the QB, to the falling sensation I still felt. Everything was tuned out as I tried my best to enter my own mindscape. I don't know whether it was the need to get there or just that I've just improved a lot since the last time I tried, but somehow, when I opened my eyes again, the view of the sewers was there to greet me. I grinned slightly, I mean I know that sewer pipes aren't the best thing to see on their own, but after seeing nothing but the pale forms my chakra echoes come back with, I didn't really mind. It didn't take me long to find the QB. After all, it's not that hard to find a giant fox behind a giant gate. Told you I would, I said. Crossing my arms I glared at the fox in front of me. He yawned, his tail swishing behind him were the only indication of his previous amusement. And what an accomplishment that was, accessing your own mind. You should be so proud of yourself. Don't give me sarcasm, I'm falling to my death and really don't need your flack. Are you sure? I find that it makes situations like this so much better. Why won't you help me? You seem to forget that I'm, essentially a demon. I do this type of stuff on a whim. I closed my eyes, my eyelid twitching in annoyance. I took a calming breath before opening my eyes and continuing. And what, whim, is it that keeping you from helping me not die? It's Tuesday, he said. My jaw dropped as I stared at him in disbelief. Also because you're supposed to do that thing on Tuesdays that you haven't done yet. The pranks. Yes. You're refusing to help me because I haven't done a prank. Yes. It's 8 in the morning. I haven't had time for pranks. That's your problem, not mine. Then how the hell am I not supposed to die? I exclaimed, pulling at my hair with both hands. I could be dead already just from talking to you and not even know it. This is your mind, Kit. Everything that happens here, happens at the speed of thought. Therefore, you could be an inch from the bottom and not know it in here for several more hours. Oh, I said, processing this information. But I can't stay here forever. For once, you're right. Then what am I supposed to do? I flopped down to sit in the sewer water as I crossed my arms once again. The only thing I can think of is spamming a tone of clones to break my fall, but with all this training... My chakra hasn't had time to replenish much at all. At this point I couldn't make enough clones to clean my room. Maybe you could use that useless jutsu to save yourself. You know, the I can summon toads the size of my tiny palm jutsu. Maybe I will, I exclaimed. The QB flashed a grin, as if calling my bluff. Or what had started as one. Oh, what are you going to do? Spawn a tone of those small toads to land on. I doubt the toad community would be very happy about that. No, I said simply, a smile spreading across my own face. I'll summon one big one. With what chakra? Yours, of course. End chapter 20. Start chapter 21. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 21. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. The QB stared at me for a moment. Mind repeating that. I must be having a hard time hearing today. He lifted one of his giant paws and used his pinky claw to clean out his ear. It was strange, I could have sworn you said you'd be using my chakra. I did. There was another pause. So tell me, what the hell gave you the impression I'd just hand over my chakra after saying I wasn't going to help you? You don't have a choice. I believe I do, that's why it's my chakra. But you're in my body. That makes it my chakra by default. That's not how it works you little brat and you know it, the QB growled, narrowing his eyes at me. But I stood firm, I was not about to be intimidated in my own mind. Sounds right to me, I said, staring down the fox in front of me. My body, my chakra. I should let you die for your impertinence. But letting me die would make you look bad. Killing a human has never been held against me before. Why should it now? I paused for a moment, trying to figure out if he told the truth. 
You're bluffing, I decided, my voice not sounding all too sure of itself. The QB only grinned, making me nervous for the first time since this conversation started. Am I, I thought I couldn't lie. The QB lowered his head so his eyes were level with mine. Doesn't that mean that I can't bluff either? I stuttered, trying to come up with something to say, but his unblinking gaze made it very difficult to do so. After hearing only a few strange sounds come out of my mouth, the QB continued with a chuckle. Therefore, if I was bluffing now, that means I would have to have lied about not being able to do so. Then, you'd have to doubt every word I've said so far. My eyes widened as I realized that he was telling the truth. If he really had fooled me all this time then there was nothing he could have said that I would be able to believe completely. I might as well have led him out when I first met him. I felt my hands start to shake as brief glimpses of the terror crossed my mind. Buildings tumbling down and people screaming as the QB destroyed all he could, all because I believed him. I see you're starting to understand, the QB said, his voice rumbling through the sewer ominously. How believing one false statement has the potential to destroy everything you hold dear. Because if I'm every free of you, truly free, I will kill those who all of those responsible for locking me away. The grin was gone from his face by the time he reached his last words. So tell me, Kit, he continued, his eyes still locked with mine. Was I bluffing? Am I still bluffing? I, I, I don't. You don't what? You don't know. I'm sorry, that's not an answer I can accept. It's either yes, I'm bluffing about letting you die, or I'm not. After all, you don't have the time for indecision. You could go splat any moment now. But you said I had time. I did say, and according to you I could be untrustworthy in lying about anything. Are you really willing to take that chance? Thoughts raced by as I tried to figure out an answer to his question. Was lying, was he telling the truth? Either could be true, he could easily be incapable of lying as he could. My mind stopped, a spark of an idea appearing. It wasn't anything concrete or anything close to an answer, just something I noticed that didn't seem right. He said, could, a lot, could, and would, and if, those are all words he'd used more than once in this conversation, and I doubt there's even one of those statements without one. You are bluffing, I finally said, feeling confident yet again. Oh, so I can lie. There's a difference between lie and bluff. I smirked at him as I went to explain. Bluffing is leading someone in different direction, lying is saying something false. You can bluff without lying, that's what you've been teaching me all month after all. The fox narrowed his eyes at me, but I wasn't done just yet. So, you were bluffing when you said you'd let me die and haven't stopped since. Is that your final answer? Yes. The QB sighed, relaxing back into a less threatening posture. Well, I can't really say that you haven't learned anything, he said, his voice not echoing as much. Go, save yourself from becoming a bug splat at the bottom of a canyon. Are you going to give me the chakra? I asked. But of course, you can have all the chakra you need, he said with a sly grin. Before I could ask what he meant by that I was thrown out of my mindscape. I felt myself falling yet again, surrounded by darkness even after I opened my eyes. But I didn't waste any time moping about it, instead I immediately bit my thumb and started running through the hand symbols. Summoning Jutsu, I shouted, slamming my hand down where the ground would have been. I heard a poof as I smelled smoke surround me. Just as I felt the smoke start to disappear, I landed on something springy. I bounced a few times before I finally settled on the surface. I wasn't falling anymore, so I had to assume that whatever I had summoned had done something to fix that. Now that my surroundings weren't rushing by me at lightning speed, I tried my jutsu again to see if it worked. Bluish-gray forms rushed to meet me, showing me the walls covered in sharp spikes as well as the huge form I had landed on. Whoa, I said, finally getting a good look at the toad I summoned. It was huge, the being easily took over the width of the cavern, which was huge in itself. It worked. I scrambled to my feet and walked towards the back end of the creature. Once I was there, 
I knelt down, staring at its rear. It didn't look like it had a tail, but I wanted to be sure. I glanced back towards its head, seeing it was more preoccupied with its surroundings than with me. So I turned forward again before touching its butt. What the hell? It exclaimed in a deep, gravelly voice. Before I could celebrate the lack of a tail, or even be surprised that it talked, it spun around, almost sending me falling once again. I had slid off the edge of the giant toad, only able to keep myself from tumbling completely off by using chakra to stick to his side. Who dares touch me? He demanded. I stayed silent, not wanting to alert him to my presence. I know you're there, whoever you are, you can't hide from me. Scared of what would happen if I spoke, I didn't say a word. Either come forward, or I leave. Sorry, sorry, I said, scrambling forward towards his face until I was standing on his nose. Please don't leave, you're the only thing keeping me from falling to death. Is that why Jiraiya summoned me? To save a tiny human? Jiraiya didn't summon you, I did, I said, my apologetic tone all but forgotten. I needed something to break my fall other than sharp rocks. He stared at me cross-eyed for a moment before he broke out in a shaking laughter that almost made me lose my footing. That's hilarious, he exclaimed in his amusement. A brat like you, summoning me. That's the best damn joke I've heard since Jiraiya tried to pass off his books as fine literature. But I did, I swear it. I don't believe you. Well it's true, I crossed my arms indignantly. Arrow Senen shoved me down this ravine for some reason and I couldn't stop myself on my own so I did the last thing I could do and summoned you, so you better start believing me. Are you trying to order me around? He asked, his eyes narrowing. Quote dot dot, maybe, I haven't decided yet. Do you have any idea who I am? Not in the slightest, does it even matter? I'm Gamabunta you brat, he exclaimed. I stared at him as I tried to figure out what that meant. I'm the chief toad and you're trying to order me around. I don't think so. I couldn't stop my jaw from dropping as I heard this. How much chakra did you give me? I demanded the QB. He only chuckled knowingly mumbled something about wishing he had snacks to watch the show. Other than your ego getting in the way, why can't you acknowledge that I summoned you? Because it's physically impossible. You don't have enough chakra, your search control is too bad and you haven't even gotten the summoning procedure mastered yet. There is no way you could have brought me here on your own accord. Now listen here, you. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, future Hokage. I have more chakra than I know what to do with and have enough search control to stick six coins around my head while standing on water. As for the summoning procedure, I am able to consistently summon real toads and not those almost toad tadpoles. Is that so? Yes and as the guy that summoned you, I demand to be taken out of this ravine. Tell me one thing first, Gamabunta said, giving me a strange look. What the hell gave you the impression that the summoner is in search control? And, better yet, what made you think a blind brat like you can do so to me? End chapter 21. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. This is part 9 of what if Naruto lost his sight. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Start chapter. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Chapter 22. Hey everyone, sorry about the late post. It's been extremely busy on my side and I've barely had a chance to write at all. Anyways, thanks for all the reviews. You guys are awesome. Also, in answer to the guest review, have no fear I will be moving on with the story soon enough. I have a one more chapter before I start with the final segment of the exams. So, I think th. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. What? I questioned as I stared at the toad blankly. Oh don't play dumb with me. I can feel those chakra waves hit me every time you send them out. You're blinder than a bat summons and even if did have enough chakra to bring me here, you'd never have been able to sign your name. I can sign my name just fine. I shouted in defense. It was a little messy but it was still there. There's no way a blind kid could have summoned me. 
My sight has nothing to do with this. Truthfully I don't care whether you're blind, deaf, or crippled. Though, I wouldn't mind if you were mute at the moment, but that's beside the point. The point is that you're a cocky shrimp that thinks just because I came when you asked means that you own me. But you don't, no one does. Even that lecher Jiraiya can't possibly think of ordering me around without risking his own safety, he said, staring at me the entire time. So, if Jiraiya can't order me around, how do you suppose you can? Um, that's right, it's impossible. You'll never be in charge of me. The closest thing you will ever get to that is being my servant, or my minion, depending on how generous I feel. Then are you feeling generous enough to not leave me to die down here? I asked tentatively. Gamabunta only laughed in response almost launching me clean off his face. And how do you expect me to do that? He said through his amusement. I don't know, jump. I climbed back to my feet once his laughter died down enough to get a firm footing. Oh yes, that will work quite well, Gamabunta said, sarcasm dripping off his words. You can hardly stay put while I laugh. If I jumped, you'd be lost for sure. No I wouldn't. You'll tumble off before I even reach ground level. I'm not that weak, I plopping myself down angrily. I sat there with my arms and legs crossed, glowering at him. I highly doubt that. Fine, I shouted, then I'm not moving. What? The toad asked. You heard me, I'm not moving from here until you recognize that I summoned you. And you stop calling me a weakling. You'd have to be on my back for the rest of the day in order to convince me of that. Then I will. Gamabunta narrowed his eyes at me, finally realizing that I wasn't backing down from this challenge. You'll be in the dirt in a matter of minutes, he said after a moment. I smirked in response. Now I highly doubt that, I said with a smirk. I could feel the vibrations his amphibian growl throughout my entire body. If that's what you want, I'll oblige. But I'm not letting you off easy, the chief toad replied. Before I could do anything with that information, he lowered himself, readying his muscles. This was the only warning I got before he leapt high into the air. I yelled as the force knocked me flat on my back, pinning me to his nose. It wasn't until we were high into the air, so far above the ground that my jutsu couldn't see it, that his ascent slowed until we were suspended in air. Well, until he started falling. The change in direction almost sent me off in a different direction, it, at the very least, sent me tumbling from his nose down towards his back. It was all I could do to grab the collar of his kimono before I was lost completely. Gamabunta landed with such force that I heard could hear trees shatter for probably a half mile around us. The only reason I didn't break bones or something was when I slammed into his back was because he was kinda squishy. I did it, I screamed happily as I tried to write my vision. I'm not done yet, Gaki. This is only the start, he said with a smile in his voice. He leapt into the air once again before I had a chance to even question my own decision. Dash 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 dash. Jiraiya watched the toad jump around frantically from a safe distance, very curious as to what had actually went on in that canyon. He had stayed close, his lion main jutsu at the ready if he needed to grab him. There was no way in hell he was going to let his student die in a training exercise. Not to mention that, if he did, he was sure Minato would come back and haunt him. But, as it would turn out, Jiraiya had no need for such measures. Naruto seemed to have worked something out with his tenant because the next thing the Toad Sage knew there was a flash of Kyubi Chakra and Gamabunta appeared. It was about then that Jiraiya decided that it would be best to retreat to a safe distance and watch this curious event unfold. What went on down there? Jiraiya muttered to himself. He could just faintly hear Naruto yelling over the trees Gamabunta was knocking down. He was just wondering how long they were going to continue this when the toad jumped high into the air again. Just let go you little snot. Jiraiya heard the toad shout before falling back to the ground with a thud. Never, Naruto replied soon after. I'm going to assume it'll be a while, Jiraiya said as he turned away from the jumping toad. I better alert Sensei to the repairs. Tenzo's going to have his work cut out for him. With that Jiraiya shunshined away, 
leaving Naruto and Gamabunta to whatever business they had going on. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Eight hours later, Jiraiya came back around four o'clock to check on their progress. He hadn't heard any crashing as of late so he figured it was at least safe enough to peek. What he came back to was puzzling to say the least. Gamabunta was sitting in the middle of the small river, his large head resting on one hand while his eyes slowly drifted shut. Naruto was still on his back, looking more ruffled than ever as he snored loudly. So, are you done jumping around like a moron? Jiraiya asked as he stepped out from one of the abused trees. Yes, the toad said, his eyes now completely shut. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. What was going on anyways? I was testing him, somehow it turned into a challenge to see if he could stay on my back till the sun disappeared. Jiraiya gave the toad a strange look before glancing at the sun still firmly up in the sky. So, why'd you stop? We're currently at a stalemate, Gamabunta replied, gesturing to the small human on his back with his free hand. He lost consciousness 15 minutes ago, yet somehow that stubborn little brat still won't let go of my kimono. I think his grip's stronger in sleep than it was when he was awake. Well, that's an interesting turn of events, Jiraiya said with a smirk. Tell me about it, the toad muttered. I guess I'm stuck here until he either lets go or falls off. I can remove him if you want. Be my guest, he answered as Jiraiya jumped onto his back to examine his student. Though if anyone asks the sun was clearly down by the time he passed out. Why is that? Jiraiya said with a chuckle. Naruto seemed all right, just some exhaustion from his early morning training and his meeting with Gamabunta. Gives me an excuse to work with him like I'm supposed to. That kid's going to need all the help he can get. Because of his disability, Jiraiya began peeling the boy's fingers away in order to free the chief toad. Because he has a habit of getting himself into trouble that could have been avoided, Gamabunta said as the last finger came free. Jiraiya put Naruto over his shoulder and jumped to the ground. I'm guessing you know about his eyes then. I'm his sensei, of course I do. Then the next time you have him sign something, make sure the scroll is right side up, he said as he got to his feet. Seeing the kid's signature upside down was a pretty good indication that he was either blind or a complete moron. I thought you'd like a small warning to what you were dealing with. Are you sure it wasn't just to troll your student? Quote dot dot, that too, Jiraiya gave the toad a sly smile. I best get this kid home, let him sleep this off. Sleep sounds good at the moment. I think I'll take a nap, Gamabunta yawned as he spoke. There was a big poof of smoke as he went back to the summoning world without so much as a goodbye. Jiraiya just shook his head before he shunshuned away himself. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Next day. When I finally woke up my head was killing me. It felt like someone used my skull to ring a very large gong. Repeatedly, the last thing I remembered was clinging to Gamabunta's collar trying not to fall off. I guess I must have passed out at some point. For a moment I thought they had dropped me off at the hospital but the familiar smell of old wood and ramen set me at ease. There wasn't a trace of antiseptic in the air, only that of water and something my ache head couldn't identify. I groaned as I sat up, my body competing with my head for the award in most painful body part of the year. Ow, I thought to the QB. Remind me not to do that again. Kid, he answered in little more than a whisper. Chakra echoes, now. Okay, I answered, a little worried. I focused my chakra before sending it out, feeling very confused on what came back. I tensed, my limbs preparing to dart at the sight of the figure sitting cross-legged at the end of my bed. It was about then that I figured out what that other smell was that I couldn't identify. Hello Foxy, Fu said enthusiastically a moment before I dived out my own window. She soon followed, starting yet another panic-filled chase through the village. End Chapter 22 Blindsided by Twice the Trouble Chapter 23 Trouble 1 Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. One week later. 
Frank, the QB stated as I grabbed my remaining jacket off the back of the chair. It was about 10 in the morning and I had decided to make the most out of the day off my sensei gave me. Of course this meant sleeping in and having Ichirakus for breakfast. Maybe lunch as well, but the fox had other plans regarding my free time. I'm not even out the door yet, I said. I slipped my arms into the sleeves and zipped up my coat. Can't you wait until I at least had breakfast? I could, but since you haven't even thought on what you're going to do I'm not. I have finals tomorrow, just leave me alone already. I shoved my hands into my pockets as I left my apartment and started my way towards the ramen stand. For the millionth time, that's not how it works, the QB said with a sigh. Fine, I'll come up with something over breakfast. Happy, I said, switching to non-verbal communication as I entered the public streets. Appeased, also, will you expand your chakra echoes already? We've had too many close calls with those women and I doubt you want to end up completely coatless. Aren't you running low on shirts as well? I'm down to two, one of which isn't even a t-shirt, I answered, stopping at the bottom of the stairs in order to focus my chakra towards the other three echo points. I didn't move for a moment as I began to see things from every side. It was hard to get used to but I was getting better at it. At least now I can figure out which way I'm facing which hopefully eliminates any possibility of a dock incident repeat. Once I was mentally situated, I started walking again, humming happily as I made my way towards the ramen. No day starting with ramen can ever be bad, no matter what happens. The ramen stand was just coming into sight when the world decided it was necessary to prove me wrong. Before I even knew what was going on, I was suddenly assaulted from above, an unknown force pinning me to the sidewalk. You know, you're getting harder and harder to sneak up on, Fishcake, an all too familiar voice said from my back. I like it. I think your next training session should be dedicated to an echo point on top your head. I'll keep that in mind, I grumbled silently. Morning foo, I muttered into the dirt. I heard her huff in disappointment. It wouldn't take a genius to figure out that she was frowning at me. What kind of reaction was that? She pouted. Where's the look of surprise? The panic to get way. The running. Particularly the running. You're not trying to boycott again are you? No, I'm hungry. I haven't had breakfast yet, I answered, propping my head up on my hands so I wasn't eating the dirt anymore. So, why don't you just take my t-shirt and leave me alone for a while? You can even leave me alone for the whole day if you want. My sensei gave me the day off and I intend to enjoy it. Really, I got the day off too. My face went pale as I heard the grin appear back in her voice. Please be joking, I muttered. That's awesome, oh, I just got the best idea, she said, ignoring me. Please don't be what I think it is. Please don't be what I think it is, I chanted to myself. We can spend the whole day together. No. And first we'll have breakfast. Please no. And then we can spend the rest of the day walking around town. No, 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 no. Just, the two of us. No, I shouted, jumping to my feet while simultaneously knocking food to the ground. Screw this, the QB screamed, get the hell out of here. I was just about to follow his advice when two vice-like hands grabbed my arm keeping me from taking even another step. Too late, my mind's already made up, she said, changing her grasp so it looked more like we had linked arms, the grip of the hold no different than before. So, where do you go for breakfast around this place, I'm starving. Why you don't want to go where I'm going, I said desperately. I was just going for some ramen. It's not even breakfast food so you should just find somewhere else to eat. I've never had ramen for breakfast, but it sounds like fun. Let's go. She began dragging me at a dead run down the sidewalk, making it very difficult for me to keep up. But, I tried to say, only to be cut off when she stopped short, almost separating my arm from the rest of my body. Um, which way is it again? Unsure of that myself now, I let the extra echo points drop away, leaving only the one on my forehead still active. 
I glanced around only to find that she was going in the exact opposite direction. I thought about telling her she was going the right way, if only to keep my favorite shop out of her knowledge, but I was starving. Seriously, my stomach was trying to eat itself while making all the appropriate noises to indicate such. That and I haven't had ramen in a week, I needed my fix. Just take her there, the QB said after a moment. At least that way you'll have a chance to escape. I suppose that's better than wandering around until she gets bored. It's the other way, I told her, only for her to spin us around and dart off in the right direction. It only took us about five minutes of food dragging me down the sidewalk to get to the ramen stand. It would have only taken two if she hadn't passed it. Twice. Are you sure this is the place? She asked as she examined the ramen stall. It's kinda small. Yes I'm sure, I said before finally being able to pull my arm free from her grasp. Welcome to Ichiraku's, the best ramen shop ever created. She continued inspecting the shop as I entered, ducking slightly under the fabric sign before taking a seat at one of the stools. Morning, I said, getting only stares from the owner and his daughter. What's up? You just passed us twice before entering, we should be asking you that, Aim stated. Did you forget where we were? I didn't. I heard Fu's footsteps near the shop as I used my thumb to point in her direction. She did. The fabric rustled as she moved it out of the way, stopping for a moment as their gazes turned to her. Um, hi, she said almost nervously before taking a seat right next to me. Though technically she didn't know where it was to begin with so saying that she forgot it isn't really true. You didn't give very good directions, she exclaimed, any nervousness I thought I heard having already left. I was giving great directions, you just weren't listening to them. What's your name? A.I.M. asked, interrupting us both. Oh, I'm Fu, from Taki, she answered. Well, it's nice to meet you Fu. I'm A.I.M. and that's my father Tuki. A.I.M. nodded her head towards the old man, who waved a spoon in response. Now, what would you two like to eat? Pork please. I said with a smile. How many? She asked as she took notes. I think only six. I want to save some for lunch. Money or ramen? Both. Aim chuckled before turning to Fu. What about you dear? I'll have what he's having, she answered cheerfully. Okay, then, the first three bowls will be done in a few minutes, she said, jotting down the last of the notes before taking them to her father. There's no way you're going to be able to eat all that. I said once A.I.M. left. Of course I can, Fu exclaimed. I'm a Jinchuriki after all. We need to eat a lot in order to keep the seal running. Still don't think so. Prepare to be proved wrong, foxy boy. I glared at her as she laughed in her own amusement. So, A.I.M. began as she returned, leaning on the other side of the counter. How do you two know each other? I'm his friend, Fu replied making me gawk at her in surprise. No, she's my stalker, I answered, making Fu huff. You make it sound like a bad thing, Fu crossed her arms in a pouty fashion. I mean, it's not like I'm the only one that stalks you. There's that white-eyed chick who's always poking her pointer fingers together. There's that eyepatch sensei sometimes, and the pervert sensei some other times. Then, of course there are those Anbu, Oh and the creepy Anbu too. Can't forget them. She had her hand out, counting each person on a different finger as she mentioned them. I stared at her in surprise. I mean, I knew Hanada was following me sometimes, I noticed it almost as soon as I got those extra echo points working. I'd also occasionally notice one of my senseis checking up on me. But why would Anbu be following me around? And what exactly made the, creepy Anbu, any different. So see, it's really not that big of a deal. That and it's easier to call me your friend then, that chick that likes to chase me and steal my clothes. That's not the point, I muttered to myself since she was ignoring me anyways. And that's how it is, she said, turning towards Aim. We're friends. Okay, she answered. She was silent for a moment, then took a breath like she was about to speak only to get cut off by her father calling the order. The whole situation was forgotten as Aim rushed back and brought the beginning of our meals. 
Arigato Ayim, I shouted, grabbing a pair of chopsticks as she set the bulls in front of us. You're welcome, dig in. And that I did, keeping an eye on Fu the whole time. I watched as she stared at the bull with a curious air to her. Almost like she had never had ramen before, but I knew that was impossible. I mean, how can someone ever live without at least trying ramen? Anyways, after a moment or two she grabbed a set of chopsticks and finally took a bite. The sound that followed could only be described as an excited yell that almost knocked me off my stool in surprise. This stuff's amazing, Fu shouted. A second later she was off her stool, her hand slammed onto the table, and her face only inches from Aime's. Tell me your secret. Um, Aime made a nervous sound as she tried to come up with an answer. You're making her nervous, Fu, I said with a sigh, the other Jinkiriki turning to face me. So, I make you nervous. Yes, but I can't throw you out of the ramen stand because of it. Oh, good point. Fu took her seat again, returning to her food. Sorry Ichiraku-san. That's all right, and you can call me Aim. Okay. After that there was silence at the booth, Fu and I were too focused on our food to talk to each other while Aim and Tuki watched us, no doubt curious about Fu. I smiled into my food as I stole a glance at my breakfast companion. She looked happy, as far as I could tell. She seemed to genuinely like the ramen to the point where she was swaying in her chair as she ate. This was a reaction to Ichiraku's that I've never seen before, and I've introduced a lot of people to this place. So, if she likes it here almost as much as I do, wouldn't that mean she isn't as bad as I first thought? I can't believe what I'm hearing, the QB muttered, almost making me drop my chopsticks. You're questioning this now. But she likes the ramen. Naruto, this food isn't a character test. A nice person can hate the taste of ramen just as much as a bad person can like it. Well, I've never met a good person that has ever hated Ichiraku's ramen. You know what, I'm not even going to argue. I have better things to be doing, like those pranks. Are you kidding, I have more important things on my mind. Then ditch her already, she's more than distracted enough to get away. I'm not leaving till I'm done with my ramen. Prank, 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 prank. Cut it out. Prank, 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 prank. Shut up, I said, not realizing that it had been out loud until Fu turned her attention towards me with a small, confused hum. I didn't say anything, she said, her voice muffled by the ramen in her mouth. Sorry, not you. Fox won't shut up, I answered quietly, not wanting Aime to hear me. He wants me to prank people. Why? She mumbled before finally swallowing her food. Is it because he's bored? That's why Nanabi has me prank. She does that too. Yup, all the time. She just had me douse my old sensei's shampoo with pink hair dye before coming here. That's awesome, I said with a grin. Of course it is. Won't be as much when I get back though. I'm sure he's going to be furious. That's half the fun. What does he want you to do? She asked, placing her chopsticks to the side. He doesn't really care. I made a deal with him a couple weeks ago and now I have to do some sort of awesome prank every week. A deal? Seriously? Fu said, sounding unbelieving. That wasn't very smart. I know, I answered, resting my head in the palm of my hand. But when it's either prank others every week or get mentally tormented for the rest of my life, well, you make up your mind pretty quickly. Sounds about right, Fu mimicked me, resting her head almost vertically on her fist as she stared at me. I tried to ignore her, but it was kinda difficult when that was the only thing she did for three minutes straight. Sue. She stared, I lifted my head, turning to look at her. What type of prank are we gonna do? We, I asked in confusion but was ignored again. It has to be something good, she continued tapping her fingers on the counter in thought. And if I'm involved it has to be freaking awesome. I don't get, was all I was about to say before she shot straight up, her hand slamming into the table yet again, almost sending our food flying. That's it, she shouted as she leapt from her stool. Let's go. What, I asked. Fu only grabbed my hand and dragged me out of the chair. 
We were halfway down the street before I realized what was going on. Wait, no, my ramen! Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark! Five hours later. It was around two o'clock that we finally finished Fu's epic prank. Now she was forcibly walking me around town as we waited for someone to notice. At the moment, more people noticed the fact that the girl I was walking arm in arm with was wearing my jacket than anything we've done today. So, how long do you think it will take them to figure it out? She asked as she almost skipped by my side. It shouldn't be long. After all Kaka Sensei is always reading those books so I'm sure he'll find out soon enough, I answered, testing her grip as I spoke. I wasn't going anywhere. I can't wait, Fu exclaimed with a little hop. Just imagining the cries of desperation as all those perverts find horticulture books in the covers of their favorite porn books. Personally, I think the gardeners checking out books at the library will be more surprised. True, she said, her voice smiling. Silence fell between us as she continued leading me through town, seemingly without a purpose. Um, since we're done, can I go home now? I asked after a few minutes. She gave me a glance before turning forwards again. No, was her only answer. But why? Because I haven't had a chance to explore the town yet. I've been too busy training, oh and chasing you of course. Then walk around on your own, I said with a pout. I have things I have to do before tomorrow, like preparing my weapons, checking my kunais, and paying for that ramen we walked out on earlier. Oh yeah, forgot about that, she said with a guilty chuckle. So can I go now? No. Why? Because I want to walk around town with you, she answered, sounding agitated. But why? I exclaimed, making her stop in her tracks. Because it's not fair. Fu threw her arms to her sides in a pouty manner. In doing so she released me, but I was so surprised that I didn't run. I stayed put, wanting to hear what she had to say, all the while ignoring the desperate yells from the Kyubi telling me to run for my life. It's not fair that the QB and Nanabi have known each other for years yet I only met you last month. It's not fair that I'm being shipped back home immediately after the exams when everyone else gets a few days to recover. And it's definitely not fair that the rest of your friends get to see you on a daily basis while I don't even know the next time I'll be in the same village as you. It's just not fair. I stared at her in silence as she recovered from her outburst. Even the QB was quiet as we waited for her to continue. I just wanted to spend a day with you so we can get to know each other more, she whispered, her head aimed at the ground. Is that too much to ask? I stood there for a moment trying to decide what to do. Every instinct inside me was telling me to run for it, to get away before she realized I was even gone, but that didn't seem right. Leaving her alone like that. Kit, don't do it, don't you dare do it, the QB warned. Just get the hell out of there like I told you. It's a trap, a trap I tell you. I sighed, tuning out the fox as I held my arm out to her. Where do you want to go? I asked. Fu looked up at me for a moment before latching onto my arm with such excitement that I almost fell to the ground. Doesn't matter, she exclaimed happily. Just make sure it's awesome. End chapter 23. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Peace out people. This is part 10 chapter 24 to 26 of what if Naruto lost his sight. Link in description. Sorry for not posting. I lost my motivation for a bit but I am back and ready to post. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Start chapter 24. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next day. I woke up the next morning a little confused. The entire day yesterday had been nothing but terror and uncertainty. By the time the sun went down, I still had no idea what was going on, or why. The rest of the day itself hadn't been too bad. She behaved herself for most of our time out. 
We mostly just walked around town and chatted about different things, most of which was boasting about pranks and complaining about our baiju. I'll admit, it was kinda nice talking with someone that was going through the same thing I was. Anyways, everything was pretty peaceful until our prank was discovered. Then we spent the next several hours running from perverts and gardeners alike. It was quite easy to ditch them once we were found out. All we had to do was run through the bookstore then Eno's flower shop and we ended up losing quite a few of them due to distractions. The rest we lost by dodging into ally ways and using the old-fashioned hedging technique. Though I will say this, by the time it was all said and done, I'm pretty sure there were a few herbalists added to Jiraiya's fan club. Judging by the fact that several of those books weren't returned to the library immediately. I also noticed a few of the lecher sneaking plants back to their apartments, so I guess everything worked out well in that regard. The sun was just starting to set when we had finally gotten rid of the last of them. We somehow ended up on top the Hokage Monument, looking down at the village below. All right, now this is awesome, she said, staring at the site with awe at whatever colors the sunset was portraying at that point. Unfortunately I couldn't exactly join in her amazement since the only thing my chakra echoes would pick up were a few of the taller rooftops. Arigato. You're welcome, I answered, unwilling to admit that we had ended up here at this time purely by accident. I stood there awkwardly, keeping my arms crossed as I tried to keep warm. I could feel the drop in temperature as the sun was falling, which would have been fine if I still had my coat. I used one of my side echo points to glance at Fu who had said jacket zipped up to her nose while she held the collar in place with both of her hands. She clearly enjoyed wearing it. So, it's getting late, I said, turning off my spare echo point so I was just looking at my shifting feet. And with the sun going down it's technically the end of the day. Yeah, it is. That means I can go home right? I asked tentatively. She was silent for a moment, not even moving from her spot for a while. I was just beginning to think she wasn't going to answer at all when she let out a small sigh. I suppose, she answers, not sounding overly happy about it. Okay, guess I'll see you tomorrow then. I had just taken a few steps away when she called back to me. Hey Naruto, she said. I stopped as I glanced over my shoulder to see her facing me now. Within the next few seconds she steps forward and gives me an unexpected peck on the cheek. Good night. I stood there in awe as I tried to figure out what was going on. I was still no closer to an answer when she tackled me, stole my shirt, and darted away while waving it like a victory flag. Even as I laid there the next morning, I still hadn't figure out what was going on. It was just so confusing. Why would she? Before I could continue that train of thought, my watch buzzed, alerting me to the turn of the hour. I ran my fingers over the face of the watch to feel that it was 9 o'clock. I sat up quickly, trying to dart out of my bed in the same motion only to get tangled in my sheets and fall to the floor. I felt the watch again to make sure I was right. It now said 9.01. I was supposed to be there at 8.30. It was going to take me 20 minutes to just get there. And usually more than 10 minutes to get ready to leave. Damn it. I shouted as struggled to get untangled from the sheets. After they finally released me, I darted over to my clothes and tried to get dressed while I turned on my chakra echoes. Unfortunately it wasn't till I got going that I noticed I was trying to put my pants on backwards and use my boxers as a shirt. Once I got situated wearing my regular pants plus the long sleeve black shirt that was the only one I had left, I checked my watch again. It read 9.10. I didn't even bother to swear as I ran through the rest of my apartment, stopping only to grab a granola bar from the kitchen before darting out the door. I'm late, I'm late. I'm late, I chanted around my breakfast as I darted across the rooftops. That's when a thought hit me. Wait, why do I care? They'll just blame Kakashi anyways. With a shrug I continued, not quite so panist as before, deciding I better come up with a pretty good excuse to make up for it. 
It took another 15 minutes to reach the entrance. I could see everyone standing in the arena already, some of which were looking at their wrists, no their watches. I immediately jumped to the ground and darted through the archway to the arena, only for my foot to catch on a rock, sending me tumbling into the stadium. You're late, I heard Sakura shout from the bleachers as I climbed back to my feet. Well, you see, Konohamaru was upset about not playing ninja with him and set a herd of cattle at me. I said, and where are these cows now? R. Proctor asked. He wasn't the same coughing one from the prelims, he was wearing his hit I ate backwards and was chewing on a sanban. Hamburger, I nodded confidently. Before he could comment, a pair of figures appeared shunshuning into the arena. Yo, the taller said. Hi sensei, I said over Sakura's second exclamation. Sorry we're late Genma, Sasuke took too long changing into his unitard, he said to the proctor blatantly ignored Sasuke's attempts to correct him as he spoke. Congratulations on corrupting your students, Genma said. Naruto just arrived as well. His excuse. Less believable than yours. Nice, I must hear it. But later, there was the sound of footsteps as he walked over to me. First, how many fingers? Seriously sensei, you're checking if I can count. I exclaimed as I pretended to scowl. It wasn't like I didn't know this was coming or anything. No one else got asked that. I questioned Sasuke before coming here. Now, how many fingers? He held a hand up with a couple fingers up. Fine. Three, five, two, six, eight, fifteen, twenty-four. You're hedging your hand. Good catch. You pass. I glared at him as he no doubt grinned back. Good luck. Thanks, sensei. Moving on, Genma said before launching into an opening speech. I stepped into the end of the line as he spoke, only to have to stiffen a groan of despair. My luck couldn't have been any worse, I was sure of it. Hey Foxy, Fu whispered, making me I shudder. Like my coat. I glanced at her to see a strange coat on over her bag. It had no sleeves or collar, but other than that it looked kind of like mine. Exactly like mine, in fact it even smelled like mine. There was no mistaking the smell of ramen and fox. Is that mine? Yep. What happened to it? I improved it. You did that to all of them, didn't you? Yep, she said as she took off the jacket and tossed it at me. I struggled to catch it, making Genma stall in his speech. Sorry. I gave a nervous laugh making him shake his head before. I slipped the coat on quietly, zipping it as far as I could, which for some reason it was only to about mid-chest. I'll drop the rest off before I leave, she whispered before analyzing my new wardrobe. Yes, that's better, you should wear a shirt like that more often. It looks very good with the coat. I don't have another shirt like this. Then get more. Why should I? Because I'm keeping the shirts, she sounded almost evil as I sent a glare her way. I'm thinking about making a quilt. Or a really large flag. Will all combatants leave the arena except Uzumaki Naruto and Huganeji, Genma announced. Wait, I'm first. Yes, you are. Kakashi should have told you a month ago. Sorry about that, the Cyclops could be heard saying from the stands. I must have slipped my mind. How could you forget something like this? You're afraid to fight me, aren't you? Neji's question had no emotion to be found in it. Fate has already dictated your loss, after all. Shut up you, I shouted, turning towards him. That has nothing to do with it. Are you finished? I need to start this match, Genma stated. I opened my mouth several times to say something but couldn't think of anything. Fine, whatever, I really shouldn't be surprised anymore. I stepped into the center of the arena, across from Neji. Are the combatants ready? Neji nodded as I shouted, hell yeah, fight. You have no chance of winning, fate is on my side. And how much an advantage can you get from a fire extinguisher? I asked, obviously infuriating the long-haired boy. A fire extinguisher? Oh come on. 
You can't tell me you've never heard of the fire extinguisher of fate. No, he stated as I grumbled, regardless, why would I need a fire extinguisher to defeat you? My strength far surpasses yours. Tell that to Kiba, his little speech was almost the same, well, without the fire extinguisher part. I am more powerful than Kiba. Me too, I said happily. Are we going to fight or just throw words back and forth till someone folds? His eyes narrowed before lunging forward, using his family tijutsu to obviously try and take me out immediately. I dodged the attack while simultaneously creating several clones to use as shields when he came at me again. Of course, it didn't take long for him to dispel them. As the clones disappeared, I got the distinct impression of foreign chakra being forced into my system, making my arm numb for a moment before it faded away. I was so surprised by this that I barely had time to dodge a palm aimed straight at my chest. That was about when I remembered that something similar happened when I fought Kiba that I had completely forgotten about, therefore never asked about. I dodged another hit before darting across the arena to get some distance between him and I if only to get a second to think. You're scared of me, I can tell. You haven't even dared to attack me. Think what you like, Neji. But I will beat you. Weren't you listening? You won't win. Sorry. I've had a problem with my ears as of late, I said, using a finger to clean my ear. I've been having trouble hearing overconfident assholes. Before he had a chance to comment back, I created several more clones that charged at him. Those few seconds had been all I needed to come up with a plan, if only a little one. I was hoping to find some sort of flaw in his technique, something that only being hit multiple times by said skill could find. But as each of my clones disappeared, I found nothing. His form was perfect, there was no hesitation in any of his throws, I couldn't find a single opening. He really did earn the title of Prodigy. Before my all my clones disappeared, I joined the fray, I maneuvered myself behind him to take advantage of what should have been a blind spot. It was a second later that I remembered what Bayakugan was when he not only dodged it, but grabbed a hold of my outstretched arm and threw me into my own clones, dispelling all of them. This is pointless. Your fate is sealed. I can see all. Hey Neji, guess what? I climbed to my feet and whipped the trickle of blood off my chin. I know. End of chapter 24. Start chapter 25. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Neji looked angry as I focused on my other echo points, opening them up in order to level the playing field. I was still adjusting to my new vision when he charged at me, attacking in a flurry of movement. It was all I could to do to dodge them all let alone keep track of him. The later I was apparently doing a worse job at than I thought I was since he somehow ended up behind me, poised to strike my spine. I dove to the side dodging the strike by mere millimeters I rolled once across the ground before stopping in a defensive kneeling position. I kept focused on Neji as paused in his attack in order to just stare at me. You should not have seen that coming, he stated, sounding confused. You were facing the other way. How did you evade it? Bayakugan isn't the only way to see everything. I smirked as I continued talking. At least... Not anymore. Impossible. Neji hissed as he charged one again. I climbed to my feet and dodged again, just in time. Not exactly, if you know how to do it. Guess the Bayakugan isn't as special as you lead on. In his fury, he attacked again, finally giving me a small opening. With a smirk I sidestepped him before kicking him hard enough to send him flying across the arena, straight into a circle of clones. Half of the clones attacked directly while the others pulled out kanais, aiming them at my opponent. I was a brilliant plan, after all, no matter how much you can see, it doesn't help very much if there's too much going on for you to dodge. Kaden, Neji shouted, surprising me when a spinning wall of chakra deflected my weapons and hid him from view. Before I could react the wall disappeared and he leapt forward, attacking me once again. Only this time his hits were too rapid for me to count, let alone avoid. 
But apparently he was able to keep track because he was constantly shouting the numbers during his pauses. I think he called its name too but I missed it. I ended up flying across the arena and slamming into the back wall with a crack. Do you finally see your place? My jutsu was acting up as he walked towards me, his steps seeming to stutter like a movie that was missing several frames. Neither you nor your pathetic jutsu can hold a candle to me. You are inferior. As soon as my vision stabilized, I began to slowly climb to my feet. Most of my chakra systems were unusable. In fact I couldn't use any of it except in small amounts, which was all I need to keep my eyes working. What? Dot the hell is your problem? I demanded, making him stop as I swayed in place. How are you still standing? I started getting perturbed that he was ignoring my question that and I was getting underestimated again. I'm tough, but seriously, is that stick up? Your ass too tight, or what? Give up, you will lose. Fate has dictated it. Yes, yes, you keep saying that. I brushed off his statement, trying to gain time so the QB could work on getting me some semblance of chakra control back before continuing the fight. I figured if I got him started on a monologue, that would do just fine. But why, the rest of your clan, isn't so obsessed with, fate? Why you? My fate was sealed by my supposed clan. He yanked his headband off his head dramatically, obviously trying to show me something. I heard some mumbling from behind me, something about a strange seal on his forehead, which was all I needed to hear. Clever pun. Don't you dare belittle me. Don't worry. I just want to know when you were actually going to answer my question. This seal is my fate. It is the fate of every branch member in the Huga clan. I hit a smirk as he began what was bound to be one of those really long monologues Jiraiya said they were famous for. This seal is placed on every branch member under the guise that it protects our dojutsu from being stolen when it's actually used to control us. It's used to keep the branch family in line. Just because my father was the second twin, he was placed in the branch family making it so I was born into it. It is because of this that my father was forced to die in his brother's place. It is. You shouldn't blame fate, or even a single seal for everything wrong in your life, I interrupted, his self-centered monologue already getting to me. If I believed what you did, I wouldn't be who I am today. You know nothing of my pain, Neji yelled. I narrowed my eyes at him, deciding enough was enough. I was going to end this fight now, whether my chakra control was back or not. I shot forward angrily, throwing punches and kicks until one caught Neji, knocking him to the ground. I don't need to, your pain is nothing compared to some people out there. You might not have your father but you still have a family. A family you hate but a family nonetheless. Hanada cares about you like you're her brother and what do you do? You almost kill her over something she didn't even do. She's too weak, he's spitting a bit of blood before climbing to his feet. Because of her I lost my father. It was her fault. That was years ago Neji. My sensei told me about it. What was she, three? She was a toddler, how could she be expected to fight back? It was obviously that he wasn't listening when he charged at me once again, only this time I was ready for that 64 hit thing he was going to do. As soon as the first undodgeable strike was about to hit I substitute myself out with a spare clone. Lucky for me he had no way of stopping the attack once he started it, so even though he knew the real me was gone, he couldn't do a damn thing about it. But I was nice and waited for him to finish his attack before starting mine. All right, it wasn't to be nice per se, I was more rubbing the fact that he wouldn't be able to have done anything if I had and judging by the frown on his face he knew it. As soon as he threw his last hit, I leapt forward and punched him right in the face, knocking him into the wall three yards behind him, and then tumbling to the ground. When he tried to get up again, I was already there to knock him back down. After that he didn't try to get up again, the only way I knew he was still conscious was from his pained breathing. I dropped to my knee next to him, I leaning close to whispered in his ear, not wanting the whole audience to hear me. 
And just so you know you're not the only one whose life changed from a seal, I said quietly, lifting my shirt to show my own. This was placed on me the day I was born. I'll leave what it's for to your imagination. I'll only say that my life could have been a lot better without it, but I could have taken it a lot worse. I could have turned out like you. After I finished that, his breathing slowed, most likely because he was finally knocked out. The proctor came over and checked his pulse just to make sure. He nodded, straightening to his feet. Winner, Uzumaki Naruto, Genma exclaimed. There was a stunned silence before Fu shouted, Hell yeah! which started a whole ton of cheering from the audience. More than I thought I would ever get in Konoha. I climbed to my feet, stumbling a bit as I smiled. You good, Kakashi asked, appearing next to me as medics came to take Neji away. Yep, I'm great, I dusted myself off as I headed out of the arena. Well, other than a couple of fractured ribs and a messed up chakra system. But the fox is working on that as we speak. Will he be done by the next match? Depends on how lazy he feels, I answered. Kakashi turned to look at me, probably with some sort of worried expression on his face. Stop being such a worrier. I can handle myself now. After all, with my healing abilities, I should be the last one you should be concerned about. I'll be as good as new in time for my next match while everyone else will be suffering from exhaustion. And I could seriously win this whole competition because of it. That is quite possible, as long as you're not put up against the tacky girl, Kakashi said, making me freeze in the process. Speaking of which, did she do that to all of them? Kakashi motioned towards my jacket. Every single one, I answered as I pulled at the jacket glumly. That was awesome, I heard a girl shout as felt a pair of arms flung themselves across my shoulders. It was all I could do keep from falling to the ground. You totally showed that stuck up ass what's what. Thanks for the compliment, I said flatly. Happy you enjoyed my fight to the death. Oh don't be so dramatic. I felt her let go, allowing me to straighten myself up once again. Was that necessary? No, but it was fun. She latched onto my arm as the QB and I silently cried in self-pity. Well... I'll just let you two love birds head up yourselves. I'm supposed to be in a different box. Wait, you're leaving me alone with her. You two were alone all day yesterday, Kakashi pointed out. I gawked at him, trying to come up with a response, but before I could, he shinshoot away with only a quick, yane. Asshat. Well, come on Foxy, the next match is about to start and I want to see it. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. That same time. Orochimaru sat in the cage box, looking quite confused, or he would have if he wasn't wearing the case cage's robes and veil. The source of his confusion was one, blonde Kitsune child. Kabuto had told him that he, in no uncertain terms, had disabled the boy and there was no way he could continue to mess with his plans. But after seeing him destroy the Huga, he was seriously starting to doubt this. Orochimaru made a hand motion a second before one of the Suna Anbu dropped down next to him. He leaned closer so that his old sensei wouldn't hear him. I thought you said you took care of the boy, he whispered tensely as he watched the boy in question chat with his comrades. I did sir, Kabuto replied, equally startled. Then why does he fight as if he can still see? I heard that he has been training with your old teammate, Jiraiya. It's possible they found a jutsu to counteract the lack of sight. I have never heard of such a thing. They could have created it. A new jutsu. The disguised Sanin's curiosity peaked. How intriguing. I must see how he does it. He watched with interest as the boy kept a mint-haired girl from lunging at one of the case cage's boys for dropping out before the fight began. Find out what you can about it. That's a pity, the third Hokage stated, breaking the other man from his thoughts. I was looking forward to seeing your eldest son fight. You're not missing much, Orochimaru replied as Kabuto stepped back into the shadows. That's awfully harsh of you. 
He is your son. When there was no reply, the third cleared his throat and continued. Anyways, I think the next match is going to start. Just as he finished speaking two girls, one being the mint-haired girl and the other a Yamanaka, pushed one of the next combatants off the balcony and into the arena. Yes, it seems to be, he stated, sending one last look at his new interest before turning his eyes reluctantly on to the next, sure to be, drawn out match. End chapter 25. Start chapter 26. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Luckily Shikamaru's match wasn't as long as his previous one, ending in Tamari getting trapped in his shadow somehow. Unfortunately the shadow had no physical shape so I couldn't see it. All I really saw was him dodging a bunch of attacks until she froze, yelling about shadow jutsus. Apparently it was pretty impressive since everyone else in the audience was in awe, but then the lazy ass had to ruin it by conceding. I don't know who's worse, him or the coward with the cat hat. Eno exclaimed, as I restrained Fu from trying to kill him as well. I'm sure he had a reason, Shino said calmly as Fu was practically foaming at the mouth. The only thing that saved Shikamaru from an assault was his slow speed coming back, and Fu's match being called. About damn time, she yelled, leaping over the railing while almost taking me with her. As it was I ended up on the ground because I didn't let go fast enough. Get up Naruto, you're going to miss it, Ino exclaimed. I only grumbled in response as I got to my feet. Shino and Fu were already facing off, waiting only for the proctor to give the go ahead. Wondering if I could get a better view of the match, I decided to try and tune my chakra echoes to focus on the soon-to-be dueling pair instead of everyone else. Amazingly, it actually worked. By the time Genma said, Begin, I had concentrated my chakra output to focus only on the arena. It was a pretty cool sight, like looking through a telescope. I saw them charge at each other as if I was still standing in the arena. The fight itself was pretty intense. Fu kept trying to attack her opponent with Tijutsu but Shino would only fight her for a short time then disengage again. It took me a few of these interactions before I was able to pick up the bugs he was leaving behind. By then it was pretty obvious that he was trying to drain her chakra like his previous opponent. Unfortunately for him, it takes a lot more than a couple bugs to drain a Jinchuriki. I don't even think Fu noticed the bugs as they each ate as much chakra as they could before they each dropped dead. For Shino's part he seemed to notice something was wrong and tried to change tactics. Instead of being stealthy about the bugs, he created a huge swarm of them and had them surround her. But this didn't work either because after seeing a bunch of their brethren die, the insects didn't want anything to do with her. They would get within a foot and pretty much refuse to get any closer. Shino began to seem frustrated, though whether it was from the misbehaving bugs or the fact that Fu was teasing him I'll never know. With my hearing I could just pick up the fact that, for some reason, she was singing something along the lines of, I'm the bug man, cuckoo cacho. Repeatedly. Nanabi put her up to it. QB told me, answering my question before I could ask it. After all, it's not something she would know about on her own. I was just about to ask why when I saw a bright, red flash as a pair of equally red insect wings sprouted from her back. A second later Fu launched her at her enemy at an almost impossible speed. I barely noticed the fact that she finished the fight a few moments after that with a series of quick punches. When Shino fell, her wings disappeared and the color faded from view. What the hell was that? I asked QB silently. Interesting. Mind telling me what is so, interesting, about it. Your jutsu seems to be able to pick up chakra colors. How the hell does it do that? How am I supposed to know, brat? I wasn't the one that invented it. He grumbled. Then why was some of her chakra red? That's the Nanabi's chakra. Hey, did you see that? Fu said, as she suddenly appeared behind me from my lack of attention. Um. Yeah. It was really cool, I said as I fought the reaction to jump over the railing. Nice wings, by the way. Wings, what wings, 
Eno asked, while everyone else watched in confusion. Thanks. They give me a speed boost, Fu answered, before turning towards Eno. And they're invisible. After hearing that, everyone turned to me, making me nervous. What? I invented a new jutsu to use against Neji. I just decided to use it to watch the match. I explained. Sometimes I can pick up on stuff better with it than if I watch normally. What type of jutsu? Is it awesome? Can you teach it to me? Fu asked in a flurry of questions. It's like echolocation with chakra waves. Yes, it's awesome. And no, I can't teach you. Aero Sanin thinks I'm the only one able to use them. And why is that? Eno asked. Because I'm awesome. It's more likely that it's because you're an idiot, Eno said sarcastically. You know, I should be offended that you think of me like that, but I have an awesome just you and you don't, so I'm not. Next match, Uchiha Sasuke vs Suna no Gara. The proctor stated, interrupting our conversation. Oh, a fight. Fu exclaimed happily, leaning over the railing in her eagerness. This one should be good. Better than mine. Well, that redhead out there has some pretty sweet control over sand but your teammate is still confident so who knows. You do realize that the only reason he is confident is that he didn't see the Gara's last match. Neither did you. I heard what he did to the last guy that he fought. Yeah, tragic, she stated simply. He was a pretty cool ninja too. I nodded in agreement as the proctor announced the beginning of the fight. Sasuke charged at the San Shinobi unsuccessfully using Tijutsu against him while Gara blocked everything using his sand. In fact, as far as I could tell Gara wasn't the one doing it at all, it looked more like the sand was moving on its own to keep the boy safe. It didn't take too much longer to realize that maybe Tijutsu wasn't the best option to fight this guy. Out of all those throws, only one of them even got close to making contact, this meaning that it didn't in the slightest. To everyone else it was a hit, but from what I saw with the echoes, Gara had kept a thin, chakra-coated layer of sand between him and the duck butt's fist. The Suna Shinobi didn't even feel a thing. Are you using those echoy thingings? Fu whispered to me. Chakra echoes, I corrected, trying not to accidentally lose focus on the match. Yeah that, she said. When I didn't respond she continued. Mind telling me what's really going on. I feel like I'm missing something. I'm having a hard time focusing it on the fight as it is. Sasuke won't stop jumping around. Please, she pleaded, no doubt trying to use puppy dog eyes on me. Despite not being able to see her at the moment I decided to relent, more because I knew that she would continue till I did anyways and not wanting to play the game. Fine, but only when something important happens. You mean like that? She asked, obviously pointing at something. I had lost focus of the fight and, despite watching what was going on, I missed what had happened. Sasuke was now clinging to the empty side of the arena using his chakra and was going through a bunch of hand size while Gara hid in a sphere of sand. I have a bad feeling about this, I stated as my sensei's Chidori suddenly appeared in my rival's hand. Before I could realize what exactly was wrong, Sasuke charged at his opponent, the Chidori in his hand going right through Gara's sphere. Within a few seconds there was a loud scream from it as red chakra started pouring out of the hole and swirling around the sphere. Crap, I swore quietly. Fu turned towards me. He's a Jinkuriki. Seriously? She asked. I nodded. Nanabi wants to know who. Can't she tell herself? It's the Aikibi. The QB wondered. I relayed the message and got a snort for a reply. Ododo one, huh, shouldn't be too much a problem for us. We're not fighting him, Sasuke is. Oh, yeah, Fu replied, sounding significantly more worried than a moment before. How long do you think he can last? They watched as Sasuke struggled to get his hand out of the sphere only for a large arm to appear out of the sand and throw him across the arena. Not very long. Well, if Aikibi goes overboard, or most likely when he goes overboard, we'll just jump down there and stop him. And how do we do that? 
We're Jenin. We also have the power of two power biju at our disposal, she pointed out. We do. I only used it once and it took like ten minutes to convince him let me. Seriously, what can you do then? Um, just clones and my aijutsu. Oh and summoning toads. What were you doing over the last month? Avoiding you, I answered flatly. She thought for a moment before nodding. So what do we do? Before I could answer the globe fell apart, revealing Gara kneeling on the ground, holding his wound. The chakra slowed, almost disappearing completely. I tried to tell Fu what happened when I got distracted by pieces of white. In fact it looked like feathers falling across the entire arena. I stood there, unsure what was going on, why I could see these feathers yet nothing else around the arena, or why just watching was making me tired. I was just starting to think that a nap was a good idea as the Kyubi began to shout at him. Damn idiot kit, that's a genjutsu you moron, he shouted, as I ignored him. I just wanted to go to sleep. I heard him growl in annoyance. Fine, I'll do it myself. His chakra built for a moment before breaking through the genjutsu, waking me up with a start. I immediately restarted my jutsu and glanced around in surprise. What's going oh? Quiet. But. This whole arena is full of enemy ninjas attacking any Konoha nin that moves. Do you really want them to target you next? I could take them. Just stay down. If the Nanabi has any sense she would have woken her warden as well, he muttered as I glanced over at Fu who was snoring. The Kyubi sighed, of course that's too much to hope for. Go wake her up, we're going to need her if Ikebi loses it. Okay, but, where is he? Still in the arena, where else would he be? He answered. I looked over to find the area completely devoid of anyone, let alone the psychotic Sandman. Damn it, those siblings of his must have took off with him. Sasuke followed him, didn't he? I'd be amazed if he didn't, Kayubi said with a sigh. You better go save him. On it, I said. I crawled over to Fu, taking a moment to remember how to break a genjutsu before actually doing so. Not the birds. Fu woke up with a start. She tried to shout more but I covered her mouth with one hand while motioning for her to be quiet with the other. I was just filling her in on what was going on when Sakura crawled into view, Shikamaru in a small pug in a ninja bandana right behind her. Naruto, time to owe you up, she whispered in surprise. We going after Sasuke, I asked. Yes, Kakashi told us to as a mission. Me, you, Shikamaru, and Kaka-sensei summons Pakun. Me too. Fu exclaimed, I tried to shush her but she didn't listen. It's not your mission, Sakura said, sounding annoyed. So, I'm coming. But, you can't stop me. Fine, Sakura relented after a moment, still not sounding happy about the arrangement. Let's just go already. End chapter 26. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. I hope to see you all in the next part of this what if. I'll see you all later, peace out people. This is part 11 character 27 through 29. Link in description. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Start chapter 27. Hope you enjoy. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark A few minutes later We're being followed, Pakun stated, making Shikamaru groan as we ran through the trees. Of course we are, Shikamaru muttered to himself. Why couldn't this have been easy? Do you know how many? Sakura asked. No, the pug replied. But they don't smell friendly. Hold on, I called, pausing on a branch for a moment to focus on my ears. It was faint but I was just able to catch the sound of several footsteps coming from behind us. A split second later I took off again, catching up with my team in no time. There's nine of them, and from the sound of it, 
they're gaining on us, I stated, getting looks from everyone that wasn't foo. I just saw Sakura open her mouth, probably to ask how I knew, when Fu interrupted her. So what do we do? She asked. I vote we turn around and bash their skulls in. Fu slammed her fist into her palm, emphasizing her point, no doubt wearing an excited smirk. There are so many reasons why that's not an option, I don't even have time to explain them all, Shikamaru stated flatly, earning a huff from Fu. You're no fun, she muttered. Well we have to do something, Sakura said, coming up beside Shikamaru. Even if they don't catch up to us, we're leading them straight to Sasuke. And what a pity it would be if there was one less emo in the world, Fu said, causing Sakura to start giving off more killing intent than I thought she was capable of. Fu, now's not the time, I stated before Sakura could retaliate. I think our best option would be leaving someone behind as a decoy, Shikamaru said, bringing us back to the topic at hand. A regular ambush won't work so we're going to need someone to stay behind and stall or the others. But wouldn't that be a suicide mission? Sakura asked quietly. Most likely. A strained silence followed while we processed this information. I don't know what the others were thinking but I had some pretty conflicting thoughts running through my head. On one hand, I really didn't want to die. I'd went through so much this last month in order to overcome my new disability and I didn't want it all to go to waste here. On the other hand, I didn't want any of them to die either. As far as I was concerned, they were my friends, and I didn't want my friends to die if I could help it. After all, protecting those precious to you is what makes you strong. I could hear the QB chuckling lightly in my mind but didn't offer me any advice. Guess he was leaving the decision up to me. Fantastic. I'll do it, a voice said that wasn't my own. My head snapped around to find Fu with her hand raised. I'm a pretty damn good distraction, if I do say so myself. That and I have several tricks up my sleeves that will probably get me out of there without actually dying. No, Shikamaru said, not even bothering to look at her as he spoke. We need someone smart. You barely know me, you don't know how smart I am. You act like Naruto. That's a good enough indicator to me, he stated, ignoring my glare. He pulled himself to a stop on one of the branches, leading us to follow suit. Guess it has to be me. After all my jutsu is the best fit for the job. Are you Su? Sakura tried to ask. Okay, I exclaimed over her. Go show them who's boss. Yeah, knock those asses on there. Well, asses. Fu replied just as enthusiastically as Shikamaru sighed. It's like having two of him, Shikamaru muttered before turning to head in the opposite direction. All right, let's go, I shouted, darting forward. Which way puppy dog? It's Pakun, and that way, he said, using his nose to point. A moment later we launched ourselves back into the trees, leaving Shikamaru behind. After a minute or two I noticed a certain smell seemed to be getting more prominent as we went, the very unnerving smell of sand mixed with blood. There were other smells that were growing stronger too, like polished wood and that of a dry, desert-like wind but they weren't as unsettling. I could also smell Sasuke in the distance, who always insisted that he smelled of vengeance even though I know now it's just tomato plants, told me we were going in the right direction. So, are we following the Sandy Death Trap or the Tomato Avenger? I wondered. Pakun looked back at me for a moment while Fu chuckled. Tomatoes, he answered, before turning back to his task. Cool, I nodded in approval. How do you actually follow a scent? There's some sort of trick to it right. You're not just. Naruto, Sakura yelled. What? I was curious. Save it for when we're not in the middle of a mission. Fine, I muttered with a huff. They've stopped moving, Hakun informed us, making me a bit confused. Sasuke and Gara, No, our pursuers. Seems Shikamaru was successful. Hell yeah, I knew that lazy ass was worth something. Fu yelled before getting shushed by Sakura. Quiet, she whispered furiously, 
turning around to look at Fu. Do you want them to find us again? Because if you keep shouting they will. No sooner had Sakura turned back around did Fu stick her tongue out at her. I shook my head at her but said nothing. A few minutes of silence later Pakun spoke again. They've stopped, the pug stated simply. I thought they were already stopped. I asked. No, Sasuke, he answered, his tone exasperated. Don't get huffy with me, you're the one not using names. There's also someone else following his trail. Who? Sakura asked for us all. I don't know, but they're not human, the dog replied ominously. Feeling a little nervous for my emo teammate, I took a large sniff of the air, sorting out the smells I already recognized and looking for one that shouldn't belong there. I found one almost immediately. Whoever it is, smells like bugs, I replied, getting a glance from Fu. Well it's not me, she replied. A different type of bug. Oh, she said simply. Are they an ally? How am I supposed to know? It's not like I can smell the symbol on their headband. I'm pretty sure you shouldn't be able to smell people either, Sakura pointed out. Only if you don't have an awesome nose like mine, I said, getting a chuckle out of Fu and a sigh out of my teammate. Anyways, they kinda smell familiar. Like I've met them before somewhere. I landed on a branch, just noticing two ninjas facing each other as if they were ready to fight. One of which had what looked like cat ears on his head and the other the ends of a trench coat waving in the breeze. Excuse me, I called, getting their attention. Did either of you happen to see a lost duckling smelling of tomato plants come through here? Naruto. Just keep going, the guy with the trench coat said quietly. Okay, thanks, I said with a grin as I took off again. Cuckoo Cacho. I heard Fu whisper to him as we passed the trench coat shinobi, getting a small twitch in response. Did he seem familiar to anyone else? I asked curiously. That was Shino, Sakura shouted. Ooh, I said, drawing it out longer than necessary. That's why the bugs. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. I should have known it was you. The Sandame stayed focused on his opponent, trying desperately to ignore the battle raging just outside the barrier. It's not like he would be able to help them from where he was, nor would they be able to help him. Therefore, Orochimaru needed his entire attention or else he feared he would be unsuccessful in eliminating the threat. Don't blame yourself, after all you're getting much too old for all of this. Orochimaru replied as he abandoned the case cage's robes to reveal his normal sound clothes, bow and all. You know, you could have avoided this long ago. If you had made me Hokage instead of that martyr Namikaze then you would still be enjoying your retirement. And let all of Konoha become your play toy. I think not, he said simply. He closed his eyes for a moment, locking away any sentimentality he had left for his student. I would rather wear these robes for a hundred years and deal with a mountain of paperwork the size of the Hokage Monument, than ever give them to you. The Sandame's eyes flashed open, determination burning in them as he threw aside his own cage garb, revealing his battle uniform underneath. They stared at each other for a while before leaping forward, each preparing their own attack. Serutobi threw a shuriken before flashing through a bunch of hand signs. He didn't even need to say the name of the move as the single shuriken multiplied into hundreds, all aimed at Orochimaru. But the snake Sanin had already been prepared for this. Before the shuriken could find their mark, two coffins burst out of the shingles in front of him. There were multiple muffled thumps as the shuriken embedded themselves in the soft wood. A third one started sprouting from the roof as well, quite a bit slower than the other two. The jutsu he was using seemed to have trouble summoning it. This gave the Serutobi plenty of time to send it back to where it had come from. Two out of three, not too bad, Orochimaru said to himself. I wasn't sure that last one was going to work anyways. Dead demon seals can be kinda of finicky like that. Why are you doing this, anyways? The Sandame asked, making Orochimaru chuckle lightly at the question. 
The snake man stepped out from behind the coffins, choosing to stand proudly next to them. You mean other than personal vengeance? He asked. When Sarutobi didn't answer he continued. Well I guess you could say that I hate to be bored, and there's nothing more boring than watching a world that doesn't change. That and I couldn't let you keep all these young, promising specimens to yourself. They're called children, Orochimaru, they're living, breathing human beings. They're not children any longer, Sensei. They're ninjas, a rank you gave them, by the way, Orochimaru stated as Sarutobi narrowed his eyes at him. If you didn't want these children in danger then maybe you shouldn't have placed them in your army. Enough, I won't let any harm come to the younger generation. Not from you, or anyone else. Orochimaru's grin widened as he laughed loudly, his voice echoing throughout the barrier. The Sandame stared at him in bewilderment as the snake-like man finally calmed down, wiping tears of amusement from his eyes. Oh sensei, it's a little late for that. End chapter 27. Start chapter 28. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Oh sensei, it's a little late for that. Sarutobi stared at him blankly for a moment. What had could his student have possibly done to those children that he wouldn't have known about? Had he ordered them to be targeted directly in order to snuff out Konoha's will of fire? He dismissed the thought almost immediately. As warped as Orochimaru was, he didn't do anything unless it benefited him, and killing off a whole generation of young ninjas would give him nothing. After all, he liked hiring ninjas about this age, and he couldn't hire any of them if they were dead. The only thing Orochimaru would gain would be revenge but he would theoretically accomplish that by killing the Sandame so it was useless. Therefore, if he wasn't talking about the generation of Genin then he had to be talking about one in particular. The only one out of the group that Serutobi could think of was the young Uchiha his students been eyeing. We've already taken care of that curse mark you left on Sasuke's neck, Serutobi replied, after a few moments of thought. This elicited another laugh from his student, thought the snake Sanin was able to keep it under control this time. I don't know which is funnier, Orochimaru said, chuckling around his words, the fact that you think that seal will hold or that you think I'm talking about him. Who else would you be talking about? Serutobi asked hesitantly. You don't know, I would think you'd have been the first to find out, Orochimaru stated, seemingly lost in thought. Unless he knew you'd remove his ninja status. That's what happened, wasn't it? That kid was actually smart enough to figure that out before informing the world. Color me impressed. Who are you talking about? The Sandame demanded, a feeling of dread taking hold. You see, during my stroll in the forest of death, there was another genin that caught my attention. Dumb as a rock yet he was able to get the drop on me. Twice. The Sanin grinned, as if the memory amused him. He's quite he interesting specimen, and I'd love to figure out what makes him tick. But he was in my way. The best solution to an unpredictable variable would be to get rid of it, but then I'd lose the chance to study it. Luckily I thought of a much better solution. What did you do? Serutobi's blood ran cold as he hoped his assumption was wrong. It didn't quite work as I planned. I'll admit, Orochimaru said, grinning at his mentor. When I ordered Kabuto to take his sight, I had thought his disability would be a lot more obvious. All anyone would have to do was watch him flounder around the room and they'd notice something wrong. Then he'd be off the squad and out of my hair in a snap. But he was more stubborn than I had calculated. Now, he's taking things seriously, he's even created a new jutsu that I've never heard of before. From what I can tell it's quite similar to the Byakugan, therefore making it quite valuable to me. Funny how the very thing I had done to weaken him, forced him to become even stronger. I can't wait for the chance to study him. Blind, you blinded one of my genin. Haven't you figured out who? I thought it would be obvious after all that. No, not him, Serutobi whispered. Not Naruto. Good guess. I suppose you still deserve the title the professor. 
Images of the blonde child flashed through his mind once more, this time proving things he hadn't wanted to believe. Naruto's actions before the prelims, his difficulty fighting Kiba, Kakashi's sudden protective streak when it came to him, even Jiraiya's odd training routine for the boy. All of these things grudgingly lined up with what Orochimaru was telling him. How could you do this to him? The Sandame asked, his voice rising again. Hasn't he been through enough already? Why did you have to take away his sight as well? I already explained myself. I won't do so again. Orochimaru's amusement finally faded as he turned back to the matter at hand. You should worry less about him and more about yourself. After all, the Sanin paused for a moment as the coffins opened, revealing the Shadaim and Nadaim standing inside, three against one aren't very good odds. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. I sniffed the air with the frown. There were new smells that mingled with Sasuke's and Gara's, they were the scent of fresh blood and upturned dirt along with a faint hint of ozone. They've started fighting, haven't they? I asked Pakun. The small pug simply nodded. Great. The Tem just couldn't wait two minutes. Apparently not, Fu replied, way too cheerfully. We'll kick his ass for it later. You know, after we saved him and all. That's your answer for everything, isn't it? Sakura asked, sounding very disapproving. No, just most things. Fu chuckled lightly as Sakura huffed in annoyance. You don't even like Sasuke, do you? I barely know the guy, Fu replied. But from what I've seen of him, no, not really. Then why are you even here? Sakura exclaimed, all her annoyance towards the other girl finally coming to a head. Because this is a hell of a lot better than sitting in an arena not being allowed to do anything, she said in a carefree tone. That's a horrible reason to go save someone, especially Sasuke. I have other reasons as well, just none of them are because of an infatuation with the dramatic emo. How dare you? Hakun and I sighed in unison as the two continued to bicker back and forth, no doubt alerting the whole area that we were there. If they keep this up, Gara will know we're coming before we ever get there, the small pug muttered. I nodded in agreement. I was in the process of figuring out how to get the girls to quiet down without them turning on me when I noticed Pakun's ears perk up. A moment later a faint, strange chirping reached my ears. Shut up, I exclaimed, no longer caring about their argument. Before either of them could complain, I continued. Do you hear that? Both of them stopped speaking for a moment, spending the time to listen to their surroundings. The chirping was getting louder but I wasn't sure if they could hear it or not. You mean the chirping? Fu asked after a few seconds. I nodded. Yeah, I can hear it. Barely. What's wrong with chirping? We're in the forest. Forests have birds. Birds chirp. Sakura pointed out shortly. I hate birds, Fu muttered. What bird would bring attention to themselves with this many shinobi running through their woods, especially with at least one of them giving off a strong killing intent? Pakun pointed out. That's Chidori. What the heck is a child Oreo? Fu questioned. Chidori is my sensei's lightning attack, the one that Sasuke used in the exam. I explained, getting a small O from her. How many of those can he do? His limit's two per day but judging by the ozone smell, that would be his third, Hakun answered, sounding a bit worried. It was about then that the chirping cut off abruptly followed by an unnerving laughter. Hakun and I shared a look before launching ourselves forward even faster, leaving the other two to catch up. There was no time left for petty arguments or explanations. We needed to get there, now. A few moments later I could just make out two figures just ahead of us. One was definitely Sasuke despite there being a slight, purple-ish aura to his figure. He was laying on a branch, struggling to get up, if I had to guess I'd have to say it was from chakra exhaustion. The other was leaking so much red chakra that I was surprised that no one from the village noticed yet. His figure was kinda warped as well, not quite looking like everyone else did. His left arm was too big, his ear was kinda pointy 
and he seemed to have a large tail attached to him. He had a feral grin spread so widely across his face that even my chakra echoes could pick it up. Just then he lunged towards my teammate, his larger arm raised to strike. But before he could do so I gathered chakra in my legs and leapt forward, my raised fist soon connecting with the normal side of his face. I skidded to a stop a little ways in front of Sasuke, keeping my focus on Gara as he tumbled to the ground with an angry yell. The younger Jinchiriki stumbled to his feet a moment later as I heard my companions join me. Two sets of footsteps, a girl and a dog, landed a bit behind me, no doubt fussing over the fallen Uchiha, while the last settled to a stop by my side. Wow, he doesn't look happy, I heard Fu say with a small whistle of amazement. You can say that again, I muttered as the other boy's snarls reverberated through the trees. Wow, he doesn't look, she cut off mid-sentence as Gara attacked once again, making the pair of us dodge out of the way. He landed on our old branch with a hiss as we came to a halt a few feet away. That was rude. That's what you get when you tell bad jokes while in combat, I told her. Admit it, you would have done the same thing. Focus Fu, we have a mission, I said, avoiding a response. Which is taking down this guy? No, it's to make sure he doesn't kill my jackass of a teammate. You mean that one, she asked, pointing to the prone figure right behind Gara. It was about then that all three of us realized that when we dodged out of the way, we accidentally left our comrade with a small dog and Sakura as his only defense. I swore as the San Jinchiriki decided to take advantage of this to finish what he started. Unable to get there fast enough, I could only watch as Gara used his large arm to swat Sakura away like she was no more than an annoying bug. She was sent flying through the air into a tree, where she fell to the ground, most likely unconscious. He then turned his attention to my other teammate, bringing his arm down towards him. I was barely quick enough to get him out of there before the large claw destroyed the branch he was sitting on. When Gara realized what was happening, he tried to follow me, but was distracted when Fu's fist came out of nowhere, missing his face by a few centimeters. Landing on the ground, I rushed over to where Sakura was laying. I placed two fingers on her throat to check her vitals and after finding a heartbeat and feeling her breathing, I dumped Sasuke nearby for safekeeping. Stay, I told him. Not bothering to stick around for his complaints, I immediately jumped into the trees in order to join the fight once again. When I got back, I took a short moment to watch Fu fight. She seemed to be handling herself quite well, all things considered. She was quick enough to dodge his attacks, and seemed to even be landing a few hits of her own. She had something surrounding her arms all the way up to her elbows that seemed to enhance her punches. Whatever it was seemed to be constantly moving and not very solid, making it very difficult for my chakra echoes to pick up. You know you can. Help me at any time. Fu shouted as she dodged another attack, this time almost getting a haircut in the process. Oh, right, I exclaimed. I jumped forward in order to join the her only to get stopped by the blonde Kunoichi her fan held out in front of her threatening. I had noticed her hanging out near the edge of our self-appointed combat zone but didn't think she would be getting involved anytime soon. I won't let you team up on him, Tamari said. Are you kidding me? The guy's insane, I argued, already fed up with everything. He's probably going to kill everyone in this area, including you, if we don't stop him. Insane or not, he's still my brother. Tamari raised her fan, sending a large gust of wind in my direction. I was dodged out of the way, its gust shredding the tree that I had been standing in front of. Well, this is going to be fun, I muttered to myself. End chapter 28. Start chapter 29. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. A few minutes later. I take it back, this isn't fun, I said as I barely dodged another one of her attacks. Not one bit. I sent another round of clones at her, 
hoping that a few of them would actually make it close enough to land a hit, but that never happened. With a wave of her fan she dispelled them all before focusing back on me. I jumped out of the way as she brought down her fan once again, sending another bout of wind towards me, somehow catching my arm in the attack. I skidded to a stop on a branch a few feet away, my hand gripping my wound instinctively. It was only a graze, not serious enough to warrant much attention. I glared at Tamari as I ignored the smell of my own blood filling my nose. She didn't move while I wiped my hand clean and grabbed a pair of kanai. I needed a new tactic, something she wouldn't see coming. Unfortunately, her planning skills were at a level higher than mine, after all she gave Shikamaru a run for his money in that area. She was a long-range fighter who excelled in her field. The only way to beat her would be in a close corner fight where she wouldn't have room to use her fan. But there was no way of getting that close without her blowing me away. I thought that I might be able to use my kanais to deflect her wind, hoping that would be enough to get close. It wasn't the best idea but I really didn't have many options at the moment. I tensed my muscles, getting ready to leap at her once again just as someone was knocked into me, almost sending me tumbling to the ground. Hey, watch it, Fu yelled right next to me. You ran into me, I shouted, turning to find her already looking at me. Before I could continue she shoved me aside just in time for her to punch at the gust of wind aimed at my back. I thought for sure she had been hit as leaves were flung off their trees obscuring my vision. When they finally settled I found that I was wrong. In fact, the only damage she had taken was a few small cuts on said forearm and the disappearance of one of her arm jutsus. And there goes the rest of my water gauntlet. As if the sand wasn't bad enough. She growled in annoyance. She threw the other off with the flick of her arm, the substance making a sound more like a mud splat than that of pure water. A moment later she went through a few hand seals making what I assumed was water come out of her bag and coat her arms once again. Go handle the sand man, will ya? His weird ground jutsu keeps muddying up my water jutsus. It's a horrible match, I'll do much better with little Miss Pigtail fail than against him. Pigtail fail, Tamari exclaimed indignantly. You can't just change opponents mid-fight. I yelled a moment later, getting back to my feet. Why not? Fu asked, most likely with a large smile across her face. We're ninjas, aren't we expected to do tricks like this? If not then we aren't very good ninjas, are we? I opened my mouth to argue but was interrupted when I had to dodge a large sand-covered claw aimed at me. I landed on a branch a few feet away, shooting a glare at my ally. Have fun, she called back as she charged towards the now irate fan wielder. No promises, I muttered back before turning to face my new opponent. I suppose you already got the memo about the partner change. I don't care who I fight, I'll kill both of you in the end. He said back, his grin so wide that even my jutsu could pick it up. Then they will join you. He inclined his head in the direction of my wounded teammates, my eyes narrowed in response. Over my dead body, I growled back, tightening my grip on my kanais. Kit, I think that's the plan regardless, the QB answered slyly. I gave him the mental equivalent to a pointed glare before charging at the other Jinchuriki. I noticed, I replied shortly while attempting to dodge Gara's oversized arm. I was doing pretty good at the moment but I knew I couldn't keep this up forever. Any suggestions? The Kayubi hummed in thought but otherwise stayed silent. Any time would be nice, I demanded as the claw got a little too close for comfort. Gara immediately took another swing at me that I blocked with my kanai, only to hear a faint clink come from the knife. Gata loved cheap craftsmanship. Patience, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to answer or not. What? You've got to be kidding me. We don't have that much time. Correction, you don't have that much time. I have all the time in the world. And then some, the fox answered. Normally I'd let you fight your own battles, after all you can't become stronger if I'm winning all your fights for you. But I think I'll make an exception today, 
After all, this is my little brother we're talking about and he can be kind of a handful. You don't say. I shouted back as I threw my now useless knives at my opponent only for his sand to absorb them before shooting them right back. I dodged out of the way just in time. The knives then collided into the tree behind me, shattering on contact. Remind me to find a new weapon smith when this is all over. Right now he's only about halfway transformed, therefore he still has some vulnerable points we can focus on, he said, ignoring my last comment. Luckily he doesn't see you as a big enough threat to finish the change so we should probably work fast before he changes his mind. And, where are they? I'm getting there, hold your horses. He hummed in thought as I dodged several sand projectiles aimed my way. There's one that would work and a few more that might work. Give me the one that will work. I don't like that one. Why the hell not? Because it's a very underhanded way of winning and we can do something a lot more fitting to our position. You mean your position, because I'm a low-ranking ninja. I'll win any way I can that isn't outright cheating. I landed on a branch for a moment only for Gara to knock the tree down and forcing me into the air once again. And so what's his damn weak spot? Right below his tail, he answered with a sigh of defeat. It's not a space that's normally targeted so he won't have that much of his armor there. You mean his butt? Yes, you annoying twit. His butt. All right, I said a sly grin spreading across my face. That's something I can work with. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. All right, let's get this show on the road, Fu said with a grin as she slammed a fist into her palm. The gauntlets splashed on impact only for the droplets to return to them only moments later. The sooner I finish you off the sooner I can make sure Naru Chan doesn't get himself killed. I won't let you team up on my brother. Tamari answered, tightening her grip on her fan. I'm not planning on giving you much a choice, Fu answered with a smirk. You'll be asleep in the dirt by the time I leave here. I doubt it. Tamari swung her fan once again, sending a large gust of wind straight at the mint-haired girl, making Fu dodge quickly behind a tree. Is that all you can do? She called over the roar of the wind. Because I've seen Academy students with a wider variety of moves than you. The wind stopped then, leaving only silence in their little corner of the forest. Fu stood there for a moment, waiting for another round to start up once again. But after about half a minute of this quiet, she decided the blonde was definitely up to something. She peeked around the other side of the tree, only to find the spot the Kunochi had been occupying was now empty. Fu didn't have the time to look for her though as she saw movement out of the corner of her eye accompanied by the sudden urge to duck. She did so just as Temeri's fan buried itself into the tree right where her head had been a moment ago. Still crouched low, Fu took advantage of it quickly as she shot out a leg, sweeping the blondes out from under her. Tamari quickly recovered, landing firmly on her feet on a lower branch. All right. I guess you're not a one-trick pony after all, Fu said with a smirk as she straightened up. Still not very impressed though. You will be when I'm done here. Temeri's glare intensified as she placed her weapon behind her, opening the fan again. Fu jumped higher up the tree as Tamari swung her weapon, sending wind at her once again. She was forced to do this several times until a large explosion rang through the woods, followed closely by a loud animal-like scream. The scream sent chills down Fu's spine as Temeri's eyes widened in fear. It didn't take much thought to guess who that had been from. Fu was the first to recover and notice her opponent's inattention. Tamari was still staring at where the sound originated when Fu leapt at her, a water-covered fist sending the blonde falling to the ground. Not impressed at all, Fu said, watching her land in the dirt before jump down, intent on finishing the fight quickly. End chapter 29. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. I'll see you all in the next video. Peace. This is part 12 chapter 30 through what if Naruto lost his sight. Link in description.
If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Thank you for taking interest in this what if. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Start chapter 30. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. Gara's enraged screams echoed throughout the area, making me cover my ears against the onslaught. That didn't work like I thought it would, I thought as I watched the Aikibi's chakra swirl around the sand nin even faster. There was so much red chakra in the air that I could hardly make out the boy behind it. What gave it away? QB exclaimed. Seriously, which brain cell did you use to come up with that horrible excuse for a plan? I'll kill it now just to keep you from ever again thinking a single, shitty exploding kanai would ever take down a biju. You said it was his weak spot. Not that weak. But I heard him. I tried to explain as a large arm came out of the chakra cloud, forcing me to dodge out of the way. Only about as much as it hurts a Junin to get punched in the face by an average academy student. All it did was piss him off. Which, may I remind you, is what we didn't want to happen. All right, I screwed up. I get it. I dodged again as he took another swipe at me. I got out of the way just before the tree I was standing on was torn to shreds. He wasn't able to do that before. And I think that's his other hand. He's completing his transformation, the QB said gravely. He's finally decided to take you seriously. Great, I muttered out loud, lowering my hands from my ears as the screams finally quieted down. The chakra slowed down as it slowly disappeared into the sand being in front of me. I gaped up at the beast once the transformation was done. He was huge, easily towering over the trees that surrounded it. The thing was mostly sand now, having long outgrown being able to use its jinchuriki as a skeleton. With its change complete, it now took the appearance of a very menacing tanuki. For whatever reason it didn't want to be like its fluffy relative so it three stories and replaced its fur with spikes, which made sense I guess. I mean no baiju would want to look cute and fluffy, and what could be cuter than a normal tanuki? So I guess he tried to make it scarier to save face or something like that. Will you stop thinking of a fluffy Aikibi and focus? The QB shouted angrily. But he'd be so cute. I answered, knowing better than to deny it at this point. Question. Will he still be cute when he smashes your puny human body into a puddle of human goo ingrained into a tree? Um, probably not. Then pay attention and dodge. I leapt out of the way as lob of sand launched itself at me. All right I know he couldn't do that before, I told him as I landed on a nearby branch. What do I do now? I'm pretty sure I'm outclassed here. And he's just figuring this out, the QB muttered, probably to himself. At least that's what I used as an excuse to ignore it. Gar is still in control, barely. Aikibi isn't strong enough to completely take over a host unless he's asleep. So as long as the insomniac doesn't decide to take an impromptu nap, we have a chance. So, what do I do? I asked, barely dodging another couple sand attacks. I was really hoping that QB's plan involved attacking because I was really getting sick and tired of just dodging. Keep him awake, give me time to think of something, QB replied. That shouldn't be much of a problem for you. You're obnoxious enough to get the job done. You're so helpful, I replied sarcastically. I'm the one doing all the hard work here, he exclaimed. So unless you can pull a miracle plan out of your orange-clad ass then I suggest you start doing what you do best, hoping around like a lunatic and make him question his life choices. Now that I can do, I said, letting my trickster's grin spread across my face. Hey sand man, I shouted, getting his attention once again. I was forced to leap out of the path of another projectile soon after, attaching myself the bottom of a nearby branch before continuing. What's your deal anyways? I mean I can tell you're a Jinchuriki, it's kinda obvious from my perspective. But I know that's not the reason you're a blood-obsessed psychopath. Mother wants your blood, Gara answered back, 
his voice switching between normal and menacingly double-layered several times even in his few short words. It seemed to be coming from this odd lump on his head, kinda like a zit. But it was hard to tell since my chakra echoes had a hard time picking it up. Yeah, that, what's the deal with that? You can't seriously think Ikebi is your mother, right? First of all, it's kinda impossible since he's male. I paused for a moment in order to dodge an angry claw aimed for my tree. After settling onto a less destroyed branch, I continued. Second, from what I can tell, he's an asshole. Why would you want an ass like that as your mother? Your blood will be a gift to her, he replied. Fine, don't answer me. I frowned at him angrily as I brought up my hands into my most familiar hand sign. I'll just do this differently then. I then proceeded to create whole army of clones, ignoring the annoyed growls coming from my tenant. I guess he didn't like my way of buying time but had told me to do what I do best, and clone spamming is definitely one of those things. My miniature army charged at the sand monster as I joined the group. As I got closer I realized that the zid-like bump on its head was actually Gara's real body, sticking out of its forehead from the waist up. Gara's a zit, I told the QB with an amused chuckle. I only got an exasperated sigh in response. My opponent seemed annoyed as he swatted at my clones like they were no more than a group of annoying flies. While he was distracted with them, another group jumped up into the trees, launching barrage of shuriken at him while his back was turned. But no sooner had they let go of the throwing stars did the monster's tail lash out, knocking down the trees they were using as perches. With so many clones dispersing at once, I hesitated a moment, trying to process the feedback of the 50 or so deaths hitting me. This was just enough time for Gara to notice and catch me unawares. A lump of sand knocked me out of the sky and into a tree. My breath was knocked out of me as I tumbled onto a branch a few feet below the point of impact. Before I realized what was going on sand swirled around me, beginning to spread across the rest of my body and pin my limbs in place. Mother will enjoy your blood, Gara said, a smile in his voice. I struggled against my bonds but it didn't do any good. I tried to keep calm and figure a way out of this, but started to panic when his sand particles began covering my echo point, making everything disappear from sight. I should be used to this by now, not being able to see, but I usually have my other senses to cover for what my eyes couldn't pick up. But with the sand now covering me completely in a sort of cocoon, it made them completely useless. All I could feel was the gritty texture of his sand, all I could smell was the old blood that soaked the particles, all I could hear was his muffled laughter nearby. I had no way of knowing what was going on and it scared the snot out of me. Pulse my chakra, the QB called, startling me out of my panic. But, just do it. I felt a bit of his chakra get released into mine, waiting to be used. So I did just that. There was a bright flash of red that even my echoes could pick up, making the sand around me fall to the ground, lifeless. I knelt on the branch, panting as I tried to get my breath back. Even with such a little bit of baiju chakra, my nails had still lengthened to a sharp tip, while my whisker marks felt as if they had grown once again. I had hoped that Gara hadn't noticed this change, but judging by the angry growl that reverberated through the forest, he already had. Hubie, he stated, his voice low and gravely. There was silence for a moment before he began to chuckle. The chuckle soon devolved into full-out laughter which shook his entire large frame. Of course, that explains everything. The laughter soon faded away leaving a still amused Gara looking at me with a feral grin on his face. We're going to have fun killing you. You're going to have to catch me first, I growled back, my voice almost matching his. He sent several flying sand projectiles at me, obviously trying to catch me off guard. It probably would have worked if the fox didn't give me a flash tutorial on how to increase my speed with his chakra. So I took more of it, forcing it into my leg and got the hell out of there. I had barely touched foot on a new branch before I was forced to move once again as he continued his attack. 
Please say you've got a plan by now. I pleaded as I launched myself to the other side of the new clearing, hoping he'd lose sight of me. Because if you don't I'm gonna go over there, fists flying. Impatient much? The QB asked. I gave him the mental equivalent of a middle finger before dodging another attack. Apparently he didn't lose sight of me after all. Regardless, I think I've got one. But it's going to involve a crap tone of clones and a technique I had no intention of teaching you. Why not? Despite the fact that this is the last thing you need to be worrying about right now, it's because I had no intention of teaching you anything. That in your chakra control sucks. It's not that bad. Focus damn you, he shouted as I dodged a little too close to the Takuni's swinging tail. Anyways, focus my chakra into your fingertips, or your nails if you can be that precise, which I doubt. My chakra will do the rest. I dodged quickly out of Gara's sight before doing as the fox said. I watched in fascination as my nails seemed grow even longer, each one covered in bright red chakra making them even more dangerous. I'm liking this technique, I said, a feral grin spreading across my face again. What's next? What else? Spawn a crap ton of clones and abuse the hell out of that new technique. My grin widened almost impossibly as I used what was pretty close to my last bit of chakra to form another small army. Even though I couldn't make out their faces, I knew they were all matching my grin as they each formed red claws of their own. Before Gara could even wonder what we were planning, we charged at him. With each of us aiming for a different body part, we hoped we'd be able to overwhelm him so that at least a few of us could get through. After all, he couldn't focus on all of us at once, even though he tried. About half of us made it through, learning from the deceased clones exactly where he was focusing on and dodging appropriately. Then, we had the pleasure of sinking our shiny new claws into the sand monster's limbs. I personally gorged out a pretty big chunk of his shoulder, making sand fall lifelessly to the ground as I did. Gara screamed in rage, or pain. I wasn't quite sure if he could feel the damage we did to his sand but either way he seemed pretty pissed about it. He lashed out at us angrily, but most of us were able to dodge out of the way before we were hit. He was just following through with his strike as I quickly launched forward, taking another chunk out of his side while my remaining clones did the same. Not that I'm complaining or anything, but why is the sand falling away when I attack it with your chakra? I wondered, watching more sand tumble to the ground from where I just cut. Basically my chakra is stronger than his so it overpowers his control he has on it. He'll gain control over it again pretty soon, but it at least cuts him down to size, for a time. As if on cue, the sand on the ground started slowly climbing back towards its master, teeny tendrils I could hardly make out climbing slowly up his legs as they tried to get back into place. Hey, here's a thought. Why don't you attack him before he can control all that sand again? Just so you know, I was already planning to do that. I turned back around using the QB's chakra to launch myself quickly back in the other direction. Sure you were. I didn't answer him as I proceeded to do several more passes, taking out sizable chunks each time, my clones doing the same. Unfortunately, though it probably looked pretty impressive, I knew it wasn't doing very much damage overall. I mean, the guy is made of sand, what was I going to aim for that would actually hurt him enough to stop him? Too bad there isn't some sort of zit-looking human sticking out of his forehead that isn't made of sand, the QB answered sarcastically. Gara, I charged at him once again, my target different than before. My remaining clones covered for me, almost all of them losing their lives as Gara swatted them away. I swiped at the other Jinchuriki, missing my intended target as he leaned out of the way. I used my other hand to try again before I had drifted too far, this time catching my claws against his cheek. Gara froze, a clump of sand falling off his cheek as the smell of fresh blood filled the air. I landed on a tree nearby, unsure of what was going on. A hand came up to the wound, lightly touching his face before bringing it forward once again. 
He stood there for a moment as he seemed to stare at the blood on his hand. He began to shake. Blood, he murmured, barely loud enough for anyone except me to hear. You struck blood. Well, yeah, did you expect me to go easy on you? I asked him, giving him a look in the process. Hate to break it to you, but I don't go easy on people that threaten to kill my friends. You struck blood, he said a little louder. My blood, I can see. My blood. You're going to be seeing a lot more of it by the time I'm. My blood, he screamed, making my eyes shoot wide in surprise. This isn't good, the QB muttered. But before I could ask why, Gara was yelling once again. I'm through playing with you, he snarled, his hands coming up to form a ram seal. Playing possum jutsu, he muttered before his body suddenly lunged forward, dangling limply from where he was still stuck. There was a moment of silence as the fox and I held our breath. The sand creature started to shift, its facial features starting to move in such a way that even my echoes could pick it up. And it looked, happy. Oh yeah, it shouted, taking me by surprise. It's about time that little brat freed me. I've been wanting to kill you since I picked up your chakra a month ago. Well, come on, Akini, show me what you and that lame Jinchuriki of yours can do. Come at me with all you got, it will be sweeter for me when I knock you back into the dirt. I is that, my brother, yes, yes it is, the QB said with a sigh. Congratulations, now we really are fighting a baiju. End chapter 30. Start chapter 31. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. An ominous aura settled over the area, making Fu and Tamari stop their fight mid-swing, both turning towards its source. H he did it. He actually did it, Tamari said, her eyes widening in fear. Idiot, Fu muttered, looking serious for the first time that afternoon. And that's why no one likes us. What? The sand kunochi turned towards her opponent in confusion. But instead of an answer, all the mint-haired girl did was flick her water gauntlets away. Sorry, I can't play with you anymore, Fu said. Tamari watched closely as she started to go through hand signs as she spoke. Naru-chan needs my help taking care of your brother, especially since he apparently let out that oversized rodent he's been guarding. I really do wish we had some more tea. Fu was suddenly cut off as Tamari swung her weapon, slamming it into the mint-haired girl's stomach. She doubled over for a moment, giving the sand kunochi just enough time to swing again, this time catching her across the back. Fu seemed to struggle to catch her breath as she knelt on the branch, her nails digging to the bark. Tamari took a few steps, opening her fan all the way as she did so. I told you, I'm not letting you go after my brother, and I meant it. She swung her weapon forward, releasing enough wind to launch the foreign nin across the woods and out of sight. Tamari let out a breath she didn't know she was holding. That had been a tough battle, she was only lucky to get out of it with the few cuts and bruises she had. But she knew it wasn't over. Her brothers were still fighting, she had to help them. She turned away, trying to decide whether she should go to help Gara or wait and make sure Konkuro was alright first. She had just decided that it was probably safer to check on Konkuro when she felt a menacing chakra spike into existence. It was close, far too close for it to be Gara's, and much more potent than anything she felt from the Aikibi. Tamari was frozen in fear, barely able to turn her head to see where it was coming from. Her eyes widened as she took in the sight of the tacky girl hovering in that exact location. She looked a lot more scraped up, with twigs and leaves stuck in her hair and clothing. But what Tamari noticed more was the red chakra leaking out of her person, a good portion of it forming a pair of insect-like wings attached to her back. The girl's eyes had changed as well turning from an orange color to a bright red with slit pupils. And I told you, you wouldn't have a choice, Fu said, her voice rougher than before. And I meant it. 
Without another word, Fu pulled back her arm and delivered a strong punch to the Sand Nin's face, knocking her out cold. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. This one is all your fault. Naruto yelled in his mind as he dodged around some sort of air technique. And why does it always have to be wind with these damn Sand Nin? I can't even see wind techniques. They are from the land of wind, QB said simply, as if the boy wasn't fighting for his life. And I am not to blame for this. It was your dumb plan. Well you obviously botched it. I did what you said, he yelled, stopping for a moment on one of the few branches left in the area. Apparently not well enough, wind, he jumped up without hesitation, missing Aikibi's technique by mere centimeters, regardless of blame, we need to wake him up, and soon. You don't say. Cut the sass, sarcasm doesn't suit you, QB stated, getting an annoyed huff in response. But don't worry, I've got a plan. Before the brat could respond, the fox showed it to him, not bothering to translate the raw thought process to words. The kit understood regardless, which was nothing short of a miracle as far as the QB was concerned. Wait, that's it, that's seriously your plan. It will work. It's worse than the last one, he exclaimed, dodging another attack. I should just spawn some clones and charge him again. Or maybe try summoning Gamabunta, he'd probably help. You barely have enough chakra for my plan, let alone your tenth army spawn of the day. And do you really think a summons will be able to fight a Baiju? I know Aikibi only has one tail but he's not that much of a wimp. Dot are you sure? Trust me, by the time I'm done, he won't even remember you exist. If I get in trouble for this, I'm blaming the entire thing on you, he said after a moment. He landed on a branch, crossing his fingers again as he began mixing the QB's chakra with his own. Shadow clone jutsu, he yelled, getting the Aikibi's attention. Smoke filled the area temporarily, hiding the kid from view. When it finally cleared, it wasn't Naruto standing there, but a tall, red-haired man sporting fox ears and a tail. Hello little brother, miss me. The QB gave him a grin only a fox could give. QB, Aikibi growled, eyes narrowing on the small figure before him. Why the hell are you so short? I want a proper fight damn it. Sorry but not all of us were sealed away by amateurs. The QB shinned his nails against his top before examining them. You should be lucky I was able to escape this much. You're nothing but a flimsy, human clone. True, but you have to admit, I make quite the sexy human. Nanabi's form isn't too shabby either, for bug-wielding psychopath that is. She does this too, neither of you have any shame, do you? It's disgraceful, you're disgraceful. We're disgraceful, have you looked in the mirror lately? You've been tormenting a child simply because he became your vessel, the QB stated. The IQB let out a roar, taking a swipe at the human-shaped Baiju. QB simply jumped out of the way, landing in the exact same spot, not even ruffled. And when angry you lash out with violence. You truly are the lowest out of all nine of us, no matter which way you look at it. You are not better than me, you bastard. My tales say otherwise, the QB taunted. He was forced to dodge another swipe of his brother's claws followed closely by a rather large wind technique. The wind ended up whipping his hair around, making quite a bit of it fall out of its tie. Once he landed again, he looked at the loose strands with a frown. Why did I even bother with long hair? He muttered to himself before brushing it back behind his shoulders. Anyways, where were we? Oh yeah, the spot where I have nine tails and they're for a more superior to you in every way. How could I have forgotten? QB sidestepped a lump of sand that was launched at his person, a bored look covering his face. Poor Odato, you really can't control yourself when you're angry, can you? It's sad really, considering that this problem is the exact reason why you will be losing today. The Aikibi paused for a moment before letting out a barking laughter that shook the forest. You don't believe me, the QB said, 
letting out a dramatic sigh before continuing. A pity. Tell me, would you believe me if I told you exactly how it will happen? Oh please tell me how I'm going to lose to a shitty clone like yourself, he answered, still laughing with amusement. It's simple really, your hatred of me has distracted you from a very important detail. Which is? The fox grinned again, pausing for effect. That it's not just me you're fighting. The Ikebi's chuckles cut off abruptly, his eyes widening as he remembered. The orange brat, it yelled, spinning around to look for him. Only a split second later, said Kid launched forward, a red aura still surrounding him as he almost appeared next to the other Jinchuriki. The Ikebi swung an arm towards him as Naruto aimed a punch at the sleeping boy, intent on waking him up. Naruto's fist made contact before the Ikebis did. Gara's eyes popped open at the blow, the Ikebi screaming in anger as he was dragged back into his seal. The sand beast started to fall apart, losing its form fairly quickly, but not quick enough to stop its swing. Naruto ended up catching most of the blow with the side of his face, which forced his goggles off his face as it launched him into the air. Shit. The QB cursed as he watched the boy fall. It was quite clear he was unconscious, unlike the redhead currently residing on top what now looked like a crumbling sand castle. He was just readying himself to try to catch the boy when a red streak of light shot towards him, colliding in midair. The QB stared for a moment, as the streak stopped and finally took the form of a ruffled foo struggling to stay in the air as she held Naruto around his torso. I've got ya. She said through gritted teeth, even though her grip didn't look all that convincing. The QB had half a thought to grab them both, especially when the girl dropped several feet in the air, almost loosing Naruto in the process. The thing that stopped him from doing so was the thought that she could at least get him to the ground safely, that Ngara was starting to fall himself. Now, normally the QB couldn't care less whether his opponent fell to their death or not, in fact it would usually be preferable, but not today. So, with a sigh, the Kyubi leapt forward, catching the other redhead in midair then landing on a surviving tree opposite him. W what? Gara mumbled as he began jumping down towards the ground. Can't let you get knocked out, or dead, now can we? I put a lot of work into getting your tenant back in his seal. He landed on the upturned dirt gracefully, dropping the exhausted boy onto the ground almost immediately. Only a moment later Fu and Naruto fell to the ground in an unorganized heap. A low moan escaped the pile as Fu was occupied letting out a string of curse words that the QB was sure she got from her tenant. Hey Kit, you alive? The QB asked, straightening up to stand next to Gara. He watched the sand nin out of the corner of his eyes as he tried to get to his feet as well. Fortunately for the fox and his jichiriki, the other boy's limbs were too exhausted to even hold his own weight. No, Naruto muttered, not moving as Fu got untangled and plopped down next to him, her curses having dissolved into angry mutterings. Oh well, guess that would mean I'm free to do what I want then, huh? Not in the mood, he said quietly, barely audible. Tired, everything hurts, are we done? That's not for me to decide, the QB answered before nudging the redhead at his feet to get his attention. Hey kid, are you two done fighting yet? I'm pretty sure neither of you can stand at this point so I'd suggest just calling it. I mean, don't get me wrong, that boy's a stubborn mule. If you say it's still on, he will get up and continue where you two left off, but I'd rather not risk losing my Jinchuriki to something stupid like chakra exhaustion. Why? Gara said after a moment as he watched Naruto in confusion. I told you, he a stubborn idiot and that's a really stupid way for an Uzumaki to go, let alone a Jinkiriki. The QB's answer was ignored. Why do you fight so hard? Gara asked again, making it clear that he was asking the blonde. Because I have to, Naruto answered, his eyes opening ever so slightly. Fu had finally quieted down completely taking to looking around the new clearing intently. If I don't, my team will die. They don't care about you, Gara pointed out bluntly as Fu struggled to her feet and limped away somewhere. 
Neither boys seemed to notice but the QB kept a spare eye on her regardless. Why do you care if they die if they don't care if you do? They're important to me, Naruto answered, hiding a wince at the other boy's words. I might not be all they have in the world, but they're all I have. And that's why I fight, because I'm too damn selfish to give them up. Why do you fight? To kill, Gara said. Naruto didn't even blink at the answer, which was probably due more to exhaustion than lack of shock. Why do you kill? To prove that I exist. Just like my pranks, huh? Naruto smiled sadly. You were ignored a lot as a child weren't you? Probably because of the Baiju. Me too. I took to pranking the village just to get the villagers to look at me. After all, they couldn't ignore my existence if I was dishonoring their beloved landmark. But I found a better way to show the world who I am so I don't need to do that anymore. The Porniculture Parade. Yeah, Naruto said chuckling lightly. That was for a different reason which is completely beside the point. My point is I don't need to make people hate me to force them to recognize me. Hell I don't even really care what they think anymore. All I care about is protecting my precious people, because if I can do that, it means I do exist. After all, if I didn't then they could be dead. Precious people, I don't have any. Yeah you do, you have siblings, right? They do not like me. They're just scared of the Baiju. Trust me they like you plenty. I mean... They wouldn't have fought so hard to keep you safe if they hadn't. Naruto's eyes dropped shut yet again as Gara looked to be deep in thought. You should try protecting them next time. You might like the results better. End chapter 31. Start chapter 32. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. We laid on the ground in silence for a while as Gara thought through what I had said. Or I assumed that's what he was doing. My chakra echoes had failed about the same time I stopped using the QB chakra so everything was kinda a mystery. But it was quiet so I figured he had to be deep in thought. Of course it didn't last forever because the damn fox had to go and interrupt it. So, is the fight done? The QB asked. Because if not, then we should probably wrap it up pretty quick. There's a group of nins only a few minutes away and if I'm caught out of my seal then there's going to be hell to pay. I concede, Gara said after another pause. Thank Kami, the QB muttered. I'm heading back then, hope you three can take care of yourselves for the small amount of time you're alone. I didn't bother to reply as I heard him poof out of existence. Oh wow, you really did use a lot of chakra. Good thing he conceded because if you kept going he probably would have killed you, the QB said simply. Shut up, I answered back. I didn't speak, Gara responded after a tense moment. Fox. Oh, he was silent for a moment before speaking again. He speaks to you as well. Yup and does his best to annoy me if I don't prank people. Shikaku shouts if I do not kill people. Guess the Baijus are just a group of demanding pricks. I'm insulted. That's the point. Fox. Yup. There was silence between us for a while, which was only broken up by the sound of Fu shuffling around the clearing. Actually it sounded more like limping, which was probably why it was taking her so long to get back. I was faintly wondering what she was doing walking around if she was hurt when she plopped back down next to me, hiding a hiss of pain as she did. Fight's done, Fu asked after a moment. Fight's done, I replied. Good, she said, she shifted somehow, but I couldn't decipher exactly how, so I didn't bother. You know, you look kinda weird. I fought Gara. what did you expect? No, it's not that. It's something else, she hummed in thought, which sounded a little fake but I couldn't tell at the moment. Actually I think you're missing something. I furrowed my brow in confusion, trying to think through what possibly could be missing. Unfortunately, I was so exhausted, I didn't notice until she blew across my face exactly what it was. 
My goggles, I said, my eyes opening in surprise. I don't have them. They probably fell off during the fight. There was the sound of more movement as she spoke but I didn't pay much attention to it. Too bad there wasn't someone that saw where it landed. I need my goggles, I told her, a hint of panic in my voice. They're important, I need them. There was a tense silence that followed, making me pause. This was not the response I was expecting from them. All right, maybe Gara, but Fu was loud and boisterous. She should have been telling me that I needed to keep track of my things better, or at least ask why it was so important. Instead she stayed quiet, barely even moving, which wasn't right. I had to be missing something, something so blatantly obvious that would cause both of them to become upset. Naruto, Fu said, her voice suddenly quiet and unsure. I already have them, they're right here, in front of you. My stomach dropped out as sat there for a moment. Now that I focused I could hear a faint rattling sound coming from right over my head, specifically right where I should be looking. Tentatively, I reached up, freezing when my shaky hand came in contact with the smooth plastic lenses. I I knew that, I said, trying to sound confident. I went to grab the goggles only to feel them yanked out of my grasp before I could. No, you didn't see them. Fu shifted again, probably pulling my goggles closer to her. Why didn't you see them? They were right in front of your face. No one could miss them. I, I, my mind went blank as I tried to come up with a believable answer, but none came. You were blind, Gara stated, leaving no room for discussion. At that moment, I didn't know what to do. I knew I needed to convince them that their conclusion was wrong, but I was so exhausted, there was no way I could come up with a convincing argument. I mean, even if I did, I wasn't even sure I'd be able to stay awake long enough to deliver it. Just tell them, the QB chimed in. I know you don't want anyone to know, but they're in the same boat you are. They'll understand your reasons better than anyone. We just got done fighting Gara, and you want me to trust him with the biggest secret I have. You don't have much a choice, Kit. I sighed audibly, too tired to fight any longer. Please don't tell. I whispered. I wasn't even sure they heard me but judging by the confused noises Fu was generating, they did. If anyone finds out I can't be a ninja anymore. I it's the only thing keeping me safe right now. The civilian law for Shinobi, Gara stated. I simply nodded. Will you keep it a secret? I asked quietly. Quote dot dot, I won't speak of it, he answered. I breathed a small sigh of relief before turning to Fu. Will you too? I asked. I waited a few seconds, but started to get nervous when I didn't get a response. Fu. You're really blind, she whispered, sounding as if she hopped I was simply pulling a prank on her. Yes, I am. It felt funny to admit it but I didn't really have the time to dwell on it now. Will you keep it a secret? She was silent for a little while longer before I heard some rustling come from my side. Before I could ask what she was doing, I felt my goggles carefully slide back into place, covering my eyes once again. I didn't realize I had been nervous without them until they were covering my eyes once again, causing me to relax to the point of almost passing straight out. Of course, she answered as she fussed with my goggles. I smiled sleepily at her, knowing I couldn't fight the exhaustion any longer. Thank you, I murmured my eyes drifting shut on their own accord. I was almost asleep when I heard Fu whisper towards Gara. If you breathe a word of this to anyone, you'll be lucky if Naruto gets to you first, she threatened in hushed tones. If anyone hears of it, it will not be from me. I felt content as I finally gave in and fell asleep. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. Jiraiya stood there and watched unable to do anything as his sensei finished the fight with his old teammate. He knew deep down that there was nothing he could do to help, not only was the barrier impenetrable, but that technique was impossible to stop. Even now, he could almost see the Shinigami standing behind his sensei, if he didn't look right at it. But, 
Despite all this, he still felt like he should be doing something to help him. It didn't take long for the third to finish his technique, causing Orochimaru's arms to drop limply at his sides. The snake Sanin looked furious as the third fell to the roof, but being unable to do anything he had his henchmen take down their barrier in order to escape. The pink walls hadn't even disappeared completely before Jiraiya was on the roof as well, kneeling beside his old sensei. Orochimaru gave Jiraiya a look as if challenging him to try to come after him. Jiraiya simply looked back towards the third, his sensei's life taking precedence over everything else. He heard the five sound nins leap off the roof just as a group of Anbu landed by Jiraiya's side. Go after them, Jiraiya told the Anbu. They shared a look among each other, unsure whether they should listen to him. I'll watch over the Hokage. You just go or they'll get away. The obvious leader nodded before they shot off the roof after the other Sanin and his entourage. Once they were gone, he turned his attention back towards the third. That was a really stupid thing to do, Sensei, Jiraiya told him as he examined the strange stomach wound. It was the only thing I could do, the Hokage wheezed out. I can think of a few things that would have been better than this, or at least wouldn't have left you dying. When you're Hokage, you can make those decisions, that I never could. Oh no, I'm not taking your hat old man, Jiraiya said, though without his usual dramatic flair. I know, I know, the third murmured, half to himself. I have one last request for you, Jiraiya. Anything sensei, within reason. You need to find Tsunade. The village will need her after I die. I doubt she would want the hat either. Jiraiya stated, looking back towards the third's face. He looked troubled by something, and possibly guilty from it. Most likely not, but she may end up with it regardless, the third stated, staring out towards his village. Though that's not the only reason. Dot for you to find her. She can help Naruto. With what? Jiraiya inquired, though he already had a feeling what his sensei was going to say next. Don't play dumb with me. Not now, Sarutobi stated, turning back towards his student. I'm sure you already know that Naruto's newly blind. Yes, I do. Orochimaru is responsible, the third said. Jiraiya's eyes widened in shock, unable to speak for a moment. He admitted it himself, said Naruto was. Getting in the way so he fixed it. I should have known, Jiraiya hissed turning away angrily. I've been looking into who did this for almost a month now and found almost nothing. Only Orochimaru has been able to keep me so thoroughly in the dark. Jiraiya sighed, slumping his shoulders in defeat. Tsunade can fix what he has broken, I'm sure of it, the third wheezed, his voice becoming more faint as he spoke. Then I'll take him with me. The kid has a gift for manipulating others, even though he's too naive to recognize it, Jiraiya said, giving his sensei a smile. If anyone can convince her to come back, it'll be him, not me. Good, that way, even if she doesn't come, she can still fix Naruto. The third smiled sadly, his eyes drifting shut as he did. Take care of him, Jiraiya, he said, his voice barely a whisper. The boy's been through hell and I fear that he's not out of the flames yet. Of course, Sensei. I leave the matter of his heritage to you. When you feel he's ready, you may share it with him. As you wish. Thank you, Jiraiya. I'm sorry I've left you to clean up after my mistakes. That's what students are for. You trained us to be better than you so we, in turn, could train our students to be better than us. That way, not only is the village always growing stronger, but when one does something wrong, there's someone strong enough to fix it. I can't tell if you're serious or just pulling my leg one last time. The Hokage smirked faintly, making Jiraiya chuckle. Can't it be both? Both sound good. They were both quiet for a while as they watched the chaos around town finally start to calm down. Jiraiya, himself, didn't move for quite some time forcing his eyes to stay on the distant horizon even as he heard his sensei's breath stop. 
He knew, right then, that the Hokage had passed, but he couldn't bring himself to look at the body. If he looked at it, then he'd be forced to accept that he was dead, which was something he didn't want to do just yet. All he wanted was to sit there and pretend his sensei was still watching the village with him. And that's what he did. End chapter 32. This is the end of part 12 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. If you enjoyed the What If then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. See you in the next What If. Peace. This is part 13 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. Link in description. If you like this What If then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Hope you enjoy. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Start chapter 33. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Three days later. I sat on the bed, motionless for one of the rare moments in my life. I had woken up several hours ago and could probably get home if I really wanted to, but I didn't. An hour earlier I would have jumped at the chance to escape this hellhole. But that was before I heard that the third had been killed, and before I was told I wasn't allowed to attend the funeral. At this point I wasn't sure if it was the nurses working against me again, or if the elders really had ordered me to stay away. It's not like it mattered much, either way they made it quite clear that I was not welcome at the ceremony which was to start at any moment. So I just sat there, my face aimed towards the open window, the fresh air doing an alright job keeping the hospital smells out of my nose. I didn't have my chakra echoes turned on, I didn't even know if they would work with how low my chakra still was and I didn't feel like checking. It's not like I had anything to see anyways. From the window I could hear much of what was happening in the village. There were birds shouting for attention, shopkeepers trying to sell their goods, and if I really focused I could almost hear funeral music. I was just wondering if I was imagining it when I picked up the sound of light footsteps sneaking closer towards my room. They were slow, deliberate, and probably silent to anyone else listening. There was a slight pause in the footsteps as they got to my door most likely from them looking around the corridor before charging into the room. The person slammed the door shut behind them, disturbing the air and sending the smell of beetles and water flowing throughout the room. I'm not in the mood foo, I said, not even bothering to pretend to look at her. She already knew so going through the motions was needed. Aren't you supposed to be halfway home? I broke my ankle during our fall so we couldn't leave yet, she said simply. I heard her trot over towards me and plop herself onto the end of the bed. How do you do that anyways? You know, recognize me without sight. You're walking fine on it now, I said, ignoring her question. I heal fast. It's a jitteriki perk. You have it too right. Yeah, I didn't say anything else as I continued to listen to what was going outside. Is something wrong? You seem kinda. Dot off. The Hokage is dead. Oh, she said quietly. She was silent for a moment before continuing. He was kinda like a grandfather to you, right? You talked about him pretty highly. Yeah. Then shouldn't you be at the funeral? Fu asked. I bit my lip as I turned my head away from the window, aiming it towards my lap. They won't let me, I murmured after a moment. Why not? Guess. I pulled my knees to my chest when she didn't say anything. I assumed she came to the right decision since she didn't ask for me to clarify. That's bullshit, she stated angrily. Complete bullshit. It's not like I can change it, I muttered back. So what, are you just going to sit around here and mope? What else can I do? I'm not allowed to leave this room. Neither was I and I'm here, aren't I? She stated. I didn't respond as I pulled my knees closer, burying my face into them. She huffed in annoyance, shifting somehow as she did so. There was a strained silence between the two of us for some time, only for it to break at the sound of a fist slamming into her palm. That's it, she exclaimed, making my head snap up to face her. She sounded excited, 
which didn't bode well for me, I'm sure. Are you wearing pants? What? Are you wearing pants? Yes, or no? Yes, I answered wearily. Putting pants on was one of the first things I did when I woke up earlier. The stupid paper shirts are always awkward, but pants make them a little more bearable. Good, can't have you mooning the village after all. Before I could ask her what she meant, she grabbed my wrist and dragged me off the bed. I had barely gotten my feet under me when she yanked me forward yet again, running across the room, opening the door, and promptly darting down the hallway with me in tow. Foo, what are you doing? I yelled, but was promptly ignored. Foo, stop. I can't say we're going to crash into something. Don't worry Naru-chan, I won't let that happen. I could hear the smile in her voice as she dodging us around anything and everything I wasn't able to see. You trust me right? Yeah. Then let's go, she exclaimed, only adding to her speed and this time, I didn't try to stop her. She led me across the village with an almost expert precision. Not once in the ten minutes we spent weaving through the streets and around obstacles did we end up crashing. In fact, I felt almost safe with her as my guide. We were a little way from the village by the time she slowed to a stop. Here we are, she said as she breathed heavier than usual from our run and the small climb up this hill. I had long lost track of our location so I wasn't exactly sure where we ended up. I was just about to tell her as such when I noticed music flowing up to us. I froze, recognizing the type immediately. It was funeral music. I took a few steps towards it only to get yanked back almost immediately. Hey, watch it, there's a cliff there, ya yeah, no. I sent her a flat look that made her chuckle nervously. Oh yeah, you wouldn't know. Well there's a cliff there, and if you keep walking you'll fall off it. I shook my head at her, deciding that it was probably best to see if I could use my chakra echoes yet. I activated them, getting a fuzzier than normal picture back in response. I frowned at the quality but it really couldn't be helped. At this point I was just happy that I could make out what was happening below me. It was the third's funeral. From as far as I could tell, it was just starting. Thank you Fu, I said after a moment. Well, I would have wanted to go if it was my Gigi, so I figured if you couldn't be there officially, we could at least spy on them from up here. I smiled at her a rare genuine smile that I reserved for special occasions. She stood there, kinda stunned as I sat down on the first stone head and focused back on the ceremony. It was a few minutes before Fu joined me, silently taking the seat next to me. End Chapter 33 Start Chapter 34 Blindsided by twice the trouble Trouble 1 Asterisk We sat there for a long time neither of us so much as speaking as the ceremony progressed. The Anbu knew we were there, I could feel their eyes on us every couple minutes or so. But they didn't make a move to get rid of us either, which was kinda nice of them. It turned out to be a couple hour ordeal, with lots of pretty words and traditions. But for once I didn't zone out, I didn't become bored, I focused on what was going on in front of me because the third deserved nothing less than my full attention. I tried to keep a brave face and keep the tears at bay, and it worked, for a while. But when everyone started putting flowers on the casket, it all broke. I could feel the tears streaming out of my useless eyes and pooling inside my goggles until they found a small place to leak out of. It wasn't long after those first few tears left trails down my cheeks that I felt someone take my hand. I glanced over to find that it was Foo's which shouldn't have surprised me much, since she was the only one there, but it did. She looked back at me, squeezing my hand softly as if to give me some sort of reassurance, before turning back. Neither of us spoke until the funeral was over and everyone had filed out of the area. So, I stated, getting her attention. What's the real reason you brought me here, to this specific spot? What do you mean, I did it so you could see the funeral? Say it wasn't so once it was over we would have a secluded place to talk. The thought never crossed my mind. She let go of my hand in order to cross her arms. I waited a moment, 
But since you brought it up, this is a very good spot to talk about how you didn't tell me you're blind. Honestly, I haven't told anyone, I answered with a sigh. The only people that know figured it out on their own. And who knows, she asked after a slight pause. Other than me and our Odito, that is. As far as I know, just Kaka-sensei and his medic nin teammate. I leaned back, propping myself up with my arms. If anyone else knows, they haven't said anything. You think others know? Probably not, I've been really careful. Plus if anyone else found out, they'd have told on me and I'd be out of a job. You still haven't answered my question, she pouted, her face no doubt mirroring her voice. I've answered every one you've asked so far. Why didn't you tell me? It's a secret foo, you don't go around telling everyone your secrets. I'm not everyone, I'm your friend. I didn't tell any of my other friends either. That's not the point, you've seen all of them before. But, but I've never seen you. Quote dot dot, yeah. We sat in silence for a little while as we both got lost in thought. Do you know how long I've been blind? I asked out of the blue. She looked towards me, tilting her head. Well, no. Then, I could have been blind since birth and therefore have never seen any of my friends. Oh, she said quietly. Is that true? Nope, I said with a smile. But it could have been. How long have you been blind? Little over a month. The second test to be exact. Walked into the forest with my sight, walked out without it. We didn't meet till after that. Officially, no, but I've seen you. Really. You're kinda hard to miss when you make as big of a scene as I do. I wasn't that bad, she muttered, scratching the back of her head in embarrassment. Foo, you were jumping up and down before the first test as if the floor was lava. I was antsy. And when I gave the proctor my little speech about not giving up, you couldn't agree silently like everyone else. You had to stand up and proclaim exactly where he could shove his last question. Yeah, I'm surprised he didn't fail me for that. You and me both, I agreed with a chuckle. There was silence for a moment before Fu continued the conversation. Do you remember what I look like? She asked tentatively. Of course, I said, flashing her a smile. What do I look like then? I rolled my eyes at her question but began to describe her anyways. Your hair is short, a little past your chin. It's a minty green color too. I'm pretty sure you have clips holding your bangs back. Your clothes were kinda skimpy but I'm pretty sure Eno dresses worse so. Oh yeah. Your eyes. I really liked your eyes. They're a light orange color and I love orange, I said, earning a small giggle for my efforts. You're a bit taller than me, but that's probably more to do with you being older than anything else. Your skin's kinda dark too, which I thought was cool. I mean, we don't really see that a lot in Konoha. I thought you may have got more sun than we do. But we get a lot of sun here so I guessed it was just your regular skin tone, right? Either way, it's... Before I could finish she leaned forward and planted a small kiss on my lips, stunning me to silence. It took a few seconds after she pulled away before I could speak again. Uh, I guess I'm describing the right person then, huh? Yes, she said as she laughed happily. Do you want me to keep going? I probably could if I really focused. I mean, I have a pretty good memory, contrary to popular belief. I just have trouble focusing on it. She hummed in thought almost playfully before I got an answer. No, that is all right, a voice said that was definitely not Foo's. We both sat up straight and spun around to find Gara sitting on the other side of me, peacefully watching the horizon as if he belonged there. Personally, I would like to hear more about your disability. Gara, I asked the same time Fu. We were having a moment. Fu continued, making me shake my head. Apologies, he stated simply. But I found no better point to interrupt than this. What are you doing here? I asked trying to hide the bit of nervousness I felt by having him so close. I mean, 
We did have a bit of an understanding but he did try to kill me a few days ago. Aren't you supposed to be under lockdown or something? I am. This is a clone. Oh, sand clone. I asked out of curiously. He nodded in addition to making a small, agreeable hum. You have enough chakra for that already. Barely. He states simply. I will not be able to keep it long. Wow and I can hardly get a good picture with my chakras let alone make a clone. You are unused to using Baiju chakra, correct? He asked. I nodded. I am sure once you are more in tune with its chakra you will be able to regenerate it, and your own, at a quicker rate. Sounds about right. Wait. Fu shouted, getting both mine and Gara's attention. How long have you been up here? I am not. This is a clone. Fine. How long's your clone been up here? I formed it here only a few minutes ago, he replied simply. So you didn't hear our conversation? I did. Or I had read it, Gara stated. I gave him an odd look that Fu was no doubt mirroring. He raised two fingers to one eyes as a small sphere appeared next to his head. Sand eye. Don't we get any sort of privacy around here? Fu exclaimed angrily. If you wanted a private conversation then maybe you should have snuck out more quietly. Why you? She exclaimed as she tried to lunge over me to no doubt attack him. I grabbed her bag before she could get far. Down Fu, I said, almost bored. I pulled her back down next to me where she crossed her arms with a huff. There's no need to kill the clone. He's being an ass, she pouted. I shook my head at her before turning back to Gara. You had questions. Yes, he said as he turned back forward. I believe Fu and I are of the same mind. That we could like to know more about this secret we shall be keeping. That's the only thing that's the same, she muttered angrily. With an amused smirk I flopped back onto the ground, folding my arms under my head to act as an impromptu pillow. Ask away. Gara and Fu looked at each other before doing exactly that. They asked a lot of questions, or at least Fu did. Gara seemed content to let her take control of the conversation, occasionally injecting one of his own. Oddly enough, I didn't mind answering whatever question they conjured up. In fact, I kinda enjoyed being able to talk about it to people my own age, knowing they'd never give away my secret. After a bit I even let my chakra echoes fade out, feeling more comfortable with my surroundings than I have in a long time. You stopped pulsing, Gara pointed out in the lull of the conversation. I turned my head towards him, giving him a confused look. Your echoes. Oh, you noticed. My sand is very sensitive, he said as I heard the grains shift around him lightly at their mention. Once I know what to look for, it wasn't hard to find. Cool, I said with a smirk before turning back towards the sky. And yeah, I turned it off. Saves on chakra and I can focus on my other senses better. I really don't want people eavesdropping on this conversation. I believe this particular conversation is about over regardless, Gara pointed out simply. My clone will not last much longer. Well I'm glad you stopped by, I said, sitting back up with a stretch. You know, you're pretty cool when you're not trying to kill us and all. You as well, he said. His sand started to shift more, sounding as if it was starting to fall onto the outcrop. But, before I go, I would like to ask you two something. Go ahead, I said while Fu said something similar. I have been thinking a lot about your suggestion from before. About proving my existence by protecting precious people. Gara paused seemingly a little lost at what to say next. That's cool, I exclaimed with a wide grin. Did you decide on anything yet? I believe I will try this, to see if it does, indeed, do a better job than my current method. That's awesome. But, he started again, but the words once again escaped him. Whatever he was going to say next, seemed to be the important part so, I waited patiently until he found them. But Fu, apparently had other ideas. But what, I thought that was a really cool concept. What, but, could you have with it? She asked. 
Nothing at all, he said, taking a breath before continuing. I was simply wondering if, it would be all right, if I counted you two as some of those people. Fu and I were stunned for a moment, unable to come up with responses ourselves. So let me get this straight, Fu started once she had recovered her voice. Three days ago you had been trying to kill, not only us, but our teammates simply because you could, and now you want to protect us. Is that strange? He wondered. Just a bit, she said, a smile hidden in her voice. She brushed against me as she leaned towards Gara, followed by the sound of hair being shifted playfully. But it's part of your charm. I'd be honored to be thought of as such, Odito. Me too, I said, placing my hand on his shoulder. It felt like it was starting to fall apart a bit but I ignored it. We Jinchurikis need to stick together after all. Thank you, he said, a small smile appearing in his voice as well. We had a small moment before his shoulder disintegrated completely, indicating his departure. We should go too, I said after a moment, earning a sigh from Fu. They're probably missing us by now. I know, but can't we stay for just a little longer? I'm not ready to deal with them yet. She leaned against my side, laying her head on my shoulder. All right, I relented, bringing a hand up to rest on her shoulder. I'm not ready to deal with them either. End chapter 34. Start chapter 35. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Trouble 1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. A few hours later. I was, once again, sitting on the hospital bed, feeling a little better than I did earlier, but I was still pretty upset about everything. It hadn't taken the Anbu much longer to find us, at which point we were lead back towards our own hospital rooms. If the faint shuffling of shoes and light breaths coming from the other side of the door meant anything, I probably had a few Anbu keeping guard as well. I let out a frustrated huff that blew my bangs up for a moment before they came back down to tickle my nose. I was just thinking that it was probably time for a haircut when I heard a very familiar voice ask my guards to let him pass. I perked up, turning towards the door as it opened up and Jiraiya entered. Hey kid, he greeted as his footsteps made their way across the room and his weight settled on the end of the bed. He sounded older than I ever thought possible, as if the last few days had aged him considerably. Hey, how are you holding up? He asked. Better than earlier, I replied honestly. I tried to tell the elders you should be at the funeral, but they didn't want to hear it, Jiraiya said, a guilty tone in his voice. I'm sorry. It's not your fault, I said with a shrug. Plus, I ended up seeing it regardless. Is that why there's four guards outside your door? Probably. I shot him a small grin that made him chuckle despite the circumstances. I should have known. I heard his ear swish back and forth as he shook his head. You're too stubborn to take no for an answer. That word has no meaning to me. And yet you can still use it in a sentence. Um. It has no meaning if anyone else says it. I can use it just fine. That's good to know, he said a small smile in his voice. Uh, sensei, I said, not continuing until a questioning hum come from his direction. How are you holding up? Well considering my sensei was killed by teammate, I could be worse. I'm sorry, I said after a moment of silence. For what? He asked, confusion coloring his voice. I'm sorry you had to lose your sensei. That has to be hard, no matter your age. I mean, I couldn't imagine what would I would do if you or Kakasensei were killed, let alone if one of my teammates did it, I said. So. I'm sorry. He was silent for a long while, making me think I had said something wrong. You're a good kid, he finally said, ruffling my hair as he spoke. Thanks. How would you like to join me on a mission? He asked, startling me even more. I stared at him slack-jawed, trying to figure out where that had come from. Are you joking? No, I wouldn't joke about something like that, he said 
his voice sounding slightly offended for a moment before continue. I have a very important mission that the third trusted me with before he died. I think it would be a good idea for you to come with me. Why? What would we be doing? Fetching the new Hokage, of course. Really? That sounds awesome. I exclaimed happily, sitting up a little straighter at the thought of going on such an important mission. But why would you want me to come? Wouldn't you want an Anbu or, at the very least, a Junin to protect the new Hokage on the way back? Security won't be a problem, trust me, he said with a laugh. If anyone needs protection for this mission, it will be us and from her. She won't exactly be willing to take this post, let alone come back with us. You mean she's not even in the village? I asked in confusion. Why would they choose someone for Hokage if they're not even here? Because the person we're fetching is Tsunade, my old teammate. The third himself nominated her for the post. He knew she was the best person for the job, regardless of her personality quirks. What about you? I asked, making him burst out in laughter. No way Gaki, he said around his laughter. Me, with that amount of responsibility. The council would rather streak through the village naked than have me take the hat. And, truth be told, I completely agree. Quote dot dot, I don't want to see that, I said, almost glad that if it did happen, I wouldn't be able to see it. Neither do I, so we better go fetch Tsunade before they start stripping. I nodded vigorously, making him laugh once again. So you'll come, good, we leave in three days. Make sure to pack for a long mission. I paused for a moment as I felt him stand up from the bed, remembering something that Rin said when I last met her. That I only had a certain amount of time before I had to go to her again if I wanted to keep the pain away. Wait, how long? I asked, feeling a little nervous. Not sure, could be anywhere from a week to a month or two, Jiraiya said simply. He continued on, but I wasn't exactly listening. Instead I was doing the math in my head, trying to see if I had enough time before the next visit to go on the mission. She had said two months, and I had already spent one of them prepping for that stupid exam. If the mission really did take more than a month to complete then the pain would be back before we even started back. On second thought, I said, interrupting whatever speech Jiraiya was on this time. I should probably talk to Kaka-sensei about it first. Get his permission and all that. Why would you need that? He asked, sounding almost insulted. I'm your sensei. Temporary sensei. Kaka sensei is my official one, and if I disappeared without his permission I'd get in serious trouble, no matter who I disappeared with. Fine, Jiraiya said with an exaggerated sigh. I heard his feet turn on the tile floor as he headed back towards the door. Go talk to your real sensei. I'll be looking for leads while you do. You mean peeping on bathhouses. I'll have you know you can get a wide variety of information from bathhouses. And a lot of it is very useful. Sure, whatever makes you feel better Aero Senen, I smirked as I heard the door creak open as he muttered something about disrespectful brats. Um, Aero Senen. You want me to tell Kakashi you want to talk to him, right? He asked from the now open doorway. Since I can't leave, yeah. Very well, I'll let him know if I see him. Can't promise he'll get her in record time though, he said, his voice fading a bit as he turned away from me. If he did, then we should start planning for the apocalypse. Agreed, Jiraiya said with a chuckle. See ya, kid. Bye, I said with a wave. The door shut with a small click, leaving me alone in the room once again. I frowned, thinking that it probably wouldn't be so boring if the Kayubi wasn't sleeping at the moment. He claimed he needed to recover from the exertion I put him through but compared to the amount of chakra he has, we used next to nothing. Though he hasn't used very much since he was sealed in me, maybe even longer, so maybe he just wasn't used to using it anymore. Either way, he's been sleeping since the fight, only the occasional snore letting me know he was even still there. I guess I was kind of annoyed, but then figured that maybe he had the right idea. 
After all that running around today, a nap sounded like an awesome idea. It wasn't like Kakashi was going to be here for several hours, so I had the time. Laying down, I got as comfy as I could on the poor excuse for a bed before falling into an almost immediate sleep. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Several hours later, I awoke to a pile of fabric connecting with my face. Time to go, a voice said from somewhere to my left. I sat there for a moment, trying reorient myself. Kaka sensei, I inquired as I sat up, moving my goggles for a moment to rub the sleep out of my eyes. Yup, and I'm here for your jail break he stated, a smile in his voice. So get dressed so we can go. Jail break. Unless you'd rather stay here. No, I exclaimed as I immediately began fighting with the stupid paper shirt, struggling to get it off. You know, your chakra echoes would work wonders. Shut up, I muttered, turning them on regardless. After that, it wasn't long before I switched shirts and was on my feet, ready to leave. What are you waiting for? I asked as I pulled open the door. I turned towards Kakashi, as he stood in the middle of the room, seeming to look out the window. When he finally turned to face me, I raised a questioning eyebrow that made him chuckle. Someone's impatient, he stated as he followed me out of the room. The ANBUs that were at the door earlier were gone now, probably leaving as soon as they heard I was being released. I've been smelling nothing but antiseptic for three days. If I don't get out of here soon, I'm not sure I'll have much a nose left. Why do you think I wear the mask? Because your face scares children, I answered without pause. I shoved my hands into my pockets as my sensei placed a hand over his heart as if he was offended. How rude, he stated, his voice way too dramatic. I rolled my eyes as I shook my head at his antics. I'm totally right, you know it. I'll have you know I'm actually quite handsome under this mask, he said. In fact I wear this mask to keep from accidentally seducing the general public. Your boasting has reached Jiraiya levels right now, I said flatly as we exited the hospital's double doors. I let out a breath that I didn't know I was holding as we reached the outside. I then breathed in the smell of clean air and nature that I couldn't get on the inside. Speaking of Jiraiya, I heard he offered to take you on a mission with him, Kakashi stated, expertly changing the subject. I also heard you all but said yes until hearing the length of the mission. He said it will probably take at least a month. I shuffled my feet forward, kicking a rock down the street. And you know what happens in a month. Yes, I remember, Kakashi replied, his voice becoming more serious. So I can't go. There was silence between us for a while as we walked down the street. It wasn't until a few minutes had passed that he spoke. Question, he stated, getting my attention. Do you want to go? What do you mean? I asked, turning towards him. If you didn't have to worry about missing your appointment, would you go? In a heartbeat, my answer was instantaneous. It's a really important mission. I'd love to be part of it. Then go. It's not that simple, I said with a huff of annoyance. Yes, it is, he stated. I opened my mouth to say something, but he continued talking as if I hadn't. Think about it. It's a mission to fetch the best medical nin this village ever produced, maybe even the best in all the elemental nations. If you end up having trouble, then who would be better than her to fix it? Oh yeah, that will go over well. Hey Tsunade-san, I know we just met and we were sent to bring you back to the village probably against your will. But can you fix my eyes before the pain gets so bad that it cripples me and everyone sees that I'm... Kakashi cleared his throat, cutting me off as another ninja passed us on the street. Kakashi nodded towards him as I could almost feel the odd look he was giving us. We didn't say anything until we had moved out of earshot of the other ninja. Once he was gone, Kakashi pulled me to a stop. Some things are worth the risk, Naruto, he said. You don't exactly have the luxury to sit around and wait for Jiraiya to bring her back on his own. 
This village is full of eyes and ears just waiting for someone to spill their secrets close enough so they can obtain them. But I was fine all month. The exams distracted anyone that would want that information. Unfortunately, they're over. He was quiet for a moment as if waiting for a response. When I didn't give one, he continued speaking. You won't have the chance to ask her about it unless you're outside these walls. Otherwise all the wrong people will find out and look to use that information before she even has the chance to fix it. But, it hurt, I murmured, my face aimed towards the ground. It hurts so much, I don't want to feel it again. I understand, he said, just as quietly as he placed a comforting hand on my shoulder. I've had my fair share of eye problems so I get it. But it's ultimately your choice to make. I can't make it for you, only give you my advice. I know, thanks, I said, giving him a small smile in response. He ruffled my hair briefly before dropping his hand back at his side. Well, I believe this is your stop. I frowned for a moment before taking in the surroundings, a little surprised to find myself at the base of my apartment building. I started heading towards the stairs when Kakashi called to me. Will you be all right? Yeah, I got this, I answered, waving away his concern with a hand over my shoulder as I kept walking. You can go check on the rest of my teammates now. I kinda want some time to think anyways. I'll stop by later to see what you've come up with, he said. When I didn't answer, he continued. I'll bring Ichirakus. I stopped mid-step, turning back towards him before smiling. Sounds like a plan, I said as I finally put my foot down on the step. But I swear, if you don't bring it, the pranks I pulled on Jiraiya will look like child's play. Duly noted. End chapter 35. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. I hope to see you all in the next what if. Peace out people. This is part 14 of what if Naruto lost his sight. Link in description. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Hope you enjoy. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Start chapter 36. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. It didn't take very long getting to my apartment. I threw open the door pausing at the threshold as I took in the comforting smells of my old home, my orchid making its presence known on the kitchen table. I smiled slightly as I walked over to it, petting one of its soft petals. Hey Kanari-chan, how've you been? I asked it sweetly. I wasn't sure how I felt about the plant when I got it, but her comforting scent and constant presence made her grow on me, so to speak. I pinched one of her leaves between my fingers gently, noticing that it felt a little dry. Thirsty, huh? I asked as I waked over to the freezer to fetch an ice cube. Not surprised. I'm pretty sure I was supposed to water you two days ago. Sorry about that. Couldn't get back before now. Dropping the ice cube onto the soil near the stem, I sat down at the table, propping my head up on my hands. 
I don't know what to do, I told the plant. It really shouldn't be this big of an issue really. I would have jumped on the chance to find the new Hokage before all of this, but now. I'm not sure if I should. On one hand, I could go and not only get an epic mission under my belt, but maybe have this Tsunade fix my eyes. On the other, I could play it safe, not risk the pain returning but possibly lose the chance to ever see again. I I just don't know. Why don't you stop bitching and let me sleep? A deep, groggy voice murmured in my mind. You're awake, I said, perking up a bit at his voice. I kinda missed him over the last few days, but I wasn't going to let him know that. And here I was enjoying the silence for once. Sure you were, Kit. You didn't miss me in the slightest, he stated, sarcasm coming of his words in waves. Even if you did, it's not like I can hear your thoughts and call your bluff. Shut up, I muttered, burying my face in my hands. I would, but someone's indecisiveness woke me up so now I can't, the Kyubi said through the bond. Can't, or won't, I said into my hands. Both. Great. I dropped my head completely down onto the table, turning so my cheek lay against the cool wood surface. You can at least make yourself useful and help me figure this out. But I'm not. Why? I whined, getting an annoyed huff from the Kyubi in response. Because you already have everything you need. Whatever I have to say you've already heard, he stated, making me frown. Not to mention, we both know you've already made your decision. You're just trying to muster the courage to actually follow through with it. You're right, I said after a moment of silence. This really shouldn't surprise you. I'm an ancient demon that knows a lot more than any of you puny humans, let alone one tiny kit. So the fact that you can read my mind like a book wasn't part of it at all, huh? Quote dot dot. Well, I can't say it didn't help. I sighed, sitting up in my chair once again. Guess I should start packing then. I climbed out of the chair and started towards my room. Can I go back to sleep now or do you need me to walk you through that as well? I think I figure out what to bring on my own, thank you very much. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next day. All right, I think I have everything, I told the Kyubi happily as I walked down the road after having finished my shopping for the trip. I do, right, I didn't forget to get something, did I? Honestly, I think you overpacked, the fox said lazily. I mean, do you really need a hundred packs of instant ramen? Yes, yes I do. It's my emergency rations in case we can't find a ramen shop where we are, I said, holding my full ceiling scroll protectively against my chest. It's necessary. Ramen stands are as common houseflies. And, in my opinion, just as annoying. Take that back, you heathen. I frowned as the Kyubi made sure I knew he was rolling his eyes at me. What did I do to get stuck with you as a container? He muttered to himself, no doubt shaking his head at me. Oh, I don't know, I said to him, sarcasm heavy in my voice. It might have something to do with how you destroyed half of Konoha the day I was born. I had expected an immediate retort of some sort, so when I didn't get one I was kinda confused. It was almost 30 seconds before he actually said something. You wouldn't be joking about that if you knew what really happened, he answered, sounding more serious than normal. Okay, I wanted to ask him about it, but something told me that I would be getting a straight answer out of him anytime soon. So I let it go. Well, I don't know about you but all that talk of ramen made me really hungry. How am I not surprised? Let me guess, Ichiraku's. Where else? I answered with a grin. I turned the corner to find that same shop right in front of me. And it just happens to be right there. It must be fate. Or it was planned from the beginning. Well, it is dinner time, I told him with a grin. I continued towards the shop breathing in the beautiful smell of ramen that wafted towards me. Before I knew it, I was at the shop sitting on my favorite stool, waiting for Ayim to finish serving another guest. Naruto, 
Aim greeted happily when she noticed me. How are you? Better. I answered with a smile. I was a bit beat up after the exams but it wasn't anything too serious. For you, I'm pretty sure most consider chakra exhaustion to be very serious, the Kyubi muttered, but I ignored him. That's good, Aim said, the kind smile on her face so wide that my echoes could just pick it up. I'm glad you weren't seriously hurt in that fiasco. My father and I were going to go to the event but were too swamped at the stall to get away. As upset as we were about missing your fight, we're sort of glad we couldn't make it. Me too. It was chaos over there. You guys could have been hurt. I don't know what I'd do if that happened. For one, I'd have to find a new ramen shop. I stopped short when she swatted me lightly upside the head. I laughed as she stood there with a hand on her hip no doubt smiling at my antics. Oh, I see how it is, he said, a playful tone in her voice. And here I was going to let you have your first three bowls on the house. I guess I don't. I didn't mean it, I could never find a better shop than you guys. Honest. So predictable, he muttered as Aim burst out laughing, unable to contain her amusement any longer. And don't forget it, she said around her laughter. She ruffled my hair briefly before starting towards the back. What type? Beef. I exclaimed happily. Coming right up. Arigato. I called back as I settled into my seat, enjoying the calm I haven't had the chance to experience in quite a while. Ever since the exam started, it's been non-stop chaos, one thing after another that I've been forced to deal with on the fly. So it was kind of nice to just be able to sit here and relax. But it didn't last for long. It was like that girl had some sort of sensor that alerted her to my calmest moments because no sooner had I relaxed did a force tackle me, almost sending me to the ground. I was confused for only a moment before the familiar smell of beetles and water surrounded me. I really should be expecting her by now. Damn it foo, do you always hide me, she demanded in an almost panicked whisper. I looked towards her blankly for a moment, completely confused by the new turn of events. Why? I asked slowly. She looked behind her for a moment before turning back towards me, almost as if she was expecting someone to be following her. I don't want to leave, that's why. She shouted before wincing at the volume and covering her mouth, letting go of me in the process. Still confused. I was supposed to leave this morning. She stated quietly from behind her hand. But I don't want to sew. I might have taken off without my sensei knowing. Again, and I might have been running around Konoha avoiding him all day. I shook my head at her as she lowered her hand from her mouth. So that's why the Anbu have been antsy. Great job. So hurry up and hide me already. He's been getting closer and I'm running out of options, she explained, sounding desperate again. I simply propped my arm on the counter, resting my chin on my hand almost casually. Why? What? Fu asked, confusion coloring her voice. Why should I hide you? Because if you don't I'll steal every speck of clothing you own on my way out. Right down to your boxers. Fair enough. Hop the counter. I'll cover for you. Thanks, she said, a grin in her voice as she popped over the counter and disappeared underneath it. She was just barely hidden when a man came running around the corner, acting like he was on one of the Torah missions. His head was snapping back and forth before it stopped on the ramen stand. He stared as I made a point to look away from him, all the while keeping one of my secondary echo points trained on him. When he started walking towards the stand, I sighed, knowing this wasn't going to end very well. Is he coming? Fu whispered her voice muffled by the counter. Yup. Do you think he knows I'm here? Probably. I'm not coming out unless he drags me. I'm sure he could arrange that, I whispered, noting how close he was now. Quiet or he'll hear you. When the man entered the stall I was playing with a pair of chopsticks, making myself look like nothing more than a bored child waiting for their food. He glanced around the small establishment before clearing his voice in order to get my attention. I turned towards him, 
my best innocent child face on just in case. Can I help you? I asked simply. Are you lost? You look kinda lost. It's all right though, a lot of foreigners can't find their way around here. It's nothing to be ashamed of, even though it's a pretty simple layout. He stared at me for a long moment. I almost thought I had lost him somewhere along the line but I hadn't said much. So, I asked again, snapping him out of his revelry. What? Are you lost? No, I'm not lost, he answered finally, sounding annoyed with me already. But my student is. Right, I got ya, I said giving him a knowing smile. Honest, I'm not lost. Don't worry about it. I tried to wink only to realize that he couldn't see my eyes. Instead I just continued speaking. And where does your student need to go? No, I'm looking for my student. His exasperated tones almost making me chuckle. She is lost. I'm looking for her. I am not lost. All right, I get it. Jeesh, no need to be rude. I pouted slightly until Aim came around with my ramen. I perked up immediately, even as she paused for a moment, probably catching sight of Fu, before delivering my food. Thanks Aim, you're the best. You're welcome, she answered, sounding a little confused but she was nice enough not to bring it up now. Well what does your student look like? Maybe I can help you find her. Green, blue hair above her shoulders. White clothes with a bright red bag on her back, he said, sounding impatient. Have you seen her? I pretended to think for a moment, tapping my chopsticks against my chin before turning them towards my ramen. Sorry, can't say I have. I fought hard to keep from smirking, ultimately failing when I heard an amused snort come from under the desk. I shoved a good chunk of noodles in my mouth to hide it. There was a small, awkward pause before he continued. Are you sure? He asked, his voice skeptical. I was pretty sure by now he knew where she was and was simply giving her the chance to reveal herself without much of a fuss. After all, she wasn't exactly being subtle. But there was no way I was going to risk losing my wardrobe by giving up the game now. Yup, I said around my noodles. I slurped them loudly earning a disgusted sound from the man questioning me. Why do I not believe you? He asked. Sighing. I set my chopsticks aside and turned to face him, making sure to aim my face towards him. Look, if I'd seen the girl I would have told you. I don't lie, it's not my thing. When he still didn't say anything I continued. I'd rather get mauled by a rabid fox than tell you something that was untrue. A fox, he said, making me pause. Why a fox? It's just a figure of speech. I could have used any animal and it would have worked just the same. You really shouldn't look too deep into it. You're right, I was being too skeptical, he relented after a long moment. I would like to apologize but don't seem to know your name. That's all right, I grinned as I picked up my chopsticks once again, digging them into the noodles in front of me. And I'm Uzumaki Naruto. Of course, I should have recognized you instantly. You competed in the final test, didn't you? Yup, I answered with a grin. Did pretty good, if I do say so myself. You're also one of three contestants to use. Foreign chakra during your tests, he said, making me pause, chopsticks halfway to my mouth. I believe you know what I'm talking about. Should I? You're being very confusing right now, I stated, slowly eating a few noodles. Yes, you should. And you do, he said, coming closer as he did, too close for my comfort. And how would you know this? I asked, trying to ignore the way his breath was pushing my hair around. Because you could have used any animal, but you didn't. You said a fox. Are you a Yamanaka? Because that sounds like something they would say, I said, but he ignored my attempt to change the conversation. I've only known one person to speak of foxes so casually in Konoha. Funny that you share her surname, he all but whispered. I froze in my seat, trying desperately to figure out what he was talking about. No one has the same surname as me. 
It was a made-up name to make me feel better about not having a family, I was sure of it. I have never heard the name Uzumaki said when not speaking about me, so why was this guy claiming he knew one? End Chapter 36 Start Chapter 37 Blindsided by twice the trouble T1 Tilda 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 Hey Kit, you might want to actually pay attention to this guy, Kayubi said, startling me out of my own thoughts. But he said. I know what he said. We can discuss it later. But right now you need to get control of this conversation. Stop reacting to him and make him react to you. But how? If you were listening to him you'd know exactly how. I nodded briefly as I focused back to the man next to me. He was still leaning close, but now I recognized it for what it was, an intimidation tactic. It was a pretty good one, and a conscious decision on his part, he knew what he was doing. If I had to guess, he was probably part of Taki's TI department before taking over as Fu Sensei. I smirked to myself, I could work with that. So, what happened? Did you leave the TI department willingly or did they throw you out for being such a dick? I asked, making him sputter to a stop. Excuse me. I'm guessing it's the second one. After all I doubt chasing Fu all day would be anyone's dream job, I said stirring the noodles with my chopsticks slowly. I bet they were happy to see you go too. Gave them a chance to hire someone with real talent instead of having to drag your useless ass around each interrogation. Now listen here, you damn foe, he hissed, leaning closer as he did. I cut him off before he got too far. I wouldn't continue that if I were you, I whispered, a smile back on my face. It could be dangerous. Oh yeah, and what are you going to do to me? Me, oh, absolutely nothing, not my job to punish lawbreakers. It is, however, theirs. I motioned lazily to one of the ANBUs across the street just before it disappeared to find a better hiding spot. What law? Shame on you, coming into a foreign village and not even bothering to read up on their laws. I clicked my tongue at him in fake disapproval before continuing. Don't worry, I'll tutor you. You see, almost 13 years ago, the third Hokage created a law that whoever spoke directly about my furry little friend in reference to me would be immediately given the death sentence. I paused for a moment, letting him process the words I just said. I wished I could have seen his eyes widen I shock but I was able to make do with the stunted gasp he gave instead. He took a step backwards out of my personal space, making me smile a little more. So you see, you really dodged a bullet on that one. You're welcome. What sort of maniac would enact a law like that? A maniac that actually saw those like me as human beings and not mobile super weapons, I said, my voice serious. I know, it's a bit of a hard concept to understand, at least for you. Why you little? I'd suggest leaving Konoha before you say something that will get you killed. He straightened himself up obviously trying to regain as much dignity as possible before leaving. Come along Fu, he said, his voice ice. No one moved for a long moment. Don't make me come back there and drag you out. She sighed as a shuffling was heard from under the counter. She stood up slowly, her shoulders slumped in defeat. She hopped to the other side slowly, dragging her feet on purpose. Go collect your things, he ordered not even looking towards her. Hi sensei, she murmured, but didn't move. Bye Naruto, I'll miss you. Bye, I said, unsure of what else to say. Will you come and visit? She asked, her voice hopeful. Do I have to? Yes, or I'll start collecting for my quilt again. After all I'm not sure I have enough t-shirts to make a good size one. You were serious about that, I demanded making her chuckle. Fine, I'll visit. Yay, you're the best, she exclaimed. You're the worst, I murmured, making her laugh. She moved as if to hug me, but after glancing at her sensei, her arms dropped back to her sides. Before either of us could say anything about it, her sensei cleared his throat, motioning for her to be on her way. She huffed in annoyance, but followed his order. 
after she was a few feet away, then leaned in once again. You stay away from her, do you hear me? He hissed, his voice low and threatening. We will not put up with two of your kind interacting in that way. Tell her that, I stated simply, turning my attention back towards my ramen. He started to say something else but I cut him off before he could finish his breath. Have a nice trip. Don't let the gate hit your ass on the way out. I continued eating as if nothing happened as he walked out. You shouldn't have done that, the Kayubi stated, long after he was out of earshot. You're right, I relented easily. What I should have done was follow him and make sure it really did hit him in the ass. But I've got ramen to eat, so he's let off the hook. For now, maybe next time, hmm. You know what I mean. Yup, I shouldn't have pissed him off so badly, right? Well, what can I say, that's what I do best. Trust me, I know. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Two days later. Hey Aero Senen, I shouted as I ran up to him. He was standing next to the village gates talking to the two eternal chunin about something I didn't really care to listen to. He had a small bag on his back that was about the same size as mine, and probably just as full of storage seals as mine too. He looked up towards me, waving lazily as I got close. You took long enough, Gaki. I've been waiting here for twenty minutes, he stated, not sounding annoyed much at all. I'm not Kakashi. If I says 8 o'clock, I mean 8 o'clock. I know, I stated as I came to a stop behind him, catching my breath as I did. I had to find someone to watch Kanari-chan. Who? Jiraiya asked after a moment. Kanari-chan, she's the orchid I got from Eno, I answered with a smile. She couldn't stay at my apartment alone for a month, so I had to have someone plant sit. I was going to ask Eno. But then I remembered, she trades her services for gossip and, well, the gossip she'd want I didn't want to share. But then I saw Sakura and asked her. She wasn't going to do it, but changed her mind when I said that Ino would probably do it better anyways. You played her on purpose. I'm impressed. Thanks. My grin widened at the praise. Is that the only reason you're late? He asked. I paused for a moment, before answering. For the most part, there was silence again as he waited for me to elaborate. I may have stopped to prank Sasuke before coming here. I figured if I was going to be out of the village, I could at least leave him a goodbye present. What did you do? His voice all but told me he was rolling his eyes at my antics. Not much, I said, shifting my feet in the dirt as I spoke. I just broke into his house rearranged his furniture and hid his TV remote in the ceiling. I don't believe you could do that all before getting here. Believe what you will, it doesn't really matter to me, I said, shrugging nonchalantly. It doesn't change the fact that when I get back, I'll be able to fetch the remote and start turning his TV on and off at will. You should have done that weeks ago but I'll let it slide. Whatever you say, he said, straightening up as he fixed his straps. Are you ready to go? Naruto, I heard Sakura shout in the distance. It came from the direction of Sasuke's apartment complex. The thought of what she'd do to me for wrecking his room scared the snot out of me. The sooner the better. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. A few hours later. Sue, I started as we made our way down what felt like a dirt road. Where exactly are we going? We've been walking for almost three hours and you just thought to ask now. He asked, turning towards me. He had an amused tone in his voice but I doubt it really surprised him very much. It doesn't really matter if I know where we're going if I'm following you, I pointed out, kicking a rock on a path. I tried to focus on it as it flew, but it disappeared from my vision almost immediately, only to reappear after hitting the ground and rolling a few feet. I frowned. I just asked because I was curious. What would you have done if we got separated, hmm? If you don't know where we're going, then you wouldn't be able to regroup there. You have a point, I relented after a moment. 
But you still haven't answered my question. Just one of the nearby villages. We should get there by tomorrow evening, he said, a smirk in his voice. I kicked another rock, watching it disappear a few inches after making contact with my foot. I frowned again. You think she's there? I questioned. Not a chance. But it's a good spot to procure some lead on her whereabouts, he said simply. I nodded as I kicked another rock, the results were the same as before, making me frown once again. Care to explain why you're glaring at that rock like it personally offended you? I'm not glaring at it. Gaki, your glare's so fierce that you're giving your emo teammate a run for his money. I am not, I exclaimed, glaring at him when he kicked the rock before I could reach it. See, if I didn't know any better, I'd think this rock was personally responsible for killing your entire clan or something like that. I doubt Sasuke would appreciate you comparing his brother to a rock, I said flatly, turning my attention back to said stone. Neither would Itachi, but that still won't stop me from naming this rock after him. I'm thinking Iwaki, he said, a grin in his voice. I sighed loudly, my face connecting fiercely with my palm. I hate you, you know that right, I muttered to him, after a moment. I'm well aware. Jiraiya bent down to pick up my rock, not even interrupting his stride to do so. What I don't know is why you suddenly hate the rock as well. I don't hate the rock, I exclaimed, throwing my hands in the air in exasperation. I hate the fact that my chakra echoes can't pick it up while it's flying through the air. Ah, that would do it, he said, nodding to himself. Let me guess, your echoes can't keep up with it. It moves too fast. Well, glaring at it isn't going to make it move any slower. I know that, and I wasn't glaring. I was trying to figure out if I could fix it, or if I should just leave it alone. Try working on your chakra control, Jiraiya suggested, earning an exasperated sound from me. That's your answer to everything. If you don't like my answers then figure it out on your own. That's what I was doing. There was silence between the two of us for quite a while before Jiraiya broke it. You should work on your control though. And how do you expect me to do that while we're traveling? I'm sure I can figure something out, he said, his tone suddenly making me regret asking. Whatever he had up his sleeves, he sounded way too happy about it. You know what, I changed my mind. It doesn't bother me at. Too late, my mind's made up he said, earning a groan from me. He tossed the rock aside as he reached into his bag and pulling out a small ceiling scroll. He opened it up in one hand and released a small bit of chakra into it with the other. A moment later there was a small poof that revealed something small and spherical item in his hands. Catch! He threw it at me, making me lose sight of it for the length of time it took to reach my hand. I fumbled briefly before finally getting a good grasp on it. Whatever the thing was, it was about the size of my palm and kinda squishy. I squeezed it a few times, noting the sound of moving water inside the sphere. The closest thing I could think of was a water balloon but why would Jiraiya have one of those with him on a mission? That's your next exercise, he said proudly. You have to pop the water balloon. I looked towards him for quite some time as I tried to figure out what he was up to. I was really confused by this point. I mean, what would popping a water balloon have to do with chakra control? But what do I know? So I shrugged and began reaching for a kanai. Not with a kanai, Jiraiya said with a small sigh. With your chakra, you have to channel into the balloon and move the water around until it pops. Why? Because it's a good way to build your chakra control, he said with a nod of his head. It's technically the first step to a cool jutsu I know, but I don't think you're quite ready for all of that. So you're having me do an exercise from a jutsu that you're not even going to teach me yet. Think of it as getting a head start for when I do teach it to you. I did mention how much I hate you, right? That's twice so far today. Just checking. End chapter 37. Start chapter 38. Blindsided by twice the trouble.
Chapter 38. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Same time. Two cloaked figures made their own way down a dirt path leading to Konoha. The pair were certainly intimidating, one being a blue, vicious-looking man with a large sword, the other a shorter, long-haired man whose presence was enough to keep people away. Either men were easily recognizable, even without their matching black cloaks being taken into account. Hey Itachi, Kisame asked, walking in front of him a few steps. He was currently trying to get his partner's attention, but was failing epically. He'd been attempting to talk to the eldest Uchiha brothers since the start of the trip, but hadn't gotten more than a yes or no answer from the man. Are you excited to see your little brother? Itachi didn't bother to even acknowledge the question. I bet he won't be very excited to see you. Again, there was no answer. I mean, you did kill his whole family. If he's happy to see you after that then there's something wrong with the kid. A faint caw could be heard in the distance, but no response from his partner. Then again, he is related to you, so who knows. Kisame shrugged dramatically, only for it to turn into a chaotic flail when a large, black-shaped dive bombed his head. What the hell? Kisame spun around to follow the thing and watch as it landed on Itachi's outstretched arm. The large crow stared at him for a long moment, cocking its head to the side before turning to his summoner, chattering in his ear. Itachi listened intently, nodding occasionally as if he could understand the bird's annoying twittering. After a long moment, the bird leaned back, apparently done with his report. Good job, Itachi murmured back to him. Continue watching them. What the hell was that about? Kisame asked as the bird cawed and took off into the sky. Itachi said nothing more as he turned around and started back the way they came. Hey, you know Konoha's the other way, right? The Kayubi Jinchuriki is no longer in Konoha, Itachi informed him simply when the fish man caught up to him. Oh, Kisame stated, good, I didn't want to see that tree-hugging village anyways. They walked in silence for a minute or so before Kisame once again broke it. You had your bird dive bomb me on purpose, didn't you? He asked with narrowed eyes on his partner. The only response he got was a hint of a smirk hiding behind the other's tall collar. Bastard! Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. One day later. I groaned in frustration as we entered a random town the same water balloon from yesterday still in my hand, unpopped. I couldn't figure out how he expected me to be able to pop the stupid balloon by just swirling my chakra around. It was stupid, not only did the water not want to move with my chakra in the first place, when it the stupid balloon just stretched. It was never going to work. I had told Aero San in this yesterday, but he just chuckled and told me there was a trick to it. He then proceeded to ignore me whenever I asked him about said trick. Over the last day and a half I've been tempted more than once to chuck the stupid balloon at the back of his spiky head, but I didn't. Not sure how I pulled that off with the Kyubi encouraging me to do so the entire time. Cheer up kid, Jiraiya said in response to my groan. We get a real bed for once. I had a real bed the other night. My own bed, I said letting the hand clutching the balloon drop to my side. True, but they'll be rare for the rest of our trips I suggest savoring it while we have it. As he spoke, a group of women walked by us, catching my sensei's attention. Even blind I could tell that his eyes were glued to their persons. Speaking of savoring, Hey Aero Senen, I said loudly, making sure the women could hear me. How are we supposed to find a hotel if you're ogling women the whole time? Jiraiya's head snapped towards me as the women whispered among themselves. I gave him my most innocent look as we came to a stop, even going so far as to tilt my head to the side curiously. Don't give me that look, he hissed. You know exactly what you're doing. Doing what? I'm simply curious on how long it's going to take to get a hotel. We've been traveling a long time sensei, and I'm tired, I said, fighting a smirk as I spoke. 
I invented that look, brat, he answered, still staring me down. You can't fool me. But sensei, I don't need to fool you, I said, turning towards the women as they whispered about cruel men and unrelenting teachers, the whole time looking towards my sensei. Brat, he whispered back as he started heading down the road once again. I smirked as I jogged to catch up. Why did I bring you again? Because I'm awesome, I exclaimed happily, ignoring the snort of amusement that came from Jiraiya. And someone has to make sure you stay on track. If you were left to yourself, you would be too busy, researching, to do the mission. I work just fine without supervision, thank you very much. He stopped walking as he held a hand out to indicate a building to my right. See, I knew this hotel was right around the corner so my distraction, as you put it, wasn't as bad as you were making it out to be. Then why are we still standing outside? I asked. He turned to look at me for a long moment before letting out an exasperated sigh. Come on, Jiraiya said as he walked into the building. I followed close behind him as he stepped up to the main desk and ordered a single room with two beds. As he was paying for the room, a clearly female figure passed by, gaining his attention once again. He was gawking at her, his jaw dropped so far that even my echoes could pick it up. I was about to call him out on it when I heard her giggle before doing something that seemed like blowing him a kiss. I was so surprised that someone was flirting with my mess of a sensei that my words were lost before I could even say them. Jiraiya let out a giggle of his own, though his sounded more perverted than hers had been. He quickly took the keys the man had been offering him for almost a minute and tossed them towards me. Here ya go, kid. I'll be back a little later. I have to gather, he said, a clearly perverted tone in his voice. He took a few steps to follow her out of the building before yelling back to me. Behave while I'm gone. Before I could even come up with an appropriate response he had already left. Looks like you were ditched, Kit, the Kyubi stated, amusement of his own curling around his words. If he doesn't come back with information about Tsunade's whereabouts, then I'm not letting him in. Sounds like a plan to me, he agreed as I left to find my room. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Two hours later, I groaned, throwing myself back onto the bed I had already claimed. Needless to say I was a tad frustrated. According to my watch it had been almost two hours since Aero Senen had ditched me, and there was still no sign of him. I was pretty sure the sun had already set since I no longer felt its warmth from when it was shining in my window, but was he here? No. Not only had my sensei not shown up yet, but his damn balloon sat in front of me, happily still whole. Why can't things be nice and easy for once? I asked out loud, not expecting an answer. Because then it would be boring, and who wants to watch a boring life play out in front of you? Shikamaru. I answered without a pause, earning an amused snort from the fox. I'll give you that one, he said, a smirk in his voice. Yay. Shouldn't you be focusing on that exercise instead of complaining to an empty room? I would, but as you already know, I can't figure it out. It's not that difficult. I have an ability that does something similar, the Kyubi stated simply, making me shoot back into a sitting position while he continued speaking. At least it is, if I'm right about what he's preparing to teach you. You know what jutsu this goes to. Probably, the one I'm thinking of was based on one of mine after all. Yes, I exclaimed happily. I'm not helping you. What? Why? Before I could continue speaking there was a loud knock on the door, interrupting my question. Room service, a muffled voice announced from the other side of the door. I didn't move as my echoes narrowed in on the door. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I hadn't ordered any room service, especially from someone clearly faking a female voice. My hand curling around the balloon, I stayed silent. I focused on my hearing, barely picking up a small grunt of pain from the other side. Not room service, a different voice said. It was clearly male and couldn't have held any less emotion if the person tried. 
Delivery. Ramen delivery compliments from a tall, flamboyant man with spiky white hair. White hair. I asked Kayubi, who had gone oddly quiet. Jiraiya. Oh, I thought, relaxing at the thought of getting ramen for dinner. I had already eaten some of my emergency rations, but that wasn't anything compared to the real thing. The Kayubi growled in annoyance but didn't say anything. Without another thought, I hopped off the bed and padded towards the door. I still felt like something was wrong, but the thought of ramen overruled everything else. My fingers had was almost touched the doorknob when I realized exactly what was making this feel off. There was no ramen smell coming from the door, just fish and birds. In fact, I hadn't smelled a single whiff of ramen since I had left Konoha except for the few instant containers I had made myself. If there was a ramen stand in this small town, I would have smelled it long before now. I stood in front of the door, frozen once again. Whoever was on the other side of it didn't have the best intentions for me. They wanted me to open the door so they could get in. I didn't know why but there was no way I was opening that door to find out, especially without my sensei around. I slowly started walking backwards careful to not make a sound as I put distance between myself and the door. I had only taken a few steps when I heard one of the men on the other side speak. Forget this, he muttered only a moment before disappeared from its hinges. The sound of splintering wood filled the room as the swiftly shifting air warned me move. Now. I dropped to the floor immediately, a large piece of door missing my head by maybe half an inch. Unfortunately I was unable to dodge the smaller pieces as well, several of them making gashes on my face and arms. I bit back a yell as a larger one embedded itself in my shoulder. And that's how it's done, the man said smugly. I glanced up at them, finding two human-shaped figures where the door used to be. One was taller than the other with what seemed to be a large sword on his back. I was trying not to make this messy, the second one said. Judging from the monotone voice he was using, he had been the one talking about ramen delivery. Now we have to rush. So, it's just one little genin. It won't take that long anyways, the taller one said as he stepped into the room. I climbed to my feet, my arm now gripping the wound around the large splinter. The man turned towards me, his grin wide and pointy. Will it, little leaf boy? Who are you? I asked through gritted teeth. That's none of your business, he said as his partner came to stand beside him. I think it is, after all, you burst into my room, breaking my door, and are after me for some reason. I think it's only fair that I know who did it, I said as my mind desperately trying to sum up with some way to get out of this. The pair glanced at each other. He makes a pretty good point, the tall one stated. Do what you want he's coming with us anyways. True, it's not like he'll be able to tell anyone, the larger one grinned again. I'm Kisame and this is my partner Itachi. Nice to meet ya. I could say the same but I don't think almost killing me with a door can ever count as nice. My wounded arm shifted slightly as I spoke, making me realize there was something still in my hand. Something squishy and dot the balloon. I wasn't exactly sure what I could do with it, but I'd figure something out. But first, I needed a distraction. Wait, Itachi, as in Uchiha Itachi. The very same. You don't look like a rock, I stated. In the confused silence that followed, I shifted my hand so that it was now gripping the splinter. What? You know, Itachi, Iwaki, I slid one leg back so I was in a better stance. Oh. Never mind, it was a bad pun to start with. Before either of them could answer, I yanked the piece of wood out of my shoulder and launched it at them, following it closely by the balloon. I didn't expect much, so I wasn't surprised when the splinter was dodged and the balloon popped. I was quite happy that it splashed the front of the Itachi's cloak. In the distraction, I tried to dodge around them and through the door, only to be grabbed by the back of my coat and tossed roughly back into the room. I winced as my back came in contact with the wall. Nice try, brat, really, 
I was sure you were going to charge at us with no though whatsoever. Kisame said as he meandered towards me. I struggled to climb to my feet, keeping my echoes trained on him as I felt familiar light burning sensation of Kyubi chakra fixing my wounds. It would take a few minutes before it was done, but I didn't exactly have that amount of time. He stopped a few feet away from me, his posture as relaxed as ever. But you're still no match for us. End chapter 38. This is the end of part 14 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. I'll see you all in the next what if. Peace out. Thus is part 15 of What If Naruto Lost His Sight. Link in description. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Start chapter 39. Hope you enjoy. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. Itachi, can you do the honors? Before I could react, colors burst out of nowhere. Brown covered the walls and black the furniture, the man named Kisame was blue for some reason, while I barely caught a pair of bright red eyes before his teammate burst into crows. I froze as I gazed around the room, unsure how my eyes could have fixed themselves. A moment later I realized that wasn't the case. Uchiha's were known for their genjutsus, and Itachi, as much as Sasuke hates to admit it, was still an Uchiha. Kai. I shouted as broke the illusion. There was a small sound before everything appeared back as I was, black, with its chakra echo shapes. Nice job Kit, now you're getting it, the Kyubi commented. I let him know this wasn't the time as I went back to glaring at my opponents. You're out of it already, aren't you supposed to be weak against Genjutsu? What gives? HNN, Itachi grunted, a small note of confusion present. Figuring it was either now or never, I created a few clones before arming ourselves with kanais. They didn't even have time to move before we lunged at them as one. I had hoped that the chaos of multiple attackers would give me the advantage against them, but no matter how much we all attacked the two, we didn't get a single hit. It was almost embarrassing how easy they made it look. I had at least two dozen clones, attacking them with everything they had but they dodged and parried as if it was just one academy student playing ninja. A few minutes of this and they seemed only to grow bored while I grew frustrated. In one last ditch attempt, I lunged at Kisame sloppily, accidentally leaving myself wide open. The possibly blue man took full advantage of this as he grabbed my wrist and wrenched it behind my back. We're done playing around, kid, he breathed in my ear before throwing me across the room once again. This time it was into one of the beds, breaking the frame into pieces. If that didn't prove that it was a more powerful throw than before, then the increased pain sure did. All I could do was lay there and try to breath around, what now was definitely, broken ribs. I struggled to my feet again, coughing on the dust flying through the air. I glanced up at them, noting that Kisame was moving towards me once again while Itachi held back. As he moved, he was reaching for the large shape he had attached to his back. He held it to his side lightly, pulling some of the bandages off around the hilt. As soon as the bandages loosened, my echoes disappeared. I blinked in surprise, confusion coloring my thoughts. It wasn't the first time my chakra echoes failed, but usually I felt the jutsu itself fizzle out before my sight went. This time my echoes were still being sent out, but none of them were coming back. I didn't think I was going to have to use Samahata against you, even just this little bit, he said, a grin in his voice. I could still hear his footsteps approaching me, but now accompanied by the scrape of what was probably his sword. Don't kill him, Itachi said flatly as if he were commenting on the weather. I won't, Kisame said, his tone exasperated. Probably. I swallowed hard, nervousness starting to set in. I knew I was outclassed here, especially without my echoes working. I didn't know what to do. Any suggestions? I asked the Kyubi silently. 
No, he answered, getting a groan from me. So you wanna watch me die? Don't be so dramatic, I'm sure Jiraiya heard about it and is on his way now. He'd be too busy ogling women to hear much of anything. You might not think it, but Jiraiya is damn good at his job. If something's going on in this town, he'll know about it, he said with such confidence that I was starting to believe him. Plus, these two weren't exactly subtle. I'm sure half the residents heard what's going on in here. So just buy him some time. Pretty much. That, I can do. My teammate hits harder than you, I wheezed, once my coughing subsided. And we're only Jenin. Kisami's footsteps hesitated. I highly doubt Itachi's brother is that strong, he answered simply, taking the bait. I struggled to hide a smirk as I continued. Oops, sorry, I wasn't specific. My bad, I was talking about my other teammate, I said, my grin making itself known. She's this pink-haired civilian born who's really smart, but isn't all that strong. Yet her punches are ferocious. I don't know how she does it. If you ask her really nice she might give you pointers. Hell, I'll even introduce. Before I could finish my words I was shoved against the wall, a large hand wrapped around my throat. Well that didn't go as planned. Shut up. You talk a lot of shit for a little leaf boy, Kisame growled. It's my charm, I struggled to say with what little air I had. Not charming enough. How about this? I asked as crossed my fingers in my favorite hand sign. I figured that 50 to 100 clones would create enough chaos to get me free. But just as I released the chakra to form them, it was ripped away, leaving me without even a single smoke cloud for my problems. How's what? Did you do something? I can't tell. His mocking tone made me sure he knew exactly what was going on. If it was those clones again, you're going to be in for a real disappointment. My eyes widened in surprise, more from habit than anything, the reality of the situation starting to hit home. You see this sword, he said, accompanied by a scrapping sound to my left. I assumed he was raising his sword for me to see. I probably would have found it amusing, if I could breathe. It eats chakra, any of it nearby is fair game. I began struggling against his grip more, my dangling legs kicking out at him, my arms clawing at his hand, but to no avail. My limbs were too short, and nails too dull to even make him flinch. All he did was laugh at my attempts. I said don't kill him, Itachi reminded. I wasn't going to, Kisame said, his voice fading a bit. I couldn't tell if it was because he turned his head or that I was about to pass out. I'm just having a little fun. Your fun ends in their death. If you kill him leader Sama will be upset. Kit, channel my chakra while he's distracted. But his sword. I doubt it can eat the chakra before it leaves the body, at least without physical contact. So do it quick, because you're going to pass out in about 10 seconds. This better work, I said as I drew on the chakra he offered. Towards your fingers. Claws. Of course. I did as he instructed, feeling the tingling as my nails elongated from the small bit of chakra. It wasn't the same as the full chakra claws, but they were definitely sharp enough to do some damage. Without a second thought, I plunged them into his hand, making him drop me with a hiss. Damn it, he exclaimed, as I almost choked on the rush of air that entered my lungs. Without waiting until I recovered, I quickly scrambled to my feet and off to the opposite side of the room. But before I got very far, I heard a whoosh of air only moments before something hard connected with my right leg. A crunching sound came from where it hit, giving me only enough time to think, well that's not good, before it exploded in pain. With a cry I tumbled the short ways to the ground, my hand automatically seeking out my wounded leg. My fingers ghosted over the spot right above the knee, even barely touching it I was still able to grimly note the large indent that hadn't been there before. One down, one leg to go, Kisame said happily. His footsteps started up again, slow and steady, as if he were dragging out this moment for as long as possible. With a start, 
I realized that this guy actually liked this, making others cower and fear him. Itachi may have been there simply for the mission, but Kisame wasn't. The mission was an excuse for him, it was fight he was here for, particularly the end when he was in complete control of his opponent's fate, and they knew it. I turned around to face him, knowing now why my stalling tactics didn't work. He wanted to see fear and pain, and my words were putting up a controlled mask, the exact opposite. It was a challenge to him, not a distraction. Great deduction, could have thought of it a minute earlier, before he shattered your leg. Can you fix it? I asked, scooching myself backwards, trying to put more distance between Kisame and me as possible. Not before he has the chance to break the other one. I let out a small whine, half in response to the Kayubi's words and half from accidentally jostling my leg during my slow escape. I heard Kisame chuckle in delight. So you're finally realizing your predicament, hem. You have every right to be afraid, he said proudly. Afraid? Nah, I just realized we aren't getting our deposit back on this room, I said, summoning up all the false bravado I could muster. It wasn't much but it was better than sounding terrified. I had plans for that money. That's the least you have to worry about, he said. Plus, even if this room was completely intact, it's not like you'd see the money. After all, you're coming with us. Before I could come up with a good retort, or even a bad one, there was a loud explosion on my left. I ducked down, swiftly covering my head as I felt debris pelt me from that same direction. I heard someone's picking on my student, a very recognizable voice said from where the explosion took place. That's not the smartest thing in the world, but hey, it's better than trying to kidnap him. There was an awkward silence between them as they no doubt stared at each other. I could almost hear the clash of wills from my spot on the floor. You were trying to kidnap him, weren't you? Jiraiya asked. What gave you the impression that we weren't? In fact, we still are since there's nothing you can do to stop. Kisame, we're leaving, Itachi stated before the soft footsteps started moving away. What? But we almost have the kid. Why are we stopping now? We've drawn too much attention here already. Fighting a Sanin will only make it worse. We're leaving. The footsteps continued to fade as Itachi left the room. After a stunned second or two, Kisame growled in annoyance and began stomping away as well. Soon after, my echo stuttered to live to see Kisame holster his weapon and leave the room. I glanced over at Jiraiya, noting that he still had his guard up and that he was standing in front of a large hole in the wall that lead to the outside. Sensei, I asked, only to get shushed by the adult. I grumbled lightly but made no other sound until he did, figuring he had a good reason for it. Can you still hear them? He asked after about a minute. I focused on my ears for a brief moment. No, I answered, I think they shunshined. Jiraiya nodded before taking the few steps necessary to get to me. He knelt down and seemed to examine my wounds. You look pretty messed up kid, he said as he observed my leg. You don't say, I answered, giving him a flat look. We don't have time for your sass, Jiraiya stated. Ask the Kayubi how long it's going to take to heal. Your shoulder's all but done already. Your ribs are just a few fractures so they'll be done by tomorrow morning. It's your leg that's going to take the most time. How long? Two days. Two days. Why two days? Your lower femur is all but shattered. I have to put all the pieces back together before I can even start to heal it. If I don't you wouldn't be walking. But two days. That's just how long you won't be able to use it. It's going to take the rest of the week for it to be completely healed. I groaned out loud, making my sensei cock his head curiously. Well, two days before I can use it and a week before it's completely healed. Sounds great. Hurts like a bitch. Well, it's probably going to hurt even more. Jiraiya climbed to his feet again and started shuffling through the rubble, obviously looking for something. We have to go. Um. I can't walk, 
I reminded him as he reached down and pulled one of our bags free. He continued looking around, presumably for the other. And it's dark. I know, but the landlords are going to be up here now that it's quieted down and there's no way I'm footing the bill for this mess. So I have to walk on a shattered leg just because you don't want to pay for repairs. Also because I don't feel like it's particularly safe here anymore. Not after 2s rank missing nins tried to snatch my student right from under my nose. Ah, here it is. He pulled the second bag out and immediately started searching though it as he made his way back towards me. Under your nose, you weren't even here. You went off with some flirty chick. I don't have time to explain to you the subtleties of information gathering. Just know that I had everything under control. If you did, I wouldn't be sitting here with a broken leg. All right, maybe not everything, he admitted. He pulled a small container out of his bag before popping it open and removing something small and round from it. Once he was back near me, he grabbed my hand and dropped it into my palm. Take this, it should help. What is it? I asked, glancing at the object wearily. Pain pill, you're going to need it. Despite his words I didn't move to take it. I didn't particularly like medicine, especially since it never seemed to work right on me. Every time I took something, it either worked too well, or not at all. Now that I thought of it, the Kyubi may have been toying with me but that didn't make me any more eager to take it. Do I really? I'm going to have to carry you, and trust me, there's no good way of carrying someone with a broken leg, especially with it so close to your knee, he explained. If your leg hurts like a bitch, now, imagine what it will be like as it's getting jostled and bent for most of the night. Pass me the water, I said after a moment of thought. End chapter 39. Start chapter 40. Blindsided by twice the trouble. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. 30 minutes later. How are you doing back there? Jiraiya asked, glancing at the student perched on his back. He watched said boy wince slightly as they landed on another tree branch. He felt bad for him but it was better than the cursing he got when they started. He figured the pain meds must be seriously kicking in now that they had time to work. Are we there yet? Naruto asked, his voice slurring. Jiraiya could just see his student's eyes drift shut behind the goggles before he turned forward again. We just left a half hour ago. I want to be at least three hours out before we even think of stopping for the night. That's a long time. Yes, yes it is. So are we there yet? No, not yet, Jiraiya said with a small sigh. He didn't think that the pain pill was supposed to be very brain-altering but the kid was acting like he was given the strong stuff. Then again, he vaguely remembered Naruto mentioning that he tended to have strange reactions to drugs. Maybe one of those reactions was that acetaminophen acts like morphine. Damn, Jiraiya cursed under his breath. Where? Naruto asked his head popping of his sensei's shoulder briefly to glance around. What? The dam. Where is it? This is going to be a long night, Jiraiya muttered to himself. Why? Because you can't find the dam? Naruto asked, making Jiraiya sigh again. Yes, especially since there is no dam. Why isn't there a dam? We're in the middle of the forest, Naruto. A dam would be near a lake, or most likely cause a lake. Do you see a lake, or even a river around here? There was a pause as Jiraiya felt Naruto's head move back and forth in order to get a look around. No, he answered, his voice questioning. That means there's no dam. Naruto was silent for a long moment, making Jiraiya hopeful that this whole conversation was over. Unfortunately for him, he was wrong. There could be a dam. No there can't be. Yes there can. No, there really can't. Sensei, Naruto said, sounding like a toddler mimicking their parents. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. It's dark and I'm blind. I can't see anything. 
Jiraiya glanced back at him, startled by the announcement. He figured he would have to pry a confession like that from him forcefully, but here he was just announcing it to the world simply because of pain meds. I think you should sleep now, he told him as he took a mental note to limit the use of pain meds in the future. The boy had his chin resting on Jiraiya's shoulder as if he was about to pass out any second. But he was a stubborn brat so he really wasn't surprised when he got an angry pout in response. I'm not joking sensei, I really can't see. A sneaky rat took my eyes when I was sleeping and now I can't even see your nose. But I'm pretty sure it's like really big. Naruto. Like really, really big. Naruto. I. Like so big that you could knock out people with it if you wanted to. I'm sure was all he said instead. Now go to sleep. But I want to see the dam. You just said yourself you can't see it. Oh, Naruto said quietly, sounding a put off by this revelation. Jiraiya groaned in exasperation. How about this? You go to sleep and if I find a dam, I'll wake you so you can experience it for yourself. How does that sound? Good, I guess, he murmured, his head already lulling to one side. Good, now go to sleep. But I'm not sleepy, he stated through an outrageous yawn. Go to sleep anyways. Jiraiya heard the boy mumble something about not sleeping but his voice tapered off before he could finish whatever he was saying. Jiraiya felt his head thump against his neck as the boy finally passed out. Stopping on a branch, Jiraiya looked back at his student, seeing a peaceful look on his face despite everything he was going through at the moment. He really hated seeing Minato's son like this, being forced to pretend everything was alright when he couldn't even see the color of his own jumpsuit. Yes, he's done surprisingly well, but it didn't mean he wasn't still hurting. He doubted the boy had even fully dealt with his disability in any emotional capacity. He'd been too busy making sure no one found out that he hadn't had the time to fully accept his new state. It was for that reason that Jiraiya hoped that Tsunade could fix Naruto. Then he would never have to go through such a thing. He would just become a great ninja who became even greater because of what he learned when he was blind. Jiraiya sighed, hoping he wasn't making it a habit. Regardless, I hope you don't remember that conversation, kid, he told Naruto gently as he started moving again. Because if you do, you're really going to be kicking yourself in the butt tomorrow. And I'll have a lot of explaining to do. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Next morning. When I woke up next my brain felt like it was full of fog. I could hardly remember what happened the day before let alone why I was asleep in the first place. I groaned, sitting up slowly, my ribs twinging briefly in protest. They were a little achy but not that bad I guess. I was having a hard time remembering why they were hurt in the first place, mostly because my head just didn't want to work. I rubbed my temples in an attempt to get some brain function back. But other than a vague memory of being thrown through a bed frame, it did nothing. I shook my head as my hands dropped to the ground. I figured then it was probably a good get up and find my sensei, so I did. Or at least, I tried to. As soon as my right leg went to move, pain shot up it, making me hiss. I ran a hand along my injury as the memories of yesterday came back to me. I winced, and not just from the broken bone. What the hell gave me the idea that I could outwit not one, but two S-ranked ninjas? Especially ones that seemed to already know about me along with my strengths and weaknesses. Overall, that wasn't one of my best days. Kit, you have no idea. The Kyubi rumbled, amusement in his voice. Well, if you had been more helpful, I probably would have been fine. I told you before, I'm not fighting your battles for you. The only reason I helped so much with Gara was because I'm somewhat responsible for my brother. As far as everything else, you're going to have to figure it out on your own. I was almost kidnapped by S-rank ninjas. How was I supposed to figure that out? You got away, didn't you? Obviously you must have figured something out. 
even if it did end with an injury. Yet you're raising me for it. No, I'm raising you for something completely different that you don't remember. Yet, I'm sure you will soon and then the real fun will begin. The Kyubi's voice held an audible grin that had me frowning. That fox was up to something and I couldn't help but think that it can't be good. Oh, you're awake, good. I was worried you were going to sleep through the entire day as well, Jiraiya's voice said somewhere to my left. I heard the shifting of leaves, followed by a soft thump of him sitting down. I frowned, a bit bothered that I didn't notice him approach. I filed that away under, things I needed to work on, and went on. When did we stop? I asked curiously as I examined the wounded leg with my fingers. There was a makeshift splint on it now which consisted of two large sticks and a lot of gauze. It went down past the knee probably so I couldn't hurt myself by accidentally moving it. About midnight, he answered, a scraping sound coming from his spot now. After a long moment of not being able to figure out what it was, I activated my chakra echoes to give me a little help. For some reason he was sharpening a stick with a kanai. I couldn't figure out for the life of me why, but it apparently had his full attention. Now it's almost eleven in the morning. I slept that long, I asked in bewilderment. You were asleep for two and a half hours before that but yeah. Apparently pain meds knock you out pretty quick, among other things, he stated, murmuring the last words of his statement. What? I frowned at him, almost missing it entirely. His kanai paused for a moment before starting up again as the Kayubi chuckled to himself. Nothing, he said simply. On a completely unrelated note, what do you remember about yesterday evening? Before or after the hotel incident? After. Not much. You said I was sleeping so I shouldn't remember anything anyways, I answered, kind of confused. Why did you ask? You were a little loopy after the drugs kicked in and before you passed out. I was just curious what you remembered of that conversation. We had a conversation. Guess that answers my question. He examined the stick for a moment before tossing it to the side and dusting himself off as he climbed to his feet. I'll start getting lunch ready. Then we can keep moving if you think you're up for it. If not, we can wait until tomorrow. One day won't make much of a difference. I watched him busy himself by searching through his bag trying to find the scroll that had our rations. He was muttering about how he should have labeled them when a question popped into my head, making an icy fear creep through me. If I was as loopy as he said, did I say anything I didn't want him to know? Could I have told him I'm blind? Um, sensei, I asked, getting a small hum in response. What was that conversation about last night? Nothing of note, Jiraiya said after a moment. Mostly just dams. Dams. Yup. Apparently you wanted to see one, he said before pulling a scroll out of his bag successfully. There it is. Anyways, I tried to tell you there wasn't one around but you didn't believe me. Jiraiya summoned the items from the scroll and started making our sandwiches. I no longer focused on him though, instead trying to remember exactly what happened last night. I needed to make sure I didn't let anything slip while my brain was addled by the drugs. It took me a few minutes, but when I was finally able to drag up something from the night before, I was disappointed with what I found. It's dark and I'm blind. Those words echoed through my head as I sat there, frozen in place. How was I supposed to fix this? I told him. He knew. He wasn't supposed to know. My brain worked as quickly as possible, trying to find a solution, but nothing was turning up. See, now that's what I was raising you for. Didn't think lowering your resistance to the drug would make you so loose-lipped. Shut up, and why the hell did you do that? Alone, the stuff he gave you would have barely took the edge off if you just sat there. So I decided to help a little bit. Mostly so I didn't need to hear your yelling and cursing all night long. So this is all your fault. You're not blaming your inability to keep your mouth shut on me. That's all you, Kit. Hey Brad, Jiraiya called before I could come up with a snappy comeback. 
He was waving what I assumed was a sandwich in front of my face. Do you want it nor not? I took it without a word, taking a bite but not actually tasting anything. Are you all right over there? Jiraiya asked after a moment. I turned back towards him to find he was observing me, holding his own sandwich close to his mouth as if he had stopped mid-bite. Yeah, I muttered, I just, um, well, about last night's conversation, I was at a loss for words, unsure of what I should say in order to convince him to not believe me. Jiraiya sighed, setting his sandwich down on his leg in order to give me his full attention. I'm guessing you remember now, hmm. I just wanted to say that I was really loopy and anything said back then shouldn't be taken at face value at all. It was probably something my stupid, drugged mind came up with because it couldn't function properly. I mean, it's really nothing to get worked up about. At all, I said, the floodgates breaking loose once I found more than one word to string together. I would have kept going if Jiraiya didn't hold up a hand to stop me. Naruto, I already know. Oh, I said after a moment, feeling a little relieved that I didn't actually tell him something he didn't know. It was a few seconds later that I actually comprehended his statement. What, what do you mean, you know? End chapter 40. Start chapter 41. Blindsided by twice the trouble. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. What? What do you mean? You know. Exactly what I said. I already know. I didn't think it was that hard to comprehend. Jiraiya said as he picked up his sandwich once again. For a good few seconds, I could do nothing but gawk at him. How do you know? I told you he's good at his job. The Kyubi picked up before Jiraiya could answer. I sent him a mental glare that only make him chuckle. It was obvious, kid. Though apparently not as obvious as it should have been, he said, almost to himself. I sent him a glare as well, just for good measure. You did pretty good, kept me in the dark, so to speak, for about a week. Do you remember getting your book back from that pretty ramen stand waitress? Ayame, yeah, that was almost a month ago. What of it? You were, reading, the book upside down. He took a bite of his sandwich as I gawked at him for a few seconds. Seriously, I exclaimed, making the man chuckle around his food. That's how you knew, Kakashi even had a better answer than that. I didn't choose how I found out, Gaki. Between that and the fact that you didn't recognize the main character's name, I was pretty certain I was right, he said after swallowing the food in his mouth. Though I did wave a hand in front of your face just to make sure. No you didn't, I would have noticed. You thought it was wind. I guess you went to Kaka-sensei after that, I said around a pout. That's why he let me go with you, isn't it? Because you already knew. Sounds about right. Our conversation lapsed into silence for a while as we ate. It was a lot for me to process finding out that he knew most of the time I've been training with him. I wasn't sure exactly how I felt about it. On one hand, it really was a relief that I didn't need to hide it from him anymore. On the other, I was sort of angry that he'd known for almost a month yet hadn't said anything to me about it. I was so lost in thought that I had only taken a few bites in the time it took Jiraiya to finish his entire sandwich and start another one. I had a lot of questions and figured it was better to ask him now than wait. Hey Aero Sanin, I called right before he took a bite of his new sandwich. He sighed. What now? Why was I supposed to have recognized the character's name? I asked, deciding to start with one of the easiest questions I had. Simple, you were named after him. I blinked in surprise, not expecting this as an answer. When I didn't say anything. I noticed Jiraiya's head turned towards me a bit before he set his sandwich aside completely. My main character's name is Naruto, spelled with the same kanji as your name. Your father read my book and decided he liked the character so much he was going to name his son after him, he said, sounding as if he were lost in a pleasant memory. Your mother agreed, but only because it was a ramen topping. You. Knew my parents. 
Jiraiya seemed to pause for a moment, like he was figuring out how he should say something. Yes, very well in fact. He spoke slowly as he fiddled with what was probably a crumb left on his pants. Who were they? What were they like? I asked, leaning forward in anticipation for the answer. I barely noticed that my sandwich had somehow made its way into the dirt next to me, but I hardly cared anyways. Jiraiya paused again, his silence stretching longer than it should have. Please tell me, everyone else likes to pretend I don't have parents at all. It helps them feel better about themselves if they only see me as the Kyubi kid and not someone else's. I used to ask Gigi but he always told me I wasn't ready and changed the subject. He was right, and honestly, you're still not ready. Why the hell not? I demanded, desperation turning to anger. I'm a ninja, I'm already risking my life on missions every day. If that's not the definition of ready that what is? Your parents were very powerful ninjas, he said calmly, despite my outburst. As powerful as they were, they ended up making a number of powerful enemies. If any of those people heard even a rumor that they had a child, all that pent up rage they couldn't take out on them, they'd take out on you. I can handle it. No, you can't. I glared at him for a long moment before turning away. My eyes dropped to the ground as they began filling with tears. I moved my goggles and swiped at the tears angrily. This was not how this conversation was supposed to have gone. That question was supposed to be the easiest to answer, not lead into a whole bunch more that he can't. You take a lot after your mother, Jiraiya said quietly. My head snapped towards him on its own accord. She was hyper and often swayed by her emotions. More than once your father stepped in to break up fights that started when one of their classmates insulted her hair. There were three things in life she loved more than everything else, Raman, your father, and you. She died the day you were born. They both did, but I doubt either of them could have cared for you more if they wanted to. I have her surname, right? I asked, my voice cracking a bit. I could feel tears running down my face but I didn't bother to wipe them away this time. They thought it best. Your father's name was more well known. If you had his surname, anyone with half a working brain cell could figure out their identities. She. He was the Jinchuriki before me, wasn't she? How do you figure that? Jiraiya asked after a pause. Fu sensei said he only knew one person in Konoha that ever spoke as lightly of foxes as I do, and that she had the same surname as me. I can only think of one reason why she would, because she knew the fox better than everyone else. I'm going to have a talk with that sensei of hers. A nice, long talk. Possibly as he hangs upside down over the edge of the Hokage monument. He'd deserve it, I said with a small chuckle. He's an ass. We were quiet for some time as I sat there processing what I had heard. It made sense in a way, as much as the whole thing annoyed me. If my parents were as powerful as Aero Senen said then they had to have made some equally powerful enemies. It's not unheard of for hatred for a single person to spread to that person's family as well. It's a horrible truth about the world but it didn't make it false. After a while I reached into my weapons pouch and pulled out the book I had been carrying for the past month, holding it gingerly. It was more than just a book that my sensei gave me now, it was a small, almost insignificant tie to parents I'll never meet. In the span of a few minutes, this book became precious to me, yet I couldn't even read it. Do you want me to read it? Jiraiya asked. I turned away from the book to find him sealing the rest of our lunch back into its seal. I could read it out loud for you. It's a pretty short book so I'm sure we could have it done by nightfall. You would, I asked, surprised for what felt like the millionth time that day. Yeah, we could use a little break from traveling. And by we, I mean you. Your leg's still broken after all. He stuffed the scroll back into his bag before holding a hand out for the book. I shrugged. Sure, I said, handing it over easily. Who better to read it out loud than the author? Exactly what I was thinking, he flipped to the front of the book. He paused for a moment, 
making the sound equivalent to a grimace as he did. Keep in mind that this was my first published novel, so the quality sucks. Don't judge it too badly since it's such an old story. My new stuff is a lot. Just read already. Fine. Pushy brat. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Two days later. Hey sensei. I called, getting him to glance back at me as I did. I was finally able to walk on my own this morning and was taking full advantage of it by practicing the trick with a different water balloon as we traveled. Apparently he had a lot more of those stashed into his bag than I thought physically possible. Are you going to read the book again tonight? What? No. You've already had me read it three times. I'm not reading it again. He called back, crossing his arms across his chest as he spoke. I picked up my speed a bit so I could walk next to him, my limp more apparent at the faster pace. Even though my leg was usable, it still hurt a good deal therefore I still wasn't walking quite right. It was only twice, I told him simply. 3. You had me read it twice the first day but fell asleep halfway through the second, he grumbled. I thought back for a moment. Oh yeah, but that's more like two and a half then. I'm not reading it again. Come on, it's an awesome book, I pleaded. Like the part where he jumps those bad guys. Or when they try to trap him in the tree and he fights them. Or where he gives him that whole speech about hatred breading more hatred. I'm glad you like it, he said flatly. He sounded a lot more thrilled the first five times I told him this. So, answer still no, was my answer. I groaned throwing my hands in the air in defeat. If you want me to keep reading then I have other books. I'm not listening to your damn porn books, Aero Senin, I told him. But they're good literature. And I'm 12. Got to start your education early. Not that early. Jiraiya huffed, muttering something about me, not knowing quality literature if it bit me in the ass. I thought about commenting on it. Manly to remind him that muttering wasn't a good way to stay unheard around me, but decided not to. I knew that it would most likely just get us into another argument that would lead to me definitely not getting my reading tonight. Over the last few days I found that I really liked being read to, and not just because the book was good. There was something calming and nice that came with someone reading words on a page I couldn't see. Maybe this was why parents read to their children at night so they could feel safe as they went to sleep. I couldn't help but feel a little put out that I was forced to miss out on that when I was younger. It would have been great to have someone read me to sleep at night. I shook those thoughts from my head, knowing that stressing over what I missed wouldn't get me anywhere. Especially when it came to this balloon exercise, or even our travels. I raised my nose into the air to try to get a sense of where we were. I could smell the forest and the dirt path just like I have for the last few days. But now there was a hint of water as well farm animals and people that wafted through the air. Every step forward was making these scents just a little bit stronger. Are we near a town? I asked out loud as I lowered my head to a normal position. Yeah, maybe an hour out, he answered, not bothering to ask how I knew. I can smell the animals the farmers lead to market earlier, I told him anyways. And some sort of lake or pond or something. Good for you, he said quietly. There was a quiet pause before he spoke again. Funny, I didn't think there was any sort of water formation nearby. Guess I was wrong. Of course you are. No one can trick my nose, I exclaimed triumphantly. I'm pretty sure the Yamanaka flower shop begs to differ. Low blow, sensei, I muttered, shooting a small glare his way. Focus on your balloon or I won't be able to teach you the next step. Jiraiya motioned towards the balloon in my hand. But I thought you weren't going to teach me that yet. I thought I wasn't ready or something stupid like that. I did, but with the possibility of more S-ranked kidnappers showing up, I thought you could use a new jutsu. Especially since you have a grand total of two. He pointed out, ignoring my pout. So, this is how it's going to work. If you complete this step, 
I'll consider you ready for the next one and show you that. Then again when you complete the second one, I'll show you the third. If you're able to complete all three stages of this jutsu then it's yours. Really? Would I lie to you? My own student. His voice sounded overly dramatic, as if he were acting badly on stage. I wouldn't put it past you. Brat. Pervert. That's it. I'm taking it back. If you can't acknowledge me as the super pervert I am then no jutsu for you, he said. You can't do that, I exclaimed, pointing at him with my free hand. You already said you would. Well I changed my mind. Nope. No way. Not believing it, I said, taking a few steps in front of my sensei as I began focusing on the balloon. I'm going to figure out this stage and then make you teach me the next one. Yeah, good luck with that, Jiraiya said, a smirk in his voice. I turned around to face him, intent on giving him a piece of my mind when the smell of water increased suddenly, making me freeze. I had just enough time to curse myself out for not recognizing it earlier before I was side-tackled into the bushes, my balloon soaking the assailant. Hi Naru-chan, did you miss me? End chapter 41. This is the end of part 15. If you enjoyed this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Hope to see you all in the next what if. Peace out. This is part 16 of what if Naruto lost his sight. Link in description. This is the last part of this what if but we will have another what if tomorrow. If you enjoy this what if then like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Start chapter 42. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. Hi Naru Chan. Did you miss me? Fu. What are you doing here? I asked as the girl's now soaked hair dripped onto my face. She didn't seem to notice. Can't a girl visit her good friend from time to time? Her voice held a pout that was no doubt mirrored on her face. I'm on a mission. Funny so am I, or, I'm supposed to be. Question, if your teammates ditch you are you still on a mission? Because either they ditched me or were in the middle of a very intense game of hide and seek. Seriously. Are you sure you didn't just loose them on your own? I asked suspiciously. Of course I didn't, silly, she said, bopping me on the nose with a finger. You see, one of my teammates made Chunin so I was doing a delivery mission with him and two other genin. We stopped in the town for the night, the one you're headed to, and we're going to continue in the morning. Unfortunately, when I woke up, the other three were gone. Have you even looked for them? Well duh, that's how hide and seek works. What do you think I've been doing for the last three days? They must be really good hiders if they can keep from being found for three days. Please say you don't honestly think they're still playing hide and seek. I asked desperately, not sure if she was being honest or not. Come on, Naruto, she exclaimed, no doubt rolling her eyes at me. Can't you have a little fun once in a while? I do, just most of it doesn't, involve you. We should change that, she said, her voice grinning. We really shouldn't. Anyways, yes, I've looked for them everywhere. Over here, throughout the town, I even asked the bandits that hang out on the other side of town. Nothing, she threw her hands up in the air for emphasis. I would have checked the bandit camp too, but it's was a week away and they've only been gone three days. They're nowhere to be seen, and neither is their stuff so I'm guessing they ditched me. Lovely, I stated flatly. I know, right. Are you two done making out? Jiraiya called from the road, sounding too amused for his own good. Because I'd really like to be in town before nightfall. We're not making out, I shouted back. Not yet anyways, Fu added. I sent her a glare but only got a giggle in response. Get off but you're so comfy, she whined as she crossed her arms across my chest. Though I am getting a weird sense of deja vu. I don't see why, you've only done this to me over two dozen times. Now get off. Fiend, she said, climbing to her feet slowly. 
I followed suit, wincing slightly as my sore leg twinged. It really didn't like the sudden assault via Fu. I rubbed it for a moment, almost feeling Fu's eyes on me as I did. You're hurt. I'm fine, I replied, letting go of my leg and starting back onto the road. Her footsteps followed close behind me. You're limping. Why are you limping? Maybe because you just shoved me into the damn bushes. Or maybe it was the broken leg you suffered a few days ago, Jiraiya pipped up as I gawked at him. He shrugged. What? It could be a factor, couldn't it? You broke your leg. Technically an S-rank bastard with a sword broke it but that's beside the point. That's not fine, Naruto. That's the opposite of fine. You probably shouldn't even be on a mission right now. Accelerated healing, remember? Yeah, and if you're still limping despite that, then it was bad. Nothing I couldn't handle, I told her before turning towards my sensei. Can we go now? But Naru-chan. She whined. Jiraiya nodded and we continued walking. I used one of my alternate focus points to look back at Fu. Her head was dropped and she wasn't following us. When after a few yards, she still hadn't moved, I sighed. Are you coming or what? I called back, making her head pop up. She grinned wide enough me to pick up before darting forward and latching onto my arm happily. I hit a wince as it, once again, added stress to the wrong leg for a moment. I can really go with you guys, she asked happily. You are going to follow us anyways, might as well just stay in the group. Thanks, she exclaimed, hugging my arm closer. I already have a room at the inn, if you want to use that. It's a two-room one so it's big enough. It was for our whole team but I've just continued to pay for it so I wouldn't have to camp outside without any camping supplies. That sounds great, Jiraiya said. Thank you. We walked in silence for a little while, or as close to silence as you can get with Fu's content humming and Jiraiya's perverted note-taking. I was a little worried on what he was writing down on that pad of his, since he wasn't doing so before Fu arrived. I hoped that later on I wouldn't find that particular moment played out in one of his erotic novels, but, with a sensei like mine, it probably would. Speaking of his stories, I glanced over at Fu, getting a brilliant idea as I did. So Fu, I said, getting her attention. From the sudden lack of muttering next to us, my tone got Jiraiya's as well. Have you ever read the book, Tale of the Gutsy Ninja? No. Well, you're in for a treat because Jiraiya's been reading it to me at night. I already told you, I'm not reading it again. Jiraiya exclaimed. I grinned in response. But Sensei, Fu hasn't read it. We need to fix it. Then lend her the damn book. But it's so much more enjoyable when it's read aloud, Fu pleaded, obviously picking up on what I was doing and deciding to help. And it takes me such a long time to read books. I just can't sit still long enough to finish them. Yeah, Sensei, take pity on her and read it for us please. I sent him my best puppy dog eyes that Fu no doubt mirrored. You two are a force to be reckoned with when you actually get along, he muttered, turning his attention back to his notes. Fine, but this is the last time. Yes, I said, high-fiving Fu at our victory. I have no idea why you did that but I'm excited anyway. She said, laughing lightly. You'll see, that book's awesome. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. Two hours later. Hey Naruto, Fu called to get my attention. We had made it to the hotel room a little while ago and had just settled in. As soon as we arrived, Jiraiya had shut himself in the second room saying he needed quiet so he could write, which left me and Fu in this room until he was done. The plan was that Fu gets the spare one once we retire for the night, but until then she was stuck kicking her feet out from under her chair while I focused on figuring out my exercise from the bed. It probably would have been the other way around but Fu insisted I put my injured leg up to give it a rest. What Fu? I asked, not taking my attention away from the balloon. Does he know? If you're talking about Jiraiya, then you're going to have to be more specific. 
He knows a lot of things, and probably doesn't know a lot more. About your, um, eyes. Does he know? Yeah, he figured it out a while ago, I answered after a moment. He's known about three weeks longer than you have. Then why didn't you say he knew when you explained things to me and Gara? Because I didn't know that he knew. But did he know that you didn't know that he knew? She asked, making me sigh and put down my balloon. Foo, you're making this a lot harder than it has to be, I told her, getting a small apology before I continued. He knows I'm blind. Why he didn't confront me about it earlier, I don't know. But that doesn't really matter I guess. I mean, even without both of us on the same page we still got what I needed to get accomplished. In fact, part of this mission's objective is to convince this medic nin to fix my eyes so it's all working out. That's good, she said, her chair shifting slightly. Do you think they will be able to do it? To fix them, I mean. She's the best so if she can't I'm pretty much screwed, I answered. My face was aimed down for a moment before I turned back towards her with a nonchalant shrug. It wouldn't be the end of the world. I'm able to function without my eyes fine by now. I just thought it would be nice to see color again. Fu was silent for a long time as I fidgeted with my sleeve. After a while the chair creaked as she got up, seemed to hop a few feet between her and the bed before shaking the entire mattress as she jumped onto it. Before I could ask her what the hell she was doing, she leaned in close and planted a kiss on my cheek, making me blush. I hope you get to see color again too, she whispered in my ear. I sputtered briefly as my otherwise silent tenant groaned in disgust. Unable to come up with a reply I turned my focus back onto the balloon, raising it up once again so I could figure out this puzzle. So, what ya doin'? Fu asked peering over my shoulder as she laid her head on it. Trying to pop this balloon, I answered, not moving my attention from the balloon in my hand. The water swirled in it sloppily, but it only stretched the balloon. You know you can do that with a kanai, right? But the whole point of the exercise is to do it by swirling the water using chakra, I answered releasing the chakra so the balloon resumed its normal shape. Plus, I tried that. Jiraiya scolded me. Oh, then why hasn't it popped yet? There's some sort of trick that Aero Senen wants me to figure out for myself. It's frustrating. I have a hard time with the water in general, but even when I do get it moving, it just stretches the damn balloon. Wow, can I try? She asked. I sighed, tossing it to her. Knock yourself out. I assumed she caught the balloon, since I didn't hear it splat on the floor. She quickly came around to my front, carefully hopping over my outstretched leg to find a comfy spot on the bed. She held the balloon in her hand, swirling the water inside with ease. You're having trouble with this. It's easy, she said tauntingly. You have a shit tone of water-based jutsus. Of course it's going to be easy for you. Ah, poor Naru chan's jealous, she exclaimed. He has a hard time swirling it one way. I bet I can do more. Foo, this isn't a competition, I told her flatly, but she did it anyways. Now the balloon was stretching out horizontally and vertically. Wow, look how easy this is. I'm already doing twice as much swirling as you, she said, with an audible smirk. I rolled my eyes, think I can do three. Your chakra control's hardly good enough for those two. Don't think just because I'm blind I can't notice you struggling. You're right, I can totally do three. She started a third stream, or at least tried. I could tell from the way the balloon bent that it would start up and pitter out before it could truly get going. I watched her struggle with it for a minute or two before it finally got going for real. See, I told you I could. Before she could finish her sentence the balloon exploded, soaking both of us in the process. For about 30 seconds we sat there, staring at her empty palm as we tried to figure out what just happened. Where'd it go? Multiple streams, I murmured, the solution dawning on me finally. What? The answer, it's multiple streams. Each with their own direction. That's why the balloon popped. 
It can't stretch several directions at once. Foo, you're a genius. I yelled happily. I am. I need another balloon. I jumped off the bed, falling flat on my face when I didn't wait until my feet were under me to do so. I popped up off the floor, darting to the room Jiraiya was currently occupying. I threw open the door, getting a startled squawk from my sensei in response. What the hell are you? I need another balloon. Did you drop the other one already? Another balloon. Fine, he snapped, pulling out a storage scroll and popping a balloon out of it. Take it. He tossed it at me, almost making me miss it when it disappeared from my view for a moment. When I finally had it in hand, I focused on it intently, making one stream flow around the balloon. Once that stream was fully established, I started another one. It was a lot harder trying to keep that one going as well, compared to just the one. As much as I wanted to try to pop it, I knew I wasn't going to be able to get that third stream going until my control was getter. I see you've finally figured out the secret, Jiraiya said, a hint of pride in his voice. I smiled back happily. Multiple streams. Good job. Now you just have to do it. I'll have it done before you know it. I exclaimed, losing control of the streams as I did. And then you'll have to teach me the second phase of it. Looking forward to it, he happily. Now get out or I'll use you as a field test for my new novel. I stood there for a moment, wondering if this new novel was anything like Tale of the Gutsy Ninja but not sure if I should ask. Jiraiya sighed, before picking up his paper and clearing his throat. Wow, Minoru. It's so big. My said as she stared at his. I'm out. I ran out of that room faster than I had run into it, slamming the door shut as I went. I could hear that pervert chuckling on the other side as he no doubt went back to work. So, what's going on again? Because I literally have no idea, Fu said as I shuffled back towards my original spot. And why's your face red? Because my sensei's a pervert, that's why. I think he's overdue for a prank as well. Prank. Fu perked up considerably, sounding way too happy about the prospect. Why does he need a prank? What are you going to do to him? Whatever it is, can I help? Yeah, sure, why not? The bastard deserves it anyways. End chapter 42. End chapter 43. Blindsided by twice the trouble. T1. Tilda 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 tilda. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. The next morning. It was way too early when my eyes popped open to an unearthly scream. I jolted upright rushing to turn on my echoes, afraid of what might have happened. Were more of those kidnappers back? Were they after Fu this time? When I finally got an image back from the echoes I relaxed, finding it was only Jiraiya standing over a pile of papers. What the hell, I muttered, flopping back onto my bed just as Fu came stumbling out of her room. She had her fists raised and was looking around the room for danger. She quickly came to the same conclusion as I did, dropping her fists to her side. My manuscript, Jiraiya wailed, holding the papers up in lament. What happened to it? Looks fine to me. I muttered as Fu shuffled over to my bed, flopping down face first at the end of it. Jiraiya sent what I assumed was a powerful glare at me. The whole thing's ruined, the entire thing is covered in corrections that make it utterly useless. Now it just sounds like an academy student wrote a bunch of words down on a scroll and claimed it's a story. He exclaimed. I tried to hide my smirk as he talked but it was a little hard when the memory of our prank was filtering back to me. Apparently Jiraiya noticed. You did this, didn't you? Who me? I asked, placing a hand on my chest dramatically. Fu snorted in amusement. Why would I ever do that to you? Not to mention, I can't even read it so I don't see how I could possibly. Don't even play that card with me, Naruto. I don't believe for a moment that you didn't convince Fu to help you he said, sounding furious. This is revenge for the field test, isn't it? And not telling me earlier that you knew I was blind. 
and for mentioning my parents even though you knew you weren't going to tell me about them. And for being a general ass all around. While those are all fairly good reasons to prank someone, they are not good reasons to ruin someone's livelihood. He exclaimed, his voice getting louder as he spoke. I yawned, do you know how long it's going to take me to fix it? It took Fu half the night with two water clones just to transcribe it so at least that long. I crossed my arms under my head as I could almost hear my sensei reaching his boiling point. You brat, I oughta. He cut off suddenly, a long silence filling the air as he processed my words. Wait, transcribed. About then Fu reached under the bed, pulling out another stack of papers about the same thickness, waving them over her head tiredly. You, you. Yes, we transcribed the whole thing and edited the other copy. Your precious porn book is safe. Though the edits we made do make for a more entertaining story, I explained as Jiraiya rushed over to grab the clean copy. I particularly like the one where we replaced all the words, dick, with, katana. That makes things so much more interesting. And more bloody, Fu muttered into the sheets. Yup, it also makes Mai's line on page 45 so much better in general. Jiraiya stared at us for a moment before flipping through the pages that had been abandoned on the desk. Now that's a katana, Jiraiya said flatly. No, you have to say it with more enthusiasm. This is a girl that likes her weapons after all. I hate you, I hate you both, Jiraiya stated, obviously not amused. Get dressed, we're leaving in ten minutes. But what about breakfast, I asked. I'm still sleepy. Fu murmured. Well you should have thought of that before you stayed up half the night to mess with my manuscript. He gave us another glare before sealing the thing inside a new scroll and pocketing it. Do you even have a lead to where she is? In fact I do, and if we don't leave now, we could very well miss her, he said as he left the room, slamming the door behind him. He's grumpy, Fu murmured yet again this time having the decency to turn her head towards me so she wasn't as muffled. I expected him to be. What I didn't expect was for him to scream like a toddler when he found it. True, she said. I sighed, sitting up once again, reluctant to leave the comfortable mattress, but knowing I had to. I swung my feet around, placing them on the cold floor. I waited a moment before climbing to my feet and collecting the stuff I needed to get ready. Fu had yet to move from her spot on the bed. Am I going with you? She asked out of the blue. I don't see why not. You don't really have anywhere else to go, I told her simply. I mean, yeah, you could go back to Taki but it's not really safe to travel alone especially with those S-ranked kidnappers on the loose. They were targeting me but there's no reason I can think of other than being a Jinchuriki. So if that's why then you could be a target too. Why would anyone target Jinchuriki? He asked, kicking her feet lightly against the end of the mattress. I don't know. Maybe they want really powerful weapons for their army. Or they're avid collectors and want the whole set. I pulled a shirt out of my bag as she giggled. Either way you shouldn't be traveling alone right now. I'm sure Jiraiya agrees. And you won't mind. I've put up with your antics for about a month now. I think I can handle a few weeks more. I said, turning towards her with a grin. Plus, you're not so bad when you're not stealing my clothes. Before I could react, Fu somehow launched herself off the bed and tackled me to the floor in a tight hug. Thank you, she exclaimed, apparently trying to crush my ribs with her arms. Can't. Breath, I whispered, which brought her back to her senses enough to let me go. She apologized sheepishly but I could still hear the smile in her voice. Great job, Kit. No, we're stuck with them, the Kyubi muttered, still moping about how Fu was able to find us so quickly. It's better than those S-ranked guys getting her. Since when do you care about her safety? She's my friend. It's in the description. You need to change that damn description then because you're going to regret this before the week's out. We'll see about that. Exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. One week later. Well, the Kyubi asked as we traveled. 
My eyebrow twitched in annoyance. Well what? I asked back, knowing full well what he was getting at. Just admit that you regret your decision and things will be a lot easier. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. He sighed in response. How many times must we go over this? I'm in your head, I can hear your thoughts. There's nothing that you can think that I don't know about. Well when you put it like that it sounds creepy. You regret bringing her. No, I don't. Naruto, look out. Fu called loudly in my ear. I froze mid-step, looking towards her. There's a stick in front of you. I know, Fu, I said for about the thousandth time that day. And probably the millionth time that week. Needless to say, it was getting old. Quick, though, apparently Jiraiya was still getting a kick out of it. I could still hear his giggling even as he tried to stifle it with his hand. I just wanted to make sure you didn't trip, she said. I sighed as I continued walking, making sure to step over said stick. I know, Fu. I wasn't sure if your echoes picked it up or not. I know, Fu. All right, that's all. Good, I muttered to myself. The three of us walked in silence once again, continuing down the path we were on we left the last town. It had felt like forever since then, and I had a feeling it was only going to get worse. Naruto, look out, Fu called again. We were only a few yards from the stick. It's a rock. All right, I may be starting to regret this. Knew it, now let's ditch her. I'm not ditching her just because she's annoying. Why not? Because that is no reason to send someone off into potential danger on their own. You know my reasons. How are we supposed to know if those two creeps aren't still following us? Or maybe two other creeps from the same group. And why would you think they're from a group? Because their robes were the same style and Itachi said something about a leader being upset if he killed me. So there's at least three of them if not more. Adequate deduction, the Kyubi muttered briefly. But I still want her gone. Stop complaining and deal with it like a grown-up, I answered, rolling my eyes at him. Honestly, it's like you're the 12-year-old and I'm the adult here. Don't push your luck, Kit. Naruto, Fu called, snapping me back to the conversation at hand. What? You didn't answer me, she said. Kayubi being obnoxious, I told her. She nodded knowingly before turning back towards the road. From the way her face was aimed down towards the ground, it seemed like she was studying the ground in front of us. I sighed. Please tell me you're not looking for sticks again. Or rocks. Or particularly large lumps of dirt. Anything you could trip on really. Foo, I'm fine. I don't need you warning me about every little potential hazard in the road. My chakra echoes are on. I can see them. If I can't then they're not much a threat to begin with. So please stop shouting out like that. But. I appreciate the thought, but honestly, all it's doing is scaring wildlife and probably attracting bandits or something, I explained. I paused for a moment, a thought striking me. Speaking of bandits, didn't you say some of them hung around outside the town? Yeah but they're not much a threat. Shouldn't we have run into them? Well, I kicked their asses last time so if they saw us they probably ran away screaming. You said you asked them about your team. Can't I do both? Of course you did both, I muttered to myself. I shook my head as I summoned a balloon out of the scroll Jiraiya gave me and started training with it again. Are you sure you should be doing that while we're walking? She asked as I started swirling the water around the balloon with ease. Over the last week, my skill with the balloon has went up drastically. Now that I knew what I was supposed to do, I was able to focus more on doing it than figuring it out. I could do two consecutive streams now without much a hassle. I could occasionally start the third and pop the balloon but Jiraiya said I needed to be able to do it at least ten times in a row before he'd teach me the next level. Foo, I've been doing this the entire time. Why do you have to ask me this every day? You can't focus on the road if you're focusing on that, she pointed out. Yes I can, 
It's called multitasking, I answered flatly. I added the second, a little wobblier than the first but it straightened out after a moment. It's like walking and chewing gum. Easy. I was just getting ready to add the third stream when the balloon broke apart on its own accord. I guess you're right, Fu said, examining the shredded balloon in my hand. That was actually pretty quick this time. That wasn't me, I said, studying my soaked hand in confusion. I hadn't even added the third one yet. Think it might have something to do with that crossbow bolt in the tree over there. Fu asked, pointing to the tree on my right. Indeed there was a bolt now lodged in the tree. It took me a second to figure out what that meant, which was barely enough time to pull Fu down to the ground as another one flew overhead. Bandits, I exclaimed as I pulled out a kunai so I was armed. Fu did the same as we got up into a low crouch. Not so long after, a large group of said individuals came out of the woods, surrounding us, each brandishing some sort of dangerous looking weapon. It was about then that I remembered that Fu also mentioned something about a bandit camp a week out of the village. And by the looks of it, we walked right into the damn thing. End chapter 43. Start chapter 44. Blindsided by twice the trouble. Well, well, what do we have here? One of them said as they stepped in front of the group. Two little lost ninjas playing in the road. You know it's dangerous to travel without adults, right? 2. Fu questioned, sounding as confused as I was. I activated my other echo points to get a better look. Yep, we were completely surrounded. And Jiraiya was nowhere in the vicinity. I could still smell his distinct scent of toads and ink, but he had apparently hidden sometime before the bandits showed up. Oh yeah, the villagers told me the same thing, I exclaimed, not wanting to draw attention to my sensei's disappearance. I had to trust that he had some sort of plan, which meant making sure we didn't pick it apart before it began. They said some mean-looking bandits live out in these woods which had us a little worried. You haven't seen any, have you? You little brats, the leader hissed. You know I was going to let you two off the hook. We'd rob you blind and you'd get to keep your miserable lives. Now I'm not so sure. Really, rob me blind? I asked, trying to hide my amusement. And let me guess, by keeping our miserable lives you mean not killing us and selling us to some slavers, right? Actually, I heard that Odo pays pretty handsomely for young ninjas. Figured we'd see what the going rate was. How am I not surprised, I said, narrowing my eyes at the mention of Orochimaru's village. And as a ninja of the village he just so recently attacked, I didn't think I'd be welcomed very warmly. On second thought, I believe we'd rather risk those nasty bandits a little further up. So we'll just be on our way. I took one step down the road just as the bandits' weapons raised higher to stop me. You're not going anywhere, the leader said through gritted teeth. Watch me, I answered simply. Before any of them could move, I threw my kanai behind me aiming for one of the ones I wasn't currently facing. Judging by the fact that he fell almost immediately after probably meant that I hit my mark. I pulled out two more kanai as the other bandits seemed to realize what was going on and start moving themselves. I noticed one on my left start at me with a particularly large mace, but as I moved to intercept Fu appeared in front of me, knocking him back with her newly formed water gauntlets. I was barely able to keep myself from hitting her instead. Foo, I had him. I yelled as I tossed another kanai at one trying to sneak up on my right, not bothering to watch him fall. Too slow, she said as she jumped quickly to another one that she deemed too close. I rolled my eyes and turned my focus on the two in front of me that were coming up to challenge me. You can't fight two at once, kid, one of them said, sounding too smug for their own good. You're outnumbered. I'm never outnumbered. I smirked back at them, raising my hands into my favorite seals. Unfortunately, before I could do so much as start channeling my chakra, Fu came out of nowhere and knocked them both into the dirt simultaneously. Hey, cut it out, I exclaimed, but she was already moving on a moment later. 
I glared at the direction she disappeared. She was doing this on purpose and I really wasn't appreciating it. Looks like you're the weak link, the leader whispered from behind me. I had just realized that my 360 echoes had dropped when I was grabbed by behind with a kanai held to my throat. I didn't even blink. Drop your jutsu or he's dead, the man told Fu, making her stop. She seemed to hesitate for a moment before her jutsu splashed onto the ground. I groaned in annoyance. Seriously Fu, seriously, you think I can't handle this guy either? I exclaimed angrily. He has a knife to your throat. Come on, like that's going to stop me. Well I'm sorry for trying to save your life. I'm not some damsel in distress you need to save every damn minute. I can fight my own battles thank you very much. I'm just trying to make sure you're safe. I am safe. Um excuse me, the man behind me said, getting both of our attention once again. Sorry to interrupt your little lover's quarrel but can we please focus on the fact that I have a knife to your throat. I can literally kill you at any time. How the hell is that safe? A tick mark was the only warning he got before I grabbed his knife hand and sent my other elbow into his stomach. I quickly ducked under his arm as I twisted it until he could no longer hold the blade. He was still doubled over as the blade hit the dirt road at my feet. I looked towards Fu, raising a challenging eyebrow at her. When she didn't respond I decided to prove my point further by raising my free hand and starting to spin chakra in it like I would inside the balloon. Once I thought there was enough I shoved it into his back. He cried out as the half-formed jutsu forced him into the ground a good half inch. Wow, didn't expect that, I said as the man groaned into the dirt. I knelt down to look at my would-be attacker, trying to get a better view of the wound on his back. I let out a low whistle as I picked at the fabric, finding most of his shirt shredded. I could even smell a bit of blood coming from it. And that's not even complete yet. I think I'm going to like this jutsu. I dusted my hands off as I stood up, dramatically placing a foot on my fallen enemy's shoulder. I glanced around at the few others that were left over. All right you pathetic idiots, unless you want to be the next one to taste this awesome jutsu, I suggest you all scram, I told them, a sly grin on my face. They paused for a moment before, in a flurry of movement, they started to run. Hey, I called to them, getting their attention once again. I took my foot off the man and nudged his now unconscious body towards them. Take your trash with you. We watched carefully as the men quickly collected their leader and darted off into the underbrush. Now Fu, what did we learn today? I asked tensely, not turning away from where the men disappeared. That bandits are just a bunch of violent cowards that can't even beat a couple of genin. You should have learned that trying to keep me from having to fight just causes more trouble but I guess that hasn't gotten through your thick head yet, I answered. There was a long silence as she thought on my words. Is this about me fighting all those guys on my own? Yes Fu, I said, turning towards her finally. I was doing you a favor. She crossed her arms defiantly. No, you weren't, I could have killed you the first time you did it. The second you almost got me killed because the damn leader noticed and thought I was the weak one. The whole reason I ended up in that farce of a hostage situation is because of you. You needed help. No I didn't, I was fine. You couldn't see them. So, I couldn't see Gara, and I still knocked him into the dirt. I couldn't see Neji but he still ended up unconscious by the end. I definitely couldn't see Kiba yet I still won. So please tell me exactly why that's a damn problem now. Because I know now. I didn't know it before but I do now so it's my responsibility to make sure those people can't take advantage of it. The only reason they did now was because of your so-called responsibility, I answered, air quoting the last word before continuing. I can still fight. Just because I can't see doesn't mean I forgot basic combat skills. I'm fine. In fact, I'd argue that I'm a better ninja because I'm blind. So back the hell off and let me do my damn job. There was silence between us as she no doubt glared at me. 
She was about as stubborn as I was so I knew this discussion wasn't completely over, but I was done with it for today. I heard a faint rustle in the trees above us as the smell of ink and toads wafted down. Jiraiya, get out of the trees or I'll leave without you, I told him as I turned back towards the road. You don't know where to go, my teacher's voice made itself known. There was a small rustle before the sound of Jiraiya dropping to the ground lightly. By the way, good fight. Would have went smoother without the attempted kidnapping though. It would have went a lot smoother if my sensei didn't disappear before it even started. I was testing you. Sure, we'll go with that. End chapter 44. This is the end of this what if. I hope you enjoyed the series series and all it had to offer. Also thank you twice the trouble for writing this great story. If you enjoyed the like, comment, and subscribe for more content. See you all in the next what if. Peace out people.